The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2 by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 11, Side 2. Friedrich, Lord of Peace, or Frederick I, 1152 to 1190, was thirty when chosen king. He was not imposing, a small, fair-skinned man with yellow hair and a red beard that won him in Italy the name of Barbarossa. But his head was clear and his will was strong, his life was spent in labors for the state, and though he suffered many defeats, he brought Germany again to the leadership of the Christian world. Carrying in his veins the blood of both the Hohenstaufens and the Welfs, he proclaimed a Landfried, or Peace of the Land, conciliated his enemies, quieted his friends, and sternly suppressed feuds, disorder, and crime. His contemporaries described him as genial and ever ready with a winning smile. But he was a terror to evildoers, and the barbarism of his penal laws advanced civilization in Germany. His private life was justly praised for decency. However, he divorced his first wife on grounds of consanguinity, and married the heiress of the Count of Burgundy, winning a kingdom with his bride. Anxious for papal coronation as emperor, he promised Pope Eugenius III aid against the rebellious Romans and the troublesome Normans in return for the imperial ointment. Arrived at Nepi, near Rome, the proud young king met the new pontiff, Hadrian IV, and omitted the customary rite by which the secular ruler held the pope's bridle and stirrup and helped him to dismount. Hadrian reached the ground unaided and refused Frederick the kiss of peace and the crown of empire until the traditional ritual should be performed. For two days the aides of pope and king disputed the point, hanging empire on protocol. Frederick yielded, the pope retired and made a second entry on horseback. Frederick held the papal bridle and stirrup and thereafter spoke of the Holy Roman Empire in the hope that the world would consider the emperor as well as the pope the vice-regent of God. His imperial title made him also king of Lombardy. No German ruler since Henry IV had taken this title literally, but Frederick now sent to each of the northern Italian cities a podesta to govern it in his name. Some cities accepted, some rejected, these alien masters. Loving order more than liberty, and perhaps anxious to control the Italian outlets of German trade with the East, Frederick set out in 1158 to subdue the rebellious towns, which loved liberty more than order. He summoned to his court at Roncaglia the learned legists who were reviving Roman law at Bologna. He was pleased to learn from them that by that law the emperor held absolute authority over all parts of the empire, owned all property in it, and might modify or abrogate private rights whenever he thought it desirable for the state. Pope Alexander III, fearing for the temporal rights of the papacy and citing the donations of Pepin and Charlemagne, repudiated these claims, and, when Frederick insisted on them, excommunicated him in 1160. The cries of Guelph and Ghibelline now passed into Italy to denote respectively the supporters of the Pope and those of the Emperor. For two years Frederick besieged obdurate Milan. Capturing it at last, he burned it to the ground in 1162. Angered by this ruthlessness and galled by the exactions of the German Podestas, Verona, Vicenza, Padua, Treviso, Ferrara, Mantua, Brescia, Bergamo, Cremona, Piacenza, Parma, Modena, Bologna, and Milan formed the Lombard League in 1167. At Legnano, in 1176, the troops of the League defeated Frederick's German army and forced him to a six years' truce. A year later, Emperor and Pope were reconciled, and at Constance, Frederick signed in 1183 a treaty restoring self government to the Italian cities. These, in return, recognized the formal suzerainty of the Empire and magnanimously agreed to provision Frederick and his retinue on his visits to Lombardy. Defeated in Italy, Frederick triumphed everywhere else. He successfully asserted the imperial authority over Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary. He reasserted over the German clergy, in practice if not in words, all the rights of appointment that Henry IV had claimed, and won the support of that clergy even against the popes. Germany, glad to woo him from Italy, basked in the splendor of his power, and gloried in the knightly pageantry of his coronations, his marriages, and his festivals. In 1189 the old emperor led 100,000 men on the Third Crusade, perhaps hoping to unite East and West in a Roman Empire restored to its ancient scope. A year later he was drowned in Cilicia. Like Charlemagne, he had drunk too deeply of the Roman tradition. He had exhausted himself in the effort to revive a dead past. Admirers of monarchy mourned his defeats as victories for chaos. Devotees of democracy celebrate them as stages in the development of freedom. 
Within the limits of his vision he was justified. Germany and Italy were sinking into a licentious disorder. Only a strong imperial authority could put an end to feudal feuds and municipal wars. Order had to pave the way before a rational liberty could grow. In the later weakness of Germany, loving legends formed about Frederick I. What the thirteenth century imagined of his grandson was in time applied to Barbarossa. He was not really dead. He was only sleeping in the Kiphauser mountain in Thuringia. His long beard could be seen growing through the marble that covered him. Some day he would wake up, shrug the earth from his shoulders, and make Germany again orderly and strong. When Bismarck forged a united Germany, a proud people saw in him Barbarossa risen triumphantly from the tomb. Henry VI, from 1190 to 1197, almost realized his father's dream. In 1194, with the help of Genoa and Pisa, he conquered southern Italy and Sicily from the Normans. All Italy but the papal states submitted to him. Provence, Dauphiné, Burgundy, Alsace, Lorraine, Switzerland, Holland, Germany, Austria, Bohemia, Moravia, and Poland were united under Henry's rule. England acknowledged itself his vassal. The Almohad Moors of Africa sent him tribute. Antioch, Cilicia, and Cyprus asked to be included in the empire. Henry eyed France and Spain with unsated appetite and planned to conquer Byzantium. The first detachments of his army had already embarked for the east when Henry, aged thirty-three, succumbed to dysentery in Sicily. He had made no provision for so ignominious a revenge by the climate of his conquest. His only son was a lad of three. A decade of disorder ensued while would-be emperors fought for the throne. When Frederick II came of age, the war of empire and papacy was resumed. It was fought in Italy by a German-Norman monarch become Italian, and will be better viewed from the Italian scene. Another generation of turmoil followed the death of Frederick II in 1250. That Herrenlose Schrecklichkeit, Schiller called it, that masterless, frightful age, in which the electoral princes sold the throne of Germany to any weakling who would leave them free to consolidate their independent power. When the chaos cleared, the Hohenstaufen dynasty had ended, and in 1273 Rudolf of Habsburg, making Vienna his capital, began a new line of kings. To win the imperial crown, Rudolf signed in 1279 a declaration recognizing the complete subordination of the royal to the papal power, and renouncing all claims to southern Italy and Sicily. Rudolf never became emperor, but his courage, devotion, and energy restored order and prosperity to Germany, and firmly established a dynasty that ruled Austria and Hungary till 1918. Henry the Seventh, from 1308 to 1313, made a final effort to unite Germany and Italy. With scant support from the nobles of Germany and a small following of Walloon knights, he crossed the Alps in 1310 and was welcomed by many Lombard cities tired of class war and interurban strife and anxious to throw off the political authority of the church. Dante hailed the invader with a treatise on monarchy, boldly proclaiming the freedom of the secular from the spiritual power and appealed to Henry to save Italy from papal domination. But the Florentine Guelphs won the upper hand the turbulent cities withdrew their support, and Henry, surrounded with enemies, died of the malarial fever with which Italy now and then repays her importunate lovers. Turned back in the south by natural barriers of topography, race, and speech, Germany found outlet and recompense in the east. German and Dutch migration, conquest, and colonization reclaimed three-fifths of Germany from the Slavs. Fertile Germans expanded along the Danube into Hungary and Romania. German merchants organized fairs and outlets at Frankfurt on the Oder, Breslau, Prague, Krakow, Danzig, Riga, Dorpat, and Raval, and trading centers everywhere from the North Sea and the Baltic to the Alps and the Black Sea. The conquest was brutal. The results were an immense advance in the economic and cultural life of the border. Meanwhile, the absorption of the emperors in Italian affairs, the recurrent need of enlisting or rewarding the support of lords and knights with grants of land or power, and the weakening of the German monarchy by papal opposition and Lombard revolts had left the nobility free to engross the countryside and reduce the peasantry to serve them, and feudalism triumphed in thirteenth-century Germany at the very time when it was succumbing to the royal power in France. The bishops, whom the earlier emperors had favored as a foil to the barons, had become a second nobility, as rich, powerful, and independent as the secular lords. By 1263, seven nobles, the archbishops of Mainz, Trier, and Cologne, the Dukes of Saxony and Bavaria, the Count Palatin and the Margrave of Brandenburg, had been entrusted by the feudality with the authority to choose the king, and these electors hedged in the powers of the ruler 
usurped royal prerogatives, and seized crown lands. They might have acted as a central government and given the nation unity. They did not. Between elections they went their several ways. No German nation existed yet. There were only Saxons, Swabians, Bavarians, Franks, etc. There was as yet no national parliament, but only territorial diets, or Landtage. A Reichstag, or Diet of the Commonwealth, established in 1247, languished feebly in the interregnum, and acquired prominence only in 1338. A corps of ministeriales, serfs or freedmen appointed by the king, provided a loose bureaucracy and continuity of government. No one capital centered the country's loyalty and interest. No one system of laws governed the realm. Despite the efforts of Barbarossa to impose Roman law upon all Germany, each region kept its own customs and code. In 1225, the laws of the Saxons were formulated in the Sachsenspiegel, or Saxon Mirror. In 1275, the Schwabenspiegel codified the laws and customs of Swabia. These codes asserted the ancient right of the people to choose their king and of the peasants to keep their freedom and their land. Serfdom and slavery, said the Sachsenspiegel, are contrary to nature and the will of God, and owe their origin to force or fraud. But serfdom grew. The age of the Hohenstaufens, from 1138 to 1254, was the greatest age of Germany before Bismarck. The manners of the people were still crude, their laws chaotic, their morals half Christian, half pagan, and their Christianity half a cover for territorial robbery. Their wealth and comforts could not compare city for city with those of Flanders or Italy. But their peasantry was industrious and fertile, their merchants enterprising and adventurous, their aristocracy the most cultured and powerful in Europe, their kings the secular heads of the Western world, ruling a realm from the Rhine to the Vistula, from the Rhone to the Balkans, from the Baltic to the Danube, from the North Sea to Sicily. Out of a virile commercial life a hundred cities had taken form. Many of them had charters of self-government. Decade by decade they grew in wealth and art, until in the Renaissance they would be the pride and glory of Germany, and be mourned in our day as a beauty that has passed from the earth. 7. Scandinavia After a century of happy obscurity, Denmark re-entered world history with Valdemar I, from 1157 to 1182. Helped by his minister Absalon, Archbishop of Lund, he organized a strong government, cleared his seas of pirates, and enriched Denmark by protecting and encouraging trade. In 1167, Absalon founded Copenhagen as a market haven, Kürbenhaven. Valdemar II, from 1202 to 1241, replied to German aggression by conquering Holstein, Hamburg, and Germany northeast of the Elbe. For the honor of the Blessed Virgin, he undertook three crusades against the Baltic Slavs, captured northern Estonia, and founded Raval. In one of these campaigns he was attacked in his camp and escaped death, we are told, partly by his own valor, partly through the timely descent from heaven of a red banner bearing a white cross. This Danabrog, or Dane's cloth, became thereafter the battle standard of the Danes. In 1223 he was taken prisoner by Count Henry of Schweren, and was released after two and a half years only on his surrendering to the Germans all his Germanic and Slav conquests except Rügen. He devoted the remainder of his remarkable life to internal reforms and the codification of Danish law. At his death Denmark was double its present area, included southern Sweden, and had a population equal to that of Sweden, or 300,000, and Norway, or 200,000, combined. The power of the kings declined after Valdemar II, and in 1282 the nobles secured from Erik Lipping, a charter recognizing their assembly, the Danahof, as a national parliament. Only the imaginative empathy of a great novelist could make us visualize the achievement of Scandinavia in these early centuries. The heroic conquest, day by day, foot by foot, of a difficult and dangerous peninsula. Life was still primitive. Hunting and fishing, as well as agriculture, were primary sources of sustenance. Vast forests had to be cleared, wild animals had to be brought under control, waters had to be channeled to productive courses, harbors had to be built, men had to harden themselves to cope with a nature that seemed to resent the intrusion of man. Cistercian monks played a noble role in this age-long war, cutting timber, tilling the soil, and teaching the peasants improved methods of agriculture. One of the many heroes of the war was Earl Berger, who served Sweden as Prime Minister from 1248 to 1266, abolished serfdom, established the reign of law, founded Stockholm, circa 1255, and inaugurated the Folkung dynasty, from 1250 to 1365, by putting his son Valdemar on the throne. 
Bergen grew rich as the outlet of Norway's trade, and Visby on the island of Gotland became the center of contact between Sweden and the Hanseatic League. Excellent churches were built, cathedral and monastic schools multiplied, poets strummed their lays, and Iceland, far off in the Arctic mists, became in the 13th century the most active literary center in the Scandinavian world. 8. England 1. William the Conqueror A masterly mixture of force, legality, piety, subtlety, and fraud. Elevated to the throne by a cowed Witten, he swore to observe existing English law. Some thanes in the west and north took advantage of his absence in Normandy to try revolt in 1067. He returned and passed like a flame of revenge through the land and harried the north with such judicious killing and destruction of homes, barns, crops, and cattle that northern England did not fully recover till the nineteenth century. He distributed the choicest lands of the kingdom in great estates among his Norman aids, and encouraged these to build castles as fortresses of defense against a hostile population. He kept large tracts as crown lands. One parcel, thirty miles long, was set aside as a royal hunting preserve. All houses, churches, and schools therein were leveled to the ground to clear the way for horses and hounds. And any man who slew a hart or hind in this new forest was to lose his eyes. So was founded the new nobility of England, whose progeny still bear now and then French names. And the feudalism that before had been relatively weak covered the land and reduced most of the conquered people to serfdom. All the soil belonged to the king, but Englishmen who could show that they had not resisted the conquest were allowed to repurchase their lands from the state. To list and know his spoils, William sent agents in 1085 to record the ownership, condition, and contents of every parcel of land in England. And so narrowly did he commission them, says the old chronicle, that there was not a yard of land, nay, not even an ox, nor a cow, nor a swine, that was not set down in his writ. The result was the Doomsday Book, ominously so named as the final doom or judgment in all disputes of realty. To assure himself military support and limit the power of his great vassals, William summoned all important landowners of England, 60,000 of them, to a concourse at Salisbury in 1086, and made every man pledge his paramount fealty to the king. It was a wise precaution against the individualistic feudalism that was at that time dismembering France. One must expect a strong government after a conquest. William set up or deposed knights and earls, bishops and archbishops and abbots. He did not hesitate to jail great lords and to assert his right over ecclesiastical appointments against the same powerful Gregory the Seventh, who was in these years bringing the Emperor Henry the Fourth to Canossa. To prevent fires, he ordered a curfew, that is, a covering or extinction of hearth fires, and therefore in winter retirement to bed by 8 p.m. for the people of England. To finance his spreading government and conquests, he laid heavy taxes upon all sales, imports, exports, and the use of bridges and roads. He restored the Danegeld, which Edward the Confessor had abolished. And when he learned that some Englishmen, to elude his fingers, had placed their money in monastic vaults, he had all monasteries searched and all such hoards removed to his own treasury. His royal court readily accepted bribes and honestly recorded them in the public register. It was frankly a government of conquerors resolved that the profits of their enterprise should be commensurate with its risks. The Norman clergy shared in the victory. The able and pliant Lanfranc was brought in from Caen and was made Archbishop of Canterbury and First Minister to the King. He found the Anglo-Saxon clergy addicted to hunting, dicing, and marriage, and replaced them with Norman priests, bishops, and abbots. He drew up a new monastic constitution, the customs of Canterbury, and raised the mental and moral level of the English clergy. Probably at his suggestion, William decreed the separation of ecclesiastical from secular courts, ordered all spiritual matters to be submitted to the canon law of the church, and pledged the state to enforce the penalties fixed by ecclesiastical tribunals. Tithes were levied upon the people for the support of the church, but William required that no papal bull or letter should be given currency or force in England without his approval, and that no papal legate should enter England without the royal consent. The National Assembly of the Bishops of England, which had been part of the Witten, was hereafter to be a distinct body, and its decrees were to have no validity except when confirmed by the king. Like most great men, William found it easier to rule a kingdom than his family. The last eleven years of his life were clouded by quarrels with his queen Matilda. His son Robert demanded full authority in Normandy. Denied this, he rebelled. William fought him indecisively and made peace by promising to bequeath the duchy to Robert. The king grew so stout that he could hardly mount a horse. He warred with Philip I of France over boundaries, 
When he tarried at Rouen, almost immovable with corpulence, Philip jested, it was said, that the King of England was lying in, and there would be a grand display of candles at his churching. William swore that he would indeed light many candles. He ordered his army to burn down Mont and all its neighborhood, and to destroy all crops and fruits, and it was done. Riding happily amid the ruins, William was thrown against the iron pommel of his saddle by a stumble of his horse. He was carried to the priory of St. Jervis near Rouen. He confessed his sins in gross, and made his will, distributed his treasure penitently among the poor and to the church, and provided for the rebuilding of Mont. All his sons except Henry deserted his deathbed to fight for the succession. His officers and servants fled with what spoils they could take. A rustic vassal bore his remains to the Abbe aux Hommes at Caen in 1087. The coffin made for him proved too small for his corpse. When the attendants tried to force the enormous bulk into the narrow space, the body burst and filled the church with a royal stench. The results of the Norman conquest were limitless. A new people and class were imposed upon the Danes who had displaced the Anglo-Saxons, who had conquered the Roman Britons, who had mastered the Celts, etc., and centuries would elapse before the Anglo-Saxon and Celtic elements would reassert themselves in British blood and speech. The Normans were akin to the Danes, but in the century since Rollo they had become Frenchmen, and with their coming the customs and speech of official England became for three centuries French. Feudalism was imported from France into England with its trappings, chivalry, heraldry, and vocabulary. Serfdom was more deeply and mercilessly imposed than ever in England before. The Jewish moneylenders who came in with William gave a new stimulus to English trade and industry. The closer connection with the continent brought to England many ideas in literature and art. Norman architecture achieved its greatest triumphs in Britain. The new nobility brought new manners, fresh vitality, a better organization of agriculture, and the Norman lords and bishops improved the administration of the state. The government was centralized. Though it was through despotism, the country was unified, life and property were made more secure, and England entered upon a long period of internal peace. She was never successfully invaded again. 2. Thomas de Becket It is an adage in England that between two strong kings a weak king intervenes, but there is no limit to the number of intermediate middlings. After the conqueror's death, his eldest son Robert received Normandy as a separate kingdom. A younger son, William Rufus the Red, 1087-1100, was crowned King of England on promising good behavior to his anointer and minister Lanfranc. He ruled as a tyrant till 1093, fell sick, promised good behavior, recovered and ruled as a tyrant till he was shot to death while hunting by an unknown hand. The saintly Anselm, who succeeded Lanfranc as Archbishop of Canterbury, withstood him patiently and was sent back to France. A third son of the conqueror, Henry I, from 1100 to 1135, recalled Anselm. The prelate philosopher demanded an end to the royal election of bishops. Henry refused. After a tedious quarrel, it was agreed that English bishops and abbots were to be chosen by cathedral chapters or the monks in the presence of the king, and should do homage to him for their feudal possessions and powers. Henry loved money and hated waste. He taxed heavily, but governed providently and justly. He kept England in order and at peace, except that with one battle at Tanche Bray in 1106, he restored Normandy to the British crown. He bade the nobles restrain themselves in dealing with the wives, sons, and daughters of their men. He himself had many illegitimate sons and daughters by various mistresses, but he had the grace and wisdom to marry Maud, scion of both the Scottish and pre-Norman English kings, thereby bringing old royal blood into the new royal line. In his last days Henry made the barons and bishops swear fealty to his daughter Matilda and her young son, the future Henry II. But on the king's death, Stephen of Blois, grandson of the conqueror, seized the throne, and England suffered fourteen years of death and taxes in a civil war marked by the most horrible cruelties. Meanwhile, Henry II grew up, married Eleanor of Aquitaine and her duchy, invaded England, forced Stephen to recognize him as heir to the throne, and on Stephen's death became king in 1154. So ended the Norman and began the Plantagenet dynasty. Geoffrey of Anjou, father of Henry II, had worn a sprig or planta of the broom plant in French Genet in his hat. Henry was a man of strong temper, eager ambition, and proud intellect, half inclined to atheism. Nominally master of a realm that reached from Scotland to the Pyrenees, including half of France, he found himself apparently helpless in a feudal society where the great lords, armed with mercenaries and fortified in castles, had pulverized the state into baronies. 
With awesome energy, the youthful king gathered money and men, fought and subdued one lord after another, destroyed the feudal castles, and established order, security, justice, and peace. With a masterly economy of cost and force, he brought under English rule an Ireland conquered and despoiled by Welsh buccaneers. But this strong man, one of the greatest kings in England's history, was shattered and humbled by encountering in Thomas a Becket a will as inflexible as his own, and in religion a power then mightier than any state. Thomas was born in London about 1118, of middle-class Norman parentage. His precocious brilliance of mind caught the eye of Theobald, Archbishop of Canterbury, who sent him to Bologna and Auxerre to study civil and canon law. Returning to England, he entered orders and soon rose to be Archdeacon of Canterbury. But like so many churchmen of those centuries, he was a man of affairs rather than a clergyman. His interest and skill lay in administration and diplomacy, and he showed such ability in these fields that at the age of thirty-seven he was made Secretary of State. For a time he and Henry accorded well. The handsome Chancellor shared the intimacy and knightly sports, almost the wealth and power of the king. His table was the most sumptuous in England, and his charity to the poor was equaled by his hospitality to his friends. In war he led in person seven hundred knights, fought single combats, planned campaigns. When he was sent on a mission to Paris, his luxurious equipage of eight chariots, forty horses, and two hundred attendants alarmed the French, who wondered how rich must be the king of so opulent a minister. In 1162 he was appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, as if by some magic incantation, he now changed his ways abruptly and thoroughly. He gave up his stately palace, his royal raiment, his noble friends. He sent in his resignation as chancellor. He put on coarse garb, wore a hair-cloth next to his skin, lived on vegetables, grains, and water, and every night washed the feet of thirteen beggars. He became now an unyielding defender of all the rights, privileges, and temporalities of the church. Among these rights was the exemption of the clergy from trial by civil courts, Henry, who aspired to spread his rule over all classes, raged to find that crimes by the clergy often went unpunished by ecclesiastical courts. Assembling the knights and bishops of England at Clarendon in 1164, he persuaded them to sign the Constitutions of Clarendon, which ended many clerical immunities. But Becket refused to put his archiepiscopal seal upon the documents. Henry promulgated the new laws nevertheless, and summoned the ailing prelate to trial at the royal court. Becket came and quietly withstood his own bishops, who joined in declaring him guilty of feudal disobedience to his suzerain the king. The court ordered his arrest. He announced that he would appeal the case to the Pope, and in his archiepiscopal robes, which none dared touch, he walked unharmed from the room. That evening he fed a great number of the poor in his London home. During the night he fled in disguise by devious routes to the Channel, crossed the turbulent strait in a frail vessel, and found haven in a monastery at St. Omer in the realm of the King of France. He submitted his resignation as archbishop to Pope Alexander III, who defended his stand, reinvested him with his see, but sent him for a time to live as a simple Cistercian monk in the Abbey of Pontigny. Henry banished from England all of Becket's relatives of any age or sex. When Henry came to Normandy, Thomas left his cell, and from a pulpit at Vaisley pronounced excommunication upon those English clergymen who upheld the constitutions of Clarendon in 1166. Henry threatened to confiscate the property of all priories in England, Normandy, Anjou, and Aquitaine, affiliated with the Abbey of Pontigny, if its abbot continued to harbor Becket. The frightened abbot begged Thomas to leave, and the ailing rebel lived for a time on alms in a dingy inn at Saint. Alexander III, prodded by Louis VII of France, commanded Henry to restore the archbishop to his see or face an interdict of all religious services in the territories under English rule. Henry yielded. He came to Avranches, met Becket, promised to remedy all his complaints, and held the archbishop's stirrup as the triumphant prelate mounted to return to England in 1169. Back in Canterbury, Thomas repeated his excommunication of the bishops who had opposed him. Some of these went to Henry in Normandy and roused him to fury with perhaps exaggerated accounts of Becket's behavior. What? exclaimed Henry. Shall a man who has eaten my bread insult the king and all the kingdom, and not one of the lazy servants whom I nourish at my table does me right for such an affront? Four knights who heard him went to England, apparently without the knowledge of the king. On December 30, 1170, they found the archbishop at the altar of the cathedral in Canterbury, and there they cut him down with their swords. All Christendom rose in horror against Henry, branding him with a spontaneous and universal excommunication. After secluding himself in his chambers and refusing food for three days, the king issued orders for the apprehension of the assassins, 
sent emissaries to the Pope to declare his innocence, and promised to perform any penance that Alexander might require. He rescinded the constitutions of Clarendon, and restored all the previous rights and property of the Church in his realm. Meanwhile the people canonized Becket, and proclaimed that many miracles were worked at his tomb. The Church officially pronounced him a saint in 1172, and soon thousands were making pilgrimage to his shrine. Finally Henry too came to Canterbury as a penitent pilgrim. All the last three miles he walked with bare and bleeding feet on a flinty road. He prostrated himself before the tomb of his dead foe, begged the monks to scourge him, and submitted to their blows. His strong will broke under the weight of general obloquy and mounting troubles in his realm. His wife Eleanor, banished and imprisoned by the adulterous king, plotted with her sons to depose him. His eldest son Henry led feudal rebellions against him in 1173 and 1183, and died in revolt. In 1189 his sons Richard and John, impatiently awaiting his death, allied themselves with Philip Augustus of France in war upon their father. Driven from Le Mans, he denounced the God who had taken from him this town of his birth and love, and dying at Chinon in 1189, he cursed with his last breath the sons who had betrayed him, and the life that had given him power and glory, riches and mistresses, enemies, contumely, treacheries, and defeat. He had not quite failed. He had surrendered to Becket dead what he had refused to Becket living. Yet in that bitter dispute it was Henry's contention that won the accolade of time. From reign to reign after him the secular courts spread their jurisdiction over clerical as well as lay subjects of the king. He liberated English law from feudal and ecclesiastical limitations and set it upon the path of development that has made it one of the supreme legal achievements since imperial Rome. Like his great-grandfather the conqueror, he strengthened and unified the government of England by reducing to discipline and order a rebellious and anarchic nobility. There he succeeded too well. The central government became strong to the verge of irresponsible and incalculable despotism. And the next round in the historic alternation between order and liberty belonged to the aristocracy and freedom. 3. Magna Carta Richard I the Lionhearted succeeded without challenge to his father's throne. Son of the adventurous, impulsive, irrepressible Eleanor, he followed in her steps rather than those of the somber and competent Henry. Born in Oxford in 1157, he was delegated by his mother to administer her dominions in Aquitaine. There he imbibed the skeptical culture of Provence, the gay science of the troubadours, and was never afterward an Englishman. He loved adventure and song more than politics and administration. He crowded a century of romance into his forty-two years and gave to the poets of his time the compliment of imitation as well as the encouragement of patronage. The first five months of his reign were spent in gathering funds for a crusade. He appropriated for the purpose the full treasury left by Henry II. He removed thousands of officials and reappointed them for a consideration. He sold charters of freedom to cities that could pay, and acknowledged Scotland's independence for 15,000 marks, not that he loved money less but adventure more. Within half a year of his accession he was off to Palestine. He cared as little for his own safety as for others' rights. He taxed his realm to the utmost and squandered revenue in luxury, feasting, and display but he galloped through the final decade of the twelfth century with such bravado and bravery that his fellow poets ranked him above Alexander, Arthur, and Charlemagne. He fought and loved Saladin, failed and swore to conquer him, turned homeward and was captured on the way in 1192 by Duke Leopold of Austria, whom he had offended in Asia. Early in 1193 Leopold surrendered him to the Emperor Henry VI, who held a grudge against Henry II and Richard, despite the law generally recognized in Europe, against the detention of a crusader, Henry VI kept the King of England prisoner in a castle at Dernstein on the Danube, and demanded for him from England a ransom of 150,000 marks, or fifteen million dollars, double the whole annual revenue of the British crown. In the meantime, Richard's brother John tried to seize the throne. Resisted, he fled to France and joined Philip Augustus in attacking England. Philip, violating a pledge of peace, attacked and seized English possessions in France, and offered great bribes to Henry VI to keep Richard prisoner. Richard fretted in comfortable durance, and wrote an excellent ballad appealing to his country for ransom. Through this turmoil Eleanor governed successfully as regent, with the wise counsel of her justiciar, Hubert Walter, Archbishop of Canterbury. But they found it hard to raise the ransom. Finally released in 1194, Richard hurried to England, levied taxes and troops, and led an army across the Channel to avenge himself and Britain against Philip. 
Tradition holds that he refused the sacraments for years lest he be required to forgive his faithless enemy. He recovered all the territory that Philip had captured and resigned himself to a peace that allowed Philip to live. In the interlude he quarreled with a vassal, Adamar, Viscount of Limoges, who had found a cache of gold on his land. Adamar offered Richard a part, Richard demanded all and besieged him. An arrow from Adamar's castle struck the king, and Richard Coeur de Lyon died in his forty-third year in a dispute over a mess of gold. His brother John, 1199 to 1216, nicknamed Lackland because, unlike his elder brothers, he had not received from his father any appanage on the continent, succeeded him after some opposition and distrust, and Archbishop Walter made him swear a coronation oath that his throne was held by the election of the nation, that is, the nobles and prelates, and the grace of God. But John, having been false to his father, his brother, and his wife, was not sorely hampered by one more vow. Like Henry II and Richard I, he gave little evidence of religious belief. It was said that he had never taken the Eucharist since coming of age, not even on his coronation day. The monks charged him with atheism and told how, having caught a fat stag, he had remarked, How plump and well fed is this animal, and yet I dare swear he never heard Mass, which the monks resented as an allusion to their corpulence. He was a man of much intellect and little scruple, an excellent administrator, no great friend to the clergy, and therefore, said Holland's head, a bit maligned by monastic chroniclers, not always in the wrong, but often alienating men by his sharp temper and wit, his scandalous humor, his proud absolutism, and the tax exactions to which he felt driven in defending continental England against Philip Augustus. In 1199 John secured permission from Pope Innocent III to divorce Isabel of Gloucester on grounds of consanguinity, and soon thereafter he married Isabella of Angoulême, despite her betrothal to the Count of Lusignan. The nobility of both countries took offense, and the count appealed to Philip for redress. About the same time, the barons of Anjou, Touraine, Poitou, and Men protested to Philip that John was oppressing their provinces. By feudal fealties, going back to the cession of Normandy to Rollo, the territorial lords of France, even in provinces owned by England, acknowledged the French king as their feudal suzerain, and by feudal law John, as Duke of Normandy, was vassal to the king of France. Philip summoned his royal vassal to come to Paris and defend himself against divers charges and appeals. John refused. The French feudal court declared his possessions in France forfeited and awarded Normandy, Anjou, and Poitou to Arthur, Count of Brittany, a grandson of Henry II. Arthur laid claim to the throne of England, raised an army, and besieged at Mirabeau Queen Eleanor, who, though eighty, led a force in defense of her unruly son. John rescued her, captured Arthur, and apparently ordered his death. Philip invaded Normandy. John was too busy honeymooning at Rouen to lead his troops. They were defeated, John fled to England, and Normandy, men, Anjou, and Touraine passed to the French crown. Pope Innocent III, at odds with Philip, had done what he could to help John. John now quarreled with Innocent. On the death of Hubert Walter in 1205, the king persuaded the older monks of Canterbury to elect John de Grey, Bishop of Norwich, to the vacant see. A group of younger monks chose Reginald, their sub-prior, as archbishop. The rival candidates hurried to Rome, seeking papal confirmation. Innocent rejected them both and appointed to the see Stephen Langton, an English prelate who for the past twenty-five years had lived in Paris and was now a professor of theology in the university there. John protested that Langton had no preparation for the office of primate of England, a position involving political as well as ecclesiastical functions. Ignoring John's demurrers, Innocent at Viterbo in Italy consecrated Stephen Archbishop of Canterbury in 1207. John defied Langton to set foot on English soil threatened to burn the cloisters over the heads of the rebellious Canterbury monks, and swore by the teeth of God that if the Pope laid an interdict on England he would banish every Catholic clergyman from the land and would put out the eyes and cut off the nose of some of them for good measure. The interdict was pronounced in 1208. All religious services of the clergy in England were suspended except baptism and extreme unction. Churches were closed by the clergy, church bells were silenced, and the dead were buried in unconsecrated ground. John confiscated all episcopal or monastic properties and gave them to laymen. Innocent excommunicated the king. John ignored the decree and waged successful campaigns in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. The people trembled under the interdict, but the nobles acquiesced in the spoliation of church property as transiently diverting the royal appetite from their own wealth. Proud of his apparent victory, John offended many by his excesses. He neglected his second wife to beget illegitimate children upon careless mistresses jailed Jews to milk their money from them, allowed some imprisoned prelates to die of hardships, alienated nobles by adding insults to taxes, 
and strictly enforced the unpopular forestry laws. In 1213, Innocent used his last resort. He promulgated a decree of deposition against the English king, released John's subjects from their oath of allegiance, and declared the king's possessions to be now the lawful spoil of whoever could wrest them from his sacrilegious hands. Philip Augustus accepted the invitation, assembled an impressive army, and marched to the Channel coast. John prepared to resist invasion, but now he discovered that the nobles would not support him in a war against a pope armed with physical as well as spiritual force. Furious against them and seeing the imminence of defeat, he struck a bargain with Pandolf, the papal legate. If Innocent would withdraw his decrees of excommunication, interdict, and deposition, and would change from foe to friend, John pledged himself to return all confiscated ecclesiastical property, and to submit his crown and his kingdom to the Pope in feudal vassalage. It was so agreed. John surrendered all England to the Pope and received it back, after five days, as a papal fief subject to perpetual tribute and fealty. This in 1213. John embarked for Poitou to attack Philip and commanded the barons of England to follow him with arms and men. They refused. The victory of Philip at Bouvines deprived John of German and other allies to whom he had looked for aid against an expanding France. He returned to England to face an embittered aristocracy. The nobles resented his inordinate taxation for disastrous wars, his violations of precedent and law, his bartering of England for innocence, forgiveness, and support. To force the issue, John required of them a scutage, a money payment in lieu of military service. They sent him instead a deputation demanding a return to the laws of Henry I, which had protected the rights of the nobles and limited the powers of the king. Receiving no satisfactory answer, the nobles collected their armed forces at Stamford. And while John dallied at Oxford, they sent emissaries to London, who won the support of the commune and the court. At Runnymede on the Thames near Windsor, the forces of the aristocracy encamped opposite the few supporters of the king. There John made his second great surrender, and signed in 1215 Magna Carta, the most famous document in English history. This book is continued on Cassette 12. Side 1. The Story of Civilization. Volume 4. The Age of Faith. Part 2. By Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 12. Side 1. At Runnymede on the Thames, near Windsor, the forces of the aristocracy encamped opposite the few supporters of the king. There John made his second great surrender and signed in 1215 Magna Carta, the most famous document in English history, excerpted below. John, by the grace of God, King of England, to his archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, barons, and all his faithful subjects, greeting. Know ye that we have by this our present charter confirmed for us and our heirs forever. 1. That the Church of England shall be free, and have her whole rights and liberties inviolable. 2. We grant to all the freemen of our kingdom, for us and for our heirs forever, all the below-written liberties. 12. No scutage or aid shall be imposed, unless by the general council of our kingdom. 14. For holding the general council concerning the assessment of aids and scutage, we shall cause to be summoned the archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, and greater barons of the realm, and all others who hold of us in chief. The five groups here named later became the House of Lords. 15. We will not in future grant to any one that he may take aid of his own free that is, non-slave, tenants, except to ransom his body, and to make his eldest son a knight, and once to marry his eldest daughter, and for this there shall be only a reasonable aid. 17. Common pleas shall not follow our court, but shall be held in some fixed place. 36. Nothing henceforth shall be given or taken for a writ of inquisition, but it shall be granted freely, that is, no man shall be long imprisoned without trial. 39. No freeman shall be taken, or imprisoned, or diseased, that is, dispossessed, or outlawed, or banished, or in any way destroyed, unless by the lawful judgment of his peers, that is, his equals in rank, or by the law of the land. 40. We will sell to no man, we will not deny to any man either justice or right. 41. All merchants shall have safe and secure conduct to go out of and to come into England, and to stay there, and to pass as well by land as by water, for buying or selling, without any unjust tolls. 60. All the aforesaid customs and liberties, all people of our kingdom, as well as clergy, as laity, shall observe, as far as they are concerned, towards their dependence. Given under our hand, in the presence of witnesses, in the meadow called Runnymede, on the fifteenth day of June, 
in the seventeenth year of our reign. The Great Charter deserves its fame as the foundation of the liberties today enjoyed by the English-speaking world. It was indeed limited. It defined the rights of the nobles and the clergy far more than of the whole people. No arrangements were made to implement the pious gesture of Article 60. The Charter was a victory for feudalism rather than for democracy. But it defined and safeguarded basic rights. It established habeas corpus and trial by jury. It gave to an incipient parliament a power of the purse that would later arm the nation against tyranny. It transformed absolute into limited and constitutional monarchy. John, however, had no idea that he had immortalized himself by surrendering his despotic powers or claims. He signed under duress, and on the morrow he plotted to annul the charter. He appealed to the Pope, and Innocent III, whose policy now required the support of England against France, came to the defense of his humiliated vassal by proclaiming the charter void, and forbidding John to obey or the nobles to enforce its terms. The barons ignored the decree. Innocent excommunicated them and the citizens of London and the five ports. But Stephen Langton, who had led in formulating the charter, refused to publish the edict. Papal legates in England suspended Langton, promulgated the decree, raised an army of mercenaries in Flanders and France, and with it ravaged the English nobility with fire and sword, plunder, murder, and rape. Apparently the nobles had no dependable public support, Instead of resisting with their own feudal levies, they invited Louis, son of the French king, to invade England, defend them, and take the English throne as his reward. Had the plan succeeded, England might have become part of France. Papal legates forbade Louis to cross the Channel, and excommunicated him and all his followers when he persisted. Louis, arriving in London, received the homage and fealty of the barons. Everywhere outside of mercantile London, John was victorious and merciless. Then, amid the energy and fury of his triumph, he was struck down by dysentery, made his way painfully to a monastery, died at Newark in the forty-ninth year of his age. A papal legate crowned John's six-year-old son as Henry III, from 1216 to 1272. A regency was formed with the Earl of Pembroke at its head. Encouraged by this elevation of one of their number, the nobles went over to Henry and sent Louis back to France. Henry grew into an artist king, a connoisseur of beauty, the inspiration and financier for the building of Westminster Abbey. He thought the Charter a disintegrating force and tried to abrogate it, but failed. He taxed the nobles within an inch of revolution, always swearing that the latest levy would be the last. The popes needed money, too, and with the king's consent drew tithes from English parishes to support the wars of the papacy against Frederick II. The memory of these exactions prepared the revolts of Wycliffe and Henry VIII. Edward I, 1272-1307, was less a scholar than his father and more a king. Ambitious, strong of will, tenacious in war, subtle in policy, rich in stratagems and spoils, yet capable of moderation and caution, and of far-seeing purposes that made his reign one of the most successful in English history. He reorganized the army, trained a large force of archers in the use of the longbow, and established a national militia by ordering every able-bodied Englishman to possess and learn the use of arms. Unwittingly, he created a military basis for democracy. So strengthened, he conquered Wales, won and lost Scotland, refused to pay the tribute that John had promised the popes, and abolished the papal suzerainty over England. But the greatest event of his reign was the development of Parliament. Perhaps without willing it, Edward became the central figure in England's finest achievement, the reconciliation in government and character of liberty and law. 4. The Growth of the Law It was in this period, from the Norman conquest to Edward II, that the law and government of England took the forms which they maintained till the nineteenth century. Through the superimposition of Norman feudal upon Anglo-Saxon local law, English law for the first time became national no longer the law of Essex or Mercia or the Dane law, but the law and custom of the realm. We can hardly realize now what a legal revolution was implied when Ranulf de Glanville, who died in 1190, used this phrase. Under the stimulus of Henry II and the guidance of his justiciar, Glanville, English law and courts acquired such repute for expedition and equity, tempered with corruption, that rival kings in Spain submitted their dispute to the royal court of England. Glanville may have been the author of a treatise on laws, Tractatus de Legibus, traditionally ascribed to him. In any case, it is our oldest textbook of English law. Half a century later, from 1250 to 1256, Henry de Bracton achieved the first systematic digest in his five-volume classic on the laws and customs of England. 
de legibus et consuetudinibus Angliae. The king's rising need for money and troops forced the expansion of the Anglo-Saxon Wittenagemot into the English Parliament. Impatient to raise more funds than the lords would vote him, Henry III summoned two knights from each county to join the barons and prelates in the Great Council of 1254. When Simon de Montfort, son of a famous Albigensian crusader, led a revolt of the nobles against Henry III in 1264, he tried to win the middle classes to his cause by asking not only two knights from each county, but also two leading citizens from each borough or town, to join the barons in a national assembly. The towns were growing, the merchants had money. It was worthwhile consulting these men if they would pay as well as talk. Edward I profited from Simon's example. Caught in the toils of simultaneous wars with Scotland, Wales, and France, he was constrained to seek the support and funds of all ranks. In 1295 he summoned the Model Parliament, the first complete parliament in English history. What touches all, his writ of summons read, should be approved by all, and common dangers should be met by measures agreed upon in common. So Edward invited two burgesses from every city, borough, and leading town to attend the great council at Westminster. These men were chosen by the more substantial citizens in each locality. No one dreamed of universal suffrage in a society where only a minority could read. In the model parliament itself, the commons did not at once hold equal powers with the aristocracy. There was as yet no annual parliament, meeting at its own will as the sole source of law. But by 1295 the principle was accepted that no statute passed by Parliament could be abrogated except by Parliament. And in 1297 it was further agreed that no taxes were to be levied without Parliament's consent. Such were the modest beginnings from which grew the most democratic government in history. The clergy only reluctantly attended this enlarged Parliament. They sat apart and refused to vote supplies except in their provincial assemblies. Ecclesiastical courts continued to try all cases involving canon law, and most cases involving any member of the clergy. Clerics accused of felonies might be tried by secular authorities, but those convicted of crimes short of high treason were, through benefit of clergy, handed over to an ecclesiastical court which alone could punish them. Moreover, most judges in secular tribunals were ecclesiastics, for education in law was largely confined to the clergy. Under Edward I, the secular courts became more secular. When the clergy refused to join in voting supplies, Edward I, arguing that those who were protected by the state should share its burdens, directed his courts to hear no cause in which a churchman was plaintiff, but to try every suit in which a cleric was defendant. In further retaliation, Edward's Council of 1279, by the Statute of Mortmain, forbade the grant of lands to ecclesiastical bodies without the royal consent. Despite this divided jurisdiction, English law developed rapidly under William I, Henry II, John, and Edward I. It was a thoroughly feudal law and bore down heavily on the serf. Crimes of freemen against serfs were usually immersed by fines. The law allowed women to own, inherit, or bequeath property, make contracts, sue and be sued, and gave the wife a dower right of one-third in her husband's real property. But all the movable property that she brought to her marriage or acquired during it belonged to her husband. Legally all land belonged to the king and was held from him in fief. Normally the whole estate of a feudal lord was bequeathed to the eldest son, not only to keep the property intact, but to protect the feudal suzerain from a division of vassal responsibility in dues and war. Among the free peasantry no such rule of primogeniture obtained. In so feudal a code the law of contract remained immature. An assize of measures of 1197 standardized weights, measures, and coins, and provided state supervision of their use. Enlightened commercial legislation in England began with the Statute of Merchants in 1283 and the Merchants' Charter, or Carta Mercatoria, of 1303, two more achievements of Edward I's creative reign. Legal procedure slowly improved. To enforce the laws, every ward had a watch, every borough a constable, every shire a shire reeve, or sheriff. All men were bound to raise a hue and cry on perceiving a violation of the law, and to join in pursuing the offender. Bail was admitted. It is a major credit to English law that torture was not used in examining suspects or witnesses. When Edward II was induced by Philip IV of France to arrest the English Templars, he could find no evidence by which to convict them. Thereupon Pope Clement V, doubtless constrained by Philip, wrote to Edward, We hear that you forbid torture as contrary to the laws of your land. But no state law can override canon law, our law, 
Therefore I command you at once to submit those men to torture. Edward yielded, but torture was not again used in English legal procedure till the reign of Bloody Mary, from 1553 to 1558. The Normans brought to England the old Frank system of inquisitio, or judicial inquiry by a jurata, or a sworn group of local citizens, into the fiscal and legal affairs of a district. The Assize of Clarendon, circa 1166, developed this jury plan by permitting litigants to submit the question of their veracity not to trial by combat, but to the country, that is, to a jury of twelve knights chosen from the local citizenry, in the presence of the court, by four knights named by the sheriff. This was the grand assize, or major sitting. In the petty assize, or minor session for the trial of ordinary cases, the sheriff himself chose twelve freemen from the neighborhood. Men shunned jury service then as now, and had no notion that the system would be one of the foundations of democracy. By the end of the thirteenth century, verdict by a jury had almost everywhere in England replaced the old tests of barbarian law. 5. The English Scene England in 1300 was ninety percent rural, with a hundred towns whose modern successors would rank them as villages, and one city, London, boasting of forty thousand population four times more than any other town in England, but far inferior in wealth or beauty to Paris, Bruges, Venice, or Milan, not to speak of Constantinople, Palermo, or Rome. Houses were of wood, two or three stories high, with gabled roofs. Often the upper story projected beyond the one beneath. City law forbade emptying the end products of kitchen, bedroom, or bath through the windows, but the tenants of upper stories often yielded to the convenience. Most of the slops from the houses found their way into the current of rainwater that ran along the curbs. It was forbidden to cast feces, permissible to empty urinals into this gutter stream, but could to improve sanitation, ordered citizens to clean the streets before their homes, levied fines for negligence, and hired rakers to gather garbage and filth and cart these to dung boats on the Thames. Horses, cattle, pigs, and poultry were kept by many citizens, but this was no great evil since there were many open spaces and nearly every house had a garden. Here and there rose a structure of stone like the Temple Church, Westminster Abbey, or the Tower of London, which William the Conqueror had built to guard his capital and shelter distinguished prisoners. Londoners were already proud of their city. Soon Froissart would say that they are of more weight than all the rest of England, for they are the most mighty in wealth and men. And the monk Thomas of Walsingham would describe them as of all people, almost the most proud, arrogant, and greedy, disbelieving in ancient customs, disbelieving in God. Through these centuries the amalgamation of Norman, Anglo-Saxon, Danish, and Celtic stocks, speech, and ways produced the English nation, language, and character. As Normandy fell away from England, the Norman families in Britain forgot Normandy and learned to love their new land. The mystic and poetic qualities of the Celt remained, especially in the lower classes, but were tempered by Norman vigor and earthiness. Amid the strife of nations and classes, and the blows of famine and plague, the resultant Britain could still make what Henry of Huntingdon, possibly from 1084 to 1155, called Anglia Plena Iocis, Merry England, a nation of abounding energy, rude jests, boisterous games, good fellowship, a love of dancing, minstrelsy, and ale. From those virile loins and generations would come the hearty sensuality of Chaucer's pilgrims and the magnificent bombast of the cultured swashbucklers of the Elizabethan age. 9. Ireland, Scotland, Wales 1066 to 1318. In the year 1154, Henry II became King of England, and an Englishman, Nicholas Breakspear, became Pope Hadrian IV. A year later, Henry sent John of Salisbury to Rome with a subtle message. Ireland was in a state of political chaos, literary decline, moral debasement, religious independence, and decay. Would not the Pope permit Henry to take possession of the individualistic isle and restore it to social order and papal obedience? If we may believe Geraldus Cambrensis, the Pope agreed, and by the bull Lauda Biliter, granted Ireland to Henry on condition of restoring orderly government there, bringing the Irish clergy into better cooperation with Rome, and arranging that a penny, or eighty-three cents, should be paid yearly to the See of Peter for every house in Ireland. Henry was too busy at the time to take advantage of this nihil obstet, but he remained in a receptive mood. In 1166, Dermot McMurrah, king of Leinster, was defeated in war by Tiernan O'Rourke, king of Breffney, whose wife he had seduced. Expelled by his subjects, he fled with his beautiful daughter Eva to England and France, 
and secured from Henry II a letter assuring royal goodwill to any of his subjects who should help Dermot to regain the Leinster throne. At Bristol, Dermot received from Richard Fitzgilbert, Earl of Pembroke and Wales, known as Strongbow, a pledge of military support in return for Eva's hand in marriage, and the succession to Dermot's kingdom. In 1169 Richard led a small force of Welshmen into Ireland, restored Dermot with the help of the Leinster clergy, and on Dermot's death in 1171 inherited the kingdom. Rory O'Connor, then High King of Ireland, led an army against the Welsh invaders and bottled them up in Dublin. The besieged made an heroic sortie, and the ill-trained and poorly equipped Irish fled. Summoned by Henry II, Strongbow crossed to Wales, met the king, and agreed to surrender to him Dublin and other Irish ports, and to hold the rest of Leinster in fief from the English crown. Henry landed near Waterford in 1171 with 4,000 men, won the support of the Irish clergy, and received the allegiance of all Ireland except Connaught and Ulster. The Welsh conquest was turned into a Norman-English conquest without a battle. A synod of Irish prelates declared their full submission to the Pope, and decreed that thereafter the ritual of the Irish Church should conform to that of England and Rome. Most of the Irish kings were allowed to keep their thrones on condition of feudal fealty and annual tribute to the King of England. Henry had accomplished his purpose with economy and skill, but he erred in thinking that the forces which he left behind him could sustain order and peace. His appointees fought one another for the spoils, and their aides and troops plundered the country with a minimum of restraint. The conquerors did their best to reduce the Irish to serfdom. The Irish resisted with guerrilla warfare, and the result was a century of turmoil and destruction. In 1315 some Irish chieftains offered Ireland to Scotland, where Robert Bruce had just defeated the English at Bannockburn. Robert's brother Edward landed in Ireland with six thousand men. Pope John XII pronounced excommunication upon all who should aid the Scots. But nearly all Irishmen rose at Edward's call, and in 1316 they crowned him king. Two years later he was defeated and slain near Dundalk, and the revolt collapsed in poverty and despair. The Scots, said Ranulph Higdon, a fourteenth-century Briton, be light of heart, strong and wild enough, but by mixing with Englishmen they be much amended. They be cruel upon their enemies, and hate bondage most of anything, and hold it foul sloth if any man dieth in bed, and great worship if he die in the field. Ireland remained Irish but lost its liberty. Scotland became British but remained free. Angles, Saxons, and Normans multiplied in the lowlands and reorganized agricultural life on a feudal plan. Malcolm III, from 1058 to 1093, was a warrior who repeatedly invaded England. But his queen Margaret was an Anglo-Saxon princess who converted the Scottish court to the English language, brought in English-speaking clergy, and reared her sons in English ways. The last and strongest of them, David I, from 1124 to 1153, made the church his chosen instrument of rule, founded English-speaking monasteries at Kelso, Dryborough, Melrose, and Holyrood, levied tithes, for the first time in Scotland, for the support of the church, and gave so lavishly to bishops and abbots that people mistook him for a saint. Under David I, Scotland, in all but its highlands, became an English state. But it was not the less independent. The English immigrants were transformed into patriotic Scots. From their number came the Stuarts and the Bruces. David I invaded and captured Northumberland. Malcolm IV, from 1153 to 1165, lost it. William the Lion, from 1165 to 1214, trying to regain it, was taken prisoner by Henry II, and was freed only on pledging homage to the King of England for the Scottish crown, this in 1174. Fifteen years later he bought release from this pledge by helping to finance Richard I in the Third Crusade, but the English kings continued to claim feudal suzerainty over Scotland. Alexander III, from 1249 to 1286, recovered the Hebrides from Norway, maintained friendly relations with England, and gave Scotland a golden age of prosperity and peace. At Alexander's death, Robert Bruce and John Balliol, descendants of David I, contested the succession. Edward I of England seized the opportunity. By his support, Balliol was made king, but acknowledged the overlordship of England, this in 1292. When, however, Edward ordered Balliol to raise troops to fight for England in France, the Scotch nobles and bishops rebelled, and bade Balliol make alliance with France against England in 1295. Edward defeated the Scots at Dunbar in 1296, 
received the submission of the aristocracy, dethroned Balliol, appointed three Englishmen to rule Scotland for him, and returned to England. Many Scotch nobles owned land in England and were thereby mortgaged to obedience. But the older Gaelic Scots strongly resented the surrender. One of them, Sir William Wallace, organized an army of the commons of Scotland, routed the English garrison, and for a year ruled Scotland as regent for Balliol. Edward returned and defeated Wallace at Falkirk in 1298. In 1305 he captured Wallace and had him disemboweled and quartered, according to the English law of treason. A year later another defender was forced into the field. Robert Bruce, grandson of the Bruce who had claimed the throne in 1286, quarreled with John Cummin, a leading representative of Edward I in Scotland, and killed him. Thereby committed to rebellion, Bruce had himself crowned king, though only a small group of nobles supported him, and the Pope excommunicated him for his crime. Edward once more marched north, but died on the way in 1307. Edward II's incompetence was a blessing for Bruce. The nobles and clergy of Scotland rallied to the outlaw's banner. His reinforced armies, bravely led by his brother Edward and Sir James Douglas, captured Edinburgh, invaded Northumberland, and seized Durham. In 1314 Edward II led into Scotland the largest army that the land had ever seen, and met the Scots at Bannockburn. Bruce had had his men dig and conceal pits before his position. Many of the English, charging, fell into the morass, and the English army was almost totally destroyed. In 1328 the regents for Edward III, involved in war with France, signed the Treaty of Northampton, making Scotland once more free. Meanwhile, a like struggle had come to other issue in Wales. William I claimed suzerainty over it as part of the realm of the defeated Harold. He had no time to add it to his conquests, but he set up three earldoms on its eastern frontier and encouraged their lords to expand them into Wales. South Wales was meanwhile overrun by Norman buccaneers who left the prefix Fitz from Fies or Son on some Welsh names. In 1094, Cadoganap Bleden subdued these Normans. In 1165 the Welsh defeated the English at Corwen, and Henry II, busy with Becket, acknowledged the independence of South Wales under its enlightened king, Rhys ap Griffith, this in 1171. Llewellyn the Great, by his ability in both war and statesmanship, extended his rule over nearly all the country. His sons quarreled and disordered the land, but his grandson, Llewellyn ap Griffith, who died in 1282, restored unity, made peace with Henry III, and created for himself the title of Prince of Wales. Edward I, intent on uniting Wales and Scotland with England, invaded Wales with an immense army and fleet in 1282. Llewellyn died in a chance encounter with a small border force. His brother David was captured by Edward, and his severed head with Llewellyn's was suspended from the Tower of London and left to bleach in the sun, wind, and rain. Wales was made a part of England in 1284, and Edward in 1301 gave the title of Prince of Wales to the heir to the English throne. Through these exaltations and depressions the Welsh kept their own language and their old customs, tilled their rough soil with obstinate courage, and solaced their days and nights with legend, poetry, music, and song. Their bards now gave form to the tales of the Mabinogion, enriching literature with a mystic melodious tenderness uniquely Welsh. Annually, the bards and minstrels assembled in a national Eisteth vote, from Eisteth to Sith, which can be traced back to 1176. Contests were held in oratory, poetry, singing, and the playing of musical instruments. The Welsh could fight bravely, but not long. They were soon eager to return and protect at first hand their women, children, and homes. And one of their proverbs wished that every ray of the sun were a poniard to pierce the friends of war. 10. The Rhinelands, 1066 to 1315. The countries huddled about the lower Rhine and its many mouths were among the richest in the medieval world. South of the Rhine lay the county of Flanders, running from Calais through modern Belgium to the Scheldt. Formerly it was a fief held from the French king. Actually it was ruled by a dynasty of enlightened counts, checked only by the proud autonomy of the towns. Near the Rhine the people were Flemish, of low German origin, and spoke a German dialect. West of the Lys River they were Walloons, a mixture of Germans and French on a Celtic base, and spoke a dialect of French. Commerce and industry fattened and disturbed Ghent, Odenard, 
Courtrai, Ypres, and Castle in the Flemish northeast, and Bruges, Lille, and Douai in the Walloon southwest. In these cities population was denser than anywhere else in Europe north of the Alps. In 1300 the cities dominated the counts. The magistrates of the larger communities formed a supreme court for the county and negotiated on their own authority with foreign cities and governments. Usually the counts cooperated with the cities, encouraged manufactures and trade, maintained a stable currency, and as early as 1100, two centuries before England, established uniform measures and weights for all the towns. The class war ultimately destroyed the freedom of both the cities and the counts. As the proletariat rose in number, resentment, and power, and the counts sided with them as an offset to the bumptious bourgeoisie, the merchants sought support from Philip Augustus of France, who promised it in the hope of bringing Flanders effectively under the French crown. England, anxious to keep the chief market for her wool out of the control of the French king, allied herself with the Counts of Flanders and Hainaut, the Duke of Brabant, and Otto IV of Germany. Philip defeated this coalition at Bouvines in 1214, subdued the Counts, and protected the merchants in their oligarchic regime. The conflict of powers and classes continued. In 1297, Count Guy de Dampierre, again allied Flanders with England. Philip the Fair invaded Flanders, imprisoned Guy, and forced him to cede the country to France. But when the French army moved to occupy Bruges, the commons rose, overcame the troops, massacred rich merchants, and gained possession of the town. Philip sent a large army to avenge this affront. The workers of the towns formed themselves into an impromptu army and defeated the knights and mercenaries of France in the Battle of Courtrai, this in 1302. The aged Guy de Dampierre was released and restored, and the strange alliance of feudal counts and revolutionary proletaire enjoyed a decade of victory. What we now know as Holland was, from the 3rd to the 9th century, part of the Frank kingdom. In 843 it became the northernmost portion of the buffer state of Lorraine created by the Treaty of Verdun. In the 9th and 10th centuries it was divided into feudal fiefs for better resistance to Norse raids. The Germans who cleared and settled the heavily wooded district north of the Rhine called it Holtland, that is, woodland. Most of the people were serfs, absorbed in the struggle to wrest a living from a land that had always to be diked or drained. Half of Holland exists by the taming of the sea. But there were cities, too, not quite as rich and turbulent as the Flemish towns, but soundly based on steady industry and orderly trade. Dordrecht was the most prosperous. Utrecht was a center of learning. Harlem was the seat of the Count of Holland. Delft became the capital for a time. Then, toward 1250, the Hague. Amsterdam made its debut in 1204, when a feudal lord built a fortress chateau at the mouth of the Amstel River. The sheltered site on the Zuider Zee and the pervasive canals invited commerce. In 1297, the city was made a free port, where goods could be received and reshipped free of customs duties, and thenceforth Little Holland played a large part in the economic world. There, as elsewhere, commerce nourished culture. In the 13th century, we find a Dutch poet, Merlant, who satirized the luxurious life of the clergy. And in the monasteries, Dutch art in sculpture, pottery, painting, and illumination was beginning its unique and extraordinary career. South of Holland lay the Duchy of Brabant, which then contained the cities of Antwerp, Brussels, and Louvain. Liège was ruled independently by its bishops, who allowed it a large measure of autonomy. Still farther south were the counties of Hainaut, Namur, Limburg, and Luxembourg, the Duchy of Lorraine, with the cities of Trier, Nancy, and Metz, and several other principalities, nominally subject to the German emperor, but left for the most part to their ruling counts. Each of these districts had a vibrant history of politics, love, and war. We salute them and move on. South and west of them lay Burgundy, in what is now east-central France, its varying boundaries discouraged definition. Its political fortunes would fill vain tomes. In 888, Rudolf I made it an independent kingdom. In 1032, Rudolf III bequeathed it to Germany, but in that year part of it was united as a duchy to France. The Dukes of Burgundy, like its early kings, governed with intelligence and for the most part cherished peace. Their great age would come in the 15th century. In classical times, Switzerland was the home of diverse tribes, Helvetii, Reti, Lepantii, of mixed Celtic, Teutonic, and Italic origin. In the third century, the Alamanni occupied and Germanized the northern plateau. 
After the collapse of the Carolingian Empire, the land was divided into feudal fiefs subject to the Holy Roman Empire. But it is difficult to enslave mountaineers, and the Swiss, while acknowledging some feudal dues, soon liberated themselves from serfdom. The villages in democratic assemblies chose their own officials and ruled themselves by the ancient Germanic laws of the Alamanni and Burgundians. For mutual protection, the peasants neighboring Lake Lucerne formed themselves into forest cantons, or Waldstädte, Uri, Nidwalden, and Schwitz, which later gave its name to the state. The sturdy burghers of the towns that had grown along the Alpine passes, Geneva, Constance, Fribourg, Bern, and Basel, elected their own officials and administered their own laws. Their feudal overlords raised no objection to this so long as basic feudal taxes were paid. The Habsburg counts, who from 1173 held the northern districts, proved an exception to this rule and earned the hatred of the men of Schwitz by attempting to apply feudal dues in full severity. In 1291 the three forest cantons formed an everlasting league and swore a confederatio to give one another aid against external aggression or internal disturbance, to arbitrate all differences, and to recognize no judge who was not a native of the valley or had bought his office. Lucerne, Zurich, and Constance soon joined the League. In 1315 the Habsburg dukes sent two armies into Switzerland to enforce all feudal dues. In the pass of Morgarten, the infantry of Schwitz and Uri, armed with halberds, defeated the Austrian cavalry in the Marathon of Switzerland. The Austrian forces withdrew. The three cantons renewed their oath of mutual support on December 9, 1315, and created the Swiss Confederacy. It was not yet an independent state. The free citizens acknowledged certain feudal obligations and the suzerainty of the Holy Roman Emperor. But feudal lords and holy emperors had learned to respect the arms and liberties of the Swiss cantons and towns, and the victory of Morgarten had opened the way to the most stable and sensible democracy in history. 11. France, 1060 to 1328. 1. Philip Augustus. At the accession of Philip II Augustus in 1180, France was a minor and harassed state, hardly promising any grandeur to come. England held Normandy, Brittany, Anjou, Touraine, and Aquitaine, a domain thrice the size of that directly controlled by the French king. Most of Burgundy adhered to Germany and the flourishing county of Flanders was in effect an independent principality. So were the counties of Lyon, Savoie, and Chambéry. So was Provence, southeastern France, rich in wine, oil, fruit, poets, and the cities of Arles and Avignon, Aigues and Marseille. The Dauphiné, centering about Vienne, had been bequeathed to Germany as part of Burgundy. It was now independently ruled by a Dauphin, who took his title from the Dauphin that was an emblem of his family. France proper was divided into duchies, counties, seigneuries, seneschalties, and bailliage, or bailiwicks, governed, in order of increasing dependence upon the king, by dukes, counts, seigneurs, seneschals, or royal stewards, and bailiffs. This loose aggregation, already called Francia in the ninth century, was in diverse degrees and with many limitations subject to the French king. Paris, his capital, was in 1180 a city of wooden buildings and muddy streets. Its Roman name, Lutetia, had meant the town of mud. Philip Augustus, shocked by the smell of the thoroughfares that ran beside the Seine, ordered that all the streets of Paris should be paved with solid stone. He was the first of three powerful rulers who in this age raised France to the intellectual, moral, and political leadership of Europe. But there had been strong men before him. Philip I, from 1060 to 1108, made a secure niche for himself in history by divorcing his wife at forty and persuading Count Fulk of Anjou to cede to him the Countess Bertrade. A priest was found to solemnize the adultery as marriage, but Pope Urban II, coming to France to preach the First Crusade, excommunicated the king. Philip persisted in sin for twelve years. At last he sent Bertrade away and was shriven, but a while later he repented his repentance and resumed his queen. She traveled with him to Anjou, taught her two husbands amity, and seems to have served both of them to the best of her charms. Having grown fat at forty-five, Philip handed over the major affairs of state to his son Louis VI, from 1108 to 1137, himself known as Louis the Fat. He deserved a better name. For twenty-four years he fought, finally with success, the robber barons who plundered travelers on the roads. 
He strengthened the monarchy by organizing a competent army. He did what he could to protect the peasants, the artisans, and the communes. And he had the good sense to make the abbot Suguet his chief minister and friend. Suguet of Saint-Denis, from 1081 to 1151, was the Richelieu of the twelfth century. He managed the affairs of France with wisdom, justice, and farsight. He encouraged and improved agriculture. He designed and built one of the earliest and finest masterpieces of the Gothic style. And he wrote an illuminating account of his ministry and work. He was the most valuable bequest left by Louis the Fat to his son, whom Suguet served till death. Louis the Seventh, from 1137 to 1180, was the man of whom Eleanor of Aquitaine said that she had married a king only to find him a monk. He labored conscientiously at his royal tasks, but his virtues ruined him. His devotion to government appeared to Eleanor as marital neglect. His patience with her amours added insult to negligence. She divorced him and gave her hand and her duchy of Aquitaine to Henry II of England. Disillusioned with life, Louis turned to piety and left to his son the task of building a strong France. Philip II Augustus, like a later Philippe, was a bourgeois gentilhomme on the throne a master of practical intelligence, softened with sentiment, a patron of learning with no taste for it, a man of shrewd caution and prudent courage, of quick temper and ready amnesty, of unscrupulous but controlled acquisitiveness, of a moderated piety that could be generous to the Church without allowing religion to countermand his politics, and of a patient perseverance that won what bold adventurousness might never have attained. Such a man, at once prosaic and auguste, this title, applied to him by his chaplain, found no medieval currency, but was applied to him by modern French historians. Amiably inflexible and ruthlessly wise was what his country needed at a time when, between Henry II's England and Barbarossa's Germany, France might have ceased to be. His marriages disturbed Europe. His first wife, Isabella, died in 1189, and four years later he married Ingeborg, the Princess of Denmark. These marriages were political and brought more property than romance. Ingeborg was not to Philip's taste. He ignored her after a day, and within the year he persuaded a council of French bishops to grant him a divorce. Pope Celestine III refused to confirm the decree. In 1196, defying the Pope, he married Agnes of Meran. Celestine excommunicated him, but Philip remained obstinate. I had rather lose half my domains, he said in a moment of tenderness, than separate from Agnes. Innocent III commanded him to take back Ingeborg. When Philip refused, the invincible Pope interdicted religious services in Philip's domain. Philip, in a rage, deposed all bishops who obeyed the interdict. Happy Saladin, he mourned, who had no Pope above him. And he threatened to turn Mohammedan. After four years of this spiritual war, the people began to grumble with fear of hell. Philip dismissed his beloved Agnes in 1202, but kept Ingeborg confined at Etam till 1213, when he recalled her to his bed. Amid these joys and tribulations, Philip reconquered Normandy from England in 1204, and in the next two years annexed Brittany, Anjou, Maine, Touraine, and Poitou to his directly ruled terrain. He was now strong enough to dominate all the dukes, counts, and seigneurs of his realm. His bailli and seneschals supervised local government. His kingdom had become an international power, not a strip of land along the Seine. John of England, so shorn, was not resigned. He persuaded Otto IV of Germany and the Counts of Boulogne and Flanders to join him against this swelling France. John would attack through Aquitaine, still England's, the others from the northeast. Instead of dividing his forces to meet these separate assaults, Philip led his main army against John's allies and defeated them at Bouvines near Lille in 1214. That battle decided many issues. It deposed Otto, secured the German throne to Frederick II, ended German hegemony, and hastened the decline of the Holy Roman Empire. It reduced the Counts of Flanders to French obedience, added Amiens, Douai, Lille, and Saint-Quentin to the French crown, and in effect extended northeastern France to the Rhine. It left John helpless against his barons and forced him to sign Magna Carta. It weakened monarchy and strengthened feudalism in England and Germany, while it strengthened monarchy and weakened feudalism in France and it favored the growth of the French communes and middle classes, which had vigorously supported Philip in peace and war. Having trebled the royal domain, Philip governed it with devotion and skill. Half the time, at odds with the church, he replaced ecclesiastics in council and administration with men from the rising lawyer class. He gave charters of autonomy to many cities, 
encouraged trade by privileges to merchants, alternately protected and plundered the Jews, and fattened his exchequer by commuting feudal services into money payments. The royal revenue was doubled from 600 to 1,200 livres, or $240,000 a day. In his reign the façade of Notre Dame was completed, and the Louvre was built as a fortress to guard the Seine. When Philip died in 1223, the France of today had been born. 2. St. Louis His son, Louis VIII, from 1223 to 1226, ruled too briefly to accomplish much. History remembers him chiefly for having married the admirable Blanche of Castile and begetting by her the one man in medieval history who, like Ashoka in ancient India, succeeded in being at once and in fact a saint and a king. Louis IX was twelve, his mother was thirty-eight when Louis VIII died. Daughter of Alfonso IX of Castile, granddaughter of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine, Blanche lived up to her royal blood. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Realization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2 by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 12, Side 2. Daughter of Alfonso IX of Castile, granddaughter of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine, Blanche lived up to her royal blood. She was a woman of beauty and charm, energy, character, and skill. At the same time, she impressed her age by her untarnished virtue as wife and widow, and her devotion as the mother of eleven children. France honored her not only as Blanche la Bonne Reine, but equally as Blanche la Bonne Mère. She freed many serfs on the royal estates, spent great sums on charity, and provided dowries for girls whose poverty discouraged love. She helped to finance the building of Chartres Cathedral, and it was through her influence that its stained glass showed Mary not as virgin but as queen. She loved her son Louis too jealously and was ungenerous to his wife. She trained him sedulously to Christian virtue and told him that she would rather see him dead than have him commit a mortal sin, but it was not her doing that he became a devotee. She herself rarely sacrificed policy to sentiment. She joined in the cruel Albigensian crusade to extend the power of the crown in southern France. For nine years, from 1226 to 1235, while Louis grew up, she governed the realm, and seldom has France been better ruled. At the outset of her regency the barons revolted, thinking to recapture from a woman the powers they had lost to Philip II. She overcame them with wise and patient diplomacy. She resisted England ably, and then signed a truce on just terms. When Louis IX came of age and assumed the government, he inherited a kingdom powerful, prosperous, and at peace. He was a handsome lad, taller by a head than most of his knights, with finely cut features, clear skin, and rich blonde hair, elegant in tastes, fond of luxurious furniture and colorful clothes, no bookworm but given to hunting and falconry, amusements and athletic games, not yet a saint, for a monk complained to Blanche of the royal flirtations. She found him a wife, and he settled down. He became a model of conjugal fidelity and parental energy. He had eleven children, and took an intimate share in their education. Gradually he abandoned luxury, lived more and more simply, and consumed himself in government, charity, and piety. He had a kingly conception of monarchy as an organ of national unity and continuity, and as a protection of the poor and weak against the superior or fortunate few. He respected the rights of the nobles, encouraged them to fulfill their obligations to serfs and vassals and suzerain, but would brook no feudal infringements of the new royal power. He interfered resolutely to repress injustices of lord to man, and in several cases severely punished barons who had executed men without due trial. When Enguerrand de Cousy hanged three Flemish students for killing some rabbits on his estate, Louis had him locked up in the tower of the Louvre, threatened to hang him, and released him on condition that he build three chapels where masses were to be said daily for his victims, that he give the forest where the young scholars had hunted to the abbey of St. Nicholas, that he lose on his estates the rights of jurisdiction and hunting, that he serve three years in Palestine, and pay the king a fine of twelve thousand five hundred pounds. Louis forbade feud vengeance and private feudal war, and condemned the judicial duel. As trial by evidence replaced trial by combat, the baronial courts were progressively superseded by the royal courts organized in each locality by the bailiffs of the king. The right of appeal from baronial judges to the central royal court was established, and in France, as in England, the thirteenth century saw feudal law give way to a common law of the realm. 
Never since Roman days had France enjoyed such security and prosperity. In this reign, the wealth of France sufficed to bring Gothic architecture to its greatest abundance and perfection. He believed and proved that a government could be just and generous in its foreign relations without losing prestige and power. He avoided war as long as possible, but when aggression threatened, he organized his armies efficiently, planned his campaigns, and, in Europe, carried them through with energy and skill to an honorable peace that left no passion for revenge. As soon as the safety of France was assured, he adopted a policy of conciliation, which accepted the compromise of opposed rights while rejecting the appeasement of unjust claims. He restored to England and Spain territory that his predecessors had seized. His counselors mourned, but peace endured, and France remained free from attack even during the long absences of Louis on crusades. Men feared him, said William of Chartres, because they knew that he was just. From 1243 to 1270, France waged no war against a Christian foe. When her neighbors fought one another, Louis labored to reconcile them, scorning the suggestion of his council that such strife should be fomented to weaken potential enemies. Foreign kings submitted their disputes to his arbitration. People marveled that so good a man should be so good a king. He was not that perfect monster whom the world ne'er knew, the completely faultless man. He was occasionally irritable, perhaps through ill health. The simplicity of his soul sometimes verged upon culpable ignorance or credulity, as in the ill-conceived crusades and maladroit campaigns in Egypt and Tunisia, where he lost many lives besides his own. And though he was honest with his Moslem enemies, he could not apply to them the same generous understanding that had succeeded so well with his Christian foes. His childlike certitude of belief led him to a religious intolerance that helped to establish the Inquisition in France, and it quieted his natural pity for the victims of the Albigensian crusade. His treasury was swelled by confiscating the goods of condemned heretics, and his usual good humor failed him toward the French Jews. But with these deductions he came nobly close to the Christian ideal. On no day of my life, reports Ranvi, did I ever hear him speak evil of anyone. When his Moslem captors accepted by mistake a sum of ten thousand livres, or two million dollars, short of the ransom promised for his release, Louis, restored safely to freedom, sent to the Saracens the additional payment in full, to the disgust of his counselors. Before leaving on his first crusade, he bade his officials through his realm to receive in writing and to examine the grievances that may be brought against us or our ancestors, as also allegations of injustices or exactions of which our bailiffs, provosts, foresters, sergeants, or their subordinates may have been guilty. Oft times, says Joan V., he would go after Mass and seat himself against a tree in the wood of Vincennes, and make us sit around him, and all those who had any cause in hand came and spoke to him without hindrance or usher. He would settle some cases himself and turn others over to the counselors seated about him, but he gave each pleader the right of appeal to the king. He founded and endowed hospitals, asylums, monasteries, hospices, a home for the blind, and another, the Fille Dieu, for redeemed prostitutes. He ordered his agents in each province to search out the old and poor and provide for them at public expense. Wherever he went he made it a principle to feed, every day, one hundred twenty-four people. He had three of them join him for dinner, served them himself, and washed their feet. Like Henry III of England, he waited on lepers and fed them with his own hands. When famine struck Normandy, he spent an enormous sum getting food to the needy there. He gave alms daily to the sick, the poor, widows, women in confinement, prostitutes, disabled working men, so that hardly it would be possible to number his alms. Nor were these acts of charity spoiled by publicity. The poor whose feet he washed were chosen from the blind, the act was done in private, and the recipients were not told that their attendant was the king. His ascetic self-lacerations were unknown to others until revealed on his flesh after his death. In the campaign of 1242, he contracted malaria in the marshy regions of Saint-Ange. It brought on pernicious anemia, and in 1244 he was near death. Perhaps such experiences turned him more and more to religion. Indeed, it was on recovering from that illness that he took the oath to crusade. He weakened himself with ascetic self-mortification. When he returned from his first crusade, aged only thirty-eight, he was already bent and bald, and nothing remained of his youthful beauty except the radiant grace of his simple faith and good will. He wore a hair shirt under a monk's brown robe, and had himself scourged with little iron chains. He loved the new monastic orders, Franciscans and Dominicans, gave to them without stint, and was with difficulty dissuaded from himself becoming a Franciscan. He heard two masses daily, recited the canonical prayers of Tierce, Sext, Known, Vespers, and Compline, 
said fifty Ave Marias before retiring, and rose at midnight to join the priests at Matins in the chapel. He abstained from marital intercourse in Advent and Lent. Most of his subjects smiled at his devotions and called him Brother Louis. One bold woman told him, It would be better that another should be king in your place, for you are only king of the Franciscans and the Dominicans. It is an outrage that you should be king of France. It is a great marvel that they don't put you out. Louis replied, You tell the truth. I am not worthy to be king. And if it had pleased our Saviour, another would have been in my place, who would have known better how to govern the kingdom. He shared with enthusiasm in the superstitions of his time. The Abbey of Saint-Denis claimed to have a nail from the true cross. One day the nail was mislaid after its ceremonial exhibition to the people. A great furor arose. The nail was found, and the king was much relieved. I had rather, he said, that the best city in my kingdom had been swallowed up. In 1236 Baldwin II of Constantinople, appealing for funds to rescue his ailing state, sold to Louis for 11,000 livres, or 2.2 million dollars, the crown of thorns worn by Jesus during his Passion. Five years later Louis bought from the same auctioneer a piece of the true cross. Possibly these purchases were intended as grants in aid to a Christian kingdom in distress. To receive the relics, Louis commissioned Peter of Montreuil to build Sainte-Chapelle. With all his deep piety, Louis was no tool of the clergy. He recognized their human shortcomings and chastised them with good example and open rebuke. He restricted the powers of ecclesiastical courts and asserted the authority of the law over all citizens, lay or clerical. In 1268 he issued the first pragmatic sanction, limiting the power of the papacy in ecclesiastical appointments and taxation in France. We will that no one may raise or collect in any manner exactions or assessments of money which have been imposed by the court of Rome, unless the cause be reasonable, pious, most urgent, and recognized by our express and spontaneous consent, and by that of the church of our realm. Despite his monastic propensities, Louis always remained the king, and preserved the royal majesty even when, as Fra Salimbene describes him, spare and slender, having the face of an angel and a countenance full of grace, he appeared on foot in pilgrim's habit and with pilgrim's staff to begin his first crusade in 1248. Queen Blanche, whom he left, despite her sixty years as regent with the fullest powers, wept as they parted. Most sweet fair son, fair tender son, I shall never see you more. He was captured in Egypt, and was held for a ransom that Blanche with great difficulty raised and paid. But when defeated and humbled, he returned to France in 1252, he found his mother dead. In 1270, weak with illness, he set out again, this time for Tunisia. It was not so quixotic an enterprise as its failure made it out to be. Louis had allowed his brother, Charles of Anjou, to lead a French army into Italy, not only to check German domination there, but also in the hope that Sicily might be made a base for a French invasion of Tunisia. Shortly after reaching Tunisia, the great crusader, older in body than in years, died of dysentery. Twenty-seven years later, the Church canonized him. Generations and centuries looked back to his reign as the golden age of France, and wondered why an inscrutable providence would not send them his like again. He was a Christian king. 3. Philip the Fair France was strengthened by the Crusades, in which she took a leading part. The long reigns of Philip Augustus and Louis the Ninth gave her government continuity and stability, while England suffered the negligent Richard I, the reckless John, and the incompetent Henry III, and while Germany disintegrated in the wars between the emperors and the popes. By 1300 France was the strongest power in Europe. Philip IV, from 1285 to 1314, was called Le Bel, for his handsome figure and face, not for his subtle statecraft and pitiless audacity. His aims were vast, to bring all classes, nobles and clergy as well as townsmen and serfs, under the direct law and control of the king, to base French growth on commerce and industry, rather than on agriculture, and to extend the boundaries of France to the Atlantic, the Pyrenees, the Mediterranean, the Alps, and the Rhine. He chose his aides and counselors not from the great ecclesiastics and barons who had served French kings for four centuries past, but from the lawyer class that came to him impregnate with the imperial ideas of Roman law. Pierre Flotte and Guillaume de Nogaret were brilliant intellects careless of morals and precedents. Under their guidance, Philip rebuilt the legal structure of France, replaced feudal with royal law, overcame his foes by shrewd diplomacy, 
and in the end broke the power of the papacy and made the Pope in effect a prisoner of France. He tried to detach Guienne from England, but found Edward I too strong for him. He won Champagne, Brie, and Navarre by marriage, and bought with hard cash Chartres, Franche-Comté, the Lyonnais, and part of Lorraine. Always needing money, he spent half in raising funds. He commuted for money the military obligations of the barons to the crown. He repeatedly debased the coinage and insisted on taxes being paid in bullion or in honest coin. He exiled the Jews and the Lombards and destroyed the Templars to confiscate their wealth. He forbade the export of precious metal from his realm. He laid heavy taxes upon exports, imports, and sales, and a war tax of a penny upon every livre of private wealth in France. Finally, without consulting the Pope, he taxed the wealth of the Church, which now owned a quarter of the land of France. The results belong to the story of Boniface the Eighth. When the old Pope, broken by the struggle, died, Philip's agents and money secured the election of a Frenchman as Clement V, and the removal of the papacy to Avignon. Never had any layman won so great a victory over the Church. Henceforth, in France, the lawyers ruled the priests. The Grand Master of the Templars, as he went to the stake, predicted that Philip would follow him within a year. It so befell. And not only Philip, but Clement, too, died in 1314. The triumphant king aged only forty-six. The French people had admired his tenacity and courage, and had upheld him against Boniface, but they cursed his memory as the most grasping monarch in their history. France was almost broken by his victory. His debased currency disordered the national economy, high rents and prices impoverished the people, taxation retarded industry, and the banishment of the Lombards and the Jews crippled the sinews of commerce and ruined the great fairs. The prosperity that had mounted under Louis the Saint declined under the master of every trick of law and diplomatic craft. Three sons of Philip mounted the throne and descended into the grave within fourteen years of his death. None of them left sons to inherit his power. Charles the Fourth, who died in 1328, left daughters, but the old Salic law was invoked to refuse them the crown. The nearest male heir of the royal family was Philip of Valois, nephew of Philip the Fair. With his accession the direct line of the Capetian kings ended, and the rule of the house of Valois began. A coup d'oeil of France in this period shows remarkable advances in economy, law, education, literature, and art. Serfdom was rapidly disappearing as the growth of urban industry lured men from the farms. Paris in 1314 had some 200,000 inhabitants, France some 22 million. Brunetto Latini, fleeing from the political violence of Florence, marveled at the peace and security that reigned in the streets of Paris under Louis the Ninth, the busy handicrafts and commerce of the towns, the fruitful fields and vineyards of the peasant countryside around the capital. The rise of the business and professional classes, almost rivaling the nobility and wealth, compelled their representation in the Etats Généraux, or States General, which Philip IV summoned to Paris in 1302 to give him moral and financial support in his conflict with Boniface. Such general assemblies of the three estates, or classes, nobles, clergy, commons, were called only in emergencies, in 1302, 1308, 1314, etc., and were cleverly guided by the lawyers who served the king as a conseil d'état or council of state. The Parliament of Paris, which took form under Louis the Ninth, was not a representative assembly, but a group of some ninety-four lawyers and clerics appointed by the king, and meeting once or twice a year to serve as a supreme court. Its ordonnance built up a body of national law based upon Roman rather than Frank codes, and giving the monarchy the full support of the classical legal tradition. The intellectual excitement of the age of Philip IV is preserved for us in the political treatises of one of his supporters, Pierre Dubois, who lived from 1255 to 1312, a lawyer who represented Coutances in the States General of 1302. In a Supplication du Peuple de France au Roi contre le Pape Boniface, an appeal of the people of France to the king against Pope Boniface of 1304, and in a tract on the recovery of the Holy Land of 1306, Dubois threw out suggestions that revealed the sharp division that now separated the legal from the ecclesiastical mind in France. The church, said Dubois, should be disendowed, should no longer receive financial support from the state. The French church should be separated from Rome, the papacy should be divorced from all temporal power, and the authority of the state should be supreme. Philip should be made emperor of a united Europe, 
with Constantinople as his capital. An international court should be set up to adjudicate the quarrels of nations, and an economic boycott should be declared against any Christian nation that warred upon another. A school of Oriental studies should be established at Rome. Women should have the same educational opportunities and political rights as men. It was the age of the troubadours in Provence, of the Trouvère in the north, of the Chanson de Roland and other Chansons de Geste, of Aucassin et Nicolette, and the Romain de la Rose, of the first outstanding French historians, Villardouin and Joinville. In this period great universities were organized in Paris, Orléans, Angers, Toulouse, and Montpellier. It began with Roselin and Abelard, and culminated in the zenith of the scholastic philosophy. It was the age of the Gothic ecstasy, of the majestic cathedrals of Saint-Denis, Chartres, Notre-Dame, Amiens, and Reims, and of Gothic sculpture in its most spiritual perfection. Frenchmen were forgivably proud of their country, their capital, and their culture. A national unifying patriotism was replacing the provincialism of the feudal era. Already, as in the Chanson de Roland, men spoke lovingly of la douce France, sweet France. It was in France, as in Italy, the climax of Christian civilization. 12. Spain, 1096 to 1285. The Christian reconquest of Spain proceeded as rapidly as the paternal chaos of the Spanish kings would permit. The popes gave the name and privileges of crusaders to Christians who would help drive back the Moors in Spain. Some Templars came from France to help the cause. And three Spanish military religious orders, the Knights of Calatrava, of Santiago, of Alcantara, were formed in the twelfth century. In 1118, Alfonso I of Aragon captured Saragossa. In 1195, the Christians were defeated at Alarcos, but in 1212 they almost wiped out the main Almohad army at Las Navas de Tolosa. The victory was decisive. Moorish resistance broke down, and one by one the Moslem citadels fell. Cordova in 1236, Valencia in 1238, Seville in 1248, and Cadiz in 1250. Thereafter the Reconquista halted for two centuries to allow time for the wars of the kings. When Alfonso VIII of Castile was defeated at Alarcos, the kings of Leon and Navarre, who had promised to go to his help, invaded his kingdom, and Alfonso had to make peace with the infidels to protect himself against the infidelity of the Christians. Fernando III, from 1217 to 1252, reunited Leon and Castile, pushed the Catholic frontier to Granada, made Seville his capital, the great mosque his cathedral, the Alcazar his residence. The church considered him a bastard at his birth and made him a saint after his death. His son, Alfonso X, from 1252 to 1284, was an excellent scholar and an irresolute king. Attracted by the Moorish learning that he found in Seville, Alfonso el Sabio, the wise, braved the bigots by hiring Arab and Jewish as well as Christian scholars to translate Moslem works into Latin for the instruction of Europe. He established a school of astronomy whose Alfonsin tables of heavenly bodies and movements became standard for Christian astronomers. He organized a corps of historians who wrote under his name a history of Spain and a vast and general history of the world. He composed some 450 poems, some in Castilian, some in Galician Portuguese. Many were set to music and survive as one of the most substantial monuments of medieval song. His literary passion overflowed in books written or commissioned by him on drafts, chess, dice, stones, music, navigation, alchemy, and philosophy. Apparently he ordered a translation of the Bible to be made directly from the Hebrew into Castilian. With him the Castilian language assumed the preeminence from which it has since ruled the literary life of Spain. He was in effect the founder of Spanish and Portuguese literature, of Spanish historiography, of Spanish scientific terminology. He tarnished a brilliant career by intriguing to secure the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. He spent much Spanish treasure in the attempt. He sought to replenish his coffers by raising taxes and debasing the coinage. He was deposed in favor of his son, survived his downfall by two years, and died a broken man. Aragon rose to prominence through the marriage of its queen Petronilla to Count Ramon Berenguer of Barcelona in 1137. Aragon thereby acquired Catalonia, including the greatest of Spanish ports. Pedro II, from 1196 to 1213, 
brought the new kingdom to prosperity by protecting with vigorously enforced law the security of harbors, markets, and roads. He made his court at Barcelona the gay and amorous center of Spanish chivalry and troubadours, and saved his soul, and ensured his title, by presenting Aragon to Innocent III as a feudal fief. His son, Jaime, or James I, from 1213 to 1276, was five when Pedro died in battle. The Aragonese nobles seized the opportunity to renew their feudal independence, but James took the reins at ten and soon brought the nobles under royal discipline. Still a youth of twenty, he captured the commercially strategic Balearic Islands from the Moors, from 1229 to 1235, and regained from them Valencia and Alicante. In 1265, in a chivalric gesture of Spanish unity, he conquered Murcia from the Moors and presented it to the King of Castile. Wiser than Alfonso the Wise, he made himself the most powerful Spanish monarch of his century, the rival of Frederick II and Louis IX. His shrewd intelligence and unscrupulous courage likened him to Frederick, but his loose morality, his many divorces, his ruthless wars and occasional brutality discourage comparison with St. Louis. He conspired to seize southwestern France, but the patient Louis outplayed him, though yielding to him Montpellier. In his old age, James plotted to conquer Sicily as a bastion of strategy and a haven of commerce, and to make the western Mediterranean a Spanish sea. But the realization of his dream was left to his son. Pedro III, from 1276 to 1285, married a daughter of Frederick's son Manfred, king of Sicily, and felt entitled to that island when Charles of Anjou seized it with the blessings of the Pope. Pedro renounced the papal suzerainty over Aragon, accepted excommunication, and sailed off to fight for Sicily. As in England and France, this period saw in Spain both the rise and the decline of feudalism. The nobles began by almost ignoring the central power. They and the clergy were exempt from taxation, which fell the more heavily upon cities and trade. But they ended by submitting to kings armed with their own troops, supported by the revenues and militia of the towns, and endowed with the prestige of a reviving Roman law that assumed absolute monarchy as an axiom of government. At the beginning of the period there was no Spanish law. There were separate law codes for each state, and for each class in each state. Fernando III began, Alfonso X completed, a new system of Castilian law, which from its seven divisions came to be known as the Siete Partidas, or Laws of the Seven Parts, from 1260 to 1265 one of the most complete and important codes in legal history. Based on the laws of the Spanish Visigoths, but remodeled to accord with Justinian's institutes, the Siete Partidas proved too advanced for their age. For seventy years they were largely ignored. But in 1338 they became the actual law of Castile, and in 1492 of all Spain. A like code was introduced into Aragon by James I, in 1283, Aragon promulgated an influential code of commercial and maritime law, and established at Valencia, and later at Barcelona and in Majorca, courts of the Consulate of the Sea. Spain led the medieval world in developing free cities and representative institutions. Seeking the support of the cities against the nobles, the kings gave charters of self-government to many towns. Municipal independence became a passion in Spain. Little towns demanded their liberty from larger ones, or from the nobles, the church, the king. When they succeeded, they raised their own gallows in the marketplace as a symbol of their freedom. Barcelona, in 1258, was ruled by a council of two hundred members, of whom a majority represented industry or trade. For a time, the towns were sovereign to the point of independently waging wars against the Moors or one another, but also they formed hermandades, brotherhoods, for mutual action or security. In 1295, when the nobles tried to subdue the communes, thirty-four towns formed the Hermandad de Castillo, pledged themselves to a common defense, and raised a joint army. This brotherhood, having overcome the nobles, supervised and checked the officials of the king, and passed laws for a common observance of the member towns, which sometimes numbered a hundred. It had long been the custom of Spanish kings to call on occasion an assembly of nobles and clergy, one such gathering, meeting in 1137, received for the first time the name Cortes, or Courts. In 1188, at the Cortes of León, businessmen from the towns were included, probably the earliest instance of representative political institutions in Christian Europe. In this historic congress, the king promised not to make war or peace or issue any decree without the consent of the Cortes. 
In Castile, the first such cortes of nobles, clergy and bourgeoisie, met in 1250, forty-five years before the model parliament of Edward I. The cortes did not directly legislate, but it formulated petitions to the king, and its power of the purse often persuaded his assent. A decree of the Cortes of Catalonia in 1283, accepted by the King of Aragon, ruled that thereafter no national legislation should be issued without the consent of the citizens, or cives. Another provision required the king to summon the Cortes annually. These enactments anticipated by over a quarter of a century similar pronouncements, in 1311 and 1322, of the English Parliament. Furthermore, the Cortes appointed members from each social class to a junta, or union, to keep watch in the intervals between the sessions of the Cortes over the administration of the laws and funds that it had voted. The problem of government in Spain was complicated by divisive mountains impeding the wide enforcement of a common law. The uneven terrain, the dry plateaus, and the periodic devastations of war discouraged agriculture and made Spain largely a grazing land for cattle and sheep. The fine sheep herds fed thousands of looms in the towns, and Spain maintained its ancient high reputation for the quality of its wool. Internal trade was harassed by difficulties of transport and diversities of weights, measures, and currencies. But foreign trade grew in the ports of Barcelona, Tarragona, Valencia, Seville, and Cadiz. Catalan merchants were everywhere, and in 1282 the merchants of Castile held a position in Bruges rivaled only by the Hanseatic League. Merchants and manufacturers became the chief financial support of the crown. The urban proletariat organized itself into guilds or gremios, but these were strictly controlled by the kings, and the working classes suffered economic exploitation without political representation. Most of the industrial workers were either Jews or Mudejares, Muslims in Christian Spain. The Jews prospered in Aragon and Castile. They shared actively in the intellectual life of the two kingdoms. Many of them were rich merchants, but at the end of this period they were subjected to increasing restrictions. The Mudejares were allowed freedom of worship and considerable self-government. They too included many rich merchants, and a few found entry to the royal courts. Their craftsmen strongly influenced Spanish architecture, woodwork, and metalwork to the Mudahar style, the use of Moorish forms and themes in Christian art. Alfonso VI, in a Catholic moment, called himself Emperador de los Dos Cultos, Emperor of the Two Faiths. But the Mudaharis in general had to wear a distinctive garb, live in a separate section of the city, and bear especially heavy taxation. Ultimately, the wealth aggregated by their industry and commercial skill excited the envy of the majority race. In 1247, James I ordered their expulsion from Aragon. Over 100,000 of them left, taking their technical skills with them, and Aragonese industry thereafter declined. The partial absorption of Moslem culture into Spanish civilization, the stimulus of victory over an ancient enemy, the growth of industry and wealth, and of manners and tastes, stirred the mental life of Spain. The thirteenth century saw the establishment of six universities in Spain. Alfonso II of Aragon, from 1162 to 1196, was the first Spanish troubadour. Soon there were hundreds, and they not only wrote poetry, they developed the ceremonies of the church into secular plays, opening a path to the triumphs of Lope de Vega and Calderon. To this period belongs the Cid, the national epic of Spain. Better than all these were the music, songs, and dances that flowed from the hearts of the people in their homes and streets, and graduated into the splendor and pageantry of the royal courts. The first recorded bullfight in the modern style was given at Avila in 1107 to adorn a wedding feast. By 1300 it was a common sport in the cities of Spain. At the same time the French knights who came to help against the Moors brought the ideas and tournaments of chivalry. Respect for women, or for a man's exclusive property in a woman, was made a point of honor as vital as a man's pride in his courage and integrity. The duel of honor became a part of Spanish life. The mixture of European and Afro-Semitic blood, of Occidental and Oriental culture, of Syrian and Persian motives with Gothic art, of Roman hardness with Eastern sentiment, generated the Spanish character and made Spanish civilization in the thirteenth century a unique and colorful element in the European scene. 13. Portugal, 1095 in the year 1095, Count Henry of Burgundy, a crusading knight in Spain, so pleased Alfonso VI of Castile and Leon 
that the king gave him a daughter, Teresa, in marriage, and included in her dowry as a fief a county of Leon named Portugal. The territory had been won from Moslem Spain only thirty-one years before, and south of the Mondego River the Moors still ruled. Count Henry felt uncomfortable as anything less than a king. From their marriage he and his wife plotted to make their fief an independent state. When Henry died in 1112, Teresa continued to labor for independence. She taught her nobles and vassals to think in terms of national liberty. She encouraged her cities to fortify themselves and study the arts of war. She led her soldiers in person on campaign after campaign, and between wars she surrounded herself with musicians, poets, and lovers. She was defeated, captured, released, and restored to her fief. She lavished funds upon an illicit love, was deposed, went into exile with her lover, and died in poverty in 1130. It was through her inspiration and preparations that her son, Afonso I Enriquez, from 1128 to 1185, achieved her aims. Alfonso VII of Castile promised to recognize him as sovereign ruler of any land that he might conquer from the moors below the Douro River. With all the reckless bravery of his father and the spirit and pertinacity of his mother, Afonso Enriquez attacked the Moors, defeated them at Urique in 1139, and proclaimed himself king of Portugal. The hierarchy persuaded the two kings to submit the matter to Pope Innocent II, who decided in favor of Castile. Afonso Enriquez reversed this decision by offering his new kingdom to the papacy as a fief. Alexander III accepted it, and recognized him as King of Portugal in 1143 on condition of annual tribute to the See of Rome. Afonso Enriquez resumed his wars with the Moors, captured Santarum and Lisbon, and extended his rule to the Tagus. Under Afonso III, from 1248 to 1279, Portugal reached its present mainland limits, and Lisbon, strategically placed at the mouth of the Tagus, became its port and capital in 1263. An old legend said that Ulysses Odysseus had founded the city and given it its ancient name Ulysipo, which the carelessness of tongues transformed into Olisipo and Lisboa. The last years of Afonso II were embittered by civil war with his son, Denis, who wondered why his father took so long to die. From this dubious beginning, Denis moved into a long and beneficent reign from 1279 to 1325, Peace with Leon and Castile was achieved by a marital alliance. Strife with another heir to the throne was averted by the mediation of Isabel, Denise's saintly queen. Renouncing the glories of war, Denise devoted himself to the economic and cultural development of his kingdom. He founded schools of agriculture, taught his people improved methods of husbandry, planted trees to check erosion, helped commerce, built ships and cities, organized a Portuguese navy, and negotiated a commercial treaty with England. So he earned the title fondly given him by his subjects, Re Labrador, the Worker King. He was an industrious administrator and a just judge. He supported poets and scholars, and himself wrote the best poetry of his nation and time. Through him Portuguese ceased to be the Galician dialect and became a literary language. In his Pastoreas he gave literary form to the songs of the people and at his court troubadours were encouraged to sing the joys and pains of love. Denis himself was a connoisseur in women, and preferred his bastards to his one legitimate son. When this son rebelled and raised an army to unseat his father, St. Isabel, who had lived apart from the merry court of the king, rode between the hostile forces, proposed to be the first victim of their violence, and chained her husband and her son to peace in 1323. Chapter 26 Pre-Renaissance Italy, 1057 to 1308. 1. Norman Sicily, 1090 to 1194. It is remarkable to how many different environments, from Scotland to Sicily, the Normans adapted themselves, with what violent energy they aroused sleeping regions and peoples, and how completely in a few centuries they were absorbed by their subjects and disappeared from history. For a turbulent century they ruled southern Italy as successors to the Byzantine power, and Sicily as heirs to the Saracens. In 1060 Roger Guiscard, with a tiny band of buccaneers, began the invasion of the island. By 1091 its conquest was complete. In 1085 Norman Italy accepted Roger as its ruler, and when he died in 1101 the two Sicilies, the island and southern Italy, were already a power in the politics of Europe. 
control of the Straits of Messina and of the fifty miles between Sicily and Africa, gave the Normans a decisive commercial and military advantage. Amalfi, Salerno, and Palermo became the foci of an active trade with all Mediterranean ports, including Moslem centers in Tunisia and Spain. Sicily, now a papal fief, replaced Mohammedan mosques with resplendent Christian churches, and in southern Italy Greek prelates gave way to Roman Catholic priests. Roger II, from 1101 to 1154, made Palermo his capital, extended his rule in Italy to Naples and Capua, and in 1130 expanded his title from count to king. He had all the ambition and courage, resourcefulness and subtlety of his uncle, Robert Guiscard. So alert in thought and industrious in action, that Idrisi, his Moslem biographer, said of him that he accomplished more asleep than other men awake. Opposed by the popes, who feared his encroachment upon the papal states, by the German emperors, who resented his annexation of the Abruzzi, by the Byzantines, who dreamed of regaining southern Italy, and by the Moslems of Africa, who longed to recapture Sicily, he fought them all, sometimes several of them at once, and emerged with his kingdom greater than before, and with new acquisitions in Tunis, Safax, Bonn, and Tripoli. He made use of the intelligent Saracens, Greeks, and Jews of Sicily to organize a better civil service and administrative bureaucracy than any other nation in Europe had at the time. He allowed the feudal organization of agriculture in Sicily, but kept his barons in check with a royal court whose law covered every class. He enriched the economy of Sicily by bringing in silk weavers from Greece and furthered commerce by competent protection of life, travel, and property. He allowed religious freedom and cultural autonomy to Moslems, Jews, and Greek Catholics, opened career to all talent, himself wore Moslem garb, liked Moslem morals, and lived as a Latin king in an Oriental court. His kingdom was for a generation the richest and most civilized state in Europe, and he was the most enlightened ruler of his age. Without him, Frederick II, a still greater king, would have been impossible. The King Roger's Book of Idrisi suggests the prosperity of Norman Sicily. A hardy, busy peasantry covered the rich soil with crops and kept the cities fed. They lived in hovels and suffered the usual exploitation of the useful by the clever, but their life was dignified with a colorful piety and brightened with festivals and song. Every season of the agricultural year had its dances and chants, and vintage time brought bacchanalian feasts that bound ancient Saturnalia with modern carnival. Even to the poorest there remained love and folk songs ranging from license and satire to lyrics of purest tenderness. In the town of San Marco, said Idrisi, the air is perfumed by the violets growing everywhere. Messina, Catania, Syracuse flourished again as in Carthaginian, Greek, or Roman days. Palermo seemed to Idrisi the finest city in the world. It turns the heads of all who see it. It has buildings of such beauty that travelers flock to it, drawn by the fame of the marvels of architecture, the exquisite workmanship, the admirable conceptions of art. The central street was a panorama of towering palaces, high and superb hostels, churches, baths, shops of great merchants. All travelers say outright that there are nowhere buildings more marvelous than those of Palermo, nor any site more exquisite than her pleasure gardens. And the Moslem traveler Ibn Jubayr, seeing Palermo in 1184, exclaimed, A stupendous city! The palaces of the king encircle it as a necklace clasps the throat of a maiden with well-filled bosom. Visitors were struck by the variety of languages spoken in Palermo, the peaceful mingling of races and faiths, the neighborly confusion of churches, synagogues, and mosques, the elegantly dressed citizens, the busy streets, the quiet gardens, the comfortable homes. In those homes and palaces the arts of the East served the conquerors from the West. This book is continued on Cassette 13, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 13, Side 1. In those homes and palaces, the arts of the East served the conquerors from the West. The looms of Palermo wove gorgeous stuffs in silk and cloth of gold. The ivory workers made little caskets shaped and carved in delicate or whimsical designs. The mosaics covered floors, walls, and ceilings with oriental themes. Greek and Saracen architects and artisans 
raised churches, monasteries, and palaces whose plan and ornament, showing no trace of Norman styles, gathered up a thousand years of Byzantine or Arabic influence. In 1143, Greek artists built for Greek nuns, with funds provided by Rogers Admiral George, a convent dedicated to Santa Maria del Amiralio, but now known as the Martorana from its founder. It has been so often restored that little remains of its twelfth-century elements. Typically, an Arabic inscription from a Greek Christian hymn runs round the inner dome. The floor is of gleaming, vari-colored marble. Eight columns of dark porphyry frame three apses. Their capitals are most gracefully carved. Walls and spandrels and vaults glitter with golden mosaics, including a famous Christos Pantocrator, the universal king in the sanctuary cupola. Finer still is the Capella Palatina, the chapel of the palace begun by Roger II in 1132. Here everything is exquisite. The simple design of the marble pavement, the perfection of the slender columns and their diverse capitals, the 282 mosaics filling every tempting space. Above the altar, the solemn figure of Christ in one of the sovereign mosaics of the world. And over all, a massive timber ceiling in honeycomb design, carved, gilded, or painted with oriental figures of elephants, antelopes, gazelles, and angels that were probably Hauris from a Mohammedan's dream of paradise. In all medieval or modern art, there is no royal chapel that can compare with this jewel of Norman Sicily. Roger died in 1154, aged 59. His son William I, from 1154 to 1166, earned the title of the Bad, partly because his life was written by his enemies, partly because he let others govern while he lived amid eunuchs and concubines in oriental ease. In his reign, the Moslems of Tunisia rose against the Christians and ended Norman power in Africa. William II, from 1166 to 1189, lived much the same sort of life as the bad, but was called the good by amiable biographers, if only to avoid a confusion of names. He asked pardon for his lax morals by financing in 1176 the monastery and cathedral of Monreale, a Mount Royal five miles outside of Palermo. The exterior is a disagreeable confusion of shafts and interlacing columns. The cloisters are a work of majestic strength and beauty. The mosaics of the interior are renowned but crude. The capitals, however, are richly carved with realistic life. Noah drunk and sleeping, a swineherd tending a pig, an acrobat standing on his head. Perhaps the oriental morals of the Norman Sicilian kings weakened their constitutions and shortened their line. Forty years after the death of Roger II, his dynasty ingloriously died. William II left no children, and Tancred, illegitimate son of a son of Roger II, was chosen king in 1189. Meanwhile, the German emperor Henry VI had married Constance, an aunt of William II. Eager to unite all Italy under the imperial crown, he claimed the throne of the Sicilies. He secured the active alliance of Pisa and Genoa, whose commerce was irked by Norman control of the central Mediterranean. In 1194 he appeared before Palermo with irresistible force, persuaded it to open its gates to him, and was there crowned king of Sicily. When he died in 1197, he left his thrones to his three-year-old son Frederick, who was to become the most powerful and enlightened monarch of a thirteenth-century rich in puissant kings. 2. The Papal States North of Norman Italy lay the city-state of Benevento, ruled by dukes of Lombard origin. Beyond this were the lands under the immediate temporal power of the popes, the patrimony of Peter, including Anagni, Tivoli, Rome, and thence to Perugia. Rome was the center but hardly the model of Latin Christianity. No city in Christendom had less respect for religion, except as a vested interest. Italy took only a modest part in the Crusades, Venice shared in the fourth only to capture Constantinople. The Italian cities thought of them chiefly as opportunities to establish ports, markets, and trade in the Near East. Frederick II postponed his crusade as long as he could, and embarked upon it with a minimum of religious belief. There were religious souls in Rome, gentle spirits who aided pilgrims to maintain the shrines, but their voices were seldom heard above the din of politics. Aside from the papacy, Rome was in this period a poor city. The Norman sack of 1084 had capped six centuries of destruction and neglect. 
the population had shrunk to some 40,000 from its ancient million. It was not a hub of commerce or industry. While cities of northern Italy led the economic revolution, the papal states tarried in a simple agrarian regime. Market gardens, vineyards, and cattle paddocks mingled with homes and ruins within the walls of Aurelia. The lower classes of the capital lived half by handicraft, half by ecclesiastical charity. The middle classes were a medley of merchants, lawyers, teachers, bankers, students, and resident or visiting priests. The upper classes were the higher clergy and the landed nobility. The old Roman custom of owning in the country and living in the city still prevailed. Long since shorn of any general patriotism that would have united them for national defense, the Roman nobles divided into factions led by rich and powerful families. Frangipani, Orsini, Colonna, Pierleoni, Caetani, Sabelli, Corsi, Conti, Anibaldi. Each family made its Roman residence a castle fortress, armed its members and retainers, and frequently indulged in street brawls, occasionally in civil wars. The popes, having only spiritual weapons little feared in Rome, struggled in vain to keep order in the city. They were repeatedly subjected to insult there, sometimes to violence, and many of them, for peace or safety, fled to Anagni, Viterbo, or Perugia, even to Lyon, at last to Avignon. The popes had dreamed of a theocracy in which the word of God, interpreted by the church, would suffice as law. They found themselves crushed amid the autocracy of the emperors, the oligarchy of the nobles, and the democracy of the citizens. The relics of the forum and the capital kept alive among the Romans the memory of their ancient republic, and periodically an effort was made to restore the old autonomy and forms. The leading nobles were still called senators, though the senate had disappeared. Consuls were chosen or appointed, though they wielded no power, and some old manuscripts preserved the half-forgotten edicts of Roman law. Inspired by the rise of free cities in northern Italy, the people of Rome in the twelfth century began to demand a return to secular self-government. In 1143, they elected a senate of fifty-six members, and for some years thereafter elected new senators annually. The mood of the time called for a voice, and found it in Arnold of Brescia, Tradition reports that he had studied under Abelard in France. He returned to Brescia as a monk, practicing such austerities that Bernard described him as a man who neither eats nor drinks. He was substantially orthodox in doctrine, but denied the validity of sacraments administered by priests in a state of sin. He held it immoral for a priest to own property, demanded a return of the clergy to apostolic poverty, and advised the church to surrender all her material possessions and political power to the state. At the Council of the Lateran in 1139, Innocent II condemned him and commanded him to silence. But Pope Eugenius III absolved him on condition of a pilgrimage to various churches in Rome. It was a kindly error. The sight of the old Republican landmarks fired the imagination of Arnold. Standing amid the ruins, he called upon the Romans to reject clerical rule and to restore the Roman Republic, this in 1145. Fascinated by his fervor, the people chose consuls and tribunes to be actual governors, and established an equestrian order to serve as leaders in a new militia of defense. Intoxicated with the ease of this glorious revolution, the followers of Arnold renounced not only the temporal power of the popes, but the authority in Italy of the German emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. Indeed, they argued, it was the Roman Republic that should rule not Italy alone, but as of old, the world. They rebuilt and fortified the capital, seized St. Peter's, turned it into a castle, took possession of the Vatican, and levied taxes upon pilgrims. Eugenius III fled to Viterbo and Pisa in 1146, while St. Bernard from Clairvaux hurled denunciations against the people of Rome and reminded them that their subsistence depended on the presence of the papacy. For ten years the Comune di Roma ruled the city of the Caesars and the popes. Plucking up his courage, Eugenius III returned to Rome in 1148. He confined himself for a time to spiritual functions, distributed charity, and won the affection of the populace. His second successor, Hadrian IV, shocked by the killing of a cardinal in a public tumult, laid an interdict upon the capital in 1155. Fearful of a profounder revolution than the aristocracy could digest, the Senate abrogated the Republic and surrendered to the Pope. 
Arnold, excommunicated, hid himself in the Campania. When Frederick Barbarossa approached Rome, Hadrian asked him to arrest the rebel. Arnold was found and apprehended. He was turned over by the emperor to the papal prefect of Rome and was by him hanged in 1155. The corpse was burned and the ashes were thrown into the Tiber for fear, said a contemporary, that the people would gather them up and honor them as the ashes of a martyr. His ideas outlived him and reappeared in the Pateran and Waldensian heretics of Lombardy, in the Albigensians of France, in Marsilius of Padua, and in the leaders of the Reformation. The Senate continued to exist till 1216, when Innocent III succeeded in replacing it with one or two senators congenial to the papal cause. The temporal power of the popes survived till 1870. At different times the papal states included Umbria, with Spoleto and Perugia, the March or frontier land of Ancona on the Adriatic, and the Romagna or Rome-ruled region with the cities of Rimini, Imola, Ravenna, Bologna, and Ferrara. Ravenna continued to decline in this period, while Ferrara rose to prominence under the wise leadership of the House of Este. Under the lead of the great lawyers produced by its university, Bologna developed a virile communal life. It was among the first cities to choose a podesta to govern the internal affairs of the commune and a capitano to lead it in its external relations. Peculiar requirements ruled the choice of the podesta or man of power. He must be a noble, a foreigner to the city, and over thirty-six years of age. He must own no property within the commune and must have no relative among the electors. He must not be kin to or come from the same place as the preceding podesta. These strange rules, adopted to secure impartial administration, prevailed in many Italian communes. The captain of the people was chosen not by the communal council, but by the popular party, dominated by the merchant guilds. He represented not the poor, but the business class. In later centuries he would extend his power at the expense of the podesta, as the bourgeoisie would come to surpass the nobility in wealth and influence. 3. Venice Triumphant 1096 to 1311. North of Ferrara and the Po lay the district of Veneto, proud of the cities of Venice, Treviso, Padua, Vicenza, and Verona. It was in this period that Venice matured her power. Her alliance with Byzantium gave her entry to Aegean and Black Sea ports. At Constantinople in the 12th century, her nationals are said to have numbered over 100,000 and to have held a section of the city in terror by their insolence and their brawls. Suddenly the Greek emperor Manuel, prodded by the jealous Genoese, turned against the Venetians in his capital, arrested a great number of them, and ordered a wholesale confiscation of their goods in 1171. Venice declared war. Her people labored night and day to build a fleet, and in 1171 the doge of Vitale Michiele II led 130 ships against Euboea, as a first goal of strategy against the Straits. But on Euboea's shores his troops fell sick with the disease said to have been caused by Greeks poisoning the water supply. So many thousands died that the ships could not be manned for war. The doge led his armada back to Venice, where the plague infected and decimated the inhabitants. And at a meeting of the assembly, the doge, blamed for these misfortunes, was stabbed to death, this in 1172. It is against the background of these events that we must view the Fourth Crusade and the oligarchic revolution that transformed the constitution of Venice. The great merchants, fearing the collapse of their commercial empire if such defeats continued, resolved to take the election of the doge and the determination of public policy from the General Assembly and establish a more select council which should be better fitted to consider and transact affairs of state and might serve as a check upon both the passions of the people and the autocracy of the doge. The three highest judges of the Republic were persuaded to appoint a commission to draw up a new constitution. Its report recommended that each of the six wards of the city-state should choose two leading men, each of whom should choose forty able men. The 480 deputies, so chosen, were to form the Major Concilio, or Greater Council, as the general legislature of the nation. The Greater Council, in turn, was to choose sixty of its members as a Senate to govern commerce, finance, and foreign relations. The Arengo, or Popular Assembly, was to meet only to ratify or reject proposals of war or peace. A Privy Council of six men, 
elected severally from the six wards, was to govern the state in any interregnum, and its sanction was to be required to legalize any governmental action of a doja. The first greater council elected by this procedure chose thirty-four of its members, who chose eleven of their number, who then, in public deliberation in the Cathedral of San Marco, chose the doja, this in 1173. A cry of protest arose from the people at losing their right of naming the head of the state, but the new doja diverted the disturbance by scattering coin among the crowd. In 1192, on the election of Enrico Dandolo, the greater council required the doja to swear in his coronation oath to obey all the laws of the state. The mercantile oligarchy was now supreme. Dandolo, already eighty-four, proved to be one of the strongest leaders in Venetian history. Through his Machiavellian diplomacy and personal heroism, Venice avenged the disaster of 1171 by capturing and despoiling Constantinople in 1204. Thereby Venice became the dominant power in the eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea, and the commercial leadership of Europe passed from Byzantium to Italy. In 1261 the Genoese aided the Greeks to regain Constantinople and were rewarded with commercial preference there. But three years later the Venetian fleet defeated the Genoese near Sicily, and the Greek emperor was forced to restore the favored position of Venice in his capital. The triumphant oligarchy capped these external victories with another constitutional stroke. In 1297 the doge Pietro Gradenigo pushed through the council a proposal that only those citizens and their male posterity should be eligible to the council who had sat in it since 1293. The great majority of the people were excluded from office by this closing of the council. A closed caste was created. A libro d'oro, or golden book of marriages and births within this patrician caste, was kept to ensure purity of blood and monopoly of power. The mercantile oligarchy decreed itself an aristocracy of birth. When the people planned a revolt against the new constitution, their leaders were admitted into the hall of the council and were immediately hanged in 1300. It must be admitted that this frank and ruthless oligarchy governed well. Public order was better maintained, public policy more shrewdly guided, laws more stable and effective than in the other communities of medieval Italy. Venetian laws for the regulation of physicians and apothecaries preceded similar statutes of Florence by half a century. In 1301 laws forbade unhealthy industries in residential quarters and excluded from Venice industries that poured injurious fumes into the air. Navigation laws were rigorous and detailed. All imports and exports were subject to state supervision and control. Diplomatic reports covered trade more than politics, and economic statistics were here for the first time made a part of government. Agriculture was almost unknown in Venice, but handicrafts were highly developed, for Venice had imported from the old cities of the eastern Mediterranean arts and crafts half submerged by political upheavals in the West. Venetian products in iron, brass, glass, gold cloth, and silk were renowned in three continents. The building of boats for pleasure, commerce, or war was probably the greatest of Venetian industries. It reached a capitalistic stage of mass labor and corporate finance, and almost a socialistic stage through control by its chief client, the state. Picturesque galleys with lofty prows, painted sails, and as many as 180 oars bound Venice with Constantinople, Tyre, Alexandria, Lisbon, London, and a score of other cities in a golden chain of ports and trade. Goods from the Valley of the Po came to Venice to be reshipped. The products of the Rhine cities came over the Alps to spread out from her keys to the Mediterranean world. The Rialto became the busiest thoroughfare in Europe, crowded with merchants, sailors, and bankers from a hundred lands. The wealth of the North could not compare with the opulence of a city where everything was geared to commerce and finance, and where one ship sent to Alexandria and back brought one thousand percent on the investment, if it encountered no enemy, pirate, or destructive storm. In the thirteenth century Venice was the richest city in Europe, equaled perhaps only by those Chinese cities that her Marco Polo incredibly described. Faith declines as wealth increases. The Venetians made much use of religion in government and consoled the voteless with processions in paradise. But the ruling classes rarely allowed Christianity or excommunication to interfere with business or war. Siamo Veneziani, 
Voi Christiani, ran their motto. We are Venetians, after that we are Christians. Ecclesiastics were excluded from any share in the government. Venetian merchants sold arms and slaves and sometimes gave military intelligence to Moslems at war with Christians. A certain liberality went with this broad-minded venality. Moslems might come safely to Venice, and Jews, especially in the Judeca on the island of Spinalunga, might worship peacefully in their synagogues. Dante denounced the unbridled lasciviousness of the Venetians, but we must not trust the strictures of one who cursed so ecumenically. More significant are the severe penalties prescribed in Venetian law for parents who prostituted their children, or the vainly repeated laws to check electoral corruption. The impression we get is of a hard and brilliant aristocracy stoically resigned to the poverty of the masses, and the populace solacing poverty with the uncornered joys of love. As early as 1094 we hear of the carnival, in 1228 the first mention of masks. In 1296 the Senate made the last day before Lent, the French Mardi Gras, a public holiday. On such occasions both sexes flaunted their most expensive finery. Rich ladies crowned themselves with jeweled tiaras or hoods, or turbans woven with cloth of gold. Their eyes gleamed through veils of gold or silver web, their necks held strings of pearls, their hands were gloved with chamois or silk. Their feet were shod with sandals or shoes of leather, wood or cork, embroidered in red and gold. Their gowns were of fine linen, silk or brocade, sprinkled with gems and cut low in the neck to the scandal and fascination of their times. They wore false hair, they painted and powdered, they laced and fasted to be slim. They moved freely in public at any time, joined with shy allure in pleasure parties and gondola escapades, and listened willingly to troubadours importing Provence modes of song for the eternal themes of love. The Venetians did not in this period go in for culture. They had a good public library, but seemed to have made little use of it. No contributions to learning, no lasting poetry appeared amid this unrivaled wealth. Schools were numerous in the 13th century, and we hear of private and state scholarships for poor students. But as late as the 14th century, there were Venetian judges who could not read. Music was held in high esteem. Art was not yet the superb coloratura of later days, but wealth was bringing to Venice the art of many lands, taste was growing, the foundation was being laid, and old Roman skills survived above all in glass. We must not picture the Venice of that age as quite so lovely as Wagner or Nietzsche found it in the nineteenth century. Houses were of wood and streets were simple earth. The Piazza di San Marco, however, was paved with brick in 1172, and the pigeons were there as early as 1256. Pretty bridges began to curve over the canals, and over the Grand Canal the Traghetti already ferried many passengers. The side canals were probably less malodorous then than now, for time is needed for any full ripening. But no faults of street or stream could close the soul to the grandeur of a city lifting itself up, century by century, out of the marshes and mists of the lagoons. Or the wonder of a people rising out of desolation and isolation to cover the sea with its ships and levy tribute of wealth and beauty upon half the world. Between Venice and the Alps lay the city and March of Treviso, of which we shall note only that its people so loved life that it won the name of Marca Amorosa or Gioiosa. In 1214, we are told, the city celebrated the festival of the Castello d'Amore. A wooden castle was set up and hung with carpets, drapes, and garlands. Pretty Trevisan women held it, armed with scented water, fruit, and flowers. Youthful cavaliers from Venice competed with gay blades from Padua in besieging the ladies, bombarding them with like weapons. The Venetians, they say, won the day by mingling ducats with their flowers. In any case, the castle and its fair defenders fell. 4. From Mantua to Genoa West of the Veneto, the famous cities of Lombardy ruled the plains between the Po and the Alps. Mantua, Cremona, Brescia, Bergamo, Como, Milan, Pavia. South of the Po, in what is now Emilia, were Modena, Reggio, Parma, Piacenza. Lovers of Italy will not resent these sonorous litanies. Between Lombardy and France, the province of Piedmont enclosed Vercelli and Turin. And south of these, Liguria bent around the gulf and city of Genoa. 
The wealth of the region was the gift of the Po, which crossed the peninsula from west to east, carrying the commerce, filling the canals, watering the fields. The growth of industry and trade gave these cities the wealth and pride that enabled them generally to ignore their nominal sovereign, the German emperor, and to subdue the semi-feudal lords of their hinterland. Usually a cathedral stood at the center of these Italian towns to brighten life with the drama of devotion and the spur of hope. Near it, a baptistry to mark the entry of the child into the privileges and responsibilities of Christian citizenship, and a campanile to sound the call to worship, assembly, or arms. In the neighboring piazza or public square, peasants and craftsmen offered their products. Actors, acrobats, and minstrels performed. Heralds cried their proclamations. Citizens chatted after Sunday Mass, and youths or knights engaged in sports or tournaments. A town hall, some shops, some houses or tenements helped to form a guard of brick around the square. From this center ran the crooked, winding, climbing streets, so narrow that when a cart or horseman passed, the pedestrians dodged into a doorway or flattened themselves against a wall. As the thirteenth century progressed and wealth grew, the stucco houses were roofed with red tiles, making a picturesque pattern for those who could forget the odors and the mud. Only a few streets in the central square were paved. Around the city ran a towered and battlemented wall, for war was frequent, and a man had to know how to fight if he cared to be other than a monk. The greatest of these cities were Genoa and Milan. Genoa, La Superba, its lovers called it, was perfectly placed for business and pleasure, rising on a hill before a sea that invited commerce, and sharing in the warm climate of a riviera that reached out to Rapallo on the east and San Remo on the west. Already a busy port in Roman days, Genoa developed a population of merchants, manufacturers, bankers, shipwrights, sailors, soldiers, and politicians. Genoese engineers brought in clear water from the Ligurian Alps by an aqueduct worthy of ancient Rome, and raised a gigantic mole out of the bay to give her great harbor security in storm and war. Like the Venetians of this epoch, the Genoese cared little for letters or art. They spent themselves in conquering competitors and exploring new avenues for gain. The Bank of Genoa was almost the state. It lent money to the city on condition of collecting the municipal revenue. Through this power, it dominated the government, and every party that came into office had to pledge loyalty to the bank. But the Genoese were as brave as they were acquisitive. They cooperated with Pisa to sweep the Saracens from the western Mediterranean from 1015 to 1113, and then fought Pisa intermittently until they shattered their rival's power in the naval battle of Meloria in 1284. For that last conflict, Pisa called all men between the ages of twenty and sixty, Genoa all between eighteen and seventy. We may judge from this the spirit and passion of the age. As there is a natural loathing between men and serpents, wrote the monk Salimbene, so there is between the Pisans and the Genoese, between the Pisans and the men of Lucca. In that engagement off the coast of Corsica, the men fought hand to hand until half the combatants were dead. And there was such wailing in Genoa and Pisa as was never heard in those cities from their foundation to our times. Learning of this disaster to Pisa, the good men of Lucca and Florence thought it an excellent time to send an expedition against that unfortunate city. But Pope Martin IV commanded them to stay their hands. Meanwhile, the Genoese pushed into the east and came into competition with the Venetians, and between these two rose the bitterest hatred of all. In 1255 they contested the possession of Acre. The Hospitallers fought on the side of Genoa, the Templars for Venice. In that battle alone twenty thousand men fell. It destroyed Christian unity in Syria, and perhaps decided the failure of the Crusades. The struggle between Genoa and Venice continued till 1379, when the Genoese suffered at Chioggia, the same culminating defeat that they had inflicted upon the Pisans a century before. Of the Lombard cities, Milan was the richest and most powerful. Once a Roman capital, she was proud of her age and her traditions. The consuls of her republic defied the emperors, her bishops defied the popes, her people shared or sheltered heresies that challenged Christianity itself. In the thirteenth century she had two hundred thousand inhabitants, thirteen thousand houses, a thousand taverns. Herself loving liberty, she did not willingly concede it to others. She patrolled the roads with her troops to force caravans, whithersoever bound, to go to Milan first. She ruined Como and Lodi, 
and struggled to subjugate Pisa, Cremona, and Pavia, she could not rest until she controlled all the commerce of the Po. At the Diet of Constance in 1154, two citizens of Lodi appeared before Frederick Barbarossa and implored his protection for their town. The emperor warned Milan to desist from her attempts upon Lodi. His message was rejected with scorn and trampled underfoot. Frederick, eager to subdue Lombardy to imperial obedience, seized the opportunity to destroy Milan in 1162. Five years later, her survivors and friends had rebuilt the city, and all Lombardy rejoiced in her resurrection as a symbol of Italy's resolve never to be ruled by a German king. Frederick yielded, but before he died, he married his son Henry VI to Constance, daughter of Roger II of Sicily. In Henry's son, the Lombard League would find a more terrible Frederick. 5. Frederick II, 1194-1250 1. The Excommunicate Crusader Constance was thirty when she married Henry, forty-two when she gave birth to her only child. Fearing doubts of her pregnancy and of her child's legitimacy, she had a tent erected in the marketplace of Iesi, near Ancona and there, in the sight of all, she was delivered of the boy who was to become the most fascinating figure of the culminating medieval century. In his veins the blood of the Norman kings of Italy merged with the blood of the Hohenstaufen emperors of Germany. He was four when at Palermo he was crowned king of Sicily in 1198. His father had died a year earlier, his mother died a year afterward. Her will besought Pope Innocent III to undertake the guardianship, education, and political protection of her son, and offered him in return a handsome stipend and the regency and renewed suzerainty of Sicily. He accepted gladly and used his position to end that union of Sicily with Germany, which Frederick's father had just achieved. The popes reasonably dreaded an empire that should encompass the papal states on every side and in effect imprison and dominate the papacy. Innocent provided for Frederick's education, but supported Otto IV for the German throne. Frederick grew up in neglect, sometimes in poverty, so that compassionate citizens of Palermo had on occasion to bring the royal gammon food. He was allowed to run free in the streets and markets of the polyglot capital, and to pick his associates wherever he pleased. He received no systematic education, but his avid mind learned from all that he heard or saw. The world would later marvel at the scope and detail of his knowledge. In those days and ways he acquired Arabic and Greek, and some of the lore of the Jews. He grew familiar with different peoples, garbs, customs, and faiths, and never quite lost his youthful habit of tolerance. He read many volumes of history. He became a good rider and fencer, and a lover of horses and hunting. He was short but strong, with a fair and gracious countenance and long red curly hair, clever, positive, and proud. At twelve, he dismissed Innocent's deputy regent and took over the government. At fourteen, he came of age. At fifteen, he married Constance of Aragon and set out to reclaim the imperial crown. Fortune favored him for a price. Otto IV had violated his agreement to respect the sovereignty of the Pope in the Papal States. Innocent excommunicated him and ordered the barons and bishops of the empire to elect as emperor his young ward Frederick, as old in wisdom as he is young in years. But Innocent, so suddenly turning toward Frederick, did not veer from his purpose of protecting the papacy. As the price of his support, he required from Frederick in 1212 a pledge to continue tribute and fealty from Sicily to the, the popes, to guard the inviolability of the papal states, to keep the two Sicilies, Norman, southern Italy, and the island, perpetually separate from the empire, to reside in Germany as emperor and leave the Sicilies to his infant son Henry as king of Sicily, under a regent to be appointed by Innocent. Furthermore, Frederick bound himself to maintain all the powers of the clergy in his realm, to punish heretics, and to take the cross as a crusader. Financing his trip and retinue with money provided by the Pope, Frederick entered a Germany still held by Otto's armies. But Otto was defeated by Philip Augustus at Bouvines. His resistance collapsed, and Frederick was crowned emperor in a splendid ceremony at Aachen in 1215. There he solemnly renewed his pledge to undertake a crusade, and in the full enthusiasm of triumphant youth he won many princes to make the same vow. For a moment he seemed to Germany a God-sent David who would free David's Jerusalem from the heirs of Saladin. But delays ensued. Otto's brother Henry raised an army to depose Frederick, and the new pope, 
Honorius III, agreed that the young emperor must defend his throne. Frederick overcame Henry, but meanwhile he became involved in imperial politics. Apparently he already longed for his native Italy. The heat and blood of the south were in his temperament, and Germany irked him. Of his fifty-six years, only eight were spent there. He granted large feudal powers to the barons, gave charters of self-government to several cities, and entrusted the government of Germany to Archbishop Engelbert of Cologne and Hermann of Salza, the able Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights. Despite Frederick's apparent negligence, Germany enjoyed prosperity and peace during the thirty-five years of his reign. The barons and bishops were so satisfied with their absentee landlord that to please him they crowned his seven-year-old son Henry King of the Romans, that is, heir to the imperial throne, in 1220. At the same time, Frederick appointed himself regent of Sicily for Henry, who remained in Germany. This rather inverted the plans of Innocent, but Innocent was dead. Honorius yielded and even crowned Frederick emperor at Rome, for he was anxious that Frederick should embark at once to rescue the crusaders in Egypt. However, the barons in southern Italy and the Saracens in Sicily staged a revolt. Frederick argued that he must restore order in his Italian realm before venturing on a long absence. Meanwhile, in 1222, his wife died. Hoping to prod him to fulfill his vow, Honorius persuaded him to marry Isabella, heiress to the lost kingdom of Jerusalem. Frederick complied in 1225 and added the title of King of Jerusalem to those of King of Sicily and Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Trouble with the Lombard cities again delayed him. In 1227 Honorius died, and the stern Gregory IX ascended the papal throne. Frederick now prepared in earnest, built a great fleet, and gathered 40,000 crusaders at Brindisi. There a terrible plague broke out in his army. Thousands died, more thousands deserted. The emperor himself and his chief lieutenant, Louis of Thuringia, caught the infection. Nevertheless, Frederick gave the order to sail. Louis died and Frederick grew worse. His doctors and the higher clergy who were with him advised him to return to Italy. He did and sought a cure at Pozzuoli. Pope Gregory, his patience exhausted, refused to hear the explanations of Frederick's emissaries and announced to the world the excommunication of the emperor. Seven months later, still excommunicate, Frederick set sail for Palestine, this in 1228. On learning of his arrival in Syria, Gregory absolved the subjects of Frederick and his son Henry from their oaths of allegiance and began negotiations to depose the emperor. Taking these actions as a declaration of war, Frederick's regent in Italy invaded the papal states. Gregory retaliated by sending an army to invade Sicily. Monks spread a rumor that Frederick was dead, and soon a large part of Sicily and southern Italy were in papal hands. Two Franciscan delegates of the Pope reached Acre soon after Frederick and forbade any man in the Christian ranks to obey the excommunicate. The Saracen commander, Al Camillo, astonished to find a European ruler who understood Arabic and appreciated Arabic literature, science, and philosophy, made a favorable peace with Frederick, who now entered Jerusalem as a bloodless conqueror. As no clergyman would crown him king of Jerusalem, he crowned himself in the church of the Holy Sepulchre. The bishop of Caesarea, calling the shrine and city desecrated by Frederick's presence, laid an interdict upon religious services in Jerusalem and Acre. Some knights Templar, learning that Frederick planned to visit the reputed site of Christ's baptism in the Jordan, sent secret word to Al Camillo, suggesting that here was a chance for the sultan to capture the emperor. The Moslem commander sent the letter to Frederick. To free Jerusalem from its interdict, the emperor left it on the third day and went to Acre. There, as he walked to his ship, the Christian populace bombarded him with filth. Arriving at Brindisi, Frederick organized an impromptu army and advanced to recapture the towns that had yielded to the Pope. The papal army fled, the cities opened their gates, only Sora resisted and stood siege. It was captured and reduced to ashes. At the frontier of the papal states, Frederick stopped and sent the Pope a plea for peace. The Pope agreed. The Treaty of San Germano was signed in 1230. The excommunication was withdrawn. For a moment there was peace. 2. The Wonder of the World Frederick turned to administration, and from his court at Foggia, in Apulia, wrestled with the problems of too wide a realm. He visited Germany in 1231 and confirmed, in a statute in favor of princes, the powers and privileges that he and his son had extended to the barons. He was willing to surrender Germany to feudalism, if that would leave him at peace to develop his ideas in Italy. Perhaps he recognized that the Battle of Bouvines had ended German hegemony in Europe, 
and that the 13th century belonged to France and Italy. He paid for his neglect of Germany in the rebellion and suicide of his son. Out of the polyglot fashions of Sicily, his despotic hand forged an order and prosperity recalling the brilliance of Roger II's reign. The rebellious Saracens of the hills were captured, were transported to Italy, were trained as mercenaries, and became the most reliable soldiers in Frederick's army. We may imagine the wrath of the popes at the sight of Moslem warriors led by a Christian emperor against papal troops. Palermo remained in law the capital of the Regno, as the two Sicilies were briefly called. But the real capital was Foggia. Frederick loved Italy more ardently than most Italians. He marveled that Yave had made so much of Palestine when Italy existed. He called his southern kingdom the apple of his eye, a haven amidst the floods, a pleasure garden amidst a wilderness of thorns. In 1223 he began to build at Foggia the rambling castle palace of which only a gateway remains today. Soon a city of palaces rose about his own to house his aides. He invited the nobles of his Italian realm to serve as pages at his court. There they rose through widening functions to administer the government. Head of them all was Piero della Vigne, a graduate of the School of Law at Bologna. Frederick made him Logothete, or Secretary of State, and loved him as a brother or son. At Foggia, as at Paris, seventy years later, lawyers replaced the clergy in administration. Here, in the state nearest to the Sea of Peter, the secularization of government was complete. Reared in an age of chaos and learned in Oriental ideas, Frederick never dreamed that the order called a state could be maintained except by monarchical force. He seems honestly to have believed that without a strong central power men would destroy or repeatedly impoverish themselves through crime, ignorance, and war. Like Barbarossa, he valued social order more highly than popular liberty, and felt that the ruler who competently maintains order earns all the luxuries of his keep. He allowed some measure of public representation in his government. Twice a year, at five points in the Reino, assemblies met to deal with local problems, complaints, and crimes. To these assemblies he summoned not only the nobles and prelates of the district, but four deputies from each major city and two from each town. For the rest, Frederick was an absolute monarch. He accepted as axiomatic the basic principle of Roman civil law, that the citizens had handed over to the emperor the sole right to legislate. At Melfi in 1231 he issued for the Regno, chiefly through the legal skill and counsel of Piero della Vigne, the Liber Augustalis, the first scientifically codified system of laws since Justinian, and one of the most complete bodies of jurisprudence in legal history. It was in some ways a reactionary code. It accepted all the class distinctions of feudalism, and maintained old rights of the lord over the serf, in many ways it was a progressive code. It deprived the nobles of legislative, judicial, and minting powers, centering these in the state. It abolished trial by combat or ordeal. It provided for state prosecutors to pursue crimes that heretofore had gone unpunished if no citizen brought in a complaint. It condemned the law's delays, advised judges to cut down the perorations of advocates, and required the state courts to sit daily except on holidays. Like most medieval rulers, Frederick carefully regulated the national economy. A just price was established for various services and goods. The state nationalized the production of salt, iron, steel, hemp, tar, dyed fabrics, and silks. It operated textile factories with Saracen slave women workers and eunuch foremen. It owned and operated slaughterhouses and public baths. It created model farms, fostered the cultivation of cotton and sugar cane, cleared woods and fields of injurious animals, built roads and bridges, and sank wells to augment the water supply. Foreign trade was largely managed by the state and was carried in vessels owned by the government. One of these had a crew of 300 men. Internal traffic tolls were reduced to a minimum, but tariffs on exports and imports provided the chief revenues of the state. There were many other taxes, for this government, like all others, could always find uses for money. To Frederick's credit must be put a sound and conscientious currency. To make this monolithic state majestic and holy without relying upon a Christianity normally hostile to him, Frederick strove to restore in his own person all the awe and splendor that had hedged a Roman emperor. This book is concluded on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2 by Will Durant. Concluded. 
To make this monolithic state majestic and holy without relying upon a Christianity normally hostile to him, Frederick strove to restore in his own person all the awe and splendor that had hedged a Roman emperor. His exquisite coins were stamped with no Christian word or symbol, but with the circular legend IMP ROM Cesar AUG. And on the reverse was the Roman eagle encircled with the name Fridericus. The people were taught that the emperor was, in a sense, the son of God. His laws were the divine justice codified and were referred to as Justitia, almost the third person of a new trinity. Anxious to place himself beside the old Roman emperors in the history and galleries of art, Frederick commissioned sculptors to carve his likeness in stone. A bridgehead at the Volturno, a gate at Capua, were adorned with reliefs in ancient style of himself and his aides. Nothing remains of these works except a female head of great beauty. This pre-Renaissance attempt to revive classic art failed, washed away by the Gothic wave. Despite his near divinity and royal industry, Frederick found it possible to enjoy life at all levels in his Foggia court. An army of slaves, many of them Saracens, ministered to his wants and managed the bureaucracy. In 1235, his second wife having died, he married again, but Isabella of England could not understand his mind or morals and retired into the background while Frederick consorted with mistresses and begot an illegitimate son. His enemies charged him with maintaining a harem, and Gregory the Ninth accused him of sodomy. Frederick explained that all these white or black ladies or lads were used only for their skill in song, dance, acrobatics, or other entertainment traditional in royal courts. In addition to these, he kept a menagerie of wild beasts, and sometimes he traveled with a retinue of leopards, lynxes, lions, panthers, apes, and bears, led on a chain by Saracen slaves. Frederick loved hunting and hawking, collected strange birds, and wrote for his son Manfred an admirable and scientific treatise on falconry. Next to hunting, he took delight in educated and graceful conversation, delicato parlare, he preferred the meeting of true minds to the joust of arms. He himself was the most cultured causeur of his time, and was noted for his wit and repartee. This Frederick was his own Voltaire. He spoke nine languages and wrote seven. He corresponded in Arabic with al Kamil, whom he called his dearest friend after his own sons, in Greek with his son-in-law, the Greek emperor John Vatetzes, and in Latin with the Western world. His associates, especially Piero delle Vigne, formed their admirable Latin style on the classics of Rome. They keenly felt and emulated the classic spirit and almost anticipated the humanists of the Renaissance. Frederick himself was a poet whose Italian verses won Dante's praise. The love poetry of Provence and Islam entered his court and was taken up by the young nobles who served there, and the emperor, like some Baghdad potentate, loved to relax after a day of administration or hunting or war with pretty women around him and poets to sing his glory and their charms. As he grew older, Frederick turned more and more to science and philosophy. Here, above all, he was stirred by the Moslem heritage of Sicily. He read many Arabic masterpieces himself, brought Moslem and Jewish scientists and philosophers to his court, and paid scholars to translate into Latin the scientific classics of Greece and Islam. He was so fond of mathematics that he persuaded the Sultan of Egypt to send him a famous mathematician, Al-Hanifi, and he was intimate with Leonardo Fibonacci, the greatest Christian mathematician of the age. He shared some of the superstitions of his time and delved into astrology and alchemy. He lured to his court the polymath Michael Scott and studied occult science with him and chemistry, metallurgy, and philosophy. His curiosity was universal. He sent questions in science and philosophy to scholars at his court, and as far abroad as Egypt, Arabia, Syria, and Iraq. He kept a zoological garden for study rather than for amusement, and organized experiments in the breeding of poultry, pigeons, horses, camels, and dogs. His laws establishing closed seasons for hunting were based on careful records of pairing and breeding seasons, for which the animals of Apulia were said to have written him a vote of thanks. His legislation included an enlightened regulation of medical practice, operations, and the sale of drugs. He favored the dissection of cadavers. Moslem physicians marveled at his knowledge of anatomy. The extent of his learning in philosophy appears in his request to some Moslem savants 
To resolve certain discrepancies between the views of Aristotle and Alexander of Aphrodisias on the eternity of the world. O fortunate emperor, exclaimed Michael Scott, I verily believe that if ever a man could escape death by his learning, it would be you. Lest the learning of the scholars whom he had assembled should die with their deaths, Frederick founded in 1224 the University of Naples, a rare example of a medieval university established without ecclesiastical sanction. He called to its faculty scholars in all arts and sciences, and paid them high salaries. He assigned subsidies to enable poor but qualified students to attend. He forbade the youths of his reigno to go outside of it for their higher education. Naples, he hoped, would soon rival Bologna as a school of law, and would train men for public administration. Was Frederick an atheist? He had been pious in his youth, and perhaps retained the basic tenets of Christianity till his crusade. Intimate intercourse with Moslem leaders and thinkers seems to have ended his Christian faith. He was attracted by Moslem learning, and considered it far superior to the Christian thought and knowledge of his day. At the Diet of German Princes in Friuli in 1232, he cordially received a Moslem deputation, and later in the sight of bishops and princes, joined the Saracens in a banquet celebrating a Mohammedan religious feast. It was said by his rivals, reports Matthew Paris, that the emperor agreed and believed in the law of Mohammed more than that of Jesus Christ, and was more a friend to the Saracens than to the Christians. A rumor credited by Gregory the Ninth charged him with saying that three conjurers so craftily led away their contemporaries as to gain the mastery of the world, Moses, Jesus, and Mohammed. All Europe buzzed with this blasphemy. Frederick denied the charge, but it helped to turn public opinion against him in the final crisis of his life. He was unquestionably something of a freethinker. He had his doubts about the creation of the world in time, personal immortality, the virgin birth, and other doctrines of the Christian faith. In rejecting trial by ordeal, he asked, How could a man believe that the natural heat of glowing iron will turn cool without an adequate cause? or that, because of a seared conscience, the element of water will refuse to accept, or submerge, the accused. In all his reign he built one Christian church. Within limits he gave freedom of worship to the diverse faiths in his kingdom. Greek Catholics, Mohammedans, and Jews were allowed to practice their religions unmolested, but, with one exception, they could not teach in the university or rise to official position in the state. All Moslems and Hebrews were required to wear a dress that would distinguish them from Christians, and the poll tax that Moslem rulers levied on Christians and Jews in Islam was here levied upon Jews and Saracens as a substitute for military service. Conversion from Christianity to Judaism or Islam was severely punished in Frederick's laws. But when in 1235 the Jews of Fulda were accused of ritual murder, the killing of a Christian child to use its blood at the Passover festival, Frederick came to their rescue and denounced the story as a cruel legend. He had several Jewish scholars at his court. The great anomaly of this rationalist's reign was the persecution of heresy. Frederick did not allow liberty of thought and speech, even to the professors in his university. It was a privilege confined to himself and his associates. Like most rulers, he recognized the necessity of religion for social order, and could not allow it to be undermined by his savants. Besides, the suppression of heresy facilitated an intermittent peace with the popes. While some other monarchs of the 13th century hesitated to cooperate with the Inquisition, Frederick gave it his full support. The popes and their greatest enemy agreed in this alone. 3. Empire versus Papacy As Frederick's rule at Foggia developed, his far-reaching aims became ever clearer. To establish his rule throughout Italy, to unify Italy and Germany in a restored Roman Empire, and perhaps to make Rome again the political as well as the religious capital of the Western world. When in 1226 he invited the nobles and cities of Italy to a diet at Cremona, he showed his hand by including in his invitation the Duchy of Spoleto, then a papal state, and by marching his troops through the lands of the popes. The pope forbade the nobles of Spoleto to attend. The Lombard cities, suspecting that Frederick planned to subject them to a real instead of nominal submission to the empire, refused to send delegates. Instead, they formed the Second Lombard League, in which Milan, Turin, Bergamo, Brescia, Mantua, Bologna, Vicenza, Verona, Padua, and Treviso pledged themselves to a defensive and offensive alliance for twenty-five years. 
the Diet was never held. In 1234, his son Henry revolted against his father and allied himself with the Lombard League. Frederick rode up from southern Italy to Worms, without an army but with plenty of cash. The rebellion collapsed at the news of his coming or the touch of his gold. Henry was put into prison, languished there for seven years, and then, while being transferred to another place of confinement, rode his horse over a cliff to death. Frederick went on to Mainz, presided over a diet there, and persuaded many of the assembled nobles to join him in a campaign for the restoration of imperial power in Lombardy. So aided, he defeated the army of the League at Corte Nuova in 1237. All the cities surrendered but Milan and Brescia. Gregory IX offered to mediate, but Frederick's dream of unity could not be reconciled with the Italian love of liberty. At this juncture, Gregory, though ninety and ailing, decided to throw in his lot with the League, and risked the whole temporal power of the popes on the issue of war. He had no fondness for the Lombard towns. He too, like Frederick, considered their liberty a license to chaotic strife, and he knew that they harbored heretics openly hostile to the wealth and temporal power of the Church. At this very time, the heretics of besieged Milan were defiling altars and turning crucifixes upside down. But if Frederick overcame these cities, the Papal States would be engulfed within a united Italy and a united empire, dominated by a foe of Christianity and the Church. In 1238, Gregory persuaded Venice and Genoa to join him and the League in war against Frederick. In a powerful encyclical, he charged the Emperor with atheism, blasphemy, and despotism, and a desire to destroy the authority of the Church. In 1239, he excommunicated him, ordered every Roman Catholic prelate to proclaim him an outlaw, and absolved his subjects from their oath of allegiance. Frederick replied in a circular letter to the kings of Europe, repudiating the charge of heresy and accusing the Pope of wishing to destroy the empire and to reduce all kings to subservience to the papacy. The final struggle between empire and papacy was on. The kings of Europe sympathized with Frederick but paid small heed to his appeal for help. The nobility in Germany and Italy sided with him, hoping to restore the cities to feudal obedience. In the cities themselves, the middle and lower classes were generally for the Pope, and the old German terms Weibling and Welf, in the forms of Ghibelline and Guelf, were revived to signify respectively the adherents of the empire and the defenders of the papacy. Even in Rome this division held, and Frederick had many supporters there. As he approached Rome with a small army, one city after another opened its gates to him as to a second Caesar. Gregory anticipated capture and led a mournful procession of priests through the capital. The courage and frailty of the old pope touched the hearts of the Romans, and many took up arms to protect him. Unwilling to force the issue, Frederick bypassed Rome and wintered at Foggia. He had persuaded the German princes to crown his son Conrad, king of the Romans, in 1237. He had placed his son-in-law, the able but brutal Ezzelino de Romano, over Vicenza, Padua, and Treviso and had set over the other surrounded cities his favorite son, Enzio, in face and figure our very image, handsome, proud, and gay, brave in battle and accomplished in poetry. In the spring of 1240 the emperor captured Ravenna and Faenza, and in 1241 he destroyed Benevento, the center of the papal forces. His fleet intercepted a Genoese convoy carrying toward Rome a group of French, Spanish, and Italian cardinals, bishops, abbots, and priests. Frederick confined them in Apulia as hostages to bargain with. He soon released the French, but his long detention of the rest and the death of several in his prisons shocked a Europe accustomed to consider the clergy inviolable, and many now believe that Frederick was the Antichrist predicted some years before by the mystic Joachim of Flora. Frederick offered to release the prelates if Gregory would make peace, but the old pope remained firm even to his death in 1241. Innocent IV was more conciliatory. At the urging of St. Louis, he agreed on terms of peace in 1244. But the Lombard cities refused to ratify this agreement and reminded Innocent that Gregory had pledged the papacy against a separate peace. Innocent left Rome secretly and fled to Lyon. Frederick resumed the war, and no force seemed now capable of preventing his conquest and absorption of the papal states and the establishment of his power in Rome. Innocent summoned the prelates of the church to the Council of Lyon. The council renewed the excommunication of the emperor and deposed him as an immoral, impious, and unfaithful vassal of his acknowledged suzerain, the pope, this in 1245. 
that the Pope surging, a group of German nobles and bishops chose Henry Raspe as anti-emperor, and when he died they named William of Holland to succeed him. Excommunication was pronounced against all supporters of Frederick, and religious services were interdicted in all regions loyal to him. A crusade was proclaimed against him and Enzio, and those who had taken the cross for the redemption of Palestine were granted all the privileges of crusaders if they joined the war against the infidel emperor. Surrendering to a fury of hatred and revenge, Frederick now burned all bridges behind him. He issued a reform manifesto, denouncing the clergy as slaves to the world, drunk with self-indulgence. The increasing stream of their wealth has stifled their piety. In the Reino he confiscated the treasures of the church to finance his war. When a town in Apulia led a conspiracy to capture him, he had the ringleaders blinded, then mutilated, then killed. Receiving a call for help from his son Conrad, he set out for Germany. At Turin he learned that Parma had overthrown his garrison, that Enzio was in peril, and that all northern Italy and even Sicily were in revolt. He put down rebellion after rebellion in town after town, took hostages from each of them, and slew these men when their towns rebelled. Prisoners found to be messengers of the Pope had their hands and feet cut off, and Saracen soldiers, immune to Christian tears and threats, were used as executioners. During the siege of Parma, Frederick, impatient of inaction, went off with Enzio and fifty knights to hunt waterfowl in the neighboring marshes. While they were away, the men and women of Parma came out in a desperate sortie, overwhelmed the disordered and leaderless forces of the emperor, captured the emperor's treasury, his harem, and his menagerie. He levied heavy taxes, raised a new army, and resumed the struggle. Evidence was brought to him that his trusted premier, Piero de Levigne, was conspiring to betray him. Frederick had him arrested and blinded, whereupon Piero beat his head against the wall of his jail till he died in 1249. In that same year news came that Enzio had been captured by the Bolognese in battle at La Fossotta. About the same time, Frederick's doctor tried to poison him. The quick succession of these blows broke the spirit of the emperor. He retired to Apulia and took no further part in the war. In 1250 his generals won many successes, and the tide seemed to have turned. St. Louis, captured by Moslems in Egypt, demanded of Innocent IV an end to the war so that Frederick might come to the Crusaders' aid. But even as hope revived, the body failed. Dysentery, the humbling nemesis of medieval kings, struck the proud emperor down. He asked for absolution and received it. The freethinker donned the garb of a Cistercian monk and died at Fiorentino on December 13, 1250. People whispered that his soul had been borne off by devils through the pit of Mount Etna into hell. His influence was not apparent. His empire soon collapsed, and a greater chaos ruled it than when he came. The unity for which he fought disappeared even in Germany, and the Italian cities followed liberty and its creative stimulus through disorder to the piecemeal tyranny of dukes and condottieri, who, hardly knowing it, inherited the unmorality of Frederick, his intellectual freedom, and his patronage of letters and arts. The virtu, or masculine unscrupulous intelligence of the Renaissance despots, was an echo of Frederick's character and mind, without his grace and charm. The replacement of the Bible with the classics, of faith with reason, of God with nature, of providence with necessity, appeared in the thought and court of Frederick, and, after an orthodox interlude, captured the humanists and philosophers of the Renaissance. Frederick was the man of the Renaissance a century before its time. Machiavelli's prince had Caesar Borgia in mind, but it was Frederick who had prepared its philosophy. Nietzsche had Bismarck and Napoleon in mind, but he acknowledged the influence of Frederick, the first of Europeans according to my taste. Posterity, shocked by his morals, fascinated by his mind and vaguely appreciating the grandeur of his imperial vision, applied to him again and again the epithets coined by Matthew Paris, Stupor mundi et immutator mirabilis, the marvelous transformer and wonder of the world. 6. The Dismemberment of Italy Frederick's will left the empire to his son, Conrad IV, and appointed his illegitimate son Manfred regent of Italy. Revolts against Manfred broke out almost everywhere in Italy. Naples, Spoleto, Ancona, Florence submitted to papal legates. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad, exclaimed Innocent IV. The victorious pope returned to Italy, made Naples his military headquarters, moved to annex the Regno to the papal states, 
and planned a less direct suzerainty over the northern Italian towns. But these cities, while joining the Pope in his Te Deum, were resolved to defend their independence against pontiffs as well as emperors. Meanwhile, Ezzelino and Uberto Pallavicino held several of the cities in fealty to Conrad. Neither of these men had any respect for religion. Heresy flourished under their rule. There was danger that all northern Italy would be lost to the church. Suddenly young Conrad, with a fresh army of Germans, came down over the Alps, reconquered disaffected towns, and entered the Regno in triumph, only to die of malaria in May of 1254. Manfred assumed charge of the imperial forces and routed a papal army near Foggia on December 2nd. Innocent was on his deathbed when the news of this defeat reached him. He died in despair on December 7th, murmuring, Lord, because of his iniquity, thou hast corrupted man. The rest of the tale is a brilliant chaos. Pope Alexander IV, from 1254 to 1256, organized a crusade against Ezzelino. The tyrant was wounded and captured. He refused doctors, priests, and food, and died of self-starvation, impenitent and unshrived, in 1259. His brother, Alberigo, likewise guilty of brutalities and crimes, was also captured, and was made to witness the torture of his family. Then his flesh was torn from his body with pincers, and while he was still alive he was tied to a horse and dragged to death. Christians and atheists alike now ran to savagery, except for the gay and charming bastard Manfred. Having defeated the papal troops again at Monteperto in 1260, he remained for the next six years master of South Italy. He had time to hunt and sing and write poetry, and had not his like in the world, said Dante, for playing of stringed instruments. Pope Urban IV, from 1261 to 1264, despairing of finding in Italy a corrective for Manfred, and perceiving that the papacy must henceforth rely on France for protection, appealed to Louis IX to accept the two Sicilies as a thief. Louis refused, but allowed his brother, Charles of Anjou, to receive from Urban the kingdom of Naples and Sicily in 1264. Charles marched through Italy with 30,000 French troops and routed Manfred's lesser force. Manfred leaped amid the enemy and died a nobler death than his sires. In the following year, a lad of fifteen, Conradine, son of Conrad, came down from Germany to challenge Charles. He was defeated at Tagliacozzo and was publicly beheaded in the market square of Naples in 1268. With him and the death of the long-imprisoned Enzio four years later, the house of Hohenstaufen reached a pitiful end. The Holy Roman Empire became a ceremonious ghost, and the leadership of Europe passed to France. Charles made Naples his capital, established in the two Sicilies a French nobility and bureaucracy, French soldiery, monks, and priests, and ruled and taxed with a scornful absolutism that made the region long for a resurrected Frederick, and inclined Pope Clement IV to mourn the papal victory. On Easter Monday of 1282, as Charles was preparing to lead his fleet to conquer Constantinople, the populace of Palermo, their hatred unleashed by the insulting familiarity of a French gendarme with a Sicilian bride, rose in violent revolt and killed every Frenchman in the city. The accumulated bitterness may be judged from the savagery with which Sicilian men ripped open with their swords the wombs of Sicilian women made pregnant by French soldiers or officials, and trampled the alien embryos to death under their feet. Other cities followed Palermo's lead, and over three thousand Frenchmen in Sicily were slaughtered in a massacre known as the Sicilian Vespers, because it began at the hour of evening prayer. French ecclesiastics in the island were not spared. Churches and convents were invaded by the normally pious Sicilians, and monks and priests were slain without benefit of clergy. Charles of Anjou swore a thousand years of revenge and promised to leave Sicily a blasted, barren, uninhabited rock. Pope Martin IV excommunicated the rebels and proclaimed a crusade against Sicily. Unable to defend themselves, the Sicilians offered their island to Pedro III of Aragon. Pedro came with an army and a fleet and established the House of Aragon as kings of Sicily in 1282. Charles made futile efforts to recapture the island. His fleet was destroyed. He died of exhaustion and chagrin at Foggia in 1285, and his successors, after seventeen years of vain struggle, contented themselves with the kingdom of Naples. North of Rome, the Italian cities played empire against papacy and maintained a heady liberty. At Milan, the Della Torre family ruled to the general satisfaction for twenty years. A coalition of nobles under Otto Visconti captured office in 1277, and the Visconti, as Capitani or Duci, 
gave Milan competent oligarchic government for 170 years. Tuscany, including Arezzo, Florence, Siena, Pisa, and Lucca, had been bequeathed to the papacy by the Countess Matilda in 1107, but this theoretic papal tenure seldom interfered with the right of the cities to rule themselves or to find their own despots. Siena, like so many Tuscan towns, had a proud past going back to Etruscan days. Ruined in the barbarian invasions, it revived in the 8th century as a midway stop on the road of pilgrimage and commerce between Florence and Rome. We hear of merchant guilds there in 1192, then of craft guilds, then of bankers. The House of Buon Signori, founded in 1209, became one of the leading mercantile and financial institutions in Europe. Its agents were everywhere. Its loans to merchants, cities, kings, and popes totaled an enormous sum. Florence and Siena contested the control of the Via Francesa that connected them. The two commercial cities fought exhausting wars with each other intermittently from 1207 to 1270. And as Florence supported the popes in the struggles between empire and papacy, Siena supported the emperors. The victory of Manfred at Monteperto in 1260 was chiefly a victory of Siena over Florence. The Sienese, though fighting against the Pope, ascribed their success in that battle to their patron saint, the Virgin Mother of God. They gave Siena to Mary as a thief, placed the proud legend Civitas Virginis on their coins, and laid the keys of the city at the feet of the Virgin in the great cathedral which they had dedicated to her name. Every year they celebrated the feast of her Assumption into heaven with a solemn and stirring ceremony. On the eve of the festival all the citizens, from the age of eighty to seventy, each holding a lighted candle, formed in procession, according to their parishes, behind their priests and their magistrates, marched to the Duomo, and renewed their vows of fealty to the Virgin. On the feast day itself another procession came, of representatives from conquered or dependent cities, villages, and monasteries. These delegates too marched to the cathedral, brought gifts, and repeated their oath of allegiance to the commune of Siena and its queen. In the city square, Il Campo, a great fair was held on this day. Goods from a hundred cities could be bought there. Acrobats, singers, and musicians performed, and the booth provided for gambling was second in attendance only to Mary's shrine. The century from 1260 to 1360 saw the apogee of Siena. In those hundred years it built the cathedral, 1245 to 1339, the massive Palazzo Publico, 1310 to 1320, and the lovely Campanile, 1325 to 1344. Niccolò Pisano carved a lordly fountain for the Duomo in 1266. And by 1311, Duccio di Buoninsegna was adorning Sienese churches with some of the earliest masterpieces of Renaissance painting. But the proud city undertook more than it could finance. The victory of Monteperto was fatal to Siena. The defeated pope laid an interdict upon the town, forbidding the entry of goods or the payment of debts, and many Sienese banks failed. In 1270, Charles of Anjou incorporated the chastened city into the Guelph or Papal League. Thereafter, Siena was dominated and outshone by her ruthless rival in the north. 7. The Rise of Florence, 1095 to 1308. Florentia, named for its flowers, had begun some two centuries before Christ as a trading post on the Arno, where it received the Mugnoni. Ruined by the barbarian invasions, it recovered in the 8th century as a crossroads on the Via Francesa between France and Rome. Ready access to the Mediterranean encouraged maritime trade. Florence acquired a large mercantile fleet which brought in dyes and silk from Asia, wool from England and Spain, and exported finished textiles to half the world. A zealously guarded trade secret enabled Florentine dyers to color silks and woolens in shades of beauty unsurpassed even in the long-skilled East. The great wool guilds, the Arte della Lana and the Arte de Calimala, imported their own materials and made lush profits in transforming them into finished goods. Most of the work was done in small factories, some of it in city or rural homes. The merchants provided the materials, collected the marketable product, and paid by the piece. The competition of home workers, chiefly women, kept factory wages low. The weavers were not allowed to take united action to raise their wages or better their working conditions, and they were forbidden to emigrate. To further promote discipline, the employers persuaded the bishops to issue pastoral letters to be read from all pulpits four times a year, threatening with ecclesiastical censure, even excommunication, the worker who repeatedly wasted wool. This industry and trade needed ready supplies of investment capital, and soon the bankers contested with the merchants the control of Florentine life. They acquired large estates through foreclosures, 
They became indispensable to the Pope through financial control of ecclesiastical properties mortgaged to them. And in the 13th century, they had almost a monopoly of papal finance in Italy. The general alliance of Florence with the popes in their struggle against the emperors was motivated partly by this financial nexus, partly by fear of imperial and aristocratic encroachments upon municipal and mercantile liberties. The bankers were therefore the chief supporters of the papal party in Florence. It was they who financed the invasion of Italy by Charles of Anjou through a loan of 148,000 livres, or $29.6 million, to Pope Urban IV. When Charles seized Naples, the Florentine bankers, to secure repayment, were allowed to mint the coin and collect the taxes of the new kingdom, to monopolize the trade in armor, silk, wax, oil, and grain, and the supply of arms and provisions to the troops. These Florentine bankers, if we may believe Dante, were not the polished manipulators of our age, but coarse and greedy buccaneers of lucre, who made fortunes by foreclosures and charged unconscionable interest on loans, like that Folco Portinari who fathered Dante's Beatrice. They spread their operations over a wide region. About 1277 we find two Florentine banking firms, the Brunelleschi and the Medici, controlling finance in Nîmes. The Florentine house of Francesi financed the wars and intrigues of Philip IV, and from his reign Italian bankers dominated French finance till the 17th century. Edward I of England borrowed 200,000 gold florins, or $2.16 million, from the Frescobaldi of Florence in 1295. Such loans were risky and subjected the economic life of Florence to distant and apparently irrelevant events. A multiplication of political investments and governmental defaults, capped by the fall of Boniface VIII and the removal of the papacy to Avignon in 1307, brought a series of bank failures to Italy, a general depression, and intensified class war. Three classes divided the secular life of Florence, the Popolo Minuto, or little people, shopkeepers and artisans, the Popolo Grasso, or fat people, employers or businessmen, and the Grandi, or nobles. The artisans, grouped in arti minori, or lesser guilds, were largely manipulated in politics by the masters, merchants, and financiers who filled the arti majori, or major guilds. In the competition to control the government, the little and the fat people united for a time as Popolani against the nobles, who claimed ancient feudal dues from the city and supported first the emperors and then the popes against municipal liberties. The Popolani organized a militia in which every able-bodied resident of the city had to serve and to learn the arts of war. So prepared, they captured and demolished the castles of the nobles in the countryside and forced the nobles to come and dwell within the city walls under municipal law. The nobles, still rich with rural rents, built palace castles in the town, divided into factions, fought one another in the streets, and competed to see which faction should overthrow the limited democracy of Florence and set up an aristocratic constitution. In 1247, the Uberti faction led a Ghibelline revolt to establish in Florence a government favorable to Frederick. The Popolani resisted bravely, but a detachment of German knights routed them, and the Florentine democracy fell. The leading Guelphs fled from the city, their homes were torn down in unforgetting revenge for their destruction of feudal castles a century before. Thereafter, each fluctuation of victory in the war of the classes and factions was celebrated by the exile of the defeated leaders and the confiscation or destruction of their property. For three years, the Ghibelline aristocracy, backed by a garrison of German soldiers, ruled the city. Then, as an aftermath of Frederick's death, a Guelph revolt of the middle and lower classes captured the government in 1250, and appointed a Capitano del Popolo to check the Podesta, as the ancient tribunes of the people had checked the consuls of Rome. The exiled Guelphs were recalled, and the triumphant bourgeoisie cemented its domestic success with wars against Pisa and Siena to control the road of Florentine commerce to the sea and to Rome. The richer merchants became a new nobility and sought to confine state offices to their class. The defeat of Florence at Monteperto by Siena and Manfred entailed the second flight of the Guelph leaders, and for six years Florence was ruled by Manfred's delegates. The collapse of the imperial cause in 1268 brought the Guelphs back to power, nominally subject to Charles of Anjou. To control the Podesta, who was an appointee of Charles, they established a body of twelve Anziani, ancients or elders, to advise that official, and a council of one hundred, without whose sanction no important measure nor any expenditure is to be undertaken. Taking advantage of Charles's preoccupation with the Sicilian Vespers, 
The bourgeoisie in 1282 put through a constitutional change by which a priory of the arts, composed of six priori, or foremen, chosen from the greater guilds, became in effect the ruling body in the city government. Through all these mutations, the office of Podesta survived, but shorn of power. The merchants and the bankers were supreme. The vanquished party of the old nobility reorganized itself under the handsome and haughty Corso Donati, and for unknown reasons received the name of Neri, the blacks. The new nobility of bankers and merchants, led by the Cherki family, took the name of Bianchi, the whites. Hopeless of aid from the shattered empire, the old nobility turned to the Pope for succor from the triumphant bourgeoisie. Through the Spini, his Florentine agents in Rome, Donati planned with Boniface VIII to capture control of Florence. The Tuscan factions had infected the Papal States, and Boniface despaired of restoring order there unless he could secure a decisive voice in the municipal governments of Tuscany. A Florentine attorney learned of these negotiations and accused three Spini agents in Rome of treason to Florence. The Priori condemned the three men in April 1300, whereupon the Pope threatened to excommunicate the accusers. A group of armed nobles of the Donati faction assaulted certain officers of the guilds. The Priory, of which Dante was now a member, exiled several nobles in defiance of the Pope in June 1300. Boniface appealed to Charles of Valois to enter Italy, subdue Florence, and recapture Sicily from Aragon. Charles reached Florence in November 1301 and announced that he had come only to establish order and peace. But soon thereafter, Corso Donati entered the city with an armed band, sacked the houses of the priors who had banished him, threw open the prisons, and released not only his friends, but all who cared to escape. Riot ran loose. Nobles and criminals joined in robbing, kidnapping, killing. Warehouses were plundered, heiresses were forced to marry impromptu suitors, and the fathers were compelled to sign rich settlements. Finally, Corso turned out the priors in the Podesta. The blacks chose a new priory, which submitted all its proposed measures to the black leaders. For seven years, Corso was the dashing dictator of Florence. The deposed priors were tried, condemned, and banished, including Dante in 1302. 359 whites were sentenced to death, but most of them were allowed to escape into exile. Charles of Valois accepted these events gracefully, and 24,000 florins, or $4.8 million, for his trouble, and departed south. In 1304, the unchecked blacks set fire to the homes of their enemies. 1,400 houses were destroyed, leaving the center of Florence in ashes. The blacks then divided into new factions, and in one of a hundred acts of violence, Corso Donati was stabbed to death in 1308. We must remind ourselves again that the historian, like the journalist, is forever tempted to sacrifice the normal to the dramatic, and never quite conveys an adequate picture of any age. During these conflicts of popes and emperors, Guelphs and Ghibellines, blacks and whites, Italy was sustained by a hard-working peasantry. Perhaps then, as now, Italian fields were cultivated with art as well as industry, and were divided and arranged to please the eye as well as feed the flesh. Hills and crags and mountains were carved and terraced to hold grapevines, fruit and nut orchards, and olive trees, and gardens were laboriously walled to check erosion and hold the precious rain. In the cities a hundred industries absorbed the great majority of men, and left little time for the strife of speeches, votes, knives, and swords. Merchants and bankers were not all merciless ghouls. They too, if only by their acquisitive fever, made the cities hum and grow. Nobles like Corso Donati, Guido Cavalcanti, Cangrande della Scala, could be men of culture even if now and then they used their swords to make a point. Women moved with vibrant freedom in this high-spirited society. Love was for them no wordy sham of troubadours, nor the grim fusion of sweating peasants, nor yet the service of a knight to a parsimonious goddess. It was a gallant and ardent amorousness, leading with reckless dispatch to a full-bodied abandonment and unpremeditated motherhood. Here and there in this ferment, teachers maneuvered with desperate patience to insert instruction into reluctant youth. Prostitutes eased the tumescence of imaginative men. Poets instilled their foiled desire into compensatory verse. Artists hungered while seeking perfection. Priests played politics and consoled the bereaved and the poor. And philosophers struggled through a labyrinth of myths toward the bright mirage of truth. There was a stimulus in this society— an excitement and competition that sharpened men's wits and tongues, brought forth their reserve and unsuspected powers, and lured them, even if by their own destruction, to clear the way and set the stage for the Renaissance. Through many pains and the shedding of blood would come the great rebirth. 
This concludes the reading of The Age of Faith, Part 2, by Will Durant. Part 3 continues the story and is available through the Books on Tape service. This book was read by Alexander Adams. Additional titles by Will Durant in the Books on Tape Library include Our Oriental Heritage and The Life of Greece. For additional information about them or for help with topics of related interest, please call our Customer Service Department or check our Catalog Index to find review material. Will you please wind or rewind the tape as appropriate so the book will be in order for the next person to enjoy? Thank you. Be right there, too. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. Chapter 27 The Roman Catholic Church 1095 to 1294 1. The Faith of the People In many aspects, religion is the most interesting of man's ways, for it is his ultimate commentary on life and his only defense against death. Nothing is more moving in medieval history than the omnipresence, almost at times the omnipotence, of religion. It is difficult for those who today live in comfort and plenty to go down in spirit into the chaos and penury that molded medieval faiths. But we must think of the superstitions, apocalypses, idolatry, and credulity of medieval Christians, Moslems, and Jews with the same sympathy with which we should think of their hardships, their poverty, and their griefs. The flight of thousands of men and women from the world, the flesh, and the devil into monasteries and nunneries suggests not so much their cowardice as the extreme disorder, insecurity, and violence of medieval life. It seemed obvious that the savage impulses of men could be controlled only by a supernaturally sanctioned moral code. Then, above all, the world needed a creed that would balance tribulation with hope, soften bereavement with solace, redeem the prose of toil with the poetry of belief, cancel life's brevity with continuance, and give an inspiring and ennobling significance to a cosmic drama that might else be a meaningless and intolerable procession of souls, species, and stars, stumbling one by one into an inescapable extinction. Christianity sought to meet these needs with a tremendous and epic conception of creation and human sin, of the Virgin Mother and the suffering God, of the immortal soul destined to face a last judgment, to be damned to everlasting hell, or to be saved for eternal bliss by a church administering through her sacraments the divine grace earned by the Redeemer's death. It was within this encompassing vision that most Christian lives moved and found their meaning. The greatest gift of medieval faith was the upholding confidence that right would win in the end, and that every seeming victory of evil would at last be sublimated in the universal triumph of the good. The Last Judgment was the pivot of the Christian, as of the Jewish and the Moslem faith. The belief in the second advent of Christ, and the end of the world, as preludes to the judgment, had survived the disappointments of the apostles, the passing of the year 1000, and the fears and hopes of forty generations. It had become less vivid in general, but it had not died. Wise men, said Roger Bacon in 1271, considered the end of the world to be near. Every great epidemic or disaster, every earthquake or comet or other extraordinary event, was looked upon as heralding the end of the world. But even if the world continued, the souls and bodies of the dead would be resurrected at once to face their judge. The early Christian theory that all judgment of the dead would be postponed till the doomsday of the end of the world had been replaced by the doctrine that every person would be judged immediately after his death. Men hoped vaguely for heaven, but vividly feared hell. There was much tenderness in medieval Christianity, probably more than in any other religion in history, but the Catholic, like the early Protestant theology and preaching, felt called upon to stress the terror of hell. Christ was to this age no gentle Jesus, meek and mild, but the stern avenger of every mortal sin. Nearly all churches showed some representation of Christ the Judge. Many had pictures of the Last Judgment, and these portrayed the tortures of the damned more prominently than the bliss of the saved. St. Methodius, we are told, converted King Boris of Bulgaria by painting a picture of hell on the wall of the royal palace. Many mystics claimed to have had visions of hell and described its geography and terror. The monk Tundal in the twelfth century reported exquisite details. In the center of hell, he said, the devil was bound to a burning gridiron by red-hot chains. His screams of agony never ended. His hands were free and reached out and seized the damned. 
His teeth crushed them like grapes. His fiery breath drew them down his burning throat. Assistant demons with hooks of iron plunged the bodies of the damned alternately into fire or icy water, or hung them up by the tongue, or sliced them with a saw, or beat them flat on an anvil, or boiled them, or strained them through a cloth. Sulfur was mixed with the fire in order that a vile stench might be added to the discomforts of the damned. But the fire gave no light, so that a horrible darkness shrouded the incalculable diversity of pains. The church herself gave no official location or description of hell, but she frowned upon men who, like Origen, doubted the reality of its material fires. The purpose of the doctrine would have been frustrated by its mitigation. St. Thomas Aquinas held that the fire which will torment the bodies of the damned is corporeal, and located hell in the lowest part of the earth. To common medieval imagination, and to such men as Gregory the Great, the devil was no figure of speech, but a life and blood reality prowling about everywhere, suggesting temptations and creating all kinds of evil. He could usually be sent packing by a dash of holy water or the sign of the cross, but he left an awful odor of burning sulfur behind him. He was a great admirer of women, used their smiles and charms as bait to lure his victims, and occasionally won their favors, if the ladies themselves might be believed. So a woman of Toulouse admitted that she had frequently slept with Satan, and had at the age of fifty-three given birth through his services to a monster with a wolf's head and a serpent's tail. The devil had an immense cohort of assistant demons, who hovered around every soul and persistently maneuvered to lead it into sin. They, too, liked to lie as incubi with careless or lonely or holy women. The monk Richalm described them as filling the whole world. The whole air is but a thick mass of devils, always and everywhere in wait for us. It is marvelous that any one of us should be alive. Were it not for God's grace, no one of us could escape. Practically everybody, including the philosophers, believed in this multitude of demons. But a saving sense of humor tempered this demonology, and most healthy males looked upon the little devils rather as poltergeist mischief-makers than as objects of terror. Such demons, it was believed, intruded audibly but invisibly into conversations, cut holes in people's garments, and threw dirt at passers-by. One tired demon sat on a head of lettuce and was inadvertently eaten by a nun. More alarming was the doctrine that many are called but few are chosen. See Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. Orthodox theologians, Mohammedan as well as Christian, held that the vast majority of the human race would go to hell. Most Christian theologians took literally the statement ascribed to Christ, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth shall not be damned. Mark, chapter 16, verse 16. St. Augustine reluctantly concluded that infants dying before being baptized went to hell. St. Anselm thought that the damnation of unbaptized infants, vicariously guilty through the sin of Adam and Eve, was no more unreasonable than the slave status of children born to slaves, which he considered reasonable. The Church softened the doctrine by teaching that unbaptized infants went not to hell but to limbo, infernus puerorum, where their only suffering was the pain of the loss of paradise. Most Christians believed that all Moslems, and most Moslems, Mohammed accepted, believed that all Christians would go to hell, and it was generally accepted that all heathen were damned. The Fourth Lateran Council of 1215 declared that no man could be saved outside the universal church. Pope Gregory the Ninth condemned as heresy Raymond Lully's hope that God hath such love for his people that almost all men will be saved, since if more were damned than saved, Christ's mercy would be without great love. No other prominent churchman allowed himself to believe or say that the saved would outnumber the damned. Berthold of Regensburg, one of the most famous and popular preachers of the thirteenth century, reckoned the proportion of the damned to the saved as a hundred thousand to one. St. Thomas Aquinas thought that in this also doth God's mercy chiefly appear, that he raiseth a few to that salvation wherefrom very many fail. Volcanoes were supposed by many to be the mouths of hell. Their rumbling was a faint echo of the moans of the damned, and Gregory the Great argued that the crater of Etna was daily widening to receive the enormous number of souls that were fated to be damned. The congested bowels of the earth held in their hot embrace the great majority of all the human beings that had ever been born. From that hell there would be no respite nor escape through all eternity, said Berthold. Count the sands of the seashore, or the hairs that have grown on man or beast since Adam. Reckon a year of torment for each grain or hair, 
and that span of time would hardly represent the beginning of the agony of the condemned. The last moment of a man's life was decisive for all eternity, and the fear that that final moment might find one sinful and unshrived lay heavy on men's souls. These terrors were in some careful measure mitigated by the doctrine of purgatory. Prayers for the dead were a custom as old as the church. Penances undergone and masses said to aid the dead can be traced as far back as 250. Augustine had discussed the possibility of a place of purging punishment for sins forgiven but not fully atoned for before death. Gregory I had approved the idea and had suggested that the pains of souls in purgatory might be shortened and softened by the prayers of their living friends. The theory did not fully capture popular belief till Peter Damien, about 1070, gave it the afflatus of his fevered eloquence. In the twelfth century it was advanced by the spread of a legend that St. Patrick, to convince some doubters, had allowed a pit to be dug in Ireland, into which several monks descended. Some returned, said the tale, and described purgatory and hell with discouraging vividness. The Irish knight Owen claimed to have gone down through that pit into hell in 1153, and his account of his nether experiences had a prodigious success. Tourists came from afar to visit this pit. Financial abuses developed, and Pope Alexander VI in 1497 ordered it closed as an imposture. What proportion of the people in medieval Christendom accepted the doctrines of Christianity? We hear of many heretics, but most of these admitted the basic tenets of the Christian creed. At Orléans in 1017, two men, among the worthiest in lineage and learning, denied creation, the Trinity, heaven and hell, as mere ravings. John of Salisbury in the twelfth century tells of hearing many persons talk otherwise than faith may hold. In that century, says Villani, there were at Florence Epicureans who scoffed at God and the saints and lived according to the flesh. Geraldus Cambrensis, possibly from 1146 to 1220, tells of an unnamed priest who, reproved by another for careless celebration of the Mass, asked whether his critic really believed in transubstantiation, the Incarnation, the Virgin Birth, and Resurrection, adding that all this had been invented by cunning ancients to hold men in terror and restraint, and was now carried on by hypocrites. The same Gerald of Wales quotes the scholar Simon of Tournay, circa 1201, as crying out one day, Almighty God, how long will this superstitious sect of Christians and this upstart invention endure? Of this Simon, the story is told that in a lecture he proved by ingenious arguments the doctrine of the Trinity, and then, elated by the applause of his audience, boasted that he could disprove the doctrine with yet stronger arguments, whereupon we are told he was immediately stricken with paralysis and idiocy. About 1200, Peter, prior of Holy Trinity in Aldgate, London, wrote, there are some who believe that there is no God, and that the world is ruled by chance. There are many who believe neither in good or evil angels, nor in life after death, nor in any other spiritual and invisible thing. Vincent of Beauvais, possibly from 1200 to 1264, mourned that many derided visions and stories of the saints as vulgar fables or lying inventions, and added, We need not wonder if such tales get no credence from men who believe not in hell. The doctrine of hell stuck in many throats. Some simple souls asked why God had created the devil if he foresaw Satan's sin and fall. Skeptics argued that God could not be so cruel as to punish finite sin with infinite pain, to which the theologians answered that a mortal sin was an offense against God and therefore involved infinite guilt. A weaver of Toulouse in 1247 remained unconvinced. If, he said, I could lay hold on that God who, out of a thousand men whom he has made, saves one and damns all the rest, I would tear and rend him tooth and nail as a traitor, and would spit in his face. Other skeptics argued more genially that hellfire must in time calcine the soul and body to insensitivity, so that he who is used to hell is as comfortable there as anywhere else. The old joke about hell having more interesting company than heaven appears in the French idol of Aucassin et Nicolette circa 1230. Priests complained that most people put off thought of hell to their deathbed, confident that however sinful their lives, three words, ego te absolvo, will save me. Apparently there were village atheists then as now, but village atheists leave few memorials behind them, and the literature that has come down from the Middle Ages was largely composed by churchmen, or was largely screened by ecclesiastical selection. 
we shall find wandering scholars composing irreverent poetry, rough burghers swearing the most blasphemous oaths, people sleeping and snoring, even dancing and whoring in church, and more lechery, gluttony, murder, and robbery in the Sunday, said a friar, than reigned all the week before. Such items, suggesting a lack of real faith, might be multiplied by heaping up instances from a hundred countries and a thousand years on one page. They serve to warn us against exaggerating medieval piety. But the Middle Ages still convey to the student a pervasive atmosphere of religious practices and beliefs. Every European state took Christianity under its protection and enforced submission to the church by law. Nearly every king loaded the church with gifts. Nearly every event in history was interpreted in religious terms. Every incident in the Old Testament prefigured something in the New. In vetere testamento, said Augustine, novum latet, in novo vetus patet. For example, said the great bishop, David watching Bathsheba bathing symbolized Christ beholding his church cleansing herself from the pollution of the world. Everything natural was a supernatural sign. Every part of a church, said Guillaume Durand, possibly from 1237 to 1296, bishop of Mond, has a religious meaning. The portal is Christ, through whom we enter heaven. The pillars are the bishops and doctors who uphold the church. The sacristy, where the priest puts on his vestments, is the womb of Mary, where Christ puts on human flesh. Every beast to this mood had a theological significance. When a lioness gives birth to a cub, says a typical medieval bestiary, she brings it forth dead and watches over it three days until the father, coming on the third day, breathes upon its face and brings it to life. So the Father Almighty raised His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, from the dead. The people welcomed, and for the most part generated, a hundred thousand tales of supernatural events, powers, and cures. An English urchin tried to steal some pigeon fledglings from a nest. His hand miraculously adhered to the stone upon which he leaned. Only three days of prayer by the community released him. A child offered bread to the sculptured infant of a nativity shrine. The Christ babe thanked it and invited it to paradise. Three days later the child died. A certain lecherous priest wooed a woman. Unable to win her consent, he kept the most pure body of the Lord in his mouth after Mass, hoping that if he thus kissed her she would be bent to his desire by the force of the sacrament. But when he would fain have gone forth from the church he seemed to himself to grow so huge that he struck his head against the ceiling. He buried the wafer in a corner of the church. Later he confessed to another priest. They dug up the wafer and found it had turned into the blood-stained figure of a crucified man. A woman kept the sacred wafer in her mouth from church to home and placed it in a hive to reduce mortality among the bees. These built for their most sweet guest, out of their sweetest honeycombs, a tiny chapel of marvelous workmanship. Pope Gregory I filled his works with stories of this kind. Perhaps the people, or the literate among them, took such tales with a grain of salt, or as pleasant fiction no worse than the wondrous narratives wherewith our presidents and kings relax their burdened brains. Credulity may have changed its field rather than its scope. There is a touching faith in many of these medieval legends. So when the beloved Pope Leo IX returned to Italy from his tour of reform in France and Germany, the river Agnene divided like the Red Sea to let him pass. The power of Christianity lay in its offering to the people faith rather than knowledge, art rather than science, beauty rather than truth. Men preferred it so. They suspected that no one could answer their questions. It was prudent, they felt, to take on faith the replies given with such quieting authoritativeness by the Church. They would have lost confidence in her had she ever admitted her fallibility. Perhaps they distrusted knowledge as the bitter fruit of a wisely forbidden tree, a mirage that would lure man from the Eden of simplicity and an undoubting life. So the medieval mind, for the most part, surrendered itself to faith, trusted in God and the Church, as modern man trusts in science and the state. You cannot perish, said Philip Augustus to his sailors in a midnight storm, for at this moment thousands of monks are rising from their beds and will soon be praying for us. Men believed that they were in the hands of a power greater than any human knowledge could give. In Christendom, as in Islam, they surrendered to God, and even amid profanity, violence, and lechery, they sought Him and salvation. It was a God-intoxicated age. 2. The Sacraments Next to the determination of the faith, the greatest power of the Church lay in the administration of the sacraments, ceremonies symbolizing the conferment of divine grace. In no religion, said St. Augustine, 
can men be held together unless they are united in some sort of fellowship through visible symbols or sacraments. Sacramentum was applied in the fourth century to almost anything sacred, to baptism, the cross, prayer. In the fifth century, Augustine applied it to the celebration of Easter. In the seventh century, Isidore of Seville restricted it to baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. In the twelfth century, the sacraments were finally fixed at seven, baptism, confirmation, penance, the Eucharist, matrimony, holy orders, and extreme unction. Minor ceremonies conferring divine grace, like sprinkling with holy water or the sign of the cross, were distinguished as sacramentals. The most vital sacrament was baptism. It had two functions, to remove the stain of original sin, and by this new birth, to formally receive the individual into the Christian fold. At this ceremony the parents were expected to give the child the name of a saint who was to be its patron, model, and protector. This was its Christian name. By the ninth century the early Christian method of baptism by total immersion had been gradually replaced by aspersion, sprinkling, as less dangerous to health in northern climes. Any priest, or in emergency, any Christian, could confer baptism. The old custom of deferring baptism to the later years of life had now been replaced by infant baptism. In some congregations, especially in Italy, a special chapel, the baptistry, was constructed for this sacrament. In the Eastern Church, the sacraments of Confirmation and Eucharist were conferred immediately after baptism. In the Western Church, the age of Confirmation was gradually postponed to the seventh year, in order that the child might learn the essentials of the Christian faith. It was administered only by a bishop, with a laying on of hands, a prayer that the Holy Ghost would enter the candidate, an anointing of the forehead with chrism, and a slight blow on the cheek. So, as in the dubbing of a knight, the young Christian was confirmed in his faith and was sworn by implication into all the rights and duties of a Christian. More important was the sacrament of penance. If the doctrines of the Church inculcated a sense of sin, she offered means of periodically cleansing the soul by confessing one's sins to a priest and performing the assigned penances. According to the gospel, Christ had forgiven sins and had endowed the apostles with a similar power to bind and loose. This power, said the church, had descended by apostolic succession from the apostles to the early bishops, from Peter to the popes. And in the twelfth century the power of the keys was extended by bishops to the priests. The public confession practiced in primitive Christianity had been replaced in the fourth century by private confession to spare embarrassment to dignitaries but public confession survived in some heretical sects, and a public penance might be imposed for such monstrous crimes as the massacre of Thessalonica or the murder of Becket. The Fourth Council of the Lateran in 1215 made annual confession and communion a solemn obligation, whose neglect was to exclude the offender from church services and Christian burial. To encourage and protect the penitent, a seal was placed upon every private confession. No priest was allowed to reveal what had been so confessed. From the 8th century onward, penitentials were published, prescribing canonical or ecclesiastically authorized penances for each sin, prayers, fasts, pilgrimage, almsgiving, or other works of piety or charity. This wondrous institution, as Leibniz called the sacrament of penance, had many good effects. It gave the penitent relief from secret and neurotic broodings of remorse. It allowed the priest to improve by counsel and warnings the moral and physical health of his flock. It comforted the sinner with the hope of reform. It served, said the skeptical Voltaire, as a restraint upon crime. Auricular confession, said Goethe, should never have been taken from mankind. There were some bad effects. Sometimes the institution was used for political purposes, as when priests refused absolution to those who sided with the emperors against the popes. Occasionally it was used as a means of inquisition, as when St. Charles Borromeo, from 1538 to 1584, Archbishop of Milan, instructed his priests to demand of penitents the names of any heretics or suspects known to them. And some simple souls mistook absolution as license to sin again. As the fervor of faith cooled, the severe canonical penances tempted penitents to lie, and priests were permitted to substitute lighter penalties, usually some charitable contribution to a cause approved by the Church. From these commutations grew indulgences. An indulgence was not a license to commit sin, but a partial or plenary exemption granted by the Church from some or all of the purgatorial punishment merited by earthly sin. 
Absolution and confession removed from sin the guilt that would have condemned the sinner to hell, but it did not absolve him from the temporal punishment due to his sin. Only a small minority of Christians completely atoned on earth for their sins. The balance of atonement would be exacted in purgatory. The Church claimed the right to remit such punishments by transmitting to any Christian penitent who performed stipulated works of piety or charity a fraction of the rich treasury of grace earned by Christ's sufferings and death, and by saints whose merits outweighed their sins. Indulgences had been granted as far back as the ninth century. Some were given in the eleventh century to pilgrims visiting sacred shrines. The first plenary indulgence was that which Urban II offered in 1095 to those who would join the First Crusade. From these uses the custom arose of giving indulgences for repeating certain prayers, attending special religious services, building bridges, roads, churches, or hospitals, clearing forests or draining swamps, contributing to a crusade, to an ecclesiastical institution, to a church jubilee, to a Christian war, etc. The system was put to many good uses, but it opened doors to human cupidity. The church commissioned certain ecclesiastics, usually friars, as questiarii, to raise funds by offering indulgences in return for gifts, repentance, and prayer. These solicitors, whom the English called pardoners, developed a competitive zeal that scandalized many Christians. They exhibited real or false relics to stimulate contributions, and they kept for themselves a due or undue part of their receipts. The Church made several efforts to reduce these abuses. The Fourth Lateran Council ordered bishops to warn the faithful against false relics and forged credentials. It ended the right of abbots and limited that of bishops to issue indulgences. And it called upon all ecclesiastics to exercise moderation in their zeal for the new device. In 1261, the Council of Mainz denounced many questiarii as wicked liars, who displayed the stray bones of men or beasts as those of saints, trained themselves to weep on order, and offered purgatorial bargains for a maximum of coin and a minimum of prayer. Similar condemnations were issued by church councils at Vienne in 1311 and Ravenna in 1317. The abuses continued. Next to baptism, the most vital sacrament was the Eucharist, or Holy Communion. The Church took literally the words ascribed to Christ at the Last Supper. Of the bread, this is my body, and of the wine, this is my blood. The main feature of the Mass was the transubstantiation of wafers of bread and a chalice of wine into the body and blood of Christ by the miraculous power of the priest. And the original purpose of the Mass was to allow the faithful to partake of the body and blood, soul and divinity of the second person of the triune God, by eating the consecrated host and drinking the consecrated wine. As the drinking of the transubstantiated wine risked spilling the blood of Christ, the custom arose in the twelfth century of communicating through taking only the host. And when some conservatives, whose views were later adopted by the Hussites of Bohemia, demanded communion in both forms to make sure that they received the blood as well as the body of the Lord, theologians explained that the blood of Christ was concomitant with his body in the bread, and his body was concomitant with his blood in the wine. A thousand marvels were told of the power of the consecrated host to cast out devils, cure disease, stop fires, and detect perjury by choking liars. Every Christian was required to communicate at least once a year, and the first communion of the young Christian was made an occasion of solemn pageantry and happy celebration. The doctrine of the real presence developed slowly. Its first official formulation was by the Council of Nicaea in 787. In 855, a French Benedictine monk, Ratramnus, taught that the consecrated bread and wine were only spiritually, not carnally, the body and blood of Christ. About 1045, Berengar, archdeacon of Tours, questioned the reality of transubstantiation. He was excommunicated, and Lanfranc, abbot of Beck, wrote a reply to him in 1063, stating the orthodox doctrine. We believe that the earthly substance is by the ineffable, incomprehensible operation of heavenly power, converted into the essence of the Lord's body, while the appearance and certain other qualities of the same realities remain behind, in order that men should be spared the shock of perceiving raw and bloody things, and that believers should receive the fuller rewards of faith. Yet at the same time the same body of the Lord is in heaven, inviolate, entire, without contamination or injury." The doctrine was proclaimed as an essential dogma of the Church by the Lateran Council of 1215, and the Council of Trent in 1560 added that every particle of the consecrated wafer, no matter how broken, 
contains the whole body, blood, and soul of Jesus Christ. Thus, one of the oldest ceremonies of primitive religion, the eating of the God, is widely practiced and revered in European and American civilization today. By making matrimony a sacrament, a sacred vow, the Church immensely raised the dignity and permanence of the marriage bond. In the sacrament of holy orders, the bishop conferred upon the new priest some of the spiritual powers inherited from the apostles and presumably given to these by God himself in the person of Christ. And in the final sacrament, extreme unction, the priest heard the confession of the dying Christian, gave him the absolution that saved him from hell, and anointed his members so that they might be cleansed of sin and fit for resurrection before his judge. His survivors gave him Christian burial instead of pagan cremation, because the church held that the body too would rise from the dead. They wrapped him in his shroud, placed a coin in his coffin as if for Karen's ferriage, and bore him to his grave with solemn and costly ceremony. Mourners might be hired to weep and wail, the relatives put on black garments for a year, and no one could tell from grief so long sustained that a contrite heart and a ministering priest had won for the departed of the pledge of paradise. 3. Prayer In every great religion, ritual is as necessary as creed. It instructs, nourishes, and often begets belief. It brings the believer into comforting contact with his God. It charms the senses and the soul with drama, poetry, and art. It binds individuals into fellowship and a community by persuading them to share in the same rites, the same songs, the same prayers, at last the same thoughts. The oldest Christian prayers were the Pater Noster and the Credo. Toward the end of the twelfth century, the tender and intimate Ave Maria began to take form. And there were poetic litanies of praise and supplication. Some medieval prayers verged on magic incantations to elicit miracles. Some ran to an importunate iteration that desperately overruled Christ's span on vain repetitions. Monks and nuns, and later the laity, from an oriental custom brought in by crusaders, gradually developed the rosary. As this was made popular by Dominican monks, so the Franciscans popularized the Via Crucis, or Way or Stations of the Cross, by which the worshiper recited prayers before each of fourteen pictures or tableaus, representing stages in the Passion of Christ. Priests, monks, nuns, and some laymen sang or recited the canonical hours, prayers, readings, psalms, and hymns formulated by Benedict and others, and gathered into a breviarium by Alcuin and Gregory the Seventh. Every day and night, at intervals of some three hours, and from a million chapels and hearths, these conspiring prayers besieged the sky. Pleasant must have been their music to homes within their hearing. Dulcis cantilena divini cultus, said Ordericus Vitalis, quae corda fidelium mitigat ac laetificat. Sweet is the song of the divine worship, which comforts the hearts of the faithful and makes them glad. The official prayers of the Church were often addressed to God the Father. A few appealed to the Holy Ghost, but the prayers of the people were addressed mostly to Jesus, Mary, and the saints. The Almighty was feared. He still carried in popular conception much of the severity that had come down from Yahweh. How could a simple sinner dare to take his prayer to so awful and distant a throne? Jesus was closer, but he too was God, and one hardly ventured to speak to him face to face after so thoroughly ignoring his beatitudes. It seemed wiser to lay one's prayer before a saint certified by canonization to be in heaven, and to beg his or her intercession with Christ. All the poetic and popular polytheism of antiquity rose from the never-dead past, and filled Christian worship with a heartening communion of spirits, a brotherly nearness of earth to heaven, redeeming the faith of its darker elements. Every nation, city, abbey, church, craft, soul, and crisis of life had its patron saint, as in pagan Rome it had had a god. England had St. George, France had St. Denis. St. Bartholomew was the protector of the tanners because he had been flayed alive. St. John was invoked by candlemakers because he had been plunged into a cauldron of burning oil. St. Christopher was the patron of porters because he had carried Christ on his shoulders. Mary Magdalene received the petitions of perfumers because she had poured aromatic oils upon the Savior's feet. For every emergency or ill, men had a friend in the skies. St. Sebastian and St. Roque were mighty in time of pestilence. St. Apollinia, whose jaw had been broken by the executioner, healed the toothache. St. Blaise cured sore throat. St. Cornet protected oxen. 
St. Gaul, chickens, St. Anthony, pigs. St. Medard was for France the saint most frequently solicited for rain. If he failed to pour his impatient worshippers now and then threw his statue into the water, perhaps as suggestive magic. The church arranged an ecclesiastical calendar in which every day celebrated a saint, but the year did not find room for the 25,000 saints that had been canonized by the 10th century. The calendar of saints was so familiar to the people that the almanac divided the agricultural year by their names. In France, the Feast of St. George was the day for sowing. In England, St. Valentine's Day marked the winter's end. On that happy day, birds, they said, coupled fervently in the woods, and youths put flowers on the window sills of the girls they loved. Many saints received canonization through the insistent worship of their memory by the people or the locality, sometimes against ecclesiastical resistance. Images of the saints were set up in churches and public squares, on buildings and roads, and received a spontaneous worship that scandalized some philosophers and iconoclasts. Bishop Claudius of Turin complained that many folk worship images of saints. They have not abandoned idols, but only changed their names. In this matter, at least, the will and the need of the people created the form of the cult. With so many saints, there had to be many relics, their bones, hair, clothing, and anything that they had used. Every altar was expected to cover one or more such sacred memorials. The Basilica of St. Peter boasted the bodies of Peter and Paul, which made Rome the chief goal of European pilgrimage. A church in St. Omer claimed to have bits of the true cross, of the lance that had pierced Christ, of his cradle and his tomb, of the manna that had rained from heaven, of Aaron's rod, of the altar on which St. Peter had said Mass, of the hair, cowl, hair shirt, and tonsure shavings, of Thomas a Becket, and of the original stone tablets, upon which the Ten Commandments had been traced by the very finger of God. The Cathedral of Amiens enshrined the head of St. John the Baptist in a silver cup. The Abbey of Saint-Denis housed the crown of thorns and the body of Dionysius the Areopagite. Each of three scattered churches in France professed to have a complete corpse of Mary Magdalene, and five churches in France vowed that they held the one authentic relic of Christ's circumcision. Exeter Cathedral showed parts of the candle that the angel of the Lord used to light the tomb of Jesus, and fragments of the bush from which God spoke to Moses. Westminster Abbey had some of Christ's blood and a piece of marble bearing the imprint of his foot. A monastery at Durham displayed one of St. Lawrence's joints, the coals that had burned him, the charger on which the head of the Baptist had been presented to Herod, the virgin's shirt, and a rock marked with drops of her milk. The churches of Constantinople before 1204 were especially rich in relics. They had the lance that had pierced Christ and was still red with his blood, the rod that had scourged him, many pieces of the true cross enshrined in gold, the sop of bread given to Judas at the Last Supper, some hairs of the Lord's beard, the left arm of John the Baptist. In the sack of Constantinople many of these relics were stolen, some were bought, and some were peddled in the West from church to church to find the highest bidder. All relics were credited with supernatural powers, and a hundred thousand tales were told of their miracles. Men and women eagerly sought even the slightest relic, or relic of a relic, to wear as a magic talisman, a thread from a saint's robe, some dust from a reliquary, a drop of oil from a sanctuary lamp in the shrine. Monasteries vied and disputed with one another in gathering relics and exhibiting them to generous worshippers, for the possession of famous relics made the fortune of an abbey or a church. The translation of the bones of Thomas a Becket to a new chapel in the Cathedral of Canterbury in 1220 drew from the attending worshippers a collection valued at three hundred thousand dollars today. So profitable a business enlisted many practitioners. Thousands of spurious relics were sold to churches and individuals, and monasteries were tempted to discover new relics when in need of funds. The culmination of abuse was the dismemberment of dead saints so that several places might enjoy their patronage and power. It is to the credit of the secular clergy and of most monasteries that, while fully accepting the miraculous efficacy of genuine saintly relics, they discountenanced and often denounced the excesses of this popular fetishism. Some monks, seeking privacy for their devotions, resented the miracles wrought by their relics. At Gramont, the abbot appealed to the remains of St. Stephen to stop his wonder-working, which was luring noisy crowds. Otherwise, he threatened, we will throw your bones into the river. It was the people, not the church, that took the lead in creating or swelling the legends of relic miracles, and the church in many cases warned the public to discredit the tales. In 386, an imperial decree, presumably requested by the church, forbade the carrying about or sale of the remains of martyrs. St. Augustine complained of hypocrites in the garb of monks, 
who trade in members of martyrs, if martyrs they be. And Justinian repeated the edict of 386. About 1119, Abbot Guibert of Nogent wrote a treatise on the relics of saints, calling a halt to the relic craze. Many of the relics, he says, are of saints celebrated in worthless records. Some abbots, enticed by the multitude of gifts brought in, suffered the fabrication of false miracles. Old wives and herds of base wenches chant the lying legends of patron saints at their looms, and if a man refute their words, they will attack him with their distaffs. The clergy, he notes, have rarely the heart or courage to protest, and he confesses that he too held his peace when relic mongers offered to eager believers some of that very bread which our Lord pressed with his own teeth. For I should rightly be condemned for a madman if I should dispute with madmen. He observes that several churches have complete heads of St. John the Baptist, and marvels at the hydra heads of that undecapitable saint. Pope Alexander III, in 1179, forbade monasteries to carry their relics about, seeking contributions. The Lateran Council of 1215 prohibited the display of relics outside their shrines. And the Second Council of Lyon in 1274 condemned the debasement of relics and images. In general, the Church did not so much encourage superstitions as inherit them from the imagination of the people or the traditions of the Mediterranean world. The belief in miracle-working objects, talismans, amulets, and formulas was as dear to Islam as to Christianity, and both religions had received these beliefs from pagan antiquity. Ancient forms of phallic worship lingered far into the Middle Ages, but were gradually abolished by the Church. The worship of God as Lord of hosts and King of kings inherited Semitic and Roman ways of approach, veneration, and address. The incense burnt before altar or clergy recalled the old burnt offerings. Aspersion with holy water was an ancient form of exorcism. Processions and lustrations continued immemorial rites. The vestments of the clergy and the papal title of Pontifex Maximus were legacies from pagan Rome. The Church found that rural converts still revered certain springs, wells, trees, and stones. She thought it wiser to bless these to Christian use than to break too sharply the customs of sentiment. So a dolmen at Pluare was consecrated as the chapel of the seven saints, and the worship of the oak was sterilized by hanging images of Christian saints upon the trees. Pagan festivals dear to the people, or necessary as cathartic moratoriums on morality, reappeared as Christian feasts, and pagan vegetation rites were transformed into Christian liturgy. The people continued to light midsummer fires on St. John's Eve, and the celebration of Christ's resurrection took the pagan name of Eoster, the old Teutonic goddess of the spring. The Christian calendar of the saints replaced the Roman Fasti. Ancient divinities dear to the people were allowed to revive under the names of Christian saints. The Dea Victoria of the Bas Alp became Saint Victoire, and Castor and Pollux were reborn as Saints Cosmas and Damien. The finest triumph of this tolerant spirit of adaptation was the sublimation of the pagan mother goddess cults in the worship of Mary. Here, too, the people took the initiative. In 431, Cyril, Archbishop of Alexandria, in a famous sermon at Ephesus, applied to Mary many of the terms fondly ascribed by the pagans of Ephesus to their great goddess Artemis Diana. And the Council of Ephesus in that year, over the protests of Nestorius, sanctioned for Mary the title Mother of God. Gradually the tenderest features of Astarte, Sibylle, Artemis, Diana, and Isis were gathered together in the worship of Mary. In the sixth century the Church established the Feast of the Assumption of the Virgin into Heaven, and assigned it to August 13th, the date of ancient festivals of Isis and Artemis. Mary became the patron saint of Constantinople and the imperial family. Her picture was carried at the head of every great procession, and was, and is, hung in every church and home in Greek Christendom. Probably it was the Crusades that brought from the East to the West a more intimate and colorful worship of the Virgin. The Church herself did not encourage Mariolatry. The, the Fathers had recommended Mary as an antidote to Eve, but their general hostility to woman as the weaker vessel, and the source of most temptations to sin, the timid flight of monks from women, the tirades of preachers against the charms and foibles of the sex, these could hardly have led to the intense and ecumenical adoration of Mary. It was the people who created the fairest flower of the medieval spirit and made Mary the most beloved figure in history. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued. 
circus at one side too. It was the people who created the fairest flower of the medieval spirit and made Mary the most beloved figure in history. The population of a recovering Europe could no longer accept the stern picture of a god damning the majority of his creatures to hell, and of their own accord the people softened the terrors of the theologians with the pity of the mother of Christ. They would approach Jesus, still too sublime and just, through her who refused no one, and whom her son could not refuse. A youth, says Caesarius of Heisterbach, in 1230, was persuaded by Satan on the promise of great wealth to deny Christ, but could not be induced to deny Mary. When he repented, the virgin persuaded Christ to forgive him. The same monk tells of a Cistercian lay brother who was heard to pray to Christ, Lord, if thou free me not from this temptation, I will complain of thee to thy mother. Men prayed so much to the virgin that popular fancy pictured Jesus as jealous. To one who had deluged heaven with Ave Marias, he appeared, says a pretty legend, and gently reproached him. My mother thanks you very much for all the salutations you make to her, but still you should not forget to salute me too. Just as the sternness of Yahweh had necessitated Christ, so the justice of Christ needed Mary's mercy to temper it. In effect, the mother, the oldest figure in religious worship, became, as Mohammed had prophetically misconceived her, the third person of a new trinity. Everyone joined in her love and praise. Rebels like Abelard bowed to her, satirists like Rutbeuf, roistering skeptics like the wandering scholars, never ventured one irreverent word about her. Knights vowed themselves to her service, and cities gave her their keys. The rising bourgeoisie saw in her the sanctifying symbol of motherhood and the family. The rough men of the guilds, even the blaspheming heroes of barracks and battlefields, vied with peasant maidens and bereaved mothers in bringing their prayers and gifts to her feet. The most passionate poetry of the Middle Ages was the litany that in mounting fervor proclaimed her glory and besought her aid. Images of her rose everywhere, even at street corners, at crossroads, and in the fields. Finally, in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries, in the noblest birth of religious feeling in history, the poor and the rich, the humble and the great, the clergy and the laity, the artists and the artisans, devoted their savings and their skills to honor her in a thousand cathedrals nearly all dedicated to her name, or having as their chief splendor some lady chapel set aside as her shrine. A new religion had been created, and perhaps Catholicism survived by absorbing it. A gospel of Mary took form, uncanonical, incredible, and indescribably charming. The people begot the legends, the monks wrote them down. So the golden legend told how a widow surrendered her only son to her country's call. The youth was captured by the enemy. The widow prayed daily to the virgin to redeem and restore her son. When many weeks passed without response, the woman stole the sculptured child from the virgin's arms and hid him in her home, whereupon the virgin opened the prison, released the youth, and bade him, Tell your mother, my child, to return me my son, now that I have returned hers. About 1230 a French prior, Gautier de Quincy, gathered the merry legends into a, a tremendous poem of thirty thousand lines. Therein we find the virgin curing a sick monk by having him suck milk from her douce mamelle. A robber, who always prayed to her before embarking on his thefts, was caught and hanged, but was supported by her unseen hands until, her protection of him being perceived, he was released. And a nun who left her convent to lead a life of sin returned years later in broken repentance and found that the virgin, to whom she had never omitted a daily prayer, had all the time filled her place as sacristan, so that none had noted her absence. The church could not approve of all these stories, but she made great festivals of the events in Mary's life, the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Purification, or Candlemas, the Assumption, and finally, yielding to the appeals of generations of the laity and of Franciscan monks, she allowed the faithful to believe, and in 1854 bade them believe, in the Immaculate Conception that Mary had been conceived free of that taint of original sin which, in the Christian theology, lay upon every child born of man and woman since Adam and Eve. The worship of Mary transformed Catholicism from a religion of terror, perhaps necessary in the Dark Ages, into a religion of mercy and love. Half the beauty of Catholic worship, much of the splendor of Catholic art and song, are the creation of this gallant faith in the devotion and gentleness, even the physical loveliness and grace, of woman. The daughters of Eve have entered the temple and have transformed its spirit, partly because of that new Catholicism, 
feudalism was chastened into chivalry, and the status of woman was moderately raised in a man-made world. Because of it, medieval and Renaissance sculpture and painting gave to art a depth and tenderness rarely known to the Greeks. One can forgive much to a religion and an age that created Mary and her cathedrals. 4. Ritual In art and hymns and liturgy, the Church wisely made place for the worship of the Virgin. But in the older elements of her practice and ritual, she insisted on the sterner and more solemn aspects of the faith. Following ancient customs, and perhaps for reasons of health, she prescribed periodical fasts. All Fridays were to be meatless. Throughout the forty days of Lent, no meat, eggs, or cheese might be eaten, and the fast was not to be broken till the hour of noon, or 3 p.m. Furthermore, there were to be in that period no weddings, no rejoicing, no hunting, no trials in court, no sexual intercourse. These were counsels of perfection, seldom fully observed or enforced, but they helped to strengthen the will and to tame the excessive appetites of an omnivorous and carnal population. The liturgy of the Church was another ancient inheritance, remolded into lofty and moving forms of religious drama, music, and, and art. The Psalms of the Old Testament, the prayers and homilies of the Jerusalem Temple, readings from the New Testament, and the administration of the Eucharist constituted the earliest elements of the Christian service. The division of the Church into Eastern and Western resulted in divergent rites, and the inability of the early popes to extend their full authority beyond central Italy resulted in a diversity of ceremony even in the Latin Church. A ritual established at Milan spread to Spain, Gaul, Ireland, and North Britain, and was not overcome by the Roman form till 664. Pope Hadrian I, probably completing labors begun by Gregory I, reformed the liturgy in a sacramentary sent to Charlemagne toward the end of the 8th century. Guillaume Durand wrote the medieval classic on the Roman liturgy in his Rationale Divinorum Officiorum, or Rational Exposition of the Divine Offices, of 1286. We may judge its wide acceptance from the fact that it was the first book printed after the Bible. The center and summit of the Christian worship was the Mass. In the first four centuries, this ceremony was called the Eucharist, or Thanksgiving, and that sacramental commemoration of the Last Supper remained the essence of the service. Around it there gathered in the course of twelve centuries a complicated succession of prayers and songs, varying with the day and season of the year and the purpose of the individual Mass, and inscribed for the convenience of the priest in the Missal, or Book of the Mass. In the Greek rite, and sometimes in the Latin, the two sexes were separated in the congregation. There were no chairs, all stood, or, at the most solemn moments, knelt. Exceptions were made for old or weak people, and for monks or canons who had to stand through long services, little ledges were built into the choir stalls to support the base of the spine. These misericordiae, or mercies, became a favorite recipient of the woodcarver's skill. The officiating priest entered in a toga covered by alb, chasuble, maniple, and stole, colorful garments bearing symbolical decorations. The most prominent symbols were usually the letters IHS, that is, Iesos Huios Soter, Jesus, Son of God, Savior. The Mass itself was begun at the foot of the altar with the humble introit, I shall go into the altar of God, to which the acolyte added, To God who giveth joy to my youth. The priest ascended the altar, and kissed it as the sacred repository of saintly relics. He intoned the Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy upon us, a Greek survival in the Latin Mass, and recited the Gloria, glory to the God in the highest, and the Credo. He consecrated little wafers of bread and a chalice of wine into the body and blood of Christ, with the words, Hoc est corpus meum, and Hic est sanguinis meus, and offered these transubstantiated elements, namely his son, as a propitiatory sacrifice to God in commemoration of the sacrifice on the cross, and in lieu of the ancient sacrifice of living things. Turning to the worshippers, he bade them lift up their hearts to God, sursum corda, to which the acolyte, representing the congregation, answered, Habemus ad dominum, we hold them up to the Lord. The priest then recited the triple sanctus, the anus dei, and the paternoster. Himself partook of the consecrated bread and wine, and administered the Eucharist to communicants. After some additional prayers, he pronounced the closing formula, ite misa est, depart, it is dismissal, from which the mass, or misa, probably derived its name. In late forms there still followed a blessing of the congregation by the priest, 
and another gospel reading, usually the Neoplatonic exordium of the Gospel of St. John. Normally there was no sermon except when a bishop officiated, or when, after the twelfth century, a friar came to preach. At first all masses were sung, and the congregation joined in the singing. From the fourth century onward the vocal participation of the worshippers declined, and canonical choristers provided the musical response to the celebrant's chant. The hymns sung in the various services of the church are among the most moving products of medieval sentiment and art. The known history of the Latin hymn begins with Bishop Hilary of Poitiers, who died in 367. Returning to Gaul from exile in Syria, he brought home some Greco-Oriental hymns, translated them into Latin, and composed some of his own. All of these are lost. Ambrose at Milan made a new beginning. Eighteen survive of his sonorous hymns, whose restrained fervor so affected Augustine. The noble hymn of faith and thanksgiving, Te Deum Laudamus, formerly ascribed to Ambrose, was probably written by the Romanian bishop Nicetus of Remisiana toward the end of the fourth century. In later centuries the Latin hymns may have assumed a new delicacy of feeling and form under the influence of Moslem and Provençal love poetry. Some of the hymns, like some Arabic poems, verged on jingling doggerel, tipsy with excess of rhyme. But the better hymns of the medieval flowering, the twelfth and thirteenth centuries, developed a subtle turn of compact phrase, a melodiousness of frequent rhyme, a grace and tenderness of thought that ranked them with the greatest lyrics in literature. To the famous monastery of St. Victor, outside of Paris, there came about 1130 a Breton youth known to us only as Adam of St. Victor. He lived there in quiet content his remaining sixty years, imbibed the spirit of the famous mystics Hugo and Richard, and expressed it humbly, beautifully, and powerfully in hymns mostly designed as sequences for the Mass. A century after him, a Franciscan monk, Jacopone da Todi, who lived possibly from 1228 to 1306, composed the supreme medieval lyric, the Stabat Mater. Jacopone was a successful lawyer in Todi, near Perugia. His wife was known for both goodness and loveliness. She was crushed to death by the fall of a platform at a festival. Jacopone became insane with grief, roamed the Umbrian roads as a wild vagrant crying out his sins and sorrows, smeared himself with tar and feathers and walked on all fours, joined the Franciscan tertiaries, and wrote the poem that sums up the tender piety of his time. The first verse in Latin reads, Stabat mater dolorosa, juxta crucem lacrimosa, dum pendebat filius, quius animam gementum, contristantem et dolentum, per transivit gladius. In translation, the entire poem reads, Stood the mother broken-hearted, all in tears before the cross, while her son hung dying, through her spirit heavy laden, mourning for him and in pain, pierced a sword of grief. Oh, how sad and deep afflicted was that mother, also blessed of the only son! Wailed she then and sore lamented, trembled when she saw the torture of her noble son. Who is he that would not sorrow if he saw our Saviour's mother in such agony? Who could help but share her sadness, seeing her, the loving mother, grieving with her son? Come, my mother, fount of loving, make me feel your fullest anguish, let me mourn with you. Let my heart be fired with ardor, loving Christ our God and Savior, let me please him so. Holy Mother, do this for me. Plant the blows of him so martyred deeply in my heart. Of your offspring sorely wounded, bearing ignominy for me, let me share the pains. Let me truly weep beside you, mourn with you the crucified all my living years. Standing by the cross together, would that I might e'er be with you, gladly bound in grief. Let me by the cross be guarded, saved by Christ's redeeming passion, cherished by His grace. When my body shall have perished, let my soul in heaven's glory see Him face to face. Only two poems rival this among medieval Christian hymns. One is the Pange Lingua, that St. Thomas Aquinas composed for the Corpus Christi feast. The other is the terrible Dies Irae, or Day of Wrath, written about 1250 by Thomas of Celano, and still sung in the Mass for the Dead. Here the horror of the Last Judgment inspires a poem as dark and perfect as any of Dante's tormented dreams. To the moving ritual of her prayers, hymns, and Mass, the Church added the imposing ceremonies and processions of religious festivals. 
In northern countries, the Feast of the Nativity took over the pleasant rites wherewith the pagan Teutons had celebrated the victory of the sun at the winter solstice over the advancing night. Hence the Yule logs that burned in German, North French, English, Scandinavian homes, and the Yule trees laden with gifts, and the merry feasting that tried strong stomachs till the twelfth night thereafter. There were countless other feasts or holy days, Epiphany, Circumcision, Palm Sunday, Easter, Ascension, Pentecost. Such days, and only in less degree all Sundays, were exciting events in the life of medieval man. For Easter he confessed such of his sins as he cared to remember, bathed, cut his beard or hair, dressed in his best and most uncomfortable clothes, received God in the Eucharist, and felt more profoundly than ever the momentous Christian drama of which he was made a part. In many towns, on the last three days of Holy Week, the events of the Passion were represented in the churches by a religious play, with dialogue and plain chant, and several other occasions of the ecclesiastical year were signalized with such mysteries. About 1240, Juliana, prioress of a convent near Liège, reported to her village priest that a supernatural vision had urged upon her the need of honoring with a solemn festival the body of Christ as transubstantiated in the Eucharist. In 1262, Pope Urban IV sanctioned such a celebration and entrusted to St. Thomas Aquinas the composition of an office for it, appropriate hymns and prayers. The philosopher acquitted himself wonderfully well in this assignment, and in 1311 the Feast of Corpus Christi was finally established and was celebrated on the first Thursday after Pentecost, with the most impressive procession of the Christian year. Such ceremonies drew immense crowds and glorified numerous participants. They opened the way to the medieval secular drama, and they helped the pageantry of the guilds, the tournaments and knightly initiations, and the coronation of kings to occupy with pious flurry and sublimating spectacle the occasional leisure of men not natively inclined to order and peace. The Church based her technique of moralization through faith not on arguments to reason, but on appeals to the senses through drama, music, painting, sculpture, architecture, fiction, and poetry, and it must be confessed that such appeals to universal sensibilities are more successful, for evil as well as for good, than challenges to the changeful and individualistic intellect. Through such appeals the Church created medieval art. The culminating pageants were at the goals of pilgrimage. Medieval men and women went on pilgrimage to fulfill a penance or a vow, or to seek a miraculous cure, or to earn an indulgence, and, doubtless like modern tourists, to see strange lands and sights, and find adventure on the way as a relief from the routine of a narrow life. At the end of the thirteenth century there were some ten thousand sanctioned goals of Christian pilgrimage. The bravest pilgrims fared to distant Palestine, sometimes barefoot or clothed only in a shirt, and usually armed with cross, staff, and purse all given by a priest. In 1054 Bishop Liedbert of Cambrai led three thousand pilgrims to Jerusalem. In 1064 the archbishops of Cologne and Mainz and the bishops of Speyer, Bamberg, and Utrecht started for Jerusalem with ten thousand Christians in their wake. Three thousand of them perished on the way. Only two thousand returned safely to their native lands. Other pilgrims crossed the Pyrenees or risked themselves on the Atlantic to visit the reputed bones of the Apostle James at Compostela in Spain. In England, pilgrims sought the tomb of St. Cuthbert at Durham, the grave of Edward the Confessor in Westminster, or that of St. Edmund at Bury. The church supposedly founded by Joseph of Arimathea at Glastonbury, and above all, the shrine of Thomas a Becket at Canterbury. France drew pilgrims to St. Martin's at Tours, to Notre Dame at Chartres, Notre Dame at Le puy en velay Italy had the church and bones of St. Francis at Assisi, and the Santa Casa or Holy House at Loreto, which the pious believed to be the very dwelling in which Mary had lived with Jesus at Nazareth. When the Turks drove the last crusader from Palestine, this cottage was carried by angels through the air and deposited in Dalmatia in 1291, then flown across the Adriatic to the Ancona Woods, or Lauretum, from which the honored village took its name. Finally, all the roads of Christendom led pilgrims to Rome, to see the tombs of Peter and Paul, to earn indulgences by visiting the stations or famous churches of the city, or to celebrate some jubilee or joyous anniversary in Christian history. In 1299, Pope Boniface VIII declared a jubilee for 1300 and offered a plenary indulgence to those who should come and worship in St. Peter's in that year. 
It was estimated that on no day in those twelve months had Rome less than two hundred thousand strangers within her gates, and a total of two million visitors, each with a modest offering, deposited such treasure before St. Peter's tomb that two priests, with rakes in their hands, were kept busy night and day collecting the coins. Guidebooks taught the pilgrims by what roads to travel and what points to visit at their goal or on the way. We may weakly imagine the exaltation of the tired and dusty pilgrims when at last they sighted the Eternal City and burst into the pilgrims' chorus of joy and praise. O noble Rome, of all this world the queen, of all the cities the most excellent, O ruby red with martyrs' rosy blood, yet white with lilies pure of virgin maids, we give thee salutation through all years, we bless thee through all generations' hail. To these varied religious services the church added social services. She taught the dignity of labor and practiced it through the agriculture and industry of her monks. She sanctified the organization of labor in the guilds and organized religious guilds to perform works of charity. Every church was a sanctuary with right of asylum in which hunted men might find some breathless refuge till the passions of their pursuers could yield to the processes of law. To drag men from such a sanctuary was a sacrilege entailing excommunication. The church or cathedral was the social as well as the religious center of the town or village. Sometimes the sacred precinct, or even the church itself, was used, with genial clerical consent, to store grain or hay or wine, to grind corn or brew beer. There most of the villagers had been baptized, there most of them would be buried. There the older folk would gather of a Sunday for gossip or discussion, and the young men and women to see and be seen. There the beggars assembled, and the alms of the church were dispensed. There nearly all the art that the village knew was brought together to beautify the house of God, and the poverty of a thousand homes was brightened by the glory of that temple which the people had built with their coins and hands, and which they considered their own, their collective and spiritual home. In the church belfry the bells rang the hours of the day or the call to services and prayer, and the music of those bells was sweeter than any other except the hymns that bound voices and hearts into one, or warmed a cooling faith with the canticles of the Mass. From Novgorod to Cadiz, from Jerusalem to the Hebrides, steeples and spires raised themselves precariously into the sky, because men cannot live without hope, and will not consent to die. 5. Canon Law Side by side with this complex and colorful liturgy, there developed the even more complex body of ecclesiastical legislation that regulated the conduct and decisions of a church governing a wider and more varied realm than any empire of the time. Canon law, the law of the rule of the church, was a slow accretion of old religious customs, scriptural passages, opinions of the fathers, laws of Rome or the barbarians, the decrees of church councils, and the decisions and opinions of the popes. Some parts of the Justinian Code were adapted to govern the conduct of the clergy. Other parts were recast to accord with the views of the church on marriage, divorce, and wills. Collections of ecclesiastical legislation were made in the 6th and 8th centuries in the West, and periodically by Byzantine emperors in the East. The laws of the Roman Church received their definitive medieval formulation by Gratian, about 1140. As a monk of Bologna, Gratian may have studied under Inerius in the university there. Certainly his digest shows a wide acquaintance with both Roman law and medieval philosophy. He called his book Concordia Discordantium Canunum, Reconciliation of Discordant Regulations. Later generations called it his Decretum. It drew into order and sequence the laws and customs, the conciliar and papal decrees of the Church down to 1139, on her doctrine, ritual, organization, and administration, the maintenance of ecclesiastical property, the procedure and precedence of ecclesiastical courts, the regulation of monastic life, the contract of marriage, and the rules of bequest. The method of exposition may have stemmed from Abelard's Sic et Non, and had in turn some influence on scholastic method after Gratian. It began with an authoritative proposition, quoted statements or precedents contradicting it, sought to resolve the contradiction, and added a commentary. Though the book was not accepted by the medieval church as a final authority, it became, for the period it covered, the indispensable and almost sacred text. Gregory the Ninth in 1234, Boniface the Eighth in 1294, and Clement V in 1313 added supplements. These and some minor editions were published with Gratian's Concordia in 1582 as Corpus Juris Canonici, a body of canonical, 
church regulating law comparable with the Corpus Juris Civilis of Justinian. Indeed, the field covered by canon law was larger than that covered by any contemporary civil code. It embraced not merely the structure, dogmas, and operation of the church, but rules for dealing with non-Christians in Christian lands, procedure in the investigation and suppression of heresy, the organization of crusades, the laws of marriage, legitimacy, dower, adultery, divorce, wills, burial, widows, and orphans, laws of oath, perjury, sacrilege, blasphemy, simony, libel, usury, and just price, regulations for schools and universities, the truce of God and other means of limiting war and organizing peace, the conduct of episcopal and papal courts, the use of excommunication, anathema, and interdict, the administration of ecclesiastical penalties, the relations between civil and ecclesiastical courts, between state and church. This vast body of legislation was held by the church to be binding on all Christians, and she reserved the right to punish any infraction of it with a variety of physical or spiritual penalties, except that no ecclesiastical court was to pronounce a judgment of blood that is condemned to capital punishment. Usually before the Inquisition, the church relied on spiritual terrors. Minor excommunication excluded a Christian from the sacraments and ritual of the church. Any priest could pronounce this penalty, and to believers it meant everlasting hell if death should reach the offender before absolution came. A major excommunication, the only kind now used by the church, could be pronounced only by councils or by prelates higher than a priest, and only upon persons within their jurisdiction. It removed the victim from all legal or spiritual association with the Christian community. He could not sue or inherit or do any valid act in law, but he could be sued, and no Christian was to eat or talk with him on pain of minor excommunication. When King Robert of France was excommunicated in 998 for marrying his cousin, he was abandoned by all his courtiers and nearly all his servants. Two domestics who remained threw into the fire the victuals left by him at his meals, lest they be contaminated by them. In extreme cases, the church added to excommunication anathema, a curse armed and detailed with all the careful pleonasm of legal phraseology. As a last resort, the Pope could lay an interdict upon any part of Christendom, that is, suspend all or most religious services. A people feeling the need of the sacraments, and fearful of death supervening upon unforgiven sins, sooner or later compelled the excommunicated individual to make his peace with the Church. Such interdicts were laid upon France in 998, Germany in 1102, England in 1208, Rome itself in 1155. The excessive use of excommunication and interdict weakened their effectiveness after the 11th century. Popes employed interdict now and then for political purposes, as when Innocent II threatened Pisa with interdict if it did not join the Tuscan League. Wholesale excommunications, for example, for false returns of tithes due the Church, were so numerous that large sections of the Christian community were outlawed at once or without knowing it and many who knew it ignored the curse or laughed it off. Milan, Bologna, and Florence thrice received wholesale excommunications in the 13th and 14th centuries. Milan ignored the third edict for twenty-two years. Said Bishop Guillaume Le Maire in 1311, I have sometimes seen with my own eyes three or four hundred excommunicates in a single parish, and even seven hundred who despised the power of the keys and uttered blasphemous and scandalous words against the church and her ministers. Philip Augustus and Philip the Fair paid little attention to the decrees that excommunicated them. Such occasional indifference marked the beginning of a decline in the authority of canon law over the laity of Europe. As the Church had taken so wide an area of human life under her rule when, in the first Christian millennium, secular powers had broken down, so in the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries, as secular government grew stronger, one phase after another of human affairs was recaptured by civil from canon law. The Church properly won in the matter of ecclesiastical appointments. In most other fields her authority began to decline, in education, marriage, morals, economy, and war. The states that had grown up under the protection and by the permission of the social order that she had created declared themselves of age and began that long process of secularization which culminates today. But the work of the canonists, like most creative activity, was not lost. It prepared and trained the Church's greatest statesmen, it shared in transmitting Roman law to the modern world. It raised the legal rights of widows and children and established the principle of dower in the civil law of Western Europe. And it helped to shape the form and terms of scholastic philosophy. Canon law was among the major achievements of the medieval mind. 
6. The Clergy Medieval parlance divided all persons into two classes, those who lived under a religious rule and those who lived in the world. A monk was a religious, so was a nun. Some monks were also priests, and constituted the regular clergy, that is, clergy following a monastic rule or regula. All other clergy were called secular, as living in the world, or seculum. All ranks of clergy were distinguished by the tonsure, a shaven crown of the head, and wore a long robe, of any single color but red or green, buttoned from head to foot. The term clergy included not only those in minor orders, that is, church doorkeepers, readers, exorcists, and acolytes, but all university students, all teachers, and all who, having taken the tonsure as students, later became physicians, lawyers, artists, authors, or served as accountants or literary aides. Hence the later narrowing of the terms clerical and clerk. Clerics who had not taken major orders were allowed to marry, and to take up any respectable profession, and they were under no obligation to continue the tonsure. The three major or holy orders, subdeacon, deacon, priest, were irrevocable and generally closed the door to marriage after the eleventh century. Instances of marriage or concubinage in the Latin priesthood after Gregory the Seventh are recorded, but they become more and more exceptional. The parish priest had to content himself with spiritual joys. As the parish was normally coterminous with the manor or a village, he was usually appointed by the lord of the manor in collusion with the bishop. He was seldom a man of much schooling, for a university education was costly and books were rare. It was enough if he could read the breviary and the missal, administer the sacraments, and organize the parish for worship and charity. In many cases he was only a vicarius, a vicar or substitute, hired by a rector to do the religious work of the parish for a fourth of the revenues of the benefice. In this way one rector might hold four or five benefices while the parish priest lived in humble poverty, eking out his income with altar fees for baptisms, marriages, burials, and masses for the dead. Sometimes in the class war he sided with the poor, like John Ball. His morals could not compare with those of the modern priest, who has been put on his best behavior by religious competition, but by and large he did his work with patience, conscience, and kindliness. He visited the sick, comforted the bereaved, taught the young, mumbled his breviary, and brought some moral and civilizing leaven to a rough and lusty population. Many parish priests said their cruelest critic were the salt of the earth, no other body of men, said the free-thinking Lecky, have ever exhibited a more single-minded and unworldly zeal, refracted by no personal interests, sacrificing to duty the dearest of earthly objects, and confronting with dauntless heroism every form of hardship, of suffering, and of death. Priesthood and episcopate constituted the sacerdotium, or sacerdotal order. The bishop was a priest selected to coordinate several parishes and priests into one diocese. Originally and theoretically he was chosen by priests and people. Usually, before Gregory the Seventh, he was named by the baron or king. After 1215 he was elected by the cathedral chapter in cooperation with the pope. To his care were committed many secular as well as ecclesiastical affairs, and his episcopal court tried some civil cases as well as all those involving clergy of any rank. He had the power to appoint and depose priests, but his authority over the abbots and monasteries in his diocese diminished in this period, as the popes, fearing the power of the bishops, brought the monastic orders under direct papal control. His revenues came partly from his parishes, mostly from the estates attached to his see. Sometimes he gave more to a parish than he received from it. Candidates for a bishopric usually agreed to pay, at first to the king, later to the pope, a fee for their nomination and as secular rulers they sometimes yielded to the amiable weakness of appointing relatives to lucrative posts. Pope Alexander III complained that when God deprived bishops of sons, the devil gave them nephews. Many bishops lived in luxury as became feudal lords, but many were consumed in devotion to their spiritual and administrative tasks. After the reform of the episcopate by Leo IX, the bishops of Europe were, in mind and morals, the finest body of men in medieval history. Above the bishops of a province stood the archbishop or metropolitan. He alone could call or preside over a provincial council of the church. Some archbishops, by their character or their wealth, ruled nearly all the life of their provinces. In Germany, the archbishops of Hamburg, Bremen, Cologne, Trier, Mainz, Magdeburg, and Salzburg were powerful feudal lords who were in several instances chosen by the emperors to administer the empire or to serve as ambassadors or royal counselors. 
The archbishops of Reims, Rouen, and Canterbury played a similar role in France, Normandy, and England. Certain archbishops of Toledo, Lyon, Narbonne, Reims, Cologne, Canterbury were made primates and exercised a debated authority over all the ecclesiastics of their region. The bishops gathered in council constituted periodically a representative government for the church. In later centuries, these councils would lay claim to powers superior to those of the pope. But in this, the age of the greatest pontiffs, no one in Western Europe questioned the supreme ecclesiastical and spiritual authority of the bishop of Rome. The scandals of the tenth century had been atoned for by the virtues of Leo the Ninth and Hildebrand. Amid the oscillations and struggles of the twelfth century, the power of the papacy had grown until, in Innocent III, it claimed to overspread the earth. Kings and emperors held the stirrup and kissed the feet of the white-robed servant of the servants of God. The papacy was now the highest reach of human ambition. The finest minds of the time prepared themselves in rigorous schools of theology and law for a place in the hierarchy of the church, and those who rose to the top were men of intelligence and courage who were not appalled by the task of governing a continent. Their individual deaths hardly disturbed the pursuit of the policies formed by them and their councils. What Gregory the Seventh left unfinished, Innocent the Third completed, and Innocent the Fourth and Alexander the Fourth carried to a victorious end the struggle that Innocent the Third and Gregory the Ninth had fought against imperial encirclement of the papacy. In theory, the authority of the Pope was derived from his succession to the power conferred upon the apostles by Christ. In this sense, the government of the church was a theocracy, a government of the people through religion by the earthly vicars of God. In another sense, the church was a democracy. Every man in Christendom except the mentally or physically defective, the convicted criminal, the excommunicate, and the slave was eligible to the priesthood and the papacy. As in every system, the rich had superior opportunities to prepare themselves for the long hierarchical climb, but career was open to all, and talent, not ancestry, chiefly determined success. Hundreds of bishops and several popes came from the ranks of the poor. This flow of fresh blood into the hierarchy from every rank continually nourished the intelligence of the clergy and was for ages the only practical recognition of the equality of man. In 1059, as we have seen, the right to select the pope was confined to cardinal bishops stationed near Rome. These seven cardinals were gradually increased by papal appointment from various nations to a sacred college of seventy members, who were marked off by their red caps and purple robes, and constituted a new rank in the hierarchy, second only to the Pope himself. Aided by such men, and by a large staff of ecclesiastics and other officials constituting the papal curia, or executive and judicial court, the Pope governed a spiritual empire which in the thirteenth century was at the height of its curve. He alone could summon a general council of the bishops, and their legislation had no force except when confirmed by his decree. He was free to interpret, revise, and extend the canon law of the Church, and to grant dispensations from its rules. He was the final court of appeals from the decisions of episcopal courts. He alone could absolve from certain grave sins, or issue major indulgences, or canonize a saint. After 1059 all bishops had to swear obedience to him, and submit to supervision of their affairs by legates of the Pope. Islands like Sardinia and Sicily, nations like England, Hungary, and Spain, acknowledged him as their feudal lord and sent him tribute. Through bishops, priests, and monks, his eyes and hands could be on every part of his realm. These men constituted a service of intelligence and administration with which no state could compete. Gradually, subtly, the rule of Rome was restored over Europe by the astonishing power of the word. 7. The Papacy Supreme, 1085-1294 the conflict between church and state over lay investitures did not die with Gregory the Seventh and the apparent triumph of the empire. It continued for a generation through several pontificates and reached a compromise in the Concordat of Worms in 1122 between Pope Calixtus II and the Emperor Henry V. Henry surrendered to the church all investiture by ring and staff and agreed that elections of bishops and abbots shall be conducted canonically, that is, be made by the affected clergy or monks and shall be free from all interference and simony. Calixtus conceded that in Germany the elections of bishops or abbots holding lands from the crown should be held in the presence of the king, that in disputed elections the king might decide between the contenders after consulting with the bishops of the province, and that an abbot or bishop holding lands from the king should render to him all feudal obligations due from vassal to suzerain. Similar agreements had already been signed for England and France. 
Each side claimed the victory. The church had made substantial progress toward autonomy, but the feudal nexus continued to give the kings a predominant voice in the choice of bishops everywhere in Europe. In 1130, the College of Cardinals divided into factions. One chose Innocent II, the other Anacletus II. Anacletus, though of the noble family of the Pier Leone, had had a Jewish grandfather, a convert to Christianity. His opponents called him Judeo Pontifex, and St. Bernard, who on other occasions was friendly to the Jews, wrote to the Emperor Lothair II that, to the shame of Christ, a man of Jewish origin has come to occupy the chair of St. Peter, forgetting Peter's origin. The greater part of the clergy, and all but one of Europe's kings, upheld innocent. The populace of Europe amused itself with slanders charging Anacletus with incest and with plundering Christian churches to enrich his Jewish friends. But the people of Rome supported him till his death in 1138. It was probably the story of Anacletus that led to the 14th century legend of Andreas the Jewish Pope. Hadrian IV, from 1154 to 1159, exemplified again the ecclesiastical carrière ouverto talon. Born in England of lowly parentage, and coming as a beggar to a monastery, Nicholas Breakspear raised himself by pure ability to be abbot, cardinal, and pope. He bestowed Ireland upon Henry II of England, compelled Barbarossa to kiss his feet, and almost maneuvered the great emperor into conceding the right of the popes to dispose of royal thrones. When Hadrian died, a majority of cardinals chose Alexander III, from 1159 to 1181. A minority chose Victor IV. Barbarossa, thinking to restore the power once held by German emperors over the papacy, invited both men to lay their claims before him. Alexander refused, Victor agreed, and at the Synod of Pavia in 1160, Barbarossa recognized Victor as pope. Alexander excommunicated Frederick, released the emperor's subjects from civil obedience, and helped revolt in Lombardy. The victory of the Lombard League at Legnano in 1176 humbled Frederick. He made his peace with Alexander at Venice, and once more kissed papal feet. The same pontiff compelled Henry II of England to repair barefoot to the tomb of Becket, and there received discipline from the canons of Canterbury. It was Alexander's long struggle and complete victory that made straight the way for one of the greatest popes. Innocent III was born at Anagni, near Rome, in 1161. As Lotario dei Conti, son of the Count of Segni, he had all the advantages of aristocratic birth and cultured rearing. He studied philosophy and theology at Paris, canon and civil law at Bologna. Back in Rome, by his mastery of both diplomacy and doctrine, and his influential connections, he advanced rapidly on the ecclesiastical ladder. At thirty, he was a cardinal deacon. At thirty-seven, though still not a priest, he was unanimously chosen pope, this in 1198. He was ordained on one day and consecrated on the next. It was his good fortune that the emperor Henry VI, who had acquired control of South Italy and Sicily, had died in 1197, leaving the throne to the three-year-old Frederick II. Innocent seized the opportunity vigorously, deposed the German prefect in Rome, ousted the German feudatories from Spoleto and Perugia, received the submission of Tuscany, re-established the rule of the papacy in the papal states, was recognized by Henry's widow as overlord of the two Sicilies, and consented to be the guardian of her son. In ten months, Innocent had made himself master of Italy. He had, on the existing evidence, the best mind of his time. This book is continued on Cassette 2, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith. Part 3 by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 2, Side 1. He had, on the existing evidence, the best mind of his time. In his early thirties, he had written four works of theology. They were learned and eloquent, but they are lost in the glare of his political fame. His pronouncements as Pope were characterized by a clarity and logic of thought, a fitness and pungency of phrase that could have made him a brilliant Aquinas or an orthodox Abelard. Despite his small stature, he derived a commanding presence from his keen eyes and stern, dark face. He was not without humor. He sang well and composed poetry. He had a tender side and could be kindly, patient, and personally tolerant. But in doctrine and morals he allowed no deviation from the dogmas or ethics of the Church. The world of Christian faith and hope was the empire that he had been named to protect, and like any king he would guard his realm with the sword when the word did not suffice. 
born to riches, he lived in philosophic simplicity. In an age of universal venality, he remained incorruptible. At once, after his consecration, he forbade the officials of his curia to charge for their services. He liked to see the wealth of the world in rich Peter's see, but he administered the papal funds with a reasonably honest hand. He was a consummate diplomat, and moderately shared in the reluctant unmorality of that distinguished trade. As if eleven centuries had fallen away, he was a Roman emperor, stoic rather than Christian, and never doubting his right to rule the world. With so many strong popes in the fresh memory of Rome, it was natural that Innocent should base his policies upon a belief in the sanctity and high mission of his office. He carefully maintained the pomp and majesty of papal ceremony, and never stooped in public from imperial dignity. Sincerely believing himself the heir to the powers then generally conceded to have been given by the Son of God to the apostles and the church, he could hardly recognize any authority as equal to his own. The Lord left to Peter, he said, the government not only of all the church, but of the whole world. He did not claim supreme power in earthly or purely secular affairs, except in the papal states. But he insisted that where the spiritual conflicted with the secular power, the spiritual power should be held as superior to the secular as the sun is to the moon. He shared the ideal of Gregory the Seventh that all governments should accept a place in a world state of which the Pope should be the head, with paramount authority over all matters of justice, morality, and faith. And for a time he almost realized that dream. In 1204, through the conquest of Constantinople by the Crusaders, he achieved one part of his plans. The Greek church submitted to the Bishop of Rome, and Innocent could speak with joy of the seamless garment of Christ. He brought Serbia and even distant Armenia under the dominion of the Roman See. Gradually he secured control over ecclesiastical appointments and made the powerful episcopacy the organ and servant of the papacy. Through an astonishing succession of vital conflicts, he reduced the potentates of Europe to an unprecedented recognition of his sovereignty. His policies were least effective in Italy. He failed in repeated efforts to end the wars of the Italian city-states and in Rome his political enemies made life so unsafe for him that for a time he had to shun his capital. King Sverre of Norway, from 1184 to 1202, successfully resisted him despite excommunication and interdict. Philip II of France ignored his command to make peace with, with England, but yielded to the Pope's insistence that he take back his discarded wife. Alfonso IX of Leon was persuaded to put away Berengaria, whom he had married within the forbidden degrees of kinship. Portugal, Aragon, Hungary, and Bulgaria acknowledged themselves as feudal fiefs of the papacy and sent it tribute yearly. When King John rejected Innocent's appointment of Langton as Archbishop of Canterbury, the Pope drove him by interdict and shrewd diplomacy to add England to the list of papal fiefs. Innocent extended his power in Germany by supporting Otto IV against Philip of Swabia, then Philip against Otto, then Otto against Frederick II, then Frederick against Otto, in each case exacting concessions to the papacy as the price of his favor, and freeing the papal states from the threat of encirclement. He reminded the emperors that it was a pope who had translated the imperium, or imperial power, from the Greeks to the Franks, that Charlemagne had been made emperor only by papal anointment and coronation, and that what the popes had given they could take away. A Byzantine visitor to Rome described Innocent as the successor not of Peter, but of Constantine. He repelled all secular efforts to tax the Christian clergy without papal consent. He provided papal funds for necessitous priests, and labored to improve the education of the clergy. He raised the social status of the clergy by defining the church not as all Christian believers, but as all the Christian clergy. He condemned the episcopal or monastic absorption of parochial tithes at the expense of the parish priest. To reform monastic laxity, he ordered the regular surveillance and visitation of monasteries and convents. His legislation reduced to order the complex relations of clergy and laity, priest and bishop, bishop and pope. He developed the papal curia to an efficient court of counsel, administration, and judgment. It became now the most competent governing body of its time, and its methods and terminology helped to form the art and technique of diplomacy. Innocent himself was probably the best lawyer of the age capable of finding legal support in logic and precedent for every decision that he made. Lawyers and learned men frequented the consistory where he presided over the cardinals as a superior ecclesiastical court to profit from his discussions and decisions on points of civil or canon law. Some called him pater juris, father of the law. 
Others, in fond humor, called him Solomon III. In his final triumph as legislator and pope, he presided in 1215 over the Fourth Lateran Council, held in the Church of St. John's Lateran in Rome. To this Twelfth Ecumenical Council came 1,500 abbots, bishops, archbishops, and other prelates, and plenipotentiaries from all the important nations of a united Christendom. The Pope's opening address was a bold admission and challenge. The corruption of the people has its chief source in the clergy. From this arise the evils of Christendom. Faith perishes, religion is defaced, justice is trodden underfoot, heretics multiply, schismatics are emboldened, the faithless grow strong, the Saracens triumph. The assembled power and intellect of the Church here allowed itself to be completely dominated by one man. His judgments became the Council's decrees. It allowed him to redefine the basic dogmas of the Church. Now, for the first time, the doctrine of transubstantiation was officially defined. It accepted his decrees requiring that a distinctive badge be worn by non-Christians in Christian lands. It responded enthusiastically to his call for a war against the Albigensian heretics. But it also followed his lead in recognizing the shortcomings of the Church. It denounced the peddling of fraudulent relics. It severely censured the indiscreet and superfluous indulgences which some prelates are not afraid to grant, whereby the keys of the church are made contemptible, and the satisfaction of penance is deprived of its force. It attempted a far-reaching reform of monastic life. It denounced clerical drunkenness, immorality, and clandestine marriage, and passed vigorous measures against them. But it condemned the Albigensian claim that all sexual intercourse is sinful. In its attendance, scope, and effects, the Fourth Lateran Council was the most important assembly of the Church since the Council of Nicaea. From that apex of his career, Innocent declined rapidly to an early death. He had given himself so unremittingly to the administration and enlargement of his office that at fifty-five he was exhausted. I have no leisure, he mourned, to meditate on supermundane things. Scarce can I breathe. So much must I live for others that almost I am a stranger to myself. Perhaps in his last year he could look back upon his work and judge it more objectively than in the heat of strife. The crusades that he had organized for the reconquest of Palestine had failed. The one that would succeed after his death was the ferocious extermination of the Albigensians in southern France. He had won the admiration of his contemporaries, but not, like Gregory I or Leo IX, their affection. Some churchmen complained that he was too much the king, too little the priest. St. Lutgardus thought he could only by a narrow margin escape hell. And the Church herself, though proud of his genius and grateful for his labors, withheld from him that canonization which she had conferred upon lesser and more scrupulous men. But we must not refuse him the credit of having brought the Church to her greatest height, and close to the realization of her dream of a moral world state. He was the ablest statesman of his age. He pursued his aims with vision, devotion, flexible persistence, and unbelievable energy. When he died in 1216, the Church had reached a height of organization, splendor, repute, and power which she had never known before, and would only rarely and briefly know again. Honorius III, from 1216 to 1227, does not rank high in the cruel annals of history, because he was too gentle to carry on with vigor the war between empire and papacy. Gregory IX, from 1227 to 1241, though eighty when made pope, waged that war with almost fanatical tenacity fought Frederick II so successfully as to postpone the Renaissance for a hundred years, and organized the Inquisition. Yet he too was a man of unquestionable sincerity and heroic devotion, who defended what seemed to him the most precious possession of mankind, its Christ-begotten faith. He could not have been a hard man who, as cardinal, had protected and wisely guided the possibly heretical Francis. Innocent IV, from 1243 to 1254, destroyed Frederick II, and sanctioned the use of torture by the Inquisition. He was a good patron of philosophy, aided the universities, and founded schools of law. Alexander IV, from 1254 to 1261, was a man of peace, kindly, merciful, and just, who astounded the world by his freedom from despotism. He deprecated the martial qualities of his predecessors, preferred piety to politics, and died of a broken heart, said a Franciscan chronicler, considering daily the terrible and increasing strife among Christians. Clement IV, from 1265 to 1268, returned to war, organized the defeat of Manfred, and ruined the Hohenstaufen dynasty and imperial Germany. The recapture of Constantinople by the Greeks threatened to end the accord between the Greek and the Roman Church. 
But Gregory X, from 1271 to 1276, earned the gratitude of Michael Paleologus by discountenancing the ambition of Charles of Anjou to conquer Byzantium. The restored Greek emperor submitted the Eastern Church to Rome, and the papacy was once again supreme. 8. The Finances of the Church A church that was actually a European superstate, dealing with the worship, morals, education, marriages, wars, crusades, deaths, and wills of the population of half a continent, sharing actively in the administration of secular affairs, and raising the most expensive structures in medieval history, could sustain its functions only through exploiting a hundred sources of revenue. The widest stream of income was the tithe. After Charlemagne, all secular lands in Latin Christendom were required by state law to pay a tenth of their gross income or produce, in kind or money, to the local church. After the tenth century, every parish had to remit a part of its tithes to the bishop of the diocese. Under the influence of feudal ideas, the tithes of a parish could be enfiefed, mortgaged, bequeathed, or sold like any other property or revenue, so that by the twelfth century a financial web had been woven in which the local church and its priest were rather the collectors than the consumers of its tithes. The priest was expected to curse for his tithes, as the English put it, to excommunicate those who shirked or falsified their returns, for men were as reluctant then to pay tithes to the church, whose functions they considered vital to their salvation, as men are now to pay taxes to the state. We hear of occasional revolts of the tithe-payers. In Regio Emilia, in 1280, says Fra Salimbene, the citizens, defying excommunication and interdict, promised one another that none should pledge the clergy any tithe, nor sit at meat with them, nor give them eat or drink. An excommunication in reverse, and the bishop was compelled to compromise. The basic revenue of the church was from her own lands. These she had received through gift or bequest, through purchase or defaulted mortgage, or through reclamation of waste lands by monastic or other ecclesiastic groups. In the feudal system, each owner or tenant was expected to leave something to the church at death. Those who did not were suspected of heresy and might be refused burial in consecrated ground. Since only a few of the laity could write, a priest was usually called in to draft the wills. Pope Alexander III decreed in 1170 that no one could make a valid will except in the presence of a priest. Any secular notary who drew up a will except under these conditions was to be excommunicated, and the Church had exclusive jurisdiction over the probate of wills. Gifts or legacies to the Church were held to be the most dependable means of telescoping the pains of purgatory. Many bequests to the Church, especially before the year 1000, began with the words Adventante Mundi Vespero, since the evening of the world is near. Some owners, as we have seen, gave their property to the church in precarium, as disability insurance. The church provided an annuity and care in sickness and old age to the donor, and received the property free of lien at his death. Some monasteries, by confraternities, gave their benefactors a share in the merits or purgatorial deductions earned by the prayers and good works of the monks. Crusaders not only sold lands to the church at low prices to raise cash, but they received loans from church bodies on the security of pledged property, which was in many cases forfeited by default. Some persons, dying without natural heirs, left their whole estate to the church. The Countess Matilda of Tuscany tried to bequeath to the church almost a fourth of Italy. As the property of the church was inalienable, and before 1200 was normally free from secular taxation, it grew from century to century. It was not unusual for a cathedral, a monastery, or a nunnery to own several thousand manors, including a dozen towns or even a great city or two. The Bishop of Langres owned the whole county. The Abbey of St. Martin of Tours ruled over twenty thousand serfs. The Bishop of Bologna held two thousand manors. So did the Abbey of Lorge. The Abbey of Las Huelgas in Spain held sixty-four townships. In Castile, about twelve hundred, the church owned a quarter of the soil. In England, a fifth. In Germany, a third. In Livonia, one half. These, however, are loose and uncertain estimates. Such accumulations became the envy and target of the state. Charles Martel confiscated church property to finance his wars. Louis the Pious legislated against bequests that disinherited the children of the testator in favor of the church. Henry II of Germany stripped many monasteries of their lands, saying that monks were vowed to poverty, and several English statutes of Mortmain put restrictions on the deeding of property to corporations, meaning ecclesiastical bodies. Edward I levied from the English church in 1291 a tenth of its property, and in 1294 a half of its annual revenue. 
Philip II began, St. Louis continued, Philip IV established the taxation of ecclesiastical property in France. As industry and commerce developed and money multiplied and prices rose, the income of abbeys and bishoprics, derived largely from feudal dues once fixed at a low price level and now hard to raise, proved inadequate not only for luxury but even for maintenance. By 1270 the majority of French cathedrals and abbeys were heavily in debt. They had borrowed from the bankers at high interest rates to meet the exactions of the kings. Hence, in part, the decline of architectural activity in France at the end of the 13th century. The popes added to the impoverishment of bishoprics by taxing their property and revenues, first to finance the Crusades, later to pay the mounting expenses of the papal see. New sources of central income became necessary as the papacy widened the area and complexity of its functions. Innocent III, in 1199, directed all bishops to send to the See of Peter yearly a fortieth of their revenue. A cent, or tax, was levied upon all monasteries, convents, and churches that came directly under papal protection. An annat, theoretically the whole, actually half, the first year's revenue of a newly elected bishop, was required by the popes as a fee for confirming his appointment, and large sums were expected from recipients of the archiepiscopal pallium. All Christian households were asked to send an annual penny, some ninety cents, to the Roman see as Peter's pence. Normally fees were charged for litigation brought to the papal court. The popes claimed the power to dispense in certain cases from canon law, as in permitting consanguineous marriage where some good political end seemed to justify the deviation, and fees were charged for legal processes involved in such dispensations. Considerable sums came to the popes from the recipients of papal indulgences and from pilgrims to Rome. It has been calculated that the total income of the papal see about 1250 was greater than the combined revenues of all the secular sovereigns of Europe. From England in 1252 the papacy received a sum thrice the revenue of the crown. The wealth of the church, however proportionate to the extent of its functions, was the chief source of heresy in this age. Arnold of Brescia, proclaimed that any priest or monk who died possessing property would surely go to hell. The Bogomiles, the Waldenses, the Paterines, the Catheri made headway by denouncing the wealth of the followers of Christ. A favorite satire in the 13th century was the Gospel According to Marks of Silver, which began, In those days the Pope said to the Romans, When the Son of Man shall come to the seat of our majesty, say first of all, Friend, wherefore art thou come hither? and if he give you naught, cast him forth into outer darkness. Throughout the literature of the time, in the Fabliaux, the Chanson de Geste, the Roman de la Rose, the poems of the wandering scholars, the troubadours, Dante, even in the monastic chroniclers, we find complaints of ecclesiastical avarice or wealth. Matthew Paris, an English monk, denounced the venality of English and Roman prelates living daintily on the patrimony of Christ. Hubert de Romand, head of the Dominican order, wrote of pardoners corrupting with bribes the prelates of the ecclesiastical courts. Petrus Cantor, a priest, told of priests who sold masses or vespers. Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, declaimed against the papal chancery as bought and sold, and quoted Henry II as boasting that he had the whole college of cardinals in his pay. Charges of corruption have been made against every government in history. They are nearly always partly true, and partly exaggerated from startling instances, but at times they rise to a revolutionary resentment. The same parishioners who built cathedrals to marry with their pennies could protest angrily against the collective propensities of the church, and occasionally they murdered a pertinacious priest. The church herself joined in this criticism of clerical money-grubbing and made many efforts to control the acquisitiveness and luxury of her personnel. Hundreds of clergymen from St. Peter Damien, St. Bernard, St. Francis, and Cardinal de Vitry, down to simple monks, labored to mitigate these natural abuses. It is chiefly from the writings of such ecclesiastical reformers that our knowledge of the abuses is derived. A dozen monastic orders devoted themselves to preaching reform by their good example. Pope Alexander III and the Lateran Council of 1179 condemned the exaction of fees for administering baptism or extreme unction, or performing a marriage, and Gregory X called the Ecumenical Council of Lyon in 1274 specifically to take measures for the reform of the Church. 
The popes themselves in this age showed no taste for luxury and earned their keep by arduous devotion to their exhausting tasks. It is the tragedy of things spiritual that they languish if unorganized and are contaminated by the material needs of their organization. Chapter 28 The Early Inquisition, 1000 to 1300 1. The Albigensian Heresy Anti-clericalism rose to a flood at the end of the twelfth century. There were, in the age of faith, recesses of religious mysticism and sentiment that escaped and resented organized sacerdotal Christianity. Moving perhaps with returning crusaders, new waves of oriental mysticism flowed into the West. From Persia, through Asia Minor and the Balkans, came echoes of Manichaean dualism and Mazdakian communism. From Islam, a hostility to images, an obscure fatalism, and distaste for priests. And from the failure of the Crusades, a secret doubt as to the divine origin and support of the Christian Church. The Paulicians, driven westward by Byzantine persecution, carried through the Balkans into Italy and Provence their scorn of images, sacraments, and the clergy. They divided the cosmos into a spiritual world created by God and a material world created by Satan, and they identified Satan with the Yahweh of the Old Testament. The Bogomiles, that is, friends of God, took form and name in Bulgaria and spread especially in Bosnia. They were attacked by fire and sword at various times in the 13th century, defended themselves tenaciously, and finally in 1463 surrendered not to Christianity, but to Islam. About the year 1000, a sect appeared in Toulouse and Orléans which denied the reality of miracles, the regenerative virtue of baptism, the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and the efficacy of prayers to the saints. They were ignored for a time, then condemned, and thirteen of their number were burned at the stake in 1023. Similar heresies developed and led to uprisings at Cambrai and Liège in 1025, in Gosler in 1052, Soissons in 1114, Cologne in 1146, etc. Berthold of Regensburg reckoned 150 heretical sects in the 13th century. Some were harmless groups who gathered to read the Bible to one another in the vernacular without a priest, and to put their own interpretation upon its disputed passages. Several, like the Humiliati in Italy, the Beguines and Begards in the Low Countries, were orthodox in everything except their embarrassing insistence that priests should live in poverty. The Franciscan movement arose as such a sect and narrowly escaped being classed as heretical. The Waldenses did not escape. About 1170, Peter Waldo, a rich merchant of Lyon, engaged some scholars to translate the Bible into the Long Doc of South France. He studied the translation zealously and concluded that Christians should live like the apostles, without individual property. He gave part of his wealth to his wife, distributed the remainder among the poor, and began to preach evangelical poverty. He gathered about him a small group, the poor men of Lyon, who dressed like monks, lived in chastity, went barefoot or in sandals, and pooled their earnings communistically. For a time the clergy made no objection and allowed them to read and sing in the churches. But when Peter thrust his sickle into another man's harvest in too literal fulfillment of the gospel, the Archbishop of Lyon sharply reminded him that only bishops were allowed to preach. Peter went to Rome in 1179 and asked Alexander III for a preaching license. It was granted on condition of consent and supervision by the local clergy. Peter resumed his preaching, apparently without such local consent. His followers became devotees of the Bible and learned large sections of it by heart. Gradually the movement took on an anti-sacerdotal tinge, rejected all priesthood, denied the validity of sacraments administered by a sinful priest, and attributed to every believer in a state of sanctity the power to forgive sins. Some members repudiated indulgences, purgatory, transubstantiation, and prayer to the saints. One group preached that all things should be in common. Another identified the church with the scarlet woman of the apocalypse. The sect was condemned in 1184. One part of it, the poor Catholics, was received into the church in 1206 by Innocent III. The majority persisted in heresy and spread through France into Spain and Germany. Probably to check their increase, a council of Toulouse in 1229 decreed that no lay folk should possess scriptural books except the Psalter and the Hours, which were chiefly Psalms. 
nor should they read these except in Latin, for no vernacular translation had yet been examined and guaranteed by the church. In the suppression of the Albigenses, thousands of Waldenses went to the stake. Peter himself died in Bohemia in 1217, apparently by a natural death. By the middle of the twelfth century, the towns of Western Europe were honeycombed with heretical sects. The cities, said a bishop in 1190, are filled with these false prophets. Milan alone had seventeen new religions. The leading heretics there were the Paterines, named apparently from Pateria, a poor quarter of the town. The movement seems to have begun as a protest against the rich. It was turned to anti-clericalism, denounced the simony, wealth, marriage, and concubinage of the clergy, and proposed, in the words of one leader, that the wealth of the clergy be impounded, their property put up at auction. If they resist, let their houses be given up to pillage, and let them and their bastards be hounded out of the city. Similar anti-clerical parties rose in Viterbo, Orvieto, Verona, Ferrara, Parma, Piacenza, Rimini. At times they dominated the popular assemblies, captured city governments, and taxed the clergy to pay for civic enterprises. Innocent III instructed his legate in Lombardy to exact an oath from all municipal officials that they would not appoint or admit heretics to office. In 1237, a Milanese mob, blaspheming and reviling, polluted several churches with unmentionable filth. The most powerful of the heretical sects was variously named Catheri, from the Greek for pure, Bulgari, from their Balkan provenance, whence the abusive term bugger, and Albigenses, from the French town of Albi, where they were especially numerous. Montpellier, Narbonne, and Marseille were the first French centers of the heresy, perhaps through contact with Moslems and Jews, and through frequentation by merchants from heretical centers in Bosnia, Bulgaria, and Italy. Merchants spread the movement to Toulouse, Orléans, Soissons, Arras, and Reims, but Languedoc and Provence remained its strongholds. There, French medieval civilization had reached its height. The great religions mingled in urbane amity. Women were imperiously beautiful. Morals were loose. Troubadours spread gay ideas. And as in Frederick's Italy, the Renaissance was ready to begin. Southern France was at that time, around 1200, composed of practically independent principalities, tenuously bound in theoretical allegiance to the King of France. In this region, the Counts of Toulouse were the greatest lords, possessing territories more extensive than those directly owned by the king. The doctrines and practices of the Catheri were in part a return to primitive Christian beliefs and ways, partly a vague memory of the Arian heresy that had prevailed in southern France under the Visigoths, partly a product of Manichaean and other Oriental ideas. They had a black-robed clergy of priests and bishops called perfecti, who at their ordination vowed to leave parents, mate, and children to devote themselves to God and the gospel, never to touch a woman, never to kill an animal, never to eat meat, eggs, or dairy food, nor anything but fish and vegetables. The believers, or credentes, were followers who promised to take these vows later. They were allowed, meanwhile, to eat meat and marry, but they were required to renounce the Catholic Church, to advance toward the perfect life, and to greet any of the perfecti with triple and reverent genuflection. The theology of the Catheri divided the cosmos Manichaeanly into good, God, spirit, heaven, and evil, Satan, matter, the material universe. Satan, not God, created the visible world. All matter was accounted evil, including the cross on which Christ died, and the consecrated host of the Eucharist. Christ spoke only figuratively when he said of the bread, This is my body. All flesh was matter, and all contact with it was impurity. All sexual congress was sinful. The sin of Adam and Eve was coitus. Opponents describe the Albigenses as rejecting the sacraments of the Mass, the veneration of images, the Trinity, and the virgin birth. Christ was an angel, but not one with God. They repudiated, we are told, the institution of private property and aspired to an equality of goods. They made the Sermon on the Mount the essence of their ethics. They were taught to love their enemies, to care for the sick and the poor, never to swear, always to keep the peace. Force was never moral, even against infidels. Capital punishment was a capital crime. One should quietly trust that in the end God would triumph over evil without using evil means. There was no hell or purgatory in this theology. Every soul would be saved, 
if only after many purifying transmigrations. To attain heaven one had to die in a state of purity. For this it was necessary to receive from a Catharist priest the consolamentum, a last sacrament which completely cleansed the soul of sin. Catharai believers, like some early Christians in the case of baptism, postponed this sacrament to what they judged to be their final illness. Those who recovered ran a risk of acquiring new impurity and dying without the consolamentum. Hence it was a great misfortune to recover after receiving it, and it is charged that the Albigensian priests, to avert this calamity, persuaded many a recovering patient to starve himself into paradise. Sometimes, we are assured, they made matters certain by suffocating a patient with his consent. The Church might have allowed this sect to die of its own suicide had not the Catharai engaged in active criticism of the Church. They denied that the Church was the Church of Christ. St. Peter had never come to Rome, had never founded the papacy. The popes were successors to the emperors, not to the apostles. Christ had no place to lay his head, but the pope lived in a palace. Christ was propertyless and penniless, but Christian prelates were rich. Surely, said the Catharai, these lordly archbishops and bishops, these worldly priests, these fat monks, were the Pharisees of old returned to life. The Roman church, they were sure, was the whore of Babylon. The clergy were a synagogue of Satan. The pope was Antichrist. They denounced the preachers of crusades as murderers. Many of them laughed at indulgences and relics. One group, it is alleged, made an image of the Virgin, ugly, one-eyed, and deformed, pretended to work miracles with it, secured wide credence for the imposture, and then revealed the hoax. Many views of the Catharai were spread on the wings of song by troubadours who resented the ethics of Christ without quite adopting those of the new sect. All the leading troubadours except two were considered to be on the side of the Albigensians. These troubadours made fun of pilgrims, confession, holy water, the cross. They called the churches dens of thieves, and Catholic priests seemed to them traitors, liars, and hypocrites. For some time the Catharai received a broad toleration from the ecclesiastics and the secular powers of southern France. Apparently the people were allowed to choose freely between the old religion and the new. Public debates were held between Catholic and Catharist theologians. One such took place at Carcassonne, in the presence of a papal legate and King Pedro II of Aragon, this in 1204. In 1167 various branches of the Catharai held a council of their clergy, attended by representatives from several countries. It discussed and regulated Catharist doctrine, discipline, and administration, and adjourned without having been disturbed. Moreover, the nobility found it desirable to weaken the church in Languedoc. The church was rich and owned much land. The nobles, relatively poor, began to seize church property. In 1171, Roger II, Viscount of Béziers, sacked an abbey, threw the bishop of Albi into prison, and sent a heretic to guard him. When the monks of Allais chose an abbot unsatisfactory to the viscount, he burned the monastery and jailed the abbot. When the latter died, the merry viscount installed his corpse in the pulpit and persuaded the monks to choose a pleasing substitute. Raymond Roger, Count of Foix, drove abbot and monks from the abbey of Pamiers. His horses ate oats from the altar. His soldiers used the arms and legs of the crucifixes as pestles to grind grain, and practiced their marksmanship upon the image of Christ. Count Raymond VI of Toulouse destroyed several churches, persecuted the monks of Moissac, and was excommunicated in 1196. But excommunication had become a trifle to the nobles of southern France. Many of them openly professed or liberally protected the Catharist heresy. Innocent III, coming to the papacy in 1198, saw in these developments a threat to both church and state. He recognized some excuse for criticism of the church, but he felt that he could hardly remain idle when the great ecclesiastical organization for which he had such lofty plans and hopes, and which seemed to him the chief bulwark against human violence, social chaos, and royal iniquity, was attacked in its very foundations, robbed of its possessions and dignity, and mocked with blasphemous travesties. The state, too, had committed sins and cherished corruption and unworthy officials, but only fools wished to destroy it. How could any continuing social order be built on the principles that forbade parentage and counseled suicide? Could any economy prosper on the idolatry of poverty and without the incentives of property? Could the relations of the sexes and the rearing of children be rescued from a wild disorder except by some such institution as marriage? Catharism seemed to innocent a mess of nonsense, 
made poisonous by the simplicity of the people. What was the sense of a crusade against infidels in Palestine when these Albigensian infidels were multiplying in the heart of Christendom? Two months after his accession, Innocent wrote to the Archbishop of Osh in Gascony, The little boat of St. Peter is beaten by many storms and tossed about on the sea. But it grieves me most of all that there are now arising, more unrestrainedly and injuriously than ever before, ministers of diabolical error who are ensnaring the souls of the simple. With their superstitions and false inventions, they are perverting the meaning of the Holy Scriptures and trying to destroy the unity of the Catholic Church. Since this pestilential error is growing in Gascony and the neighboring territories, we wish you and your fellow bishops to resist it with all your might. We give you a strict command that, by whatever means you can, you destroy all these heresies and repel from your diocese all who are polluted by them. If necessary, you may cause the princes and people to suppress them with the sword. The Archbishop of Osh, a man indulgent to others as well as to himself, seems to have taken no action on this letter, and the Archbishop of Narbonne and the Bishop of Béziers resisted the papal legates that Innocent sent to enforce his decrees. About this time six noble ladies, led by the sister of the Count of Foix, were converted to Catharism in a public ceremony attended by many of the nobility. Innocent replaced his unsuccessful legates with a more resolute agent, Arnaud, head of the Cistercian monks, this in 1204. He gave him extraordinary powers to make inquisition throughout France, and commissioned him to offer a plenary indulgence to the king and nobles of France for aid in suppressing the Catharist heresy. To Philip Augustus, in return for such aid, the Pope offered the lands of all who should fail to join in a crusade against the Albigensians. Philip demurred. He had just conquered Normandy and wanted time for digestion. Raymond VI of Toulouse agreed to use persuasion on the heretics, but refused to join in a war against them. Innocent excommunicated him. He promised to comply, was absolved, and proved negligent again. How can we do it? asked a knight who had been commanded by a papal legate to expel the Catharai from their lands. We have been brought up with these people, we have kindred among them, and we see them living righteously. St. Dominic entered the scene from Spain, preached peaceably against the heretics, and made converts to orthodoxy by the holiness of his life. Perhaps the problem could have been met by such means, aided by clerical reform, had not Pierre de Castelnau, a papal legate, been slain by a knight who was thereafter protected by Raymond. Innocent, who had borne with patience the frustration of his efforts against the heresy for almost ten years, now resorted to extreme measures. He excommunicated Raymond and all his abettors, laid under interdict all lands subject to them, and offered these lands to any Christian who could seize them. He summoned Christians from all countries to a crusade against the Albigensians and their protectors. Philip Augustus allowed many barons of his realm to enlist, and contingents came from Germany and Italy. To all participants the same plenary indulgence was promised as to those who took the cross for Palestine. Raymond asked forgiveness, did public penance, being scourged half-naked in the church of Saint-Gilles, was absolved again, and joined the Holy War in 1209. Most of the population of Languedoc, nobles and commoners alike, resisted the crusaders, seeing in the attack of northern barons and soldiers of fortune an attempt to seize their lands under cover of religious zeal. Even the Orthodox Christians of the South fought the invasion from the North. When the Crusaders approached Béziers, they offered to spare it the horrors of war if it would surrender all heretics listed by its bishop. The city leaders refused, saying they would rather stand siege till they should be reduced to eating their children. The Crusaders scaled the walls, captured the town, and slew 20,000 men, women, and children in indiscriminate massacre. Even those who had sought asylum in the church— Caesarius of Heisterbach, a Cistercian monk writing twenty years after, is our only authority for the story that when Arnaud, the papal legate, was asked should Catholics be spared, he answered, Kill them all, for God knows his own. Perhaps he feared that all the defeated would profess orthodoxy for the occasion. Béziers having been burned to the ground, the crusaders, led by Raymond, advanced to attack the fortress of Carcassonne, where Raymond's nephew, Count Roger of Béziers, made a final stand. The fortress was taken, and Roger died of dysentery. The bravest leader in this siege was Simon de Montfort. Born in France about 1170, he was the elder son of the Lord of Montfort, near Paris. He became Earl of Leicester through his English mother. Like many men of that swashbuckling age, he was able to combine great piety with great wars. 
He heard Mass every day, was famous for his chastity, and had served with honor in Palestine. With his small army of forty-five hundred men, and urged on by the papal legate, he now assaulted town after town, overcame all resistance, and gave the population a choice between swearing allegiance to the Roman faith or suffering death as heretics. Thousands swore, hundreds preferred death. For four years Simon continued his campaigns, devastating nearly all the territory of Count Raymond except Toulouse. In 1215, Toulouse itself surrendered to him. Count Raymond was deposed by a council of prelates at Montpellier, and Simon succeeded to his title and most of his lands. Innocent III did not quite approve of these proceedings. He was shocked to find that the Crusaders had appropriated the holdings of men never guilty of heresy, and had robbed and murdered like savage buccaneers. Taking mercy on Raymond, he assigned him an annuity, and took under the care of the church a portion of his lands in trust for Raymond's son. Raymond the Seventh, coming of age, recaptured Toulouse. Simon died in a second siege of the city in 1218. The crusade was suspended now that Innocent had died, and such Albigensian devotees as had survived came forth to practice and preach again under the lenient rule of the new Count of Toulouse. In 1223, Louis the Eighth of France offered to depose Raymond the Seventh and to crush out all heresy in Raymond's territory if Honorius the Third would allow him to add the region to the royal domain. We do not know the Pope's reply, but a new crusade was begun, and Louis was on the verge of victory when he died at Montpensier in 1226. Seizing the opportunity to make peace with Blanche of Castile, regent for Louis the Ninth, Raymond offered the hand of his daughter Jeanne to Louis's brother Alphonse, with the reversion of Raymond's lands to Jeanne and her husband at Raymond's death. Blanche, harassed by rebellious nobles, accepted, and Pope Gregory the Ninth approved on Raymond's pledge to suppress all heresy. A treaty of peace was signed at Paris in 1229, and the Albigensian Wars came to an end after thirty years of strife and devastation. Orthodoxy triumphed, toleration ceased, and the Council of Narbonne in 1229 forbade the possession of any part of the Bible by laymen. Feudalism spread, municipal liberty declined, the gay age of the troubadours passed away in southern France. In 1271 Jeanne and Alphonse, who had inherited Raymond's possessions, died without issue, and the spacious county of Toulouse fell to Louis IX and the French crown. Central France now had free commercial outlets on the Mediterranean, and France had taken a great step toward unity. This and the Inquisition were the chief results of the Albigensian Crusades. 2. The Background of the Inquisition The Old Testament laid down a simple code for dealing with heretics. They were to be carefully examined, and if three reputable witnesses testified to their having gone and served other gods, the heretics were to be led out from the city and stoned with stones till they die. See Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 25. If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, saying, Let us go after other gods, that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. If thy brother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him. Neither shalt thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Deuteronomy, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Exodus, chapter 22, verse 18. According to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15, verse 6, Jesus accepted this tradition. If anyone abide not in me, he shall be cast forth as a branch, and shall wither, and they shall gather him up and cast him into the fire, and he burneth. Medieval Jewish communities retained the biblical law of heresy in theory, but rarely practiced it. Maimonides adopted it without reserve. The laws of the Greeks made Asabea, failure to worship the gods of the Orthodox Hellenic pantheon, a capital crime. It was by such a law that Socrates was put to death. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization 
Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2. The laws of the Greeks made Asabea, failure to worship the gods of the Orthodox Hellenic pantheon, a capital crime. It was by such a law that Socrates was put to death. In classic Rome, where the gods were allied with the state in close harmony, heresy and blasphemy were classed with treason and were punishable with death. Where no accuser could be found to denounce an offender, the Roman judge summoned the suspect and made an inquisitio, or inquiry into the case. From this procedure, the medieval inquisition took its form and name. The Eastern emperors, applying Roman law in the Byzantine world, inflicted the death penalty upon Manichaeans and other heretics. During the Dark Ages in the West, when Christianity was seldom challenged by its own children, tolerance increased, and Leo IX held that excommunication should be the only punishment for heresy. In the twelfth century, as heresy spread, some ecclesiastics argued that the excommunication of heretics by the Church should be followed with their banishment or imprisonment by the state. The revival of Roman law at Bologna in the twelfth century provided terms, methods, and stimulus for a religious inquisition and the canon law of heresy was copied word for word from the fifth law of the title De Hereticis in the Justinian Code. Finally, in the 13th century, the Church took over the law of its greatest enemy, Frederick II, that heresy should be punished with death. It was a general assumption of Christians, even of many heretics, that the Church had been established by the Son of God. On this assumption, any attack upon the Catholic faith was an offense against God himself, the contumacious heretic could only be viewed as an agent of Satan, sent to undo the work of Christ. And any man or government that tolerated heresy was serving Lucifer. Feeling herself an inseparable part of the moral and political government of Europe, the Church looked upon heresy precisely as the state looked upon treason. It was an attack upon the foundations of social order. The civil law, said Innocent III, punishes traitors with confiscation of their property and death. All the more, then, should we excommunicate and confiscate the property of those who are traitors to the faith of Jesus Christ. For it is an infinitely greater sin to offend the divine majesty than to attack the majesty of the sovereign. To ecclesiastical statesmen like Innocent, the heretic seemed worse than a Moslem or a Jew. These lived either outside of Christendom or by an orderly and equally severe law within it. The alien enemy was a soldier in open war. The heretic was a traitor within who undermined the unity of a Christendom engaged in a gigantic conflict with Islam. Furthermore, said the theologians, if every man may interpret the Bible according to his own light, however dim, and make his own individual brand of Christianity, the religion that held up the frail moral code of Europe would soon be shattered into a hundred creeds and lose its efficacy as a social cement binding natively savage men into a society and a civilization. Whether because it shared these views without formulating them, or because simple souls naturally fear the different or the strange, or because men enjoy releasing in the anonymity of the crowd instincts normally suppressed by individual responsibility, the people themselves, except in southern France and northern Italy, were the most enthusiastic persecutors. The mob lynched heretics long before the church began to persecute. The orthodox population complained that the church was too lenient with heretics. Sometimes it snatched sectaries from the hands of protecting priests, in this country, wrote a priest of northern France to Innocent III, the piety of the people is so great that they are always ready to send to the stake not only avowed heretics, but those merely suspected of heresy. In 1114, the bishop of Soissons imprisoned some heretics. While he was away, the populace, fearing that the clergy might be too lenient, broke into the jail, dragged forth the heretics, and burned them at the stake. In 1144 at Liège, the mob insisted on burning some heretics whom Bishop Adobero still hoped to convert. When Pierre de Bouy said, The priests lie when they pretend to make the body of Christ, in the Eucharist, and burned a pile of crosses on Good Friday, the people killed him there and then. The state, with some reluctance, joined in persecuting heretics because it feared that government would be impossible without the aid of a church inculcating a unified religious belief. Moreover, it suspected religious heresy to be a cloak for political radicalism, and was not always wrong. Material considerations may have played a part, for religious or political heresy threatened the possessions of church and state. The public opinion of the upper classes, again excepting Languedoc, demanded the extirpation of heresy at any cost. 
Henry VI of Germany in 1194 ordered severe punishment of heretics and the confiscation of their property, and similar edicts were issued by Otto IV in 1210, Louis VIII of France in 1226, Florence in 1227, and Milan in 1228. The most rigorous code of suppression was enacted by Frederick II in 1220 to 1239. Heretics condemned by the church were to be delivered to the secular arm, the local authorities, and burned to death. If they recanted, they were to be let off with imprisonment for life. All their property was to be confiscated, their heirs were to be disinherited, their children were to remain ineligible to any position of emolument or dignity, unless they atoned for their parents' sin by denouncing placed similar laws among the statutes of France. Indeed, it was the kings who disputed with the people the distinction of inaugurating the persecution of heresy. King Robert of France had thirteen heretics burned at Orléans in 1022. This is the first known case of capital punishment of heresy since the secular execution of Priscillian in 385. In 1051, Henry III of Germany hanged several Manichaeans or Catheri at Goslar over the protests of Bishop Vazzo of Liège, who argued that excommunication was enough. In 1183, Count Philip of Flanders, in collaboration with the Archbishop of Reims, sent to the stake a great many nobles, clerics, knights, peasants, young girls, married women and widows, whose property they confiscated and shared between them. Normally, before the 13th century, inquisition into heresy was left to the bishops. They were hardly inquisitors. They waited for public rumor or clamor to point out the heretics. Summoning them, they found it difficult to elicit confessions by inquiry, Loath to use torture, they resorted to trial by ordeal, apparently in the sincere belief that God would work miracles to protect the innocent. St. Bernard approved of this expedient, and an Episcopal council at Reims in 1157 prescribed it as regular procedure in trials for heresy. But Innocent III forbade it. In 1185, Pope Lucius III, dissatisfied with the negligence of the bishops in pursuing heresy, ordered them to visit their parishes at least once a year, to arrest all suspects, to reckon as guilty any who would not swear full loyalty to the church, the Catheri refused to take any oaths, and to hand over such recalcitrants to the secular arm. Papal legates were empowered to depose bishops negligent in stamping out heresy. Innocent III, in 1215, required all civil authorities, on pain of being themselves indicted for heresy, to swear publicly to exterminate from the lands subject to their obedience all heretics who have been marked out by the church for animadversio debita, due punishment. Any prince who neglected this duty was to be deposed, and the Pope would release his subjects from their allegiance. Due punishment was as yet only banishment and confiscation of goods. When Gregory the Ninth mounted the papal throne in 1227, he found that despite popular, governmental, and episcopal prosecutions, heresy was growing. All the Balkans, most of Italy, much of France, were so turbulent with heresy that the Church so soon after Innocent's splendid power, seemed doomed to division and disintegration. As the aged pontiff saw the matter, the Church, simultaneously fighting Frederick and heresy, was engaged in a struggle for survival, and was warranted in adopting the morals and measures of a state of war. Shocked at learning that Bishop Filippo Paternone, whose diocese extended from Pisa to Arezzo, had been converted to Catharism, Gregory appointed a board of inquisitors, headed by a Dominican monk, to sit in Florence and bring the heretics to judgment, this in 1227. This, in effect, was the beginning of the papal inquisition, though formally the inquisitors were to be subject to the local bishop. In 1231, Gregory adopted into the law of the Church Frederick's legislation of 1224. Henceforth, Church and State agreed that impenitent heresy was treason, and should be punished with death. The Inquisition was now officially established under the control of the popes. 3. The Inquisitors After 1227, Gregory and his successors sent out an increasing number of special inquisitores to pursue heresy. He favored for this task the members of the new mendicant orders, partly because the simplicity and devotion of their lives would counteract the scandals of ecclesiastical luxury, and partly because he could not depend upon the bishops. However, no inquisitor was to condemn a heretic to serious punishment without episcopal consent. So many Dominicans were employed in this work that they were nicknamed Dominicanes, the hunting dogs of the Lord. Most of them were men of strict morals, but few had the quality of mercy. 
They thought of themselves not as judges impartially weighing evidence, but as warriors pursuing the enemies of Christ. Some were careful and conscientious men like Bernard Gui. Some were sadists like Robert the Dominican, a converted Paterine heretic, who in one day in 1239 sent 180 prisoners to the stake, including a bishop who, in his judgment, had given heretics too much freedom. Gregory suspended Robert from office and imprisoned him for life. The jurisdiction of the inquisitors extended only to Christians. Jews and Moslems were not summoned unless they were relapsed converts. The Dominicans made special efforts to convert Jews, but only by peaceful means. When, in 1256, some Jews were accused of ritual murder, Dominican and Franciscan monks risked their own lives to save them from the mob. The purpose and scope of the Inquisition are best expressed by a bull of Nicholas III in 1280. We hereby excommunicate and anathematize all heretics, Catheri, Paterines, poor men of Lyon, and all others, by whatever name they may be called. When condemned by the Church, they shall be given over to the secular judge to be punished. If any, after being seized, repent and wish to do penance, they shall be imprisoned for life. All who receive, defend, or aid heretics shall be excommunicated. If any one remains under excommunication a year and a day, he shall be proscribed. If those who are suspected of heresy cannot prove their innocence, they shall be excommunicated. If they remain under the ban and of excommunication a year, they shall be condemned as heretics. They shall have no right of appeal. Whoever grants them Christian burial shall be excommunicated until he makes proper satisfaction. He shall not be absolved until he has with his own hands dug up their bodies and cast them forth. We prohibit all laymen to discuss matters of the Catholic faith. If anyone does so, he shall be excommunicated. Whoever knows of heretics, or of those who hold secret meetings, or of those who do not conform in all respects to the Orthodox faith, shall make it known to his confessor or to someone else who will bring it to the knowledge of the bishop or the inquisitor. If he does not do so, he shall be excommunicated. Heretics and all who receive, support, or aid them, and all their children to the second generation, shall not be admitted to an ecclesiastical office. We now deprive all such of their benefices forever. Inquisitorial procedure might begin with the summary arrest of all heretics, sometimes also of all suspects or the visiting inquisitors might summon the entire adult population of a locality for a preliminary examination. During an initial time of grace, about thirty days, those who confessed heresy and repented were let off with brief imprisonment or some work of piety or charity. Heretics who did not now confess but were detected in this initial inquiry, or by the spies of the Inquisition, or elsewise, were cited before the inquisitorial court. Normally, this court was composed of twelve men chosen by the local secular ruler for a list of nominees presented to him by the bishop and the inquisitors. Two notaries and several servitors were added. If the accused took this second chance to confess, they received punishments varying with the degree of their adjudged offense. If they denied their guilt, they were imprisoned. Accused persons might be tried in their absence or after their death. Two condemnatory witnesses were required. Confessed heretics were accepted as witnesses against others. Wives and children were allowed to testify against, but not for, husbands and fathers. All the accused in a locality were, on demand, allowed to see a combined list of all accusers, without any specification as to which had accused whom. It was feared that individual confrontations would lead to the killing of accusers by friends of the accused. And in fact, says Lee, a number of witnesses were slain on simple suspicion. Usually the accused man was asked to name his enemies, and any evidence against him by such men was rejected. False accusers were severely punished. Before 1300 the accused was not allowed to have legal aid. After 1254 the inquisitors were required by papal decree to submit the evidence not only to the bishop, but also to men of high repute in the locality, and to decide in agreement with their votes. Sometimes a board of experts, or periti, was called in to pass on the evidence. In general, the inquisitors were instructed that it was better to let the guilty escape than to condemn the innocent, and that they must have either clear proof or a confession. Roman law had permitted the eliciting of confessions by torture. It was not used in the episcopal courts, nor in the first twenty years of the papal inquisition. But Innocent IV in 1252 authorized it where the judges were convinced of the accused man's guilt, and later pontiffs condoned its use. The popes advised that torture shall be a last resort, 
should be applied only once and should be kept this side of loss of limb and danger of death. The inquisitors interpreted only once as meaning only once for each examination. Sometimes they interrupted torture to resume examination and then felt free to torture anew. Torture was in several cases used to force witnesses to testify or to induce a confessing heretic to name other heretics. It took the form of flogging, burning, the rack, or solitary imprisonment in dark and narrow dungeons. The feet of the accused might be slowly roasted over burning coals, or he might be bound upon a triangular frame and have his arms and legs pulled by cords wound on a windlass. Sometimes the diet of the imprisoned man was restricted to weaken his body and will and render him susceptible to such psychological torture as alternate promises of mercy or threats of death. Confessions elicited under torture were little respected by the inquisitorial court, but this difficulty was met by having the accused confirm, three hours later, the admissions he had made under torture. If he refused, the torture could be resumed. In 1286, the officials of Carcassonne sent to Philip IV of France and Pope Nicholas IV a letter of complaint alleging the severity of the tortures used by the inquisitor Jean Galland. Some of Jean's prisoners were left for long periods in complete darkness and solitude. Some were so manacled that they had to sit in their own filth and could only lie on their backs on the cold earth. Some men had been so drawn on the rack that they had lost the use of their arms and legs. Some had died under torture. Philip denounced these barbarities, and Pope Clement V in 1312 endeavored to moderate the use of torture by inquisitors, but his cautions were soon ignored. Prisoners who had refused two opportunities to confess and were later convicted, and those who had relapsed into heresy after recanting, were imprisoned for life or were put to death. Life imprisonment might be mitigated with certain freedom of movement, visitation, and games, or it might be enhanced with fasting or chains. Confiscation of property was an added penalty of conviction after resistance. Usually a part of the confiscated goods went to the secular ruler of the province, part to the church. In Italy, one-third was given to the informer. In France, the crown took all. These considerations stimulated individuals and the state to join in the hunt and led to trials of the dead. At any time, the possessions of innocent persons might be seized on the charge that the testator had died in heresy. This was one of many abuses that popes vainly denounced. The bishop of Rodet boasted that he had made 100,000 sols in a single campaign against the heretics of his diocese. Periodically, the inquisitors, in a fearful ceremony, sermo generalis, announced convictions and penalties. The penitents were placed on a stage in the center of a church, their confessions were read, and they were asked to confirm them and to pronounce a formula abjuring heresy. The celebrant inquisitor then absolved the penitents from excommunication and announced the various sentences. Those who were to be relaxed or abandoned to the secular arm were allowed another day for conversion. Those who confessed and repented, even at the foot of the stake, were given life in imprisonment. The obdurate were burned to death in the public square. In Spain, this entire procedure of sermo generalis and execution was termed an act of faith or auto da fe for it was intended to strengthen the orthodoxy of the people and to reaffirm the faith of the church. The church never pronounced a sentence of death. Her old motto was Ecclesia abhoreta sanguine. The church shrinks from blood. Clerics were forbidden to shed blood. So, in turning over to the secular arm those whom she had condemned, the church confined herself to asking the state authorities to inflict the due penalty, with a caution to avoid all bloodshed and all danger of death. After Gregory the Ninth, it was agreed by both church and state that the caution should not be taken literally, but that the condemned were to be put to death without shedding of blood, that is, by burning at the stake. The number of those sentenced to death by the official inquisition was smaller than historians once believed. Bernard de Coe, a zealous inquisitor, left behind him a long register of cases tried by him. Not one of these was relaxed. In seventeen years as an inquisitor, Bernard Gui condemned 930 heretics, 45 of them to death. At a sermo generalis in Toulouse in 1310, 20 persons were ordered to go on pilgrimage, 65 were condemned to life imprisonment, 18 to death. In an auto da fe of 1312, 51 were sent on pilgrimage, 86 received various terms of imprisonment, 5 were turned over to the secular arm. The worst tragedies of the Inquisition were concealed in the dungeons, rather than brought to light at the stake. 4. Results The medieval inquisition achieved its immediate purposes. 
It stamped out Catharism in France, reduced the Waldenses to a few scattered zealots, restored South Italy to orthodoxy, and postponed by three centuries the dismemberment of Western Christianity. France lost to Italy the cultural leadership of Europe, but the French monarchy, strengthened by the acquisition of Languedoc, grew powerful enough to subdue the papacy under Boniface VIII and to imprison it under Clement V. In Spain, the Inquisition played a minor role before 1300. Raymond of Peñafort, Dominican confessor to James I of Aragon, persuaded him to admit the Inquisition in 1232. Perhaps to check inquisitional zeal, a statute of 1233 made the state the chief beneficiary of confiscations for heresy. In later centuries, however, this would prove a heady stimulus to monarchs who found that inquisition and acquisition were nearly allied. In northern Italy, heretics continued to exist in great number. The orthodox majority were too indifferent to join actively in the hunt, and independent dictators like Ezzelino at Vicenza and Pallavicino at Cremona and Milan clandestinely or openly protected heretics. In Florence, the monk Ruggieri organized the military order of orthodox nobles to support the Inquisition. The Paterines fought bloody battles with them in the streets and were defeated in 1254. Thereafter, Florentine heresy hit its head. In 1252, the inquisitor Fra Piero da Verona was assassinated by heretics at Milan, and his canonization as Peter Martyr did more to check heresy in North Italy than all the rigors of the inquisitors. The papacy organized crusades against Ezzelino and Pallavicino. The one was overthrown in 1259, the other in 1268. The triumph of the Church in Italy was, on the surface, complete. In England, the Inquisition never took hold. Henry II, anxious to prove his orthodoxy amid his controversy with Becket, scourged and branded twenty-nine heretics at Oxford in 1166. For the rest, there was little heresy in England before Wycliffe. In Germany, the Inquisition flourished with brief madness and then died away. In 1212, Bishop Henry of Strasbourg burned eighty heretics in one day. Most of them were Waldenses. Their leader, Priest John, proclaimed their disbelief in indulgences, purgatory, and sacerdotal celibacy, and held that ecclesiastics should own no property. In 1227, Gregory IX made Conrad, a priest of Marburg, head of the Inquisition in Germany, and commissioned him not only to exterminate heresy, but to reform the clergy, whose immorality was denounced by the Pope as the chief cause of waning faith. Conrad approached both tasks with outstanding cruelty. He gave all indicted heretics a simple choice, to confess and be punished, or to deny and be burned at the stake. When he applied like energy to reforming the clergy, orthodox and heretics joined to oppose him. He was killed by the friends of his victims in 1233, and the German bishops took over the Inquisition and domesticated it to a juster procedure. Many sects, some heretical, some mystical, survived in Bohemia and Germany, and prepared the way for Hus and Luther. In judging the Inquisition, we must see it against the background of a time accustomed to brutality. Perhaps it can be better understood by our age, which has killed more people in war, and snuffed out more innocent lives without due process of law, than all the wars and persecutions between Caesar and Napoleon. Intolerance is the natural concomitant of strong faith. Tolerance grows only when faith loses certainty. Certainty is murderous. Plato sanctioned intolerance in his laws. The reformers sanctioned it in the 16th century, and some critics of the Inquisition defend its methods when practiced by modern states. The methods of the inquisitors, including torture, were adopted into the law codes of many governments, and perhaps our contemporary secret torture of suspects finds its model in the Inquisition even more than in Roman law. Compared with the persecution of heresy in Europe from 1227 to 1492, the persecution of Christians by Romans in the first three centuries after Christ was a mild and humane procedure. Making every allowance required of an historian and permitted to a Christian, we must rank the Inquisition, along with the wars and persecutions of our time, as among the darkest blots on the record of mankind, revealing a ferocity unknown in any beast. Chapter 29 Monks and Friars, 1095-1300 to 1. The Monastic Life it may be that the Church was saved not by the tortures of the Inquisition, but by the rise of new monastic orders that took out of the mouths of heretics the gospel of evangelical poverty, and for a century gave to the older monastic orders and to the secular clergy a cleansing example of sincerity. 
The monasteries had multiplied during the Dark Ages, reaching a peak in the troubled nadir of the 10th century, and then declining in number as secular order and prosperity grew. In France, about 1100, there were 543. About 1250, there were 287. Possibly this loss in the number of abbeys was compensated by a rise in their average membership, but very few monasteries had a hundred monks. It was still a custom in the 13th century for pious or burdened parents to commit children of seven years or older to monasteries as oblates, offered up to God. St. Thomas Aquinas began his monastic career so. The Benedictine order considered the vows taken for an oblate by his parents as irrevocable. St. Bernard and the new orders held that the oblate on reaching maturity might without reproach return to the world. Generally, an adult monk required a papal dispensation if he wished, without sin, to renounce his vows. Before 1098, most Western monasteries followed, with variable fidelity, some form of the Benedictine rule. A year of novitiate was prescribed, during which the candidate might freely withdraw. One knight drew back, says the monk Caesarius of Heisterbach, on the cowardly plea that he feared the vermin of the monastic garment, for our woolen clothing harbors much vermin. Prayer occupied some four hours of the monk's day. Meals were brief and usually vegetarian. The remainder of the day was given to labor, reading, teaching, hospital work, charity, and rest. Caesarius tells how his monastery, in, in the famine of 1197, gave as many as 1,500 doles of food in a day, and kept alive till harvest time all the poor who came to us. In the same crisis, a Cistercian abbey in Westphalia slaughtered all its flocks and herds, and pawned its books and sacred vessels to feed the poor. Through their own labor and that of their serfs, the monks built abbeys, churches, and cathedrals, farmed great manors, subdued marshes and jungles to tillage, practiced a hundred handicrafts, and brewed excellent wines and ales. Though the monastery seemed to take many good and able men from the world to bury them in a selfish sanctity, it trained thousands of them in mental and moral discipline, and then returned them to the world to serve as counselors and administrators to bishops, popes, and kings. In the course of time, the growing wealth of the communities overflowed into the monasteries, and the generosity of the people financed the occasional luxury of the monks. The Abbey of saint Riquier was not among the richest, yet it had 117 vassals, owned 2,500 houses in the town where it was placed, and received from its tenants yearly 10,000 chickens, 10,000 capons, 75,000 eggs, and a money rent individually reasonable, cumulatively great. Much richer were the monasteries of Monte Cassino, Cluny, Fulda, St. Gaul, Saint Denis. Abbots like Suger of Saint Denis, Peter the Venerable of Cluny, or even Samson of Bury St. Edmunds, were mighty lords controlling immense material wealth and social or political power. Suger, after feeding his monks and building a majestic cathedral, had enough resources left to half-finance a crusade. It was probably of Suger that St. Bernard wrote, I lie if I have not seen an abbot riding with a train of sixty horses and more. But Suger was prime minister and had to clothe himself in pomp to impress the populace. He himself lived with austere simplicity in a humble cell, observing all the rules of his order so far as his public duties would allow. Peter the Venerable was a good man, but he failed, despite repeated efforts, to check the progress of the Cluniac monasteries, once the leaders of reform, toward a corporate wealth that enabled the monks, while owning nothing, to live in a degenerative idleness. Morals fall as riches rise, and nature will out according to men's means. In any large group, certain individuals will be found whose instincts are stronger than their vows. While the majority of monks remained reasonably loyal to their rule, a minority took an easier view toward the world and the flesh. In many cases, the abbot had been appointed by some lord or king, usually from a rank accustomed to comfort. Such abbots were above monastic rules. They enjoyed hunting, hawking, tournaments, and politics, and their example infected the monks. Geraldus Cambrensis paints a merry picture of the abbot of Eversham. None was safe from his lust. The neighborhood reckoned his offspring at eighteen. Finally, he had to be deposed. Worldly abbots, fat and rich and powerful, became a target of public humor and literary diatribe. The most merciless and incredible satire in medieval literature is a description of an abbot by Walter Mapp. Some cloisters were known for their fine food and wines. 
we should not grudge the monks a little good cheer, and we can understand how weary they were of vegetables, how they longed for meat. We can sympathize with their occasional gossiping, quarreling, and sleeping at mass. The monks, in bowing celibacy, had underestimated the power of a sexual instinct repeatedly stirred by secular example and sights. Caesarius of Heisterbach tells a story, often repeated in the Middle Ages, of an abbot and a young monk riding out together. The youth saw women for the first time. What are they? he asked. They be demons, said the abbot. I thought, said the monk, that they were the fairest things that ever I saw. Said the ascetic Peter Damien, nearing the end of a saintly but acerbic life, I, who am now an old man, may safely look upon the seared and wrinkled visage of a blear-eyed crone. Yet from sight of the more comely and adorned I guard my eyes like boys from fire. Alas, my wretched heart, which cannot hold scriptural mysteries read through a hundred times, and will not lose the memory of a form seen but once. To some monks' virtues who seemed a contest for their souls between woman and Christ. Their denunciation of woman was an effort to deaden themselves to her charms. Their pious dreams were sometimes softened with the dews of desire, and their saintly visions often borrowed the terms of human love. Ovid was a welcome friend in some monasteries, and not least thumbed were his manuals of the amorous art. The sculptures of certain cathedrals, the carvings of their furniture, even the paintings in some missals, portrayed riotous monks and nuns, pigs dressed as monks, monastic robes bulging over erect phalli, nuns sporting with devils. A relief on the portal of the judgment at Reims shows a devil dragging condemned men to hell. Among them is a mitred bishop. Medieval ecclesiastics, perhaps seculars and being regulars, allowed such caricatures to remain in place. Modern churchmen thought it better to have most of them removed. The church herself was the severest critic of her sinning members. A noble succession of ecclesiastical reformers labored to bring monks and abbots back to the ideals of Christ. 2. St. Bernard At the end of the eleventh century, simultaneously with the purification of the papacy and the fervor of the First Crusade, a movement of self-reform swept through Christendom, immensely improved the secular clergy, and founded new monastic orders dedicated to the full rigor of the Augustinian or Benedictine rule. At an unknown date before 1039, St. John Galbertus established the Order of Vallombrosa in the shady valley of that name in Italy, and inaugurated in it the institution of lay brothers later developed by the mendicant orders. The Roman Synod of 1059 exhorted canons, clergymen sharing the labors and revenues of a cathedral, to live in community and hold all their property in common, like the apostles. Some were reluctant and remained secular canons. Many responded, adopted a monastic rule that they ascribed to St. Augustine, and formed semi-monastic communities collectively known as Augustinian or Austin canons. In 1084, St. Bruno of Cologne, having declined the Archbishopric of Reims, founded the Carthusian Order by establishing a monastery at a desolate spot named Chartreuse, in the Alps near Grenoble. Other pious men, sick of worldly strife and clerical laxity, formed similar Carthusian units in secluded places. Each monk worked, ate, and slept in his own separate cell, lived on bread and milk, wore garments of horsehair, and practiced almost perpetual silence. Three times a week they came together for Mass, Vespers, and Midnight Prayers and on Sundays and holy days they indulged themselves in conversation and a common meal. Of all the monastic orders, this was the most austere, and has kept most faithfully through eight centuries to its original rule. In 1098, Robert of Molem, tired of trying to reform the various Benedictine monasteries of which he had been prior, built a new monastic house at a wild point called Citeaux near Dijon, and as Chartreuse named the Carthusians, so Citeaux named the Cistercian monks. The third abbot of Citeaux, Stephen Harding of Dorsetshire, reorganized and expanded the monastery, opening branches of it, and drew up the Carta Caritatis, or Charter of Love, to ensure the peaceful federal cooperation of the Cistercian houses with Citeaux. The Benedictine rule was restored in full severity. Absolute poverty was essential. All flesh food was to be avoided. Learning was to be discouraged. Verse-making was forbidden and all splendor of religious vestment, vessel, or building was to be shunned. 
Every physically able monk was to join in manual labor in gardens and workshops that would make the monastery independent of the outside world and give no excuse for any monk to leave the grounds. The Cistercians outshone all other groups, monastic or secular, in agricultural energy and skill. They set up new centers of their order in unsettled regions, subdued marshes, jungles, and forests to cultivation, and played a leading part in colonizing eastern Germany and in repairing the damage that William the Conqueror had done in northern England. In this magnificent labor of civilization, the Cistercian monks were aided by lay brothers, conversi, vowed to celibacy, silence, and illiteracy, and working as farmers or servants in return for shelter, clothing, and food. These austerities frightened potential novices. The little band grew slowly, and the new order might have died in infancy had not fresh ardor come to it in the person of St. Bernard. Born near Dijon in 1091 of a knightly family, he became a shy and pious youth, loving solitude. Finding the secular world an uncomfortable place, he determined to enter a monastery. But, as if desiring companionship in solitude, he made effective propaganda among his relatives and friends to enter Cito with him. Mothers and nubile girls, we are told, trembled at his approach, fearing that he would lure their sons or lovers into chastity. Despite their tears and charms, he succeeded. And when he was admitted to Cito in 1113, he brought with him a band of twenty-nine candidates, including brothers, an uncle, and friends. Later he persuaded his mother and sister to become nuns and his father a monk, on the promise that, unless thou do penance, thou shalt burn forever and send forth smoke and stench. Stephen Harding came presently to such admiration for Bernard's piety and energy that he sent him forth in 1115 as abbot, with twelve other monks, to found a new Cistercian house. Bernard chose a heavily wooded spot, ninety miles from Citeaux, known as Clara Vallis, or Bright Valley, Clairvaux. There was no habitation there and no human life. The initial task of the fraternal band was to build with their own hands their first monastery, a wooden building containing under one roof a chapel, a refectory, and a dormitory loft reached by a ladder. The beds were bins strewn with leaves. The windows were no larger than a man's head. The floor was the earth. Diet was vegetarian except for an occasional fish. No white bread, no spices, little wine. These monks, eager for heaven, ate like philosophers courting longevity. The monks prepared their own meals, each serving as cook in turn. By the rule that Bernard drew up, the monastery could not buy property. It could own only what it was given. He hoped that it would never have more land than could be worked by the monks' own hands and simple tools. In that quiet valley, Bernard and his growing fellowship labored in silence and content, free from the storm of the world, clearing the forest, planting and reaping, making their own furniture, and coming together at the canonical hours to sing, without an organ, the psalms and hymns of the day. The more attentively I watch them, said William of Santieri, the more I believe that they are perfect followers of Christ, a little less than angels, but much more than men. The news of this Christian peace and self-containment spread, and before Bernard's death there were seven hundred monks at Clairvaux. They must have been happy there, for nearly all who were sent from that communistic enclave to serve as abbots, bishops, and counselors longed to return, and Bernard himself offered the highest dignities in the church and going to many lands at her bidding, always yearned to get back to his cell at Clairvaux, that my eyes may be closed by the hands of my children, and that my body may be laid at Clairvaux side by side with the bodies of the poor. He was a man of moderate intellect, of strong conviction, of immense force and unity of character. He cared nothing for science or philosophy. The mind of man, he felt, was too infinitesimal a portion of the universe to sit in judgment upon it or pretend to understand it. He marveled at the silly pride of philosophers prating about the nature, origin, and destiny of the cosmos. He was shocked by Abelard's proposal to submit faith to reason, and he fought that rationalism as a blasphemous impudence. Instead of trying to understand the universe, he preferred to walk unquestioning and grateful in the miracle of revelation. He accepted the Bible as God's word, for otherwise, it seemed to him, life would be a desert of dark uncertainty. The more he preached that childlike faith, the more surely he felt it would be the way. When one of his monks, in terror, confessed to him that he could not believe in the power of the priest to change the bread of the Eucharist into the body and blood of Christ, Bernard did not reprove him. He bade him receive the sacrament nevertheless. Go and communicate with my faith. 
and we are assured that Bernard's faith overflowed into the doubter and saved his soul. Bernard could hate and pursue, almost to the death, heretics like Abelard or Arnold of Brescia, who weakened a church which, with all her faults, seemed to him the very vehicle of Christ. And he could love with almost the tenderness of the virgin whom he worshipped so fervently. Seeing a thief on the way to the gallows, he begged the Count of Champagne for him, promising that he would subject the man to a harder penance than a moment's death. He preached to kings and popes, but more contentedly to the peasants and shepherds of his valley. He was lenient with their faults, converted them by his example, and earned their mute love for the faith and love he gave them. He carried his piety to an exhausting asceticism. He fasted so much that his superior at Citeaux had to command him to eat, and for thirty-eight years he lived in one cramped cell at Clairvaux, with a bed of straw and no seat but a cut in the wall. All the comforts and goods of the world seemed to him as nothing compared with the thought and promise of Christ. He wrote in this mood several hymns of unassuming simplicity and touching tenderness. Jesus, sweet in memory, giving the heart true joy, yea, beyond honey and all things, sweet is his presence. Nothing sung is lovelier, nothing heard is pleasanter, nothing thought is sweeter than Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, hope of the penitent, how gentle thou art to suppliants, how good to those seeking thee. What must thou be to those finding thee? Despite his flair for graceful speech, he cared little for any but spiritual beauty. He covered his eyes lest they take too sensual a delight from the lakes of Switzerland. His abbey was bare of all ornament except the crucified Christ. He berated Cluny for spending so much on the architecture and adornment of its abbeys. The church, he said, is resplendent in its walls and wholly lacking in its poor. It gilds its stones and leaves its children naked. With the silver of the wretched it charms the eyes of the rich. He complained that the great abbey of Saint-Denis was crowded with proud and armored knights instead of simple worshippers. He called it a garrison, a school of Satan, a den of thieves. Suger, humbly moved by these strictures, reformed the customs of his church and his monks, and lived to earn Bernard's praise. The monastic reform that radiated from Clairvaux, and the improvement of the hierarchy through the elevation of Bernard's monks to bishoprics and archbishoprics, were but a part of the influence which this astounding man, who asked nothing but bread, wielded on all ranks in his half-century. Henry of France, brother of the king, came to visit him. Bernard spoke to him. On that day Henry became a monk, and washed the dishes at Clairvaux. Through his sermons, themselves so eloquent and sensuous as to verge on poetry, he moved all who heard him. Through his letters, masterpieces of passionate pleading, he influenced councils, bishops, popes, kings. Through personal contacts he molded the policies of church and state. He refused to be more than an abbot, but he made and unmade popes, and no pontiff was heard with greater respect or reverence. He left his cell on a dozen errands of high diplomacy, usually at the call of the church, when contending groups chose Anacletus II and Innocent II as rival popes in 1130, Bernard supported Innocent. When Anacletus captured Rome, Bernard entered Italy, and by the pure power of his personality and his speech, roused the Lombard cities for Innocent. The crowds, drunk with his oratory and his sanctity, kissed his feet and tore his garments to pieces as sacred relics for their posterity. The sick came to him at Milan, and epileptics, paralytics, and other ailing faithful announced that they had been cured by his touch. On his return to Clairvaux from his diplomatic triumphs, the peasants would come in from the fields and the shepherds down from the hills to ask his blessing, and receiving it they would return to their toil, uplifted and content. When Bernard died in 1153, the number of Cistercian houses had risen from thirty in 1134, the year of Stephen Harding's death, to three hundred forty-three. The fame of his sanctity and his power brought many converts to the new order. By 1300 it had 60,000 monks in 693 monasteries. Other monastic orders took form in the 12th century. About 1100, Robert of Arbrisol founded the order of Fontvraud in Anjou. In 1120, St. Norbert gave up a rich inheritance to establish the Premonstratensian order of canons regular at Fremontre, near Laon. In 1131, St. Gilbert constituted the English Order of Sempringham, the Gilbertons, on the model of Fontvraud. About 1150, some Palestinian anchorites adopted the eremitical rule of St. Basil, 
and spread throughout Palestine. When the Muslims captured the Holy Land, these Carmelites migrated to Cyprus, Sicily, France, and England. In 1198, Innocent III approved the Articles of the Order of Trinitarians and dedicated it to the ransoming of Christians captured by Saracens. These new orders were a saving and uplifting leaven in the Christian Church. The burst of monastic reform climaxed by Bernard died down as the 12th century advanced. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 1. The burst of monastic reform climaxed by Bernard died down as the 12th century advanced. The younger orders kept their arduous rules with reasonable fidelity, but not many men could be found in that dynamic period to bear so strict a regimen. In time, the Cistercians, even at Bernard's Clairvaux, became rich through hopeful gifts. Endowments for pittances enabled the monks to add meat to their diet and plenty of wine. They delegated all manual labor to lay brothers. Four years after Bernard's death, they bought a supply of Saracen slaves. They developed a large and profitable trade in the products of their socialistic industry and aroused guild animosity through their exemption from transportation tolls. The decline of faith as the Crusades failed reduced the number of novices and disturbed the morale of all the monastic orders. But the old ideal of living like the apostles in a propertyless commune did not die. The conviction that the true Christian must shun wealth and power and be a man of unflinching peace lingered in thousands of souls. At the opening of the 13th century, a man appeared in the Umbrian hills of Italy who brought these old ideals to vigor again by such a life of simplicity, purity, piety, and love that men wondered had Christ been born again. 3. St. Francis The literature on Francis is partly history, partly legend. As the legends are among the masterpieces of medieval literature, some of them are included in the following pages, with a warning in each instance. Most of the Fioretti, Little Flowers of St. Francis, and the Speculum Perfectionis, Mirror of Perfection, are legend, and quotations from these writings are to be so construed. Giovanni di Bernardone was born in 1182 in Assisi, son of Ser Pietro di Bernardone, a wealthy merchant who did much business with Provence. There Pietro had fallen in love with a French girl, Pica, and he had brought her back to Assisi as his wife. When he returned from another trip to Provence and found that a son had been born to him, he changed the child's name to Francesco, or Francis, apparently as a tribute to Pica. The boy grew up in one of the loveliest regions of Italy and never lost his affection for the Umbrian landscape and sky. He learned Italian and French from his parents and Latin from the parish priest. He had no further formal schooling, but soon entered his father's business. He disappointed Ser Pietro by showing more facility in spending money than in making it. He was the richest youth in town and the most generous. Friends flocked about him, ate and drank with him, and sang with him the songs of the troubadours. Francis wore now and then a party-colored minstrel's suit. He was a good-looking boy with black eyes and hair and kindly face and a melodious voice. His early biographers protest that he had no relations with the other sex and indeed knew only two women by sight but this surely does Francis some injustice. Possibly in those formative years he heard from his father about the Albigensian and Waldensian heretics of southern France and their new old gospel of evangelical poverty. In 1202 he fought in the Assisian army against Perugia, was made prisoner, and spent a year in meditative captivity. In 1204 he joined as a volunteer the army of Pope Innocent III. At Spoleto, lying in bed with a fever, he thought he heard a voice asking him, why do you desert the Lord for the servant, the prince for his vassal? Lord, he asked, what do you wish me to do? The voice answered, Go back to your home. There it shall be told you what you are to do. He left the army and returned to Assisi. Now he showed ever less interest in his father's business, ever more in religion. Near Assisi was a poor chapel of St. Damien. Praying there in February 1207, Francis thought he heard Christ speak to him from the altar, accepting his life and soul as an oblation. From that moment, he felt himself dedicated to a new life. He gave the chapel priest all the money he had with him and went home. One day he met a leper and turned away in revulsion. Rebuking himself for unfaithfulness to Christ, he went back, emptied his purse into the leper's hand, 
and kissed the hand. This act, he tells us, marked an era in his spiritual life. Thereafter, he frequently visited the dwellings of the lepers and brought them alms. Shortly after this experience, he spent several days in or near the chapel, apparently eating little. When he appeared again in Assisi, he was so thin, haggard, and pale, and his clothes so tattered, his mind so bewildered, that the urchins in the public square cried out, Pazzo! Pazzo! A madman! A madman! There his father found him, called him a half-wit, dragged him home, and locked him in a closet. Freed by his mother, Francis hurried back to the chapel. The angry father overtook him, upbraided him for making his family a public jest, reproached him for making so little return on the money spent in his rearing, and bade him leave the town. Francis had sold his personal belongings to support the chapel. He handed the proceeds to his father, who accepted them. But he would not recognize the authority of his father to command one who now belonged to Christ. Summoned before the tribunal of the bishop in the Piazza Santa Maria Maggiore, he presented himself humbly, while a crowd looked on in a scene made memorable by Giotto's brush. The bishop took him at his word and bade him give up all his property. Francis retired to a room in the Episcopal Palace and soon reappeared stark naked. He laid his bundled clothing and a few remaining coins before the bishop and said, Until this time I have called Pietro Bernardone my father, but now I desire to serve God. That is why I return to him this money, as well as my clothing and all that I have had from him. For henceforth I desire to say nothing else than, Our Father who art in heaven. Bernardone carried off the clothing, while the bishop covered the shivering Francis with his mantle. Francis returned to St. Damien's, made himself a hermit's robe, begged his food from door to door, and with his hands began to rebuild the crumbling chapel. Several of the townspeople came to aid him, and they sang together as they worked. In February 1209, as he was hearing Mass, he was struck by the words which the priest read from the instruction of Jesus to the apostles. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes nor a staff. Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. It seemed to Francis that Christ himself was speaking, and directly to him. He resolved to obey these words literally, to preach the kingdom of heaven and possess nothing. He would go back across the twelve hundred years that had obscured the figure of Christ, and would rebuild his life on that divine exemplar. So that spring, braving all ridicule, he stood in the squares of Assisi and nearby towns and preached the gospel of poverty and Christ. Revolted by the unscrupulous pursuit of wealth that marked the age, and shocked by the splendor and luxury of some clergymen, he denounced money itself as a devil and a curse, bade his followers despise it as dung, and called upon men and women to sell all that they had and give to the poor. Small audiences listened to him in wonder and admiration, but most men passed him by as a fool in Christ. The good bishop of Assisi protested, Your way of living without owning anything seems to me very harsh and difficult. To which Francis replied, my lord, if we possessed property, we should need arms to defend it. Some hearts were moved. Twelve men offered to follow his doctrine and his way. He welcomed them, and gave them the above-quoted words of Christ as their commission and their rule. They made themselves brown robes, and built themselves cabins of branches and boughs. Daily they and Francis, rejecting the old monastic isolation, went forth barefoot and penniless to preach. Sometimes they would be absent for several days, and sleep in haylofts or leper hospitals or under the porch of a church. When they returned, Francis would wash their feet and give them food. They greeted one another, and all whom they met on the road, with the ancient oriental salutation, The Lord give thee peace. They were not yet named Franciscans. They called themselves fratres minores, friars minor, or minorites. Friars as meaning brothers rather than priests, minor as being the least of Christ's servants, and never wielding but always under superior authority. They were to hold themselves subordinate to even the lowliest priest, and to kiss the hand of any priest they met. Very few of them in this first generation of the order were ordained. Francis himself was never more than deacon. In their own little community they served one another and did manual work, and no idler was long tolerated in the group. Intellectual study was discouraged. Francis saw no advantage in secular knowledge except for the accumulation of wealth or the pursuit of power. My brethren who are led by desire of learning will find their hands empty in the day of tribulation. 
He scorned historians who perform no great deed themselves, but receive honors for recording the great deeds of others. Anticipating Goethe's dictum that knowledge that does not lead to action is vain and poisonous, Francis said, A man has only so much knowledge as he puts to work. No friar was to own a book, not even a psalter. In preaching they were to use song as well as speech. They might even, said Francis, imitate the jongleur and become joculatores dei, gleemen of God. Sometimes the friars were derided, beaten, or robbed of almost their last garment. Francis bade them offer no resistance. In many cases the miscreants, astonished at what seemed a superhuman indifference to pride and property, begged forgiveness and restored their thefts. We do not know if the following specimen of the little flowers of St. Francis is history or legend, but it portrays the ecstatic piety that runs through all that we hear of the saint. One winter's day, as Francis was going from Perugia, suffering sorely from the bitter cold, he said, Friar Leo, although the friars minor give good examples of holiness and edification, nevertheless write and note down diligently that perfect joy is not to be found therein. And Francis went his way a little farther and said, O Friar Leo, even though the friars minor give sight to the blind, made the crooked straight, cast out devils, made the deaf to hear and the lame to walk, and raised to life those who had lain four days in the grave, write, Perfect joy is never found there. And he journeyed on a little while, and cried aloud, O Friar Leo, if the Friar Minor knew all tongues and sciences and all the scriptures, so that he could foretell and reveal not only future things, but even the secrets of the conscience and the soul, write, Perfect joy is not there. Yet a little farther he went, and cried again aloud, O Friar Leo, although the Friar Minor were skilled to preach so well that he should convert all infidels to Christ, write, Not there is perfect joy. And when this fashion of talk had continued for two miles, Friar Leo asked, Father, prithee in God's name, tell me, where is perfect joy to be found? And Francis answered him, When we are come to St. Mary of the Angels, then the Franciscan chapel in Assisi, wet through with rain, frozen with cold, foul with mire, and tormented with hunger, and when we knock at the door and the doorkeeper comes in a rage and says, Who are you? And we say, We are two of your friars. And he answers, You lie. You are rather two knaves who go about deceiving the world and stealing the alms of the poor. Be gone. And he opens not to us and makes us stay outside hungry and cold all night in the rain and snow. Then, if we endure patiently such cruelty without complaint or mourning, and believe humbly and charitably that it is God who made the doorkeeper rail against us. O Friar Leo, right there is perfect joy. And if we persevere in our knocking, and he issues forth and angrily drives us away, abusing us and smiting us on the cheek, saying, Go hence, you vile thieves. If this we suffer patiently with love and gladness, right, O Friar Leo, this is perfect joy. And if, constrained by hunger and by cold, we knock once more and pray with many tears that he open to us for the love of God, and he issues forth with a big knotted stick and seizes us by our cowls and flings us on the ground and rolls us in the snow, bruising every bone in our bodies with that heavy club, if we, thinking on the agony of the blessed Christ, endure all these things patiently and joyously for love of him, write, O Friar Leo, that here and in this is found perfect joy. The remembrance of his early life of indulgence gave him a haunting sense of sin, and if we may believe the little flowers, he sometimes wondered whether God would ever forgive him. A touching story tells how, in the early days of the order, when they could find no breviary from which to read the divine office, Francis extemporized a litany of contrition, and bad brother Leo repeat after him words accusing Francis of sin. Leo, at each sentence, tried to repeat the accusation, but found himself saying, instead, The mercy of God is infinite. On another occasion, just convalescing from court and fever, Francis had himself dragged naked before the people in the marketplace of Assisi, and commanded a friar to throw a full dish of ashes into his face. And to the crowd he said, You believe me to be a holy man, but I confess to God and you that I have in this my infirmity eaten meat and broth made with meat. The people were all the more convinced of his sanctity. They told how a young friar had seen Christ and the Virgin conversing with him, they attributed many miracles to him and brought their sick and possessed to him to be healed. His charity became a legend. He could not bear to see others poorer than himself. He so often gave to the passing poor the garments from his back that his disciples found it hard to keep him clothed. Once, says the probably legendary Mirror of Perfection, when he was returning from Siena he came across a poor man on the way and said to a fellow monk, 
We ought to return this mantle to its owner, for we received it only as a loan until we should come upon one poorer than ourselves. It would be counted to us as a theft if we should not give it to him who is more needy. His love overflowed from men to animals, to plants, even to inanimate things. The mirror of perfection, unverified, ascribes to him a kind of rehearsal for his later canticle of the sun. In the morning, when the sun rises, every man ought to praise God who created it for our use. When it becomes night, every man ought to give praise on account of brother fire, by which our eyes are then enlightened. For we be all as it were blind, and the Lord by these two our brothers doth enlighten our eyes. He so admired fire that he hesitated to extinguish a candle. The fire might object to being put out. He felt a sensitive kinship with every living thing. He wished to supplicate the emperor, Frederick II, the great hunter of birds, to tell him for the love of God and me to make a special law that no man should take or kill our sisters the larks, nor do them any harm. Likewise, that all the podestas or mayors of the towns, and the lords of castles and villages, should require men every year on Christmas Day to throw grain outside the cities and castles, that our sisters the larks and other birds may have something to eat. Meeting a youth who had snared some turtle doves and was taking them to market, Francis persuaded the boy to give them to him. The saint built nests for them, that ye may be fruitful and multiply. They obeyed abundantly and lived near the monastery in happy friendship with the monks, occasionally snatching food from the table at which these were eating. A score of legends embroidered this theme. One told how Francis preached to my little sisters the birds on the road between Canora and Bivania. And those that were on the trees flew down to hear him, and stood still the while Francis made an end of his sermon. My little sisters the birds, much are ye beholden to God your Creator, and always and in every place ye ought to praise him for that he hath given you a double and triple vesture. He hath given you freedom to go into any place. Moreover, ye sow not, neither do ye reap, and God feedeth you and giveth you the rivers and the fountains for your drink. He giveth you the mountains and the valleys for your refuge, and the tall trees wherein to build your nests. And for as much as ye can neither spin nor sow, God clotheth you and your children. Therefore beware, little sisters mine, of the sin of ingratitude, but ever strive to praise God." We are assured by Friars James and Maceo that the birds bowed in reverence to Francis and would not depart until he had blessed them. The Fioretti, or little flowers from which this story comes, are an Italian amplification of a Latin Actus Beati Francisci, from 1323. They belong less to factual history than to literature, but there they rank among the most engaging compositions of the Age of Faith. Having been advised that he needed papal permission to establish a religious order, Francis and his twelve disciples went to Rome in 1210 and laid their request and their rule before Innocent III. The great pope gently counseled them to defer formal organization of a new order until time should test the practicability of the rule. My dear children, he said, your life appears to me too severe. I see indeed that your fervor is great, but I ought to consider those who will come after you, lest your mode of life be beyond their strength. Francis persisted, and the Pope finally yielded, incarnate strength to incarnate faith. The friars took the tonsure, submitted themselves to the hierarchy, and received from the Benedictines of Mount Subasio, near Assisi, the chapel of St. Mary of the Angels, so small, some ten feet long, that it came to be called Portiuncula, little portion. The friars built themselves huts around the chapel, and these huts formed the first monastery of the First Order of St. Francis. Now, not only did new members join the order, but to the joy of the saint, a wealthy girl of eighteen, Clara de Ischifi, asked his permission to form a second order of St. Francis for women in 1212. Leaving her home, she vowed herself to poverty, chastity, and obedience, and became the abbess of a Franciscan convent built around the chapel of St. Damien. In 1221, a third order of St. Francis, the Tertiaries, was formed among laymen who, while not bound to the full Franciscan rule, wished to obey that rule as far as possible while living in the world, and to help the first and second orders with their labor and charity. The ever more numerous Franciscans now in 1212 brought their gospel to the towns of Umbria, and later to the other provinces of Italy. They uttered no heresy, but preached little theology, nor did they ask of their hearers the chastity, poverty, and obedience to which they themselves were vowed. Fear and honor God, they said, praise and bless him, repent, 
for you know that we shall soon die. Abstain from evil, persevere in the good. Italy had heard such words before, but seldom from men of such evident sincerity. Crowds came to their preaching, and one Umbrian village, learning of Francis's approach, went out en masse to greet him with flowers, banners, and song. At Siena, he found the city in civil war. His preaching brought both factions to his feet, and at his urging they ended their strife for a while. It was on these missionary tours in Italy that he contracted the malaria which was to bring him to an early death. Nevertheless, encouraged by his Italian success, and knowing little of Islam, Francis resolved to go to Syria and convert the Moslems, even the Sultan. In 1212 he sailed from an Italian port, but a storm cast his ship upon the Dalmatian coast, and he was forced to return to Italy. Legend, however, tells how St. Francis converted the Sultan of Babylon. In the same year, says a story probably also mythical, he went to Spain to convert the Moors. But on arrival he fell so ill that his disciples had to bring him back to Assisi. Another questionable narrative takes him to Egypt. He passed unharmed, we are told, into the Moslem army that was resisting the crusaders at Damietta. He offered to go through fire if the sultan would promise to lead his troops into the Christian faith in case Francis emerged unscathed. The sultan refused, but had the saint escorted safely to the Christian camp. Horrified by the fury with which the soldiers of Christ massacred the Moslem population at the capture of Damietta, Francis returned to Italy a sick and saddened man. To his chilling malaria, it is said, he added in Egypt an eye infection that would in later years almost destroy his sight. During these long absences of the saint, his followers multiplied faster than was good for his rule. His fame brought recruits who took the vows without due reflection. Some came to regret their haste, and many complained that the rule was too severe. Francis made reluctant concessions. Doubtless, too, the expansion of the order, which had divided itself into several houses scattered through Umbria, made such demands upon him for administrative skill and tact as his mystic absorption could hardly meet. Once, we are told, when one monk spoke evil of another, Francis commanded him to eat a lump of ass's dung, so that his tongue should not relish evil any more. The monk obeyed, but his fellows were more shocked by the punishment than by the offense. In 1220 Francis resigned his leadership, bade his followers elect another minister-general, and thereafter counted himself a simple monk. A year later, however, disturbed by further relaxations of the original rule of 1210, he drew up a new rule, his famous testament, aiming to restore full observance of the vow of poverty, and forbidding the monks to move from their huts at the Portiuncula to the more salubrious quarters built for them by the townspeople. He submitted this rule to Honorius III, who turned it over to a committee of prelates for revision. When it came from their hands, it made a dozen obeisances to Francis and as many relaxations of the rule. The predictions of Innocent III had been verified. Reluctantly but humbly obedient, Francis now gave himself to a life of mostly solitary contemplation, asceticism, and prayer. The intensity of his devotion and his imagination occasionally brought him visions of Christ, or Mary, or the Apostles. In 1224, with three disciples, he left Assisi and rode across hill and plain to a hermitage on Mount Verna, near Chiusi. He secluded himself in a lonely hut beyond a deep ravine, allowed none but Brother Leo to visit him, and bade him come only twice a day, and not to come if he received no answer to his call of approach. On September 14, 1224, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, after a long fast and a night spent in vigilant prayer, Francis thought he saw a seraph coming down from the sky, bearing an image of the crucified Christ. When the vision faded, he felt strange pains, and discovered fleshy excrescences on the palms and backs of his hands, on the soles and tops of his feet, and on his body, resembling in place and color the wounds, or stigmata, presumably made by the nails that were believed to have bound the extremities of Jesus to the cross, and by the lance that had pierced his side. It has been suggested that these swellings could have been due to malignant malaria, which in the absence of modern treatment has been known to produce purple hemorrhages of blood in the skin. Francis returned to the hermitage and to Assisi. A year after the appearance of the stigmata, he began to lose his sight. On a visit to St. Clara's nunnery, he was struck completely blind. Clara nursed him back to sight and kept him at St. Damien's for a month. There one day in 1224, perhaps in the joy of convalescence, he composed in Italian poetic prose his Canticle of the Sun. Most high, omnipotent, good Lord, 
Thine be the praise, the glory, the honor, and all benediction. To thee alone, Most High, they are due, and no man is worthy to mention thee. Be thou praised, my Lord, with all thy creatures, above all brother Son, who gives the day and lightens us therewith. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor. Of thee, Most High, he bears similitude. Be thou praised, my Lord, of Sister Moon and the stars. In the heaven hast thou formed them, clear and precious and comely. Be thou praised, my Lord, of Brother Wind, and of the air, and the cloud, and of fair, and of all weather, by the which thou givest to thy creatures sustenance. Be thou praised, my Lord, of Sister Water, which is much useful, and humble, and precious, and pure. Be thou praised, my Lord, of Brother Fire, by which thou hast lightened the night, and he is beautiful, and joyful, and robust, and strong. Be thou praised, my Lord, of our Sister Mother Earth, which sustains and hath us in rule, and produces divers fruits with colored flowers and herbs. Be thou praised, my Lord, of those who pardon for thy love and endure sickness and tribulations. Blessed are they who will endure it in peace, for by thee, Most High, they shall be crowned. In 1225, some physicians at Rieti, having to no good effect anointed his eyes with the urine of a virgin boy, resorted to drawing a rod of white-hot iron across his forehead. Francis, we are told, appealed to Brother Fire. You are beautiful above all creatures. Be favorable to me in this hour. You know how much I have always loved you. And he said later that he had felt no pain. He recovered enough sight to set forth on another preaching tour. He soon broke down under the hardships of travel. Malaria and dropsy crippled him, and he was taken back to Assisi. Despite his protestations, he was put to bed in the Episcopal Palace. He asked the doctor to tell him the truth, and was told that he could barely survive the autumn. He astonished everyone by beginning to sing. Then it is said he added a stanza to his Canticle of the Sun. Be praised, Lord, for our sister bodily death, from whom no man can escape. Alas, for them who die in mortal sin, blessed are they who are found in thy holy will, for the second death will not work them harm. It is said that in these last days he repented of his asceticism, as having offended his brother the body. When the bishop was called away, Francis persuaded the monks to remove him to Portiuncula. There he dictated his will, at once modest and commanding. He bade his followers be content with poor and abandoned churches, and not to accept habitations out of harmony with their vows of poverty, to surrender to the bishop any heretic or recreant monk in the order, and never to change the rule. He died October 3, 1226, in the forty-fifth year of his age, singing a psalm. Two years later the church named him a saint. Two other leaders dominated that dynamic age, Innocent III and Frederick II. Innocent raised the church to its greatest height, from which in a century it fell. Frederick raised the empire to its greatest height, from which in a decade it fell. Francis exaggerated the virtues of poverty and ignorance, but he reinvigorated Christianity by bringing back into it the spirit of Christ. Today only scholars know of the Pope and the Emperor, but the simple saint reaches into the hearts of millions of men. The order that he had founded numbered at his death some 5,000 members, and had spread into Hungary, Germany, England, France, and Spain. It proved the bulwark of the Church in winning northern Italy from heresy back to Catholicism. Its gospel of poverty and illiteracy could be accepted by only a small minority. Europe insisted on traversing the exciting parabola of wealth, science, philosophy, and doubt. Meanwhile, even the modified rule that Francis had so unwillingly accepted was further relaxed in 1230. Men could not be expected to stay long and in needed number on the heights of the almost delirious asceticism that had shortened Francis's life. With a milder rule, the Friars Minor grew by 1280 to 200,000 monks in 8,000 monasteries. They became great preachers, and by their example led the secular clergy to take up the custom of preaching, heretofore confined to bishops. They produced saints like St. Bernardino of Siena and St. Anthony of Padua, scientists like Roger Bacon, philosophers like Duns Scotus, teachers like Alexander of Hales. Some became agents of the Inquisition, some rose to be bishops, archbishops, popes. Many undertook dangerous missionary enterprises in distant and alien lands. Gifts poured in from the pious. Some leaders, like Brother Elias, learned to like luxury, and though Francis had forbidden rich churches, Elias raised to his memory the imposing basilica that still crowns the hill of Assisi. The paintings of Cimabue and Giotto there were the first products of an immense and enduring influence of St. Francis, his history and his legend, on Italian art.
Many Minorites protested against the relaxation of Francis's rule. As spirituals or zealots, they lived in hermitages or small convents in the Apennines, while the great majority of Franciscans preferred spacious monasteries. The spirituals argued that Christ and his apostles had possessed no property. St. Bonaventura agreed. Pope Nicholas III approved the proposition in 1279. Pope John XII pronounced it false in 1323. And thereafter those spirituals who persisted in preaching it were suppressed as heretics. A century after the death of Francis, his most loyal followers were burned at the stake by the Inquisition. 4. St. Dominic It is unjust to Dominic that his name should suggest the Inquisition. He was not its founder, nor was he responsible for its terrors. His own activity was to convert by example and preaching. He was of sterner stuff than Francis, but revered him as the saintlier saint and Francis loved him in return. Essentially their work was the same. Each organized a great order of men devoted not to self-salvation in solitude, but to missionary work among Christians and infidels. Each took from the heretics their most persuasive weapons, the praise of poverty and the practice of preaching. Together they saved the church. Domingo de Guzman was born at Calaruega in Castile in 1170. Brought up by an uncle priest, he was one of thousands who in those days took Christianity to heart. When famine struck Palencia, he is said to have sold all his goods, even his precious books, to feed the poor. He became an Augustinian canon regular in the Cathedral of Osma, and in 1201 accompanied his bishop on a mission to Toulouse, then a center of the Albigensian heresy. Their very host was an Albigensian. It may be a legend that Dominic converted him overnight. Inspired by the advice of the bishop and the example of some heretics, Dominic adopted the life of voluntary poverty, went about barefoot, and strove peaceably to bring the people back to the church. At Montpellier he met three papal legates, Arnold, Raoul, and Peter of Castelnau. He was shocked by their rich dress and luxury, and attributed to this their confessed failure to make headway against the heretics. He rebuked them with the boldness of a Hebrew prophet. It is not by the display of power and pomp, nor by cavalcades of retainers and richly houseled palfreys, nor by gorgeous apparel that the heretics win proselytes. It is by zealous preaching, by apostolic humility, by austerity, by holiness. The shamed legates, we are told, dismissed their equipage and shed their shoes. For ten years, from 1205 to 1216, Dominic remained in Languedoc, preaching zealously. The only mention of him in connection with physical persecution tells how, at a burning of heretics, he saved one from the flames. Some of his order proudly called him, after his death, Persecutor Hereticorum, not necessarily the persecutor, but the pursuer of heretics. He gathered about him a group of fellow preachers, and their effectiveness was such that Pope Honorius III, in 1216, recognized the friars' preachers as a new order, and approved the rule drawn up for it by Dominic. Making his headquarters at Rome, Dominic gathered recruits, taught them, inspired them with his almost fanatical zeal, and sent them out through Europe as far east as Kiev and into foreign lands to convert Christendom and heathendom to Christianity. At the first general chapter of the Dominicans at Bologna in 1220, Dominic persuaded his followers to adopt by unanimous vote the rule of absolute poverty. There, a year later, he died. Like the Franciscans, the Dominicans spread everywhere as wandering mendicant friars. Matthew Paris describes them in the England of 1240. Very sparing in food and raiment, possessing neither gold nor silver nor anything of their own, they went through cities, towns, and villages, preaching the gospel, living together by tens or sevens, thinking not of the morrow nor keeping anything for the next morning. Whatsoever was left over from their table of the alms given them, this they gave forthwith to the poor. They went shod only with the gospel, they slept in their clothes on mats, and laid stones for pillows under their heads. They took an active and not always a gentle part in the work of the Inquisition. They were employed by the popes in high posts and diplomatic missions. They entered the universities and produced the two giants of scholastic philosophy, Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas. It was they who saved the church from Aristotle by transforming him into a Christian. Together with the Franciscans, the Carmelites, and the Austin Friars, they revolutionized the monastic life by mingling with the common people in daily ministrations 
and raised monasticism in the 13th century to a power and beauty which it had never attained before. A large perspective of monastic history does not bear out the exaggerations of moralists nor the caricatures of satirists. Many cases of monastic misconduct can be cited. They draw attention precisely because they are exceptional. And which of us is so saintly that he may demand an untarnished record from any class of men? The monks who remained faithful to their vows, who lived in obscure poverty, chastity, and piety, eluded both gossip and history. Virtue makes no news, and bores both readers and historians. We hear of sumptuous edifices possessed by Franciscan monks as early as 1249, and in 1271 Roger Bacon, whose hyperboles often forfeited him a hearing, informed the Pope that the new orders are now horribly fallen from their original dignity. But this is hardly the picture that we get from Fra Salimbene's candid and intimate chronicle of possibly 1288. Here a Franciscan monk takes us behind the scenes and into the daily career of his order. There are peccadilloes here and there, and some quarrels and jealousy. But over all that arduously inhibited life hovers an atmosphere of modesty, simplicity, brotherliness, and peace. If occasionally a woman enters this story, she merely brings a touch of grace and tenderness into narrow and lonely lives. Here a sample of Fra Salimbene's guileless chatter. There was a certain youth in the convent of Bologna who was called Brother Guido. He was wont to snore so mightily in his sleep that no man could rest in the same house with him, wherefore he was set to sleep in a shed among the wood and straw. Yet even so the brethren could not escape him, for the sound of that accursed rumbling echoed throughout the whole convent. So all the priests and discreet brethren gathered together, and it was decreed by a formal sentence that he should be sent back to his mother, who had deceived the order, since she knew all this of her son before he was received among us. Yet was he not sent back forthwith, which was the Lord's doing. For brother Nicholas, considering within himself that the boy was to be cast out through a defect of nature, and without guilt of his own, called the lad daily about the hour of dawn to come and serve him at Mass, and at the end of the Mass the boy would kneel at his bidding behind the altar, hoping to receive some grace of him. Then would Brother Nicholas touch the boy's face and nose with his hands, desiring by God's gifts to bestow on him the boon of health. In brief, the boy was suddenly and wholly healed, without further discomfort to the brethren. Thenceforth he slept in peace and quiet, like any dormouse. 5. The nuns. As early as the time of St. Paul, it had been the custom in Christian communities for widows and other lonely or devout women to give some or all of their days and their property to charitable work. In the fourth century, some women, emulating monks, left the world and lived the life of religious in solitude or in communities under vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. About 5.30, St. Benedict's twin sister, Scholastica, established a nunnery near Monte Cassino under his guidance and rule. From that time, Benedictine convents spread through Europe, and Benedictine nuns became almost as numerous as Benedictine monks. The Cistercian Order opened its first convent in 1125, its most famous one, Port Royal, in 1204. By 1300, there were 700 Cistercian nunneries in Europe. In these older orders, most of the nuns came from the upper classes, and nunneries were too often the repository of women for whom their male relations had no room or taste. In 458, the Emperor Majorian had to forbid parents to rid themselves of supernumerary daughters by compelling them to enter a convent. Entry into Benedictine nunneries usually required a dowry, though the Church prohibited any but voluntary offerings. Hence a prioress, like Chaucer's, could be a woman of proud breeding and large responsibilities, administering a spacious domain as the source of her convent's revenues. In those days a nun was usually called not sister, but madam. St. Francis revolutionized conventual as well as monastic institutions. When Santa Clara came to him in 1212 and expressed her wish to found for women such an order as he had founded for men, he overlooked canonical regulations and, though himself only a deacon, received her vows, accepted her into the Franciscan order, and commissioned her to organize the poor clares. Innocent III, with his usual ability to forgive infractions of the letter by the Spirit, confirmed the commission in 1216. Santa Clara gathered about her some pious women who lived in communal poverty, wove and spun, nursed the sick, and distributed charity. Legends formed around her almost as fondly as around Francis himself. Once, we are told, a pope, 
went to her convent to hear her discourse of divine and celestial things. Santa Clara had the table laid, and set loaves of bread thereon that the Holy Father might bless them. Santa Clara knelt down with great reverence, and besought him to be pleased to bless the bread. The Holy Father answered, Sister Clare, most faithful one, I desire that thou shouldst bless this bread, and make over it the sign of the most holy cross of Christ, to which thou hast completely devoted thyself. And Santa Clara said, Most holy Father, forgive me, but I should merit great reproof if, in the presence of the Vicar of Christ, I, who am a poor, vile woman, should presume to give such benediction. And the Pope answered, To the end that this not be imputed to thy presumption, but to the merit of obedience, I command thee, by holy obedience, that thou bless this bread in the name of God. And then Santa Clara, even as a true daughter of obedience, devoutly blessed the bread with the sign of the Most Holy Cross. Marvelous to tell, forthwith on all those loaves the sign of the cross appeared figured most beautifully. And the Holy Father, when he saw this miracle, partook of the bread and departed, thanking God and leaving his blessing with Santa Clara. She died in 1253 and was canonized soon afterward. Franciscan monks in divers localities organized similar groups of Clarice, or poor clares. The other mendicant orders, Dominicans, Augustinians, Carmelites, also established a second order of nuns, and by 1300 Europe had as many nuns as monks. In Germany, the nunneries tended to be havens of intense mysticism. In France and England, they were often the refuge of noble ladies converted from the world, or deserted, disappointed, or bereaved. The Ankern rule, that is, the rule of the Anchorites, reveals the mood expected of English nuns in the 13th century. It may have been written by Bishop Poor, probably for a convent at Tarrant in Dorsetshire. It is darkened with much talk of sin and hell, and some blasphemous abuse of the female body, but a tone of fine sincerity redeems it, and it is among the oldest and noblest specimens of English prose. It would be a simple matter to gather from ten centuries some fascinating instances of conventual immorality. A number of nuns had been cloistered against their wills and found it uncomfortable to be saints. Archbishop Theodore of Canterbury and Bishop Egbert of York deemed it necessary to forbid the seduction of nuns by abbots, priests, and bishops. Bishop Evo of Chartres, from 1035 to 1115, reported that the nuns of St. Farah's convent were practicing prostitution. Abelard, 1079 to 1142, gave a similar picture of some French convents of his time. Pope Innocent III described the convent of St. Agatha as a brothel that infected the whole surrounding country with its evil life and repute. Bishop Rigaud of Rouen, in 1249, gave a generally favorable report of the religious groups in his diocese, but told of one nunnery in which, out of thirty-three nuns and three lay sisters, eight were guilty or suspected of fornication, and the prioress is drunk almost any night. Boniface the Eighth in 1300, tried to improve conventual discipline by decreeing strict claustration or seclusion from the world, but the decree could not be enforced. At one nunnery in the Diocese of Lincoln, when the bishop came to deposit this papal bull, the nuns threw it at his head and vowed they would never obey it. Such isolation had probably not been in their vows. The prioress in Chaucer's tales had no business there, for the church had forbidden nuns to go on pilgrimage. If history had been as careful to note instances of obedience to conventual rules as to record infractions, we should probably be able to counter each sinful lapse with a thousand examples of fidelity. In many cases the rules were inhumanly severe and merited violation. Carthusian and Cistercian nuns were required to keep silence except when speech was indispensable, a command sorely uncongenial to the gentle sex. Usually the nuns attended to their own needs of cleaning, cooking, washing, sewing, they made clothing for monks and the poor, linen for the altar, vestments for the priest. They wove and embroidered hangings and tapestries, and depicted on them with nimble fingers and patient souls half the history of the world. They copied and illuminated manuscripts. They received children to board and taught them letters, hygiene, and domestic arts. For centuries they provided the only higher education open to girls. Many of them served as nurses in hospitals. They rose at midnight for prayers and again before dawn, and recited the canonical hours. Many days were fast days, on which they ate no food till the evening meal. Let us hope that these hard rules were sometimes infringed. If we look back upon the nineteen centuries of Christianity, with all their heroes, kings, and saints, we shall find it difficult to list many men who came so close to Christian perfection as the nuns. 
their lives of quiet devotion and cheerful ministration have made many generations blessed. When all the sins of history are weighed in the balance, the virtues of these women will tip the scale against them and redeem our race. 6. The Mystics Many such women could be saints because they felt divinity closer to them than hands and feet. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 2. Many such women could be saints because they felt divinity closer to them than hands and feet. The medieval imagination was so stimulated by all the forces of word, picture, statue, ceremony, even by the color and quantity of light, that supersensory visions came readily, and the believing soul felt itself breaking through the bounds of nature to the supernatural. The human mind itself, in all the mystery of its power, seemed a supernatural and unearthly thing, surely akin to a blurred image and infinitesimal fraction of the mind behind and in the matter of the world. So the top of the mind might touch the foot of the throne of God. In the ambitious humility of the mystic, the hope burned that a soul unburdened of sin and uplifted with prayer might rise on the wings of grace to the beatific vision and a divine companionship. That vision could never be attained through sensation, reason, science, or philosophy, which were bound to time, the many, and the earth, and could never reach to the core and power and oneness of the universe. The problem of the mystic was to cleanse the soul as an internal organ of spiritual perception, to wash away from it all stain of selfish individuality and illusory multiplicity, to widen its reach and love to the uttermost inclusion, and then to see with clear and disembodied sight that the cosmic, eternal, and divine, and thereby to return as from a long exile to union with the God from whom birth had meant a penal severance. Had not Christ promised that the pure in heart would see God? Mystics, therefore, appeared in every age, every religion, and every land. Greek Christianity abounded in them, despite the Hellenic legacy of reason. St. Augustine was a mystic fountain for the West. His confessions constituted a return of the soul from created things to God. Seldom had any mortal so long conversed with the deity. St. Anselm, the statesman, St. Bernard, the organizer, upheld the mystical approach against the rationalism of Roslin and Abelard. When William of Champeau was driven from Paris by the logic of Abelard, he founded in a suburb in 1108 the Augustinian Abbey of St. Victor as a school of theology, and his successors there, Hugh and Richard, ignoring the perilous adventure of young philosophy, based religion not on argument but on the mystical experience of the divine presence. Hugh, who died in 1141, saw supernatural sacramental symbols in every phase of creation. Richard, who died in 1173, rejected logic and learning, preferred the heart to the head a la Pascal, and described with learned logic the mystical rise of the soul to God. The passion of Italy kindled mysticism into a gospel of revolution. Joachim of Florida, Giovanni de Gioacchini di Fiori, a noble of Calabria, developed a longing to see Palestine. Impressed on the way by the misery of the people, he dismissed his retinue and continued as a humble pilgrim. Legend tells how he passed an entire Lent in an old well on Mount Tabor, how on Easter Sunday a great splendor appeared to him and filled him with such divine light that he understood at once all the scriptures, all the future, and all the past. Returning to Calabria, he became a Cistercian monk and priest, thirsted for austerity, and retired to a hermitage. Disciples gathered, and he formed them into a new order of flora, whose rule of poverty and prayer was approved by Celestin III. In 1200 he sent to Innocent III a series of works which he had written, he said, under divine inspiration, but which nevertheless he submitted for papal censorship. Two years later he died. His writings were based on the Augustinian theory, widely accepted in Orthodox circles, that a symbolic concordance existed between the events of the Old Testament and the history of Christendom from the birth of Christ to the establishment of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Joachim divided the history of man into three stages— the first, under the rule of God the Father, ended at the Nativity. The second, ruled by the Son, would last, according to apocalyptic calculations, 1260 years. The third, under the Holy Ghost, would be preceded by a time of troubles, of war and poverty and ecclesiastical corruption, and would be ushered in by the rise of a new monastic order which would cleanse the Church and would realize a worldwide utopia of peace, justice, and happiness. 
Thousands of Christians, including men high in the church, accepted Joachim's claim to divine inspiration and looked hopefully to 1260 as the year of the Second Advent. The spiritual Franciscans, confident that theirs was the new order, took courage from Joachim's teachings. And when they were outlawed by the church, they carried on their propaganda through writings published under his name. In 1254, an edition of Joachim's main works appeared under the title of The Everlasting Gospel, with a commentary proclaiming that a pope tainted with simony would mark the close of the Second Age, and that in the Third Age the need of sacraments and priests would be ended by the reign of universal love. The book was condemned by the Church. Its presumptive author, a Franciscan monk, Gerardo da Borga, was imprisoned for life. But its circulation secretly continued, and deeply affected mystical and heretical thought in Italy and France, from St. Francis to Dante, who placed Joachim in paradise. Perhaps an excited expectation of the coming kingdom, a mania of religious penitence flared up around Perugia in 1259 and swept through northern Italy. Thousands of penitents of every age and class marched in disorderly procession, dressed only in loincloths, weeping, praying God for mercy, and scourging themselves with leather thongs. Thieves and usurers fell in and restored their illegal gains. Murderers, Catching the contagion of repentance, knelt before their victim's kin and begged to be slain. Prisoners were released, exiles were recalled, enmities were healed. The movement spread through Germany into Bohemia, and for a time it seemed that a new and mystical faith, ignoring the Church, would inundate Europe. But in a little while the nature of man reasserted itself. New enmities developed, sinning and murder were renewed, and the flagellant craze disappeared into the psychic recesses from which it had emerged. The mystic flame burned less fitfully in Flanders. A priest of Liège, Lambert Le Begue, that is, the stutterer, established in 1184 on the Meuse a house for women who, without taking monastic vows, wished to live together in small, semi-communistic groups, supporting themselves by weaving wool and making lace. Similar Maison Dieu, or Houses of God, were established for men. The men called themselves Begards, the women Beguines. These communities, like the Waldenses, condemned the church for owning property and themselves practiced a voluntary poverty. A similar sect, the Brethren of the Free Spirit, appeared about 1262 in Augsburg and developed in the cities along the Rhine. Both movements claimed a mystical inspiration which absorbed them from ecclesiastical control, even from state or moral law. State and church combined to suppress them. They went underground, emerged repeatedly under new names, and contributed to the origin and fervor of the Anabaptists and other radical sects in the Reformation. Germany became the favorite land of mysticism in the West. Hildegard of Bingen, from 1099 to 1179, the Sibyl of the Rhine, lived all but eight of her 82 years as a Benedictine nun, and ended as abbess of a convent on the Rupertsberg. She was an unusual mixture of administrator and visionary, pietist and radical, poet and scientist, physician and saint. She corresponded with popes and kings, always in a tone of inspired authority, and in Latin prose of masculine power. She published several books of visions, or shivias, for which she claimed the collaboration of the deity. The clergy were chagrined to hear it, for these revelations were highly critical of the wealth and corruption of the church. Said Hildegard in accents of eternal hope, Divine justice shall have its hour. The judgments of God are about to be accomplished. The empire and the papacy, sunk into impiety, shall crumble away together. But upon their ruins shall appear a new nation. The heathen, the Jews, the worldly, and the unbelieving shall be converted together. Springtime and peace shall reign over a regenerated world, and the angels will return with confidence to dwell among men. A century later, Elizabeth of Thuringia, from 1207 to 1231, aroused Hungary with her brief life of ascetic sanctity. Daughter of King Andrew, she was married at thirteen to a German prince, was a mother at fourteen, a widow at twenty. Her brother-in-law despoiled her and drove her away penniless. She became a wandering pietist devoted to the poor. She housed leprous women and washed their wounds. She too had heavenly visions, but she gave them no publicity and claimed no supernatural powers. Meeting the fiery inquisitor Conrad of Marburg, she was morbidly fascinated by his merciless devotion to orthodoxy. She became his obedient slave. 
He beat her for the slightest deviation from his concept of sanctity. She submitted humbly, inflicted additional austerities upon herself, and died of them at twenty-four. Her reputation for saintliness was so great that at her funeral half-mad devotees cut off her hair, ears, and nipples as sacred relics. Another Elizabeth entered the Benedictine nunnery of Schonau, near Bingen, at the age of twelve, in 1141, and lived there till her death in 1165. Bodily infirmities and extreme asceticism generated trances in which she received heavenly revelations from various dead saints, nearly all anti-clerical. The Lord's vine has withered, her guardian angel told her. The head of the church is ill and her members are dead. Kings of the earth, the cry of your iniquity has risen even to me. Toward the end of this period, the mystic tide ran high in Germany. Meister Eckhart, born about 1260, would come to his ripe doctrine in 1326, to his trial and death in 1327. His pupils, Suzo and Tauler, would continue his mystic pantheism. And from that tradition of unecclesiastical piety would flow one source of the Reformation. Usually the Church bore patiently with the mystics in her fold. She did not tolerate serious doctrinal deviations from the official line, or the anarchic individualism of some religious sects. But she admitted the claim of the mystics to a direct approach to God, and listened with good humor to saintly denunciations of her human faults. Many clergymen, even high dignitaries, sympathized with the critics, recognized the shortcomings of the Church, and wished that they too could lay down the contaminating tools and tasks of world politics, and enjoy the security and peace of monasteries fed by the piety of the people and protected by the power of the Church. Perhaps it was such patient ecclesiastics who kept Christianity steady amid the delirious revelations that periodically threatened the medieval mind. As we read the mystics of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries, it dawns upon us that orthodoxy was often a barrier to contagious superstitions, and that in one aspect the Church was belief, as the state was force, organized from chaos into order to keep men sane. 7. The Tragic Pope When Gregory X came to the papacy in 1271, the Church was again at the summit of her power. He was a Christian as well as a pope, a man of peace and amity, seeking justice rather than victory. Hoping to regain Palestine by one united effort, he persuaded Venice, Genoa, and Bologna to end their wars— he secured the election of Rudolf of Habsburg as emperor, but soothed with courtesy and kindness the defeated candidates. And he reconciled Guelph and Ghibelline in factious Florence and Siena, saying to his Guelph supporters, Your enemies are Ghibellines, but they are also men, citizens, and Christians. He summoned the prelates of the church to the Council of Lyon in 1274. Fifteen hundred seventy leading churchmen came. Every great state sent a representative— the Greek emperor sent the heads of the Greek church to reaffirm its submission to the Roman see. Latin and Greek churchmen sang together a Te Deum of joy. Bishops were invited to list the abuses that needed reform in the church. They responded with startling candor, and legislation was passed to mitigate these evils. All Europe was magnificently united for a mighty effort against the Saracens. But on the way back to Rome, Gregory died in 1276. His successors were too busy with Italian politics to carry out his plans. Nevertheless, when Boniface VIII was chosen Pope in 1294, the papacy was still the strongest government in Europe, the best organized, the best administered, the richest in revenue. It was the misfortune of the Church that at this juncture, nearing the end of a virile and progressive century, the mightiest throne in Christendom should have fallen to a man whose love of the Church and sincerity of purpose were equaled by his imperfect morals, his personal pride, and his tactless will to power. He was not without charm. He loved learning and rivaled Innocent III in legal training and wide culture. He founded the University of Rome and restored and extended the Vatican Library. He gave commissions to Giotto and Arnolfo di Cambio and helped finance the amazing facade of Orvieto Cathedral. He had prepared his own elevation by persuading the saintly but incompetent Celestine V to resign after a pontificate of five months an unprecedented act that surrounded Boniface with ill will from the start. To scotch all plans for a restoration, he ordered the eighty-year-old Celestine to be kept in detention in Rome. Celestine escaped, was captured, escaped again, wandered for weeks through Apulia, reached the Adriatic, attempted a crossing to Dalmatia, was wrecked, 
was cast ashore in Italy and was brought before Boniface. He was condemned by the Pope to imprisonment in a narrow cell at Ferentino, and there, ten months later, he died in 1296. The temper of the new Pope was sharpened by a succession of diplomatic defeats and costly victories. He tried to dissuade Frederick of Aragon from accepting the throne of Sicily. When Frederick persisted, Boniface excommunicated him and laid an interdict upon the island, this in 1296. Neither king nor people paid any heed to these censures, and in the end Boniface recognized Frederick. To prepare for a crusade, he ordered Venice and Genoa to sign a truce. They continued their war for three years more and rejected his intervention in making peace. Failing to secure a favorable order in Florence, he placed the city under interdict and invited Charles of Valois to enter and pacify Italy in 1300. Charles accomplished nothing but won the hatred of the Florentines for himself and the Pope. Seeking peace in his own papal states, Boniface had attempted to settle a quarrel among the members of the powerful Colonna family. Pietro and Jacopo Colonna, both cardinals, repudiated his suggestions. He deposed and excommunicated them in 1297, whereupon the rebellious nobles affixed to the doors of Roman churches and laid upon the altar of St. Peter's a manifesto appealing from the Pope to a general council. Boniface repeated the excommunication, extended it to five other rebels, ordered their property confiscated, invaded the Colonna domain with papal troops, captured its fortresses, razed Palestrina to the ground, and had salt strewn over its ruins. The rebels surrendered, were forgiven, revolted again, were again beaten by the warrior pope, fled from the papal states, and planned revenge. Amid these Italian tribulations, Boniface was suddenly confronted by a major crisis in France. Philip IV, resolved to unify his realm, had seized the English province of Gascony. Edward I had declared war, this in 1294. Now, to finance their struggle, both kings decided to tax the property and personnel of the church. The popes had permitted such taxation for crusades, but never for a purely secular war. The French clergy had recognized their duty of contributing to the defense of the state that protected their possessions, but they feared that if the power of the state to tax were unchecked, it would be a power to destroy. Philip had already reduced the role of the clergy in France. He had removed them from the manorial and royal courts, and from their old posts in the administration of the government and in the council of the king. Disturbed by this trend, the Cistercian order refused to send Philip the fifth of their revenues which he had asked for the war with England, and its head addressed an appeal to the Pope. Boniface had to move carefully, for France had long been the chief support of the papacy in the struggle with Germany and the empire. But he felt that the economic basis of the power and freedom of the church would soon be lost if she could be shorn of her revenues by state taxation of church property without papal consent. In February 1296 he issued one of the most famous bulls in ecclesiastical history. Its first words, Clericis Laicos, gave it a name, its first sentence made an unwise admission, and its tone recalled the papal bolts of Gregory the Seventh. Antiquity reports that laymen are exceedingly hostile to the clergy, and our experience certainly shows this to be true at present. With the counsel of our brethren and by our apostolic authority, we decree that if any clergy shall pay to laymen any part of their income or possessions without the permission of the Pope, they shall incur excommunication. And we also decree that all persons of whatever power or rank who shall demand or receive such taxes, or shall seize or cause to be seized the property of churches or of the clergy, shall incur excommunication. Philip, for his part, was convinced that the great wealth of the church in France should share in the costs of the state. He countered the papal bull by prohibiting the export of gold, silver, precious stones, or food, and by forbidding foreign merchants or emissaries to remain in France. These measures blocked a main source of papal revenue and banished from France the papal agents who were raising funds for a crusade in the east. In the bull... Ineffabilis Amor, September 1296, Boniface retreated. He sanctioned voluntary contributions from the clergy for the necessary defense of the state, and conceded the right of the king to be the judge of such a necessity. Philip rescinded his retaliatory ordinances. He and Edward accepted Boniface, not as pope but as a private person, as arbitrator of their dispute. Boniface decided most of the issues in Philip's favor. England yielded for the moment and the three warriors enjoyed a passing peace. 
perhaps to replenish the papal treasury after the decline of receipts from England and France, perhaps to finance a war for the recovery of Sicily as a papal fief, and another war to extend the papal states into Tuscany, Boniface proclaimed 1300 as a jubilee year. The plan was a complete success. Rome had never in its history seen such crowds before. Now, apparently for the first time, traffic rules were enforced to govern the movement of the people. Boniface and his aides managed the affair well. Food was brought in abundantly and was sold at moderate prices, papally controlled. It was an advantage for the Pope that the great sums so collected were not earmarked for any special purpose, but could be used according to his judgment. Despite half-victories and severe defeats, Boniface was now at the crest of his curve. In the meantime, however, the Colonna exiles were entertaining Philip with tales of the Pope's greed, injustice, and private heresies. A quarrel arose between Philip's aides and a papal legate, Bernard Cessé. The legate was arrested on a charge of inciting to insurrection. He was tried by the royal court, convicted and committed to the custody of the Archbishop of Narbonne in 1301. Boniface, shocked by this summary treatment of his legate, demanded Cessé's immediate release and instructed the French clergy to suspend payment of ecclesiastical revenues to the state. In the bull Ausculta Fili, Listen, Son, December 1301, he appealed to Philip to listen modestly to the Vicar of Christ as the spiritual monarch over all the kings of the earth. He protested against the trial of a churchman before a civil court and the continued use of ecclesiastical funds for secular purposes, and he announced that he would summon the bishops and abbots of France to take measures for the preservation of the liberties of the church, the reformation of the kingdom, and the amendment of the king. When this bull was presented to Philip, the Count of Artois snatched it from the hands of the Pope's emissary and flung it into the fire, and a copy destined for publication by the French clergy was suppressed. Passion was inflamed on both sides by the circulation of two spurious documents, one allegedly from Boniface to Philip, demanding obedience even in temporal affairs, the other from Philip to Boniface, informing thy very great fatuity that in temporal things we are subject to no one and these forgeries were widely accepted as genuine. On February 11, 1302, the bull Ausculta Fili was officially burned at Paris before the king and a great multitude. To forestall the ecclesiastical council proposed by Boniface, Philip summoned the three estates of his realm to meet at Paris in April. At this first states-general in French history, all three classes, nobles, clergy, and commons, wrote separately to Rome in defense of the king and his temporal power. Some forty-five French prelates, despite Philip's prohibition and the confiscation of their property, attended the council at Rome in October 1302. From that council issued the bull Unam Sanctum, which made arrestingly specific the claims of the papacy. There is, said the bull, but one true church, outside of which there is no salvation. There is but one body of Christ, with one head, not two. That head is Christ and his representative, the Roman Pope. There are two swords or powers, the spiritual and the temporal. The first is borne by the church, the second is borne for the church by the king, but under the will and sufferance of the priest. The spiritual power is above the temporal and has the right to instruct it regarding its highest end and to judge it when it does evil. We declare and define and pronounce, concluded the bull, that it is necessary for salvation that all men should be subject to the Roman pontiff. Philip replied by calling two assemblies, in March and June of 1303, which drew up a formal indictment of Boniface as a tyrant, sorcerer, murderer, embezzler, adulterer, sodomite, simoniac, idolater, and infidel, and demanded his deposition by a general council of the church. The king commissioned William of Nogaret, his chief legist, to go to Rome and notify the pope of the king's appeal to a general council. Boniface, then in the papal palace at Anagni, declared that only the Pope could call a general council, and prepared a decree excommunicating Philip and laying an interdict upon France. Before he could issue it, William of Nogaret and Chiara Colonna, heading a band of two thousand mercenaries, burst into the palace, presented Philip's message of notification, and demanded the Pope's resignation. This on September 7, 1303. Boniface refused. A tradition of considerable trustworthiness says that Chiara struck the pontiff in the face and would have killed him had not Nogaret intervened. Boniface was seventy-five years old, physically weak but still defiant. For three days he was kept a prisoner in his palace while the mercenaries plundered it. 
Then the people of Anagni, reinforced by four hundred horsemen from the Orsini clan, scattered the mercenaries and freed the Pope. Apparently his jailers had given him no food in the three days, for standing in the marketplace he begged, If there be any good woman who would give me an alms of wine and bread, I would bestow upon her God's blessing and mine. The Orsini led him to Rome and the Vatican. There he fell into a violent fever, and in a few days he died on October 11th, 1303. His successor, Benedict XI, from 1303 to 1304, excommunicated Nogare, Chiara, Colonna, and thirteen others whom he had seen breaking into the palace at Anagni. A month later, Benedict died at Perugia, apparently poisoned by Italian Ghibellines. Philip agreed to support Bertrand de Go, Archbishop of Bordeaux, for the papacy if he would adopt a conciliatory policy, absolve those who had been excommunicated for the attack upon Boniface, allow an annual income tax of ten percent to be levied upon the French clergy for five years, restore the colonists to their offices and property, and condemn the memory of Boniface. We do not know how far Bertrand consented. He was chosen pope and took the name of Clement V in 1305. The cardinals warned him that his life would be unsafe in Rome. And after some hesitation and perhaps a pointed suggestion from Philip, Clement removed the papal seat to Avignon, on the east bank of the Rhone, just outside the southeastern boundary of France. This in 1309. So began the sixty-eight years of the Babylonian captivity of the popes. The papacy had freed itself from Germany and surrendered to France. Clement, against his weak will, became the humiliated tool of the insatiable Philip. He absolved the king, restored the Colonna family, withdrew the bull Clericis Laicos, allowed the spoliation of the Templars, and finally, in 1310, consented to a post-mortem trial of Boniface by an ecclesiastical consistory at Grosso, near Avignon. In the preliminary examinations held before the Pope and his commissioners, six ecclesiastics testified to having heard Boniface, a year before his pontificate, remark that all supposedly divine laws were inventions of men to keep the common people in good behavior through fear of hell, that it was fatuous to believe that God was at once one and three, or that a virgin had borne a child, or that God had become a man, or that bread could be changed into the body of Christ, or that there was a future life. So I believe and so I hold, as doth every educated man. The vulgar hold otherwise. We must speak as the vulgar do, and think and believe with the few. So these six quoted Boniface, and three of them, later re-examined, repeated their testimony. The prior of Saint Gilles at San Gimino reported that Boniface, as Cardinal Gaetani, had denied the resurrection of either body or soul, and several other ecclesiastics confirmed this testimony. One ecclesiastic quoted Boniface as saying of the consecrated host, It is mere paste. Men formerly belonging to the household of Boniface accused him of repeated sexual sins, natural and unnatural. Others accused the supposed skeptic of attempting magical communication with the powers of darkness. Before the actual trial could be held, Clement persuaded Philip to leave the question of Boniface's guilt to the coming Ecumenical Council of Vienne. When that council met in 1311, three cardinals appeared before it and testified to the orthodoxy and morality of the dead pope. Two knights, as challengers, threw down their gauntlets to maintain his innocence by wager of battle. No one accepted the challenge, and the council declared the matter closed. 8. Retrospect The testimony against Boniface, true or false, reveals the undercurrent of skepticism that was preparing to end the Age of Faith. Likewise, the blow physical or political, given Boniface VIII at the Nanyi, marks in one sense the beginning of modern times. It was the victory of nationalism against supernationalism, of the state against the church, of the power of the sword over the magic of the word. The papacy had been weakened by its struggle against the Hohenstaufens, by the failure of the Crusades. France and England had been strengthened by the collapse of the empire, and France had been enriched by acquiring Languedoc with the help of the church. Perhaps the popular support given to Philip IV against Boniface VIII reflected public resentment of the excesses of the Inquisition and the Albigensian Crusade. Some of Nogare's ancestors, it was said, had been burned by the Inquisitors. Boniface had not realized, in undertaking so many conflicts, that the weapons of the papacy had been blunted by overuse. Industry and commerce had generated a class less pious than the peasantry. 
life and thought were becoming secularized. The laity was coming into its own. For seventy years now the state would absorb the church. Looking back over the panorama of Latin Christianity, we are impressed above all by the relative unanimity of religious faith among diverse peoples and the overspreading hierarchy and power of the Roman Church, giving to Western Europe, non-Slavic, non-Byzantine Europe, a unity of mind and morals such as it has never known again. Nowhere else in history has an organization wielded so profound an influence over so many men for so long a time. The authority of the Roman Republic and Empire over its immense realm endured from Pompey to Alaric, 480 years, that of the Mongol Empire or the British Empire, some 200 years. But the Roman Catholic Church was the dominant force in Europe, from the death of Charlemagne in 814 to the death of Boniface VIII in 1303, 489 years. Her organization and administration do not appear to have been as competent as that of the Roman Empire, nor was her personnel as capable or cultured as the men who governed the provinces and cities for the Caesars. But the church inherited a barbarous bedlam and had to find a laborious way back to order and education. Even so, her clergy were the best instructed men of the age, and it was they who provided the only education available in Western Europe during the five centuries of her supremacy. Her courts offered the justice justice of her time. Her papal curia, sometimes venal, sometimes incorruptible, constituted in some degree a world court for the arbitration of international disputes and the limitation of war. And though that court was always too Italian, the Italians were the best trained minds of those centuries, and any man could rise to membership in that court from any rank and nation in Latin Christendom. Despite the chicanery usually accompanying collective human power, it was good that above the states and kings of Europe there should be an authority that could call them to account and moderate their strife. If any world state was to be, what could seem fitter than that its seat should be the throne of Peter, whence men, however limited, could see with a continental eye and from the background of centuries? What decisions could be more peaceably accepted, or could be more easily enforced, than those of a pontiff revered as the vicar of God by nearly all the population of Western Europe? When Louis the Ninth left on crusade in 1248, Henry the Third of England made extreme demands upon France and prepared to invade. Pope Innocent the Fourth threatened England with interdict should Henry persist, and Henry refrained. The power of the Church, said the skeptical Hume, was a rampart of refuge against the tyranny and injustice of kings. The Church might have realized the high conception of Gregory the Seventh, might have made her moral power supreme over the physical forces of the states had she used her influence only for spiritual and moral purposes and never for material ends. When Urban II united Christendom against the Turks, the dream of Gregory was almost realized. But when Innocent III, Gregory IX, Alexander IV, and Boniface VIII gave the holy name of crusade to their wars against the Albigensians, Frederick II, and the Colonnas, the great ideal broke to pieces in papal hands stained with Christian blood. Where the church was not threatened, she responded with considerable tolerance for diverse, even heretical views. We shall find an unexpected freedom of thought among the philosophers of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries, even among professors at universities chartered and supervised by the church. All that she asked was that such discussions should be confined and intelligible only to the educated, and should not take the form of revolutionary appeals to the people to abandon their creed or the church. The church says her most industrious recent critic, as it embraced the whole population, embraced also every type of mind, from the most superstitious to the most agnostic, and many of these unorthodox elements worked far more freely under the cloak of outward conformity than is generally supposed. All in all, the picture that we form of the medieval Latin church is that of a complex organization doing its best, despite the human frailties of its adherents and its leaders, to establish moral and social order, and to spread an uplifting and consoling faith amid the wreckage of an old civilization and the passions of an adolescent society. The sixth century church found Europe a flotsam of migratory barbarians, a babel of tongues and creeds, a chaos of unwritten and incalculable laws. She gave it a moral code buttressed with supernatural sanctions strong enough to check the unsocial impulses of violent men. She offered it monastic retreats for men, women, and classic manuscripts. She governed it with episcopal courts, educated it with schools and universities, 
and tamed the kings of the earth to moral responsibility in the tasks of peace. She brightened the lives of her children with poetry, drama, and song, and inspired them to raise the noblest works of art in history. Unable to establish a utopia of equality among unequally able men, she organized charity and hospitality, and in some measure protected the weak from the strong. She was, beyond question, the greatest civilizing force in medieval European history. Chapter 30 The Morals and Manners of Christendom 700 to 1300 1. The Christian Ethic Man in the jungle or hunting stage had to be greedy, to seek food eagerly and gorge himself zealously, because when food came he could not be sure when it would come again. He had to be sexually sensitive, often promiscuous, because a high death rate compelled a high birth rate. Every woman had to be made a mother whenever possible, and the function of the male was to be always in heat. He had to be pugnacious, ever ready to fight for food or mate. Vices were once virtues, indispensable to survival. But when man found that the best means of survival for individual as well as species was social organization, he expanded the hunting pack into a system of social order in which the instincts, once so useful in the hunting stage, had to be checked at every turn to make society possible. Ethically, every civilization is a balance and tension between the jungle instincts of men and the inhibitions of a moral code. The instincts without the inhibitions would end civilization. The inhibitions without the instincts would end life. The problem of morality is to adjust inhibitions to protect civilization without enfeebling life. In the task of moderating human violence, promiscuity, and greed, certain instincts, chiefly social, took the lead and provided a biological basis for civilization. Parental love in beast and man created the natural social order of the family, with its educative discipline and mutual aid. Parental authority, half a pain of love and half a joy of tyranny, transmitted a life-saving code of social conduct to the individualistic child. The organized force wielded by chieftain, baron, city, or state circumscribed and largely circumvented the unorganized force of individuals. Love of approval bent the ego to the will of the group. Custom and imitation guided the adolescent, now and then, into ways sanctioned by the trial and error experience of the race. Law frightened instinct with the specter of punishment. Conscience tamed youth with the detritus of an endless stream of prohibitions. The Church believed that these natural or secular sources of morality could not suffice to control the impulses that preserve life in the jungle but destroy order in a society. Those impulses are too strong to be deterred by any human authority that cannot be everywhere at once with awesome police. A moral code bitterly uncongenial to the flesh must bear the seal of a supernatural origin if it is to be obeyed. It must carry a divine sanction and prestige that will be respected by the soul in the absence of any force, and in the most secret moments and coverts of life. Even parental authority, so vital to moral and social order, breaks down in the contest with primitive instincts unless it is buttressed by religious belief inculcated in the child. To serve and save a society, a religion must oppose to insistent instinct no disputable man-made directives, but the undebatable categorical imperatives of God himself. And those divine commandments, so sinful or savage is man, must be supported not only by praise and honor bestowed for obeying them, nor only by disgrace and penalties imposed for violating them, but also by the hope of heaven for unrequited virtue and the fear of hell for unpunished sin. The commandments must come not from Moses, but from God. The biological theory of primitive instincts unfitting man for civilization was symbolized in Christian theology by the doctrine of original sin. Like the Hindu conception of karma, this was an attempt to explain apparently unmerited suffering. The good endured evil here because of some ancestral sin. In Christian theory, the whole human race had been tainted by the sin of Adam and Eve. Said Gratian's Decretum, circa 1150, unofficially accepted by the Church as her teaching, Every human being who is conceived by the coition of a man with a woman is born with original sin, subject to impiety and death, and therefore a child of wrath. And only divine grace and the atoning death of Christ could save him from wickedness and damnation. Only the gentle example of the martyred Christ, 
could redeem man from violence, lust, and greed, and save him and his society from destruction. The preaching of this doctrine, combined with natural catastrophes that seemed unintelligible except as punishments for sin, gave many medieval Christians a sense of inborn impurity, depravity, and guilt, which colored much of their literature before 1200. Thereafter, that sense of sin and fear of hell diminished till the Reformation to reappear with fresh terror among the Puritans. Gregory I and later theologians spoke of seven deadly sins, pride, avarice, envy, anger, lust, gluttony, and sloth, and opposed to them the seven cardinal virtues, four natural or pagan virtues praised by Pythagoras and Plato, wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, and three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. But though accepting the pagan virtues, Christianity never assimilated them, it preferred faith to knowledge, patience to courage, love and mercy to justice, abstention and purity to temperance. It exalted humility and ranked pride, so prominent in Aristotle's ideal man, as the deadliest of the deadly sins. It spoke occasionally of the rights of man, but it stressed rather the duties of man, to himself, his fellow man, his church, and God. In preaching a gentle Jesus meek and mild, the church had no fear of making men effeminate. On the contrary, the men of medieval Latin Christendom were more masculine because they met more hardships than their modern beneficiaries and heirs. Theologies and philosophies, like men and states, are what they are because in their time and place they have to be. 2. Premarital Morality How far did medieval morality reflect or justify medieval ethical theory? Let us first look at the picture with no thesis to prove. The first moral incident of the Christian life was baptism. The child was solemnly inducted into the community and the church and was vicariously subjected to their laws. Every child received a Christian name, that is, usually the name of some Christian saint. Surnames, that is, added names, were of motley origin and could go back through generations to kinship, occupation, place, a feature of body or character, even a bit of church ritual. Cicely Wilkins' daughter, James Smith, Margaret Ferrywoman, Matthew Paris, Agnes Redhead, John Merriman, Robert Litany, Robert Benedicity, or Benedict. Gregory the Great, like Rousseau, urged mothers to nurse their own infants. Most poor women did, most upper-class women did not. Children were loved as now, but were beaten more. They were numerous, despite high infantile and adolescent mortality. They disciplined one another by their number and became civilized by attrition. They learned a hundred arts of the country or the city from relatives and playmates, and grew rapidly in knowledge and wickedness. Boys are taught evil as soon as they can babble, said Thomas of Celano in the thirteenth century, and as they grow up they become steadily worse until they are Christians only in name. But moralists are bad historians. Boys reached the age of work at twelve and legal maturity at sixteen. Christian ethics followed, with adolescence, a policy of silence about sex. Financial maturity, the ability to support a family, came later than biological maturity, the ability to reproduce. Sexual education might aggravate the pains of continence in this interval, and the Church required premarital continence as an aid to conjugal fidelity, social order, and public health. Nevertheless, by the age of sixteen, the medieval youth had probably sampled a variety of sexual experiences. Pederasty, which Christianity had effectively attacked in late antiquity, reappeared with the Crusades, the influx of Oriental ideas, and the unisexual isolation of monks and nuns. In 1177, Henry, abbot of Clairvaux, wrote of France that ancient Sodom is springing up from her ashes. Philip the Fair charged that homosexual practices were popular among the Templars. The Penitentials, ecclesiastical manuals prescribing penances for sins, mentioned the usual enormities, including bestiality. An astonishing variety of beasts received such attentions. Where amours of this sort were discovered, they were punishable with the death of both participants, and the records of the English Parliament contain many cases of dogs, goats, cows, pigs, and geese being burned to death with their human paramours. Cases of incest were numerous. Premarital and extramarital relations were apparently as widespread as at any time between antiquity and the twentieth century. This book is continued on Cassette 4, Side 1, The Story of Civilization, 
Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 4, Side 1. Premarital and extramarital relations were apparently as widespread as at any time between antiquity and the 20th century. The promiscuous nature of man overflowed the dikes of secular ecclesiastical legislation, and some women felt that abdominal gaiety could be atoned for by abdominal piety. Rape was common despite the severest penalties. Knights who served high-born dames or damoiselles for a kiss or a touch of the hand might console themselves with ladies' maids. Some ladies could not sleep with a good conscience until they had arranged this courtesy. The knight of La Tour Landry mourned the prevalence of fornication among aristocratic youth. If we were to believe him, some men of his class fornicated in church, nay, on the altar, and he tells of two queens which in Lent on Holy Thursday took their foul delight and pleasance within the church during divine service. William of Malmesbury described the Norman nobility as given over to gluttony and lechery, and exchanging concubines with one another, lest fidelity should dull the edge of husbandry. Illegitimate children littered Christendom and gave a plot to a thousand tales. The heroes of several medieval sagas were bastards. Cuchulain, Arthur, Gawain, Roland, William the Conqueror, and many a knight in Foissard's chronicles. Prostitution adjusted itself to the times. Some women on pilgrimage, according to Bishop Boniface, earned their passage by selling themselves in the towns on their route. Every army was followed with another army, as dangerous as the enemy. The Crusaders, reports Albert of Eggs, had in their ranks a crowd of women wearing the habit of men. They traveled together without distinction of sex, trusting to the chances of a frightful promiscuity. At the siege of Acre in 1189, says the Arabic historian Emadadin, three hundred pretty French women arrived for the solace of the French soldiers, for these would not go into battle if they were deprived of women, seeing which the Moslem armies demanded similar inspiration. In the first crusade of St. Louis, according to Joinville, his barons set up their brothels about the royal tent. The university students, particularly at Paris, developed urgent or imitative needs, and fee established centers of accommodation. Some towns, for example Toulouse, Avignon, Montpellier, Nuremberg, legalized prostitution under municipal supervision, on the ground that without such lupinars, bordelli, frauenhäuser, good women could not venture safely into the streets. St. Augustine had written, If you do away with harlots, the world will be convulsed with lust. And St. Thomas Aquinas agreed. London in the twelfth century had a row of bordels or stews near London Bridge. Originally licensed by the Bishop of Winchester, they were subsequently sanctioned by Parliament. An act of Parliament in 1161 forbade the brothel keepers to have women suffering from the perilous infirmity of burning, the earliest known regulation against the spread of venereal disease. Louis IX, in 1254, decreed the banishment of all prostitutes from France. The edict was enforced. Soon a clandestine promiscuity replaced the former open traffic. The bourgeois gentlemen complained that it was well-nigh impossible to guard the virtue of their wives and daughters from the solicitations of soldiers and students. At last, criticism of the ordinance became so general that it was repealed in 1256. The new decree specified those parts of Paris in which prostitutes might legally live and practice, regulated their dress and ornaments, and submitted them to supervision by a police magistrate popularly known as the Roi des Ribots, or King of the Bawds, Beggars, and Vagabonds. Louis IX, dying, advised his son to renew the edict of expulsion. Philip did, with results much as before. The law remained in the statutes, but was not enforced. In Rome, according to Bishop Durand II of Mond, in 1311, there were brothels near the Vatican, and the Pope's marshals permitted them for a consideration. The Church showed a humane spirit toward prostitutes. She maintained asylums for reformed women, and distributed among the poor the donations received from converted courtesans. 3. Marriage Youth was brief, and marriage came early in the age of faith. A child of seven could consent to a betrothal, and such engagements were sometimes made to facilitate the transfer or protection of property. Grace de Saleby, aged four, was married to a great noble who could preserve her rich estate. Presently he died, and she was married at six to another lord. At eleven she was married to a third. Such unions could be annulled at any time before the normal age of consummation, which in the girl was presumed to be twelve, in the boy fourteen. 
The church reckoned the consent of parents or guardian unnecessary for valid marriage if the parties were of age. She forbade the marriage of girls under fifteen, but allowed many exceptions, for in this matter the rights of property overruled the whims of love, and marriage was an incident in finance. The bridegroom presented gifts or money to the girl's parents, gave her a mourning gift, and pledged her a dower right in his estate. In England, this was a life interest of the widow in one-third of the husband's inheritance in land. The bride's family gave presents to the family of the groom, and assigned to her a dowry consisting of clothing, linen, utensils, and furniture, and sometimes of property. Engagement was an exchange of gauges or pledges. The wedding itself was a pledge, Anglo-Saxon wedian or promise. The spouse was one who had responded, I will. State and church alike accepted as valid marriage, a consummated union accompanied by the exchange of a verbal pledge between the participants, without other ceremony, legal or ecclesiastical. The church sought in this way to protect women from abandonment by seducers, and preferred such unions to fornication or concubinage. But after the twelfth century, she denied validity to marriages contracted without ecclesiastical sanction, and after the Council of Trent in 1563, she required the presence of a priest. Secular law welcomed the ecclesiastical regulation of marriage. Bracton, who died in 1268, held a religious ceremony essential to valid matrimony. The Church raised marriage to a sacrament and made it a sacred covenant between man, woman, and God. Gradually she spread her jurisdiction over every phase of marriage, from the duties of the nuptial bed to the last will and testament of the dying spouse. Her canon law drew up a long list of impediments to matrimony. Each party must be free from any previous marriage bond and from any vow of chastity. Marriage with an unbaptized person was forbidden. Nevertheless, there were many marriages between Christian and Jew. Marriage between slaves, between slave and free, between orthodox Christian and heretic, even between the faithful and the excommunicate was recognized as valid. The parties must not be related within the fourth degree of kinship, that is, must not have an identical ancestor within four generations. Here the Church rejected Roman law and accepted the primitive exogamy that feared degeneration from inbreeding. Perhaps she also deprecated the concentration of wealth through narrow family alliances. In rural villages such inbreeding was difficult to avoid, and the Church had to close her eyes to it, as to many another gap between reality and law. After the marriage ceremony came the wedding procession, with blaring music and flaunting silk, from the Church to the bridegroom's home. Festivities would there ensue through all the day and half the night. The marriage was not valid until consummated. Contraception was forbidden. Aquinas accounted it a crime second only to homicide. Nevertheless, diverse means, mechanical, chemical, magical, were used to effect it, with chief reliance on coitus interruptus. Drugs were peddled that would produce abortion or sterility or impotence or sexual ardor. The penitential formulas of Rabanus Morris decreed three years of penance for her who mixes the semen of her husband with her food, so that she may better receive his love. Infanticide was rare. Christian charity established foundling hospitals in various cities from the 6th century onward. A council at Rouen in the 8th century invited women who had secretly borne children to deposit them at the door of the church, which would undertake to provide for them. Such orphans were brought up as serfs on ecclesiastical properties. A law of Charlemagne decreed that exposed children should be the slaves of those who rescued and reared them. About 1190, a Montpellier monk founded the Fraternity of the Holy Ghost, dedicated to the protection and education of orphans. Penalties for adultery were severe. Saxon law, for example, condemned the unfaithful wife at least to lose her nose and ears, and empowered her husband to kill her. Adultery was common notwithstanding, least so in the middle classes, most in the nobility. Feudal masters seduced female serfs at the cost of a modest fine. He who covered a maiden without her thanks, against her will, paid the court three shillings. The eleventh century said Freeman was a profligate age, and he marveled at the apparent marital fidelity of William the Conqueror, who could not say as much for his father. Medieval society, said the learned and judicious Thomas Wright, was profoundly immoral and licentious. The Church allowed separation for adultery, apostasy, or grave cruelty. This was called divorcium, but not in the sense of annulling the marriage. Such annulment was granted only when the marriage could be shown to have contravened one of the canonical impediments to matrimony. It is hardly probable that these were deliberately multiplied to provide grounds of divorce for those who could afford the substantial fees and costs required for an annulment.
The Church used these impediments to meet with flexible judgment exceptional cases where divorce would promise an heir to a childless king or would otherwise serve public policy or peace. Germanic law allowed divorce for adultery, sometimes even by mutual agreement. The kings preferred the laws of their ancestors to the stricter law of the Church, and feudal lords and ladies, reverting to the ancient codes, sometimes divorced one another without ecclesiastical leave. Not until Innocent III refused divorce to Philip Augustus, the powerful king of France, was the Church strong enough in authority and conscience to hew bravely to her own decrees. 4. Woman The theories of churchmen were generally hostile to woman. Some laws of the Church enhanced her subjection. Many principles and practices of Christianity improved her status. To priests and theologians, woman was still in these centuries what she had seemed to Chrysostom, a necessary evil, a natural temptation, a desirable calamity, a domestic peril, a deadly fascination, a painted ill. She was still the ubiquitous reincarnation of the Eve who had lost Eden for mankind, still the favored instrument of Satan in leading men to hell. St. Thomas Aquinas, usually the soul of kindness but speaking with the limitations of a monk, placed her in some ways below the slave. The woman is subject to the man on account of the weakness of her nature, both of mind and of body. Man is the beginning of woman and her end, just as God is the beginning and end of every creature. Woman is in subjection according to the law of nature, but a slave is not. Children ought to love their father more than their mother. Canon law gave to the husband the duty of protecting his wife, and to the wife the duty of obeying her husband. Man, but not woman, was made in the image of God. It is plain from this, argued the canonist, that wives should be subject to their husbands and should almost be servants. Such passages have the ring of wistful wishing. On the other hand, the Church enforced monogamy, insisted upon a single standard of morals for both sexes, honored woman in the worship of Mary, and defended woman's right to the inheritance of property. Civil law was more hostile to her than canon law. Both codes permitted wife-beating, and it was quite a forward step when, in the thirteenth century, the laws and customs of Beauvais bade a man beat his wife only in reason. Civil law ruled that the word of women could not be admitted in court because of their frailty. It required only half as high a fine for an offense against a woman as for the same offense against a man. It excluded even the most high-born ladies from representing their own estates in the Parliament of England or the Estates General of France. Marriage gave the husband full authority over the use and usufruct of any property that his wife owned at marriage. No woman could become a licensed physician. Her economic life was as varied as the man's. She learned and practiced the wondrous unsung arts of the home, to bake bread and puddings and pies, cure meats, make soap and candles, cream and cheese, to brew beer and make home medicines from herbs, to spin and weave wool, and make linen from flax and clothing for her family and curtains and drapes, bedspreads and tapestries, to decorate her home and keep it as clean as the male inmates would allow, and to rear children. Outside the agricultural cottage, she joined with strength and patience in the work of the farm, sowed and cultivated and reaped, fed chickens, milked cows, sheared sheep, helped to repair and paint and build. In the towns, at home or in the shop, she did most of the spinning and weaving for the textile guilds. It was a company of silk women that first established in England the arts of spinning, throwing, and weaving silk. Most of the English guilds contained as many women as men, largely because craftsmen were permitted to employ their wives and daughters and enlist them in the guilds. Several guilds, devoted to feminine manufactures, were composed wholly of women. There were fifteen such guilds at Paris at the end of the thirteenth century. Women, however, rarely became masters in bisexual guilds, and they received lower wages than men for equal work. In the middle classes, Women displayed in raiment the wealth of their husbands, and took an exciting part in the religious feasts and social festivities of the towns. By sharing their husbands' responsibilities, and accepting with grace and restraint the grandiose or amorous professions of knights and troubadours, the ladies of the feudal aristocracy attained a status such as women had rarely reached before. As usual, despite theology and law, the medieval woman found ways of annulling her disabilities with her charms. The literature of this period is rich in records of women who ruled their men. In several respects, woman was the acknowledged superior. Among the nobility, she learned something of letters and art and refinement, while her letterless husband labored and fought. She could put on all the graces of an eighteenth-century salonniere and swoon like a Richardson heroine. 
At the same time, she rivaled man in lusty liberty of action and speech, exchanged risque stories with him, and often took an unabashed initiative in love. In all classes, she moved with full freedom, seldom chaperoned. She crowded the fairs and dominated the festivals. She joined in pilgrimages and took part in the crusades, not only as a solace, but now and then as a soldier dressed in the panoply of war. Timid monks tried to persuade themselves of her inferiority, but knights fought for her favors and poets professed themselves her slaves. Men talked of her as an obedient servant and dreamed of her as a goddess. They prayed to marry, but they would have been satisfied with Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor was but one of a score of great medieval women, Galla Placidia, Theodora, Irene, Anna Comnena, Matilda, Countess of Tuscany, Matilda, Queen of England, Blanche of Navarre, Blanche of Castile, Eloise. Eleanor's grandfather was a prince and a poet, William X of Aquitaine, patron and leader of the troubadours. To his court at Bordeaux came the best wits and graces and gallants of southwestern France. And in that court Eleanor was reared to be a queen to life and letters both. She absorbed all the culture and character of that free and sunny clime, vigor of body and poetry of motion, passion of temper and flesh, freedom of mind and manners and speech, lyric fantasies and sparkling esprit, a boundless love of love and war and every pleasure, even to the death. When she was fifteen in 1137, the king of France offered her his hand, anxious to add her duchy of Aquitaine and the great port of Bordeaux to his revenues and his crown. She did not know that Louis the Seventh was a man stolid and devout, gravely absorbed in affairs of state. She went to him gay and lovely and unscrupulous. He was not charmed by her extravagance, and did not care for the poets who followed her to Paris to reward her patronage with lauds and rhymes. Hungry for a living romance, she resolved to accompany her husband to Palestine on the Second Crusade in 1147. She and her attendant ladies donned mail and martial costumes, sent their distaffs scornfully to stay-at-home knights, and rode off in the van of the army, flying bright banners and trailing troubadours. Neglected or chided by the king, she allowed herself at Antioch and elsewhere a few amours. Rumor gave her love now to her uncle Raymond of Poitiers, now to a handsome Saracen slave, now, said ignorant gossip, to the pious Saladin himself. Louis bore these dalliances and her keen tongue patiently, but St. Bernard of Clairvaux, the watchdog of Christendom, denounced her to the world. In 1152, suspecting that the king would divorce her, she sued him for divorce on the ground that they were related in the sixth degree. The church smiled at the pretext, but granted the divorce, and Eleanor returned to Bordeaux, resuming her title to Aquitaine. There a swarm of suitors courted her. She chose Henry Plantagenet, heir to the throne of England. Two years later he was Henry II, and Eleanor was again a queen in 1154. Queen of England, she was to say, by the wrath of God. To England she brought the tastes of the South, and she continued in London to be the supreme lawgiver, patron, and idol of the Trouvere and Troubadours. She was now old enough to bear fidelity, and Henry found no scandal in her. But the tables were turned. Henry was eleven years her junior, quite her equal in temper and passion. Soon he was spreading his love among the ladies of the court, and Eleanor, who had once scorned a jealous husband, fretted and fumed in jealousy. When Henry deposed her, she fled from England, seeking the protection of Aquitaine. He had her pursued, arrested, imprisoned. And for sixteen years she languished in a confinement that never broke her will. The troubadours roused the sentiment of Europe against the king. His sons at her behest plotted to dethrone him, but he fought them off until his death in 1189. Richard Coeur de Lyon succeeded his father, released his mother, and made her regent of England while he crusaded against Saladin. When her son John became king, she retired to a convent in France, and died there through sorrow and anguish of mind at the age of eighty-two. She had been a bad wife, a bad mother, and a bad queen. But who would think of her as belonging to a subject sex? 5. Public Morality In every age the laws and moral precepts of the nations have struggled to discourage the inveterate dishonesty of mankind. In the Middle Ages, not demonstrably more nor less than in other epochs, men, good and bad, lied to their children, mates, congregations, enemies, friends, governments, and God. Medieval man had a special fondness for forging documents. He forged apocryphal gospels, perhaps never intending them to be taken as more than pretty stories. He forged decretals as weapons in ecclesiastical politics. Loyal monks forged charters to win royal grants for their monasteries. 
Archbishop Lanfranc of Canterbury, according to the papal curia, forged a charter to prove the antiquity of his see. Schoolmasters forged charters to endow some colleges at Cambridge with a false antiquity. And pious frauds corrupted texts and invented a thousand edifying miracles. Bribery was general in education, trade, war, religion, government, law. Schoolboys sent pies to their examiners. Politicians paid for appointments to public office and collected the necessary sums from their friends. Witnesses could be bribed to swear to anything. Litigants gave presents to jurors and judges. In 1289, Edward I of England had to dismiss most of his judges and ministers for corruption. The laws arranged for solemn oaths at every turn. Men swore on the scriptures or the most sacred relics. Sometimes they were required to take an oath that they would keep the oath they were about to take. Yet perjury was so frequent that trial by combat was sometimes resorted to in the hope that God would identify the greater liar. Despite a thousand guild and municipal statutes and penalties, medieval craftsmen often deceived purchasers with shoddy products, false measures, and crafty substitutes. Some bakers stole small portions of dough under their customers' eyes by means of a trap door in the kneading board. Cheap cloths were secretly put in the place of better cloths promised and paid for. Inferior leather was doctored to look like the best. Stones were concealed in sacks of hay or wool sold by weight. The meat packers of Norwich were accused of buying measly pigs and making from them sausages and puddings unfit for human bodies. Bertolt of Regensburg, circa 1220, described the different forms of cheating used in the various trades and the tricks played upon country folk by merchants at the fairs. Writers and preachers condemned the pursuit of wealth, but a medieval German proverb said, All things obey money, and some medieval moralists judged the lust for gain stronger than the urge of sex. Knightly honor was often real in feudalism, but the thirteenth century was apparently as materialistic as any epoch in history. These examples of chicanery are drawn from a great area and time. Though such instances were numerous, they were presumably exceptional. They do not warrant any larger conclusion than that men were no better in the age of faith than in our age of doubt, and that in all ages law and morality have barely succeeded in maintaining social order against the innate individualism of men never intended by nature to be law-abiding citizens. Most states made grave theft a capital crime, and the church excommunicated brigands. Even so, theft and robbery were common, from pickpockets in the streets to robber barons on the Rhine. Hungry mercenaries, fugitive criminals, ruined knights made roads unsafe and city streets after dark saw many a brawl, robbery, rape, and murder. Coroner's records from 13th century Merry England show a proportion of manslaughters which would be considered scandalous in modern times. Murders were almost twice as numerous as deaths by accident, and the guilty were seldom caught. The church labored patiently to repress feudal wars, but her modest measure of success was won by diverting men and pugnacity to the Crusades, which were in one aspect imperialistic wars for territory and trade. Once at war, Christians were no gentler to the defeated, no more loyal to pledges and treaties than the warriors of other faiths and times. Cruelty and brutality were apparently more frequent in the Middle Ages than in any civilization before our own. The barbarians did not at once cease to be barbarians when they became Christians. Noble lords and ladies buffeted their servants and one another. Criminal law was brutally severe, but failed to suppress brutality and crime. The wheel, the cauldron of burning oil, the stake burning alive, flaying, tearing the limbs apart with wild animals, were often used as penalties. Anglo-Saxon law punished a female slave convicted of theft by making each of eighty female slaves pay a fine, bring three faggots, and burn her to death. In the wars of central Italy in the late thirteenth century, says the chronicle of the contemporary Italian monk Salimbene, prisoners were treated with a barbarity that in our youth would have been incredible. For some men's heads they bound with a cord and lever, and strained it with such force that their eyes started from their sockets and fell upon their cheeks. Others they bound by the right or left thumb only, and thus lifted the whole weight of their bodies from the ground. Others again they racked with yet more foul and horrible torments, which I blush to relate. Others they would seat with hands bound behind their backs, and laid under their feet a pot of live coals. Or they bound their hands and legs together round a spit, as a lamb is carried to the butcher, and kept them thus hanging all day long without food or drink. Or again, with a rough piece of wood, they would rub and grate their shins until the bare bone appeared, which was a misery and sore pity even to behold. 
Medieval man bore suffering bravely, and perhaps with less sensitivity than the men of Western Europe would show today. In all classes, men and women were hearty and sensual. Their festivals were feasts of drinking, gambling, dancing, and sexual relaxation. Their jokes were of a candor hardly rivaled today. Their speech was freer, their oaths vaster and more numerous. Hardly a man in France, says Joinville, could open his mouth without mentioning the devil. The medieval stomach was stronger than ours, and bore without flinching the most Rabelaisian details. The nuns in Chaucer listened unperturbed to the scatology of the miller's tale, and the chronicle of the good monk Salimbene is at times untranslatably physical. Taverns were numerous, and some, in modern style, supplied tarts with ale. The church tried to close the taverns on Sundays with small success. Occasional drunkenness was the prerogative of every class. A visitor to Lübeck found some patrician ladies in a wine cellar drinking hard under their veils. At Cologne there was a society that meant to drink wine, and took for its motto, Bibite cum hilaritate, but it imposed upon its members strict rules for moderation in conduct and modesty in speech. The medieval man, like any other, was a thoroughly human mixture of lust and romance, humility and egotism, cruelty and tenderness, piety and greed. Those same men and women who drank and cursed so heartily were capable of touching kindnesses and a thousand charities. Cats and dogs were pets then as now, dogs were trained to lead the blind, and knights developed an attachment for their horses, falcons, and dogs. The administration of charity reached new heights in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries. Individuals, guilds, governments, and the church shared in relieving the unfortunate. Almsgiving was universal. Men hopeful of paradise left charitable bequests. Rich men dowered poor girls, fed scores of the poor daily, and hundreds on major festivals. At many baronial gates, doles of food were distributed thrice weekly to all who asked. Nearly every great lady felt it a social, if not a moral, necessity to share in the administration of charity. Roger Bacon, in the thirteenth century, advocated a state fund for the relief of poverty, sickness, and old age, but most of this work was left to the church. In one aspect, the church was a continent-wide organization for charitable aid. Gregory the Great, Charlemagne, and others required that one-fourth of the tithes collected by any parish should be applied to succor the poor and the infirm. It was so done for a time, but the expropriation of parish revenues by lay and ecclesiastical superiors disrupted this parochial administration in the twelfth century, and the work fell more than ever upon bishops, monks, nuns, and popes. All nuns but a few human sinners devoted themselves to education, nursing, and charity— their ever-widening ministrations are among the brightest and most heartening features of medieval and modern history. Monasteries, supplied by gifts and alms and ecclesiastical revenues, fed the poor, tended the sick, ransomed prisoners. Thousands of monks taught the young, cared for orphans, or served in hospitals. The great abbey of Cluny atoned for its wealth by an ample distribution of alms. The popes did what they could to help the poor of Rome, and continued in their own way the ancient imperial dole. Despite all this charity, begging flourished. Hospitals and almshouses tried to provide food and lodging for all applicants. Soon the gates were surrounded by the halt, the decrepit, the maimed, the blind, and ragged vagabonds who went from spittle to spittle, prowling and poaching for lumps of bread and meat. Mendicancy reached in medieval Christendom and Islam a scope and pertinacity unequaled today, except in the poorest areas of the Far East. 6. Medieval Dress who were the people of medieval Europe? We cannot divide them into races. They were all of the white race, except the Negro slaves. But what a baffling, unclassifiable variety of men! Greeks of Byzantium and Hellas, the half-Greek Italians of southern Italy, the Greco-Moorish Jewish population of Sicily, the Romans, Umbrians, Tuscans, Lombards, Genoese, Venetians of Italy, all so diverse that each at once betrayed his origin by dress and coiffure and speech the Berbers, Arabs, Jews, and Christians of Spain, the Gascons, Provençals, Burgundians, Parisians, Normans of France, the Flemings, Walloons, and Dutch of the Lowlands, the Celtic, Anglian, Saxon, Danish, Norman stocks in England, the Celts of Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, the Norwegians, Swedes, and Danes, the hundred tribes of Germany, the Finns and Magyars and Bulgars, the Slavs of Poland, Bohemia, the Baltic States, the Balkans, and Russia, here was such a farrago of bloods and types and noses and beards and dress that no one description could fit their proud diversity. 
The Germans, by a millennium of migrations and conquests, had made their type prevail in the upper classes of all Western Europe except Central and Southern Italy and Spain. The blonde type was so definitely admired in hair and eyes that St. Bernard struggled through an entire sermon to reconcile with this preference the I am black but beautiful of the Song of Songs. The ideal knight was to be tall and blonde and bearded. The ideal woman in epic and romance was slender and graceful, with blue eyes and long blonde or golden hair. The long hair of the Franks gave place in the upper classes of the ninth century to heads closely cropped in back with only a cap of hair on the top, and beards disappeared among the European gentry in the twelfth century. The male peasantry, however, continued to wear long and unclean beards, and hair so ample that it was sometimes gathered in braids. In England, all classes kept long hair, and the male bows of the thirteenth century dyed their hair, curled it with irons, and bound it with ribbons. In the same land and century the married ladies tied up their hair in a net of golden thread, while high-born lasses let it fall down their backs, with sometimes a curl falling demurely over each shoulder upon the breast. The West Europeans of the Middle Ages were more abundantly and attractively dressed than before or since, and the men often excelled the women in splendor and color of costume. In the fifth century the loose toga and tunic of the Roman fought a losing war with the breeches and belt of the Gaul. The colder climate and military occupations of the north required tighter and thicker clothing than had been suggested by the warmth and ease of the south, and a revolution in dress followed the transfer of power across the Alps. The common man wore close-fitting pantaloons and tunic or blouse, both of leather or strong cloth. At the belt hung knife, purse, keys, sometimes the worker's tools. Over the shoulders was flung a cloak or cape, on the head a cap or hat, of wool or felt or skins, on the legs long stockings, and on the feet high leather shoes curled up at the toe to forestall stubbing. Toward the end of the Middle Ages the hose grew longer till they reached the hips and evolved into the uncomfortable trousers that modern man has substituted as a perennial penance for the hair shirt of the medieval saint. Nearly all garments were of wool except some of skin or leather among peasants or hunters. Nearly all were spun, woven, cut, and sewed at home. But the rich had professional tailors, known in England as scissors. Buttons, occasionally used in antiquity, were avoided before the thirteenth century, and then appeared as functionless ornaments. Hence the phrase, not worth a button. In the twelfth century, the tight Germanic costume was overlaid in both sexes with a girdled gown. The rich embellished these basic garments in a hundred fancy ways. Hems and necklines were trimmed with fur. Silk, satin, or velvet replaced linen or wool when the weather allowed. A velvet cap covered the head, and shoes of colored cloth followed closely the form of the feet. The finest furs came from Russia. The choicest was ermine, made from white weasel. Barons were known to mortgage their lands to buy ermine for their wives. The rich wore drawers of fine white linen, hose often colored, usually of wool, sometimes of silk, a shirt of white linen with flaunty collar and cuffs, over this a tunic, and over all, in cold or rainy weather, a mantle or cape or chaperon, a cape with a cowl that could be drawn up over the head. Some caps were made with a flat square top. These mortier or mortar boards were affected in the later Middle Ages by lawyers and doctors, and survive in our college dignities. Dandies wore gloves in any weather, and, complained the monk Ordericus Vitalis, swept the dusty ground with the prodigal trains of their mantles and robes. Jewelry was displayed by men not only on the person but on the clothing, cap, robe, shoes. Some garments were embroidered with sacred or profane texts in pearls. Some were trimmed with gold or silver lace. Some wore cloth of gold. Kings had to distinguish themselves with extra finery. Edward the Confessor wore a robe resplendently embroidered with gold by his accomplished wife, Edgitha, and Charles the Bold of Burgundy bore a robe of state so thickly inlaid with precious stones that it was valued at two hundred thousand ducats, or one million eighty-two thousand dollars. All but the poor wore rings, and every man of any account had a signet ring bearing his personal seal. A mark made with this seal was accepted as his personal signature. Dress was an index of status or wealth. Each class protested against the imitation of its raiment by the class below it, and sumptuary laws were vainly passed, as in France in 1294 and 1306, seeking to regulate a citizen's expenditure on wardrobe according to his fortune and his class. The retainers or dependent knights of a great lord wore, at formal functions, robes presented to them by him and dyed in his favorite or distinctive color. Such robes were called livery, 
or livret, because the Lord delivered them twice a year. Good medieval garments, however, were made to last a lifetime, and some were carefully bequeathed by will. Well-born ladies wore a long linen chemise, over this a fur-trimmed pelisson, or robe reaching to the feet, over this a bliot, or blouse, worn loose in déshabille, but tightly laced against the coming of company, for all fine ladies longed for slenderness. They might also wear jeweled girdles, a silken purse, and chamois skin gloves. Often they wore flowers in their hair, or bound it with fillets of jeweled silk. Some ladies aroused the clergy, and doubtless worried their husbands, by wearing tall conical hats adorned with horns. At one time a woman without horns was subject to unbearable ridicule. In the later Middle Ages high heels became the fashion. Moralists complained that women found frequent occasions to raise their robes an inch or two to show trim ankles and dainty shoes. Female legs, however, were a private and costly revelation. Dante denounced the ladies of Florence for public décolleté that showed the bosom and the breasts. The dress of ladies at tournaments furnished an exciting topic for clergymen, and cardinals legislated on the length of women's robes. When the clergy decreed veils as vital to morality, the women caused their veils to be made of fine muslin and silk inwoven with gold, wherein they showed ten times fairer than before, and drew beholders' eyes all the more to wantonness. The monk Guillot of Provins complained that women used so much paint on their faces that none was left to color the icons in the churches. He warned them that when they wore false hair, or applied poultices of mashed beans and mare's milk to their faces to improve their complexion, they were adding centuries to their durance in purgatory. Bertolt of Regensburg, about 1220, berated women with vain eloquence. Ye women, ye have bowels of compassion, and ye go to church more readily than the men, and many of you would be saved but for this one snare. In order that ye may compass men's praise, ye spend all your labor on your garments. Many of you pay as much to the seamstress as the cost of the cloth itself. It must have shields on the shoulders. It must be flounced and tucked all round the hem. It is not enough for you to show your pride in your very buttonholes. You must also send your feet to hell by special torments. Ye busy yourselves with your veils. Ye twitch them hither, ye twitch them thither. Ye gild them here and there with gold thread, and spend thereon all your trouble. Ye will spend a good six months' work on a single veil, which is sinful great travail. And all that men may praise your dress. Ah, God, how fair! Was ever so fair a garment? How, Brother Bertolt, you say, we do it only for the goodman's sake, that he may gaze the less on other women. No, believe me, if thy goodman be a good man indeed, he would far rather behold thy chaste conversation than thy outward adorning. Ye men might put an end to this and fight against it doughtily, first with good words, and if they are still obdurate, step valiantly in, tear it from her head, even though four or ten hairs should come with it, and cast it into the fire. Do thus not thrice or four times only, and presently she will forbear. Sometimes the women took such preaching to heart, and two centuries before Savonarola, cast their veils and ornaments into the fire. Fortunately, such repentance was brief and rare. 7. In the Home There was not much comfort in a medieval home. Windows were few and seldom glazed. Wooden shutters closed them against glare or cold. Heating was by one or more fireplaces. Drafts came in from a hundred cracks in the walls and made high-backed chairs a boon. In winter it was common to wear warm hats and furs indoors. Furniture was scanty but well made. Chairs were few and usually had no backs, but sometimes they were elegantly carved, engraved with armorial bearings, and inlaid with precious stones. Most seats were cut into the masonry walls or built upon chests in alcoves. Carpets were unusual before the thirteenth century. Italy and Spain had them, and when Eleanor of Castile went to England in 1254 as the bride of the future Edward I, her servants covered the floors of her apartment at Westminster with carpets after the Spanish custom, which then spread through England. Ordinary floors were strewn with rushes or straw, making some houses so malodorous that the parish priest refused to visit them. Walls might be hung with tapestries, partly as ornaments, partly to hinder drafts, partly to divide the great hall of the house into smaller rooms. Homes in Italy and Provence, still remembering Roman luxuries, were more comfortable and sanitary than those of the north. The homes of German bourgeois in the 13th century had water piped into the kitchen from wells. Cleanliness in the Middle Ages was not next to godliness. Early Christianity had denounced the Roman baths as wells of perversion and promiscuity, and its general disapproval of the body had put no premium on hygiene. 
The modern use of the handkerchief was unknown. Cleanliness was next to money and varied with income. The feudal lord and the rich bourgeois bathed with reasonable frequency in large wooden tubs, and in the twelfth century the spread of wealth spread personal cleanliness. Many cities in Germany, France, and England had public baths in the thirteenth century. One student reckons that Parisians bathed more frequently in 1292 than in the twentieth century. One result of the Crusades was the introduction into Europe of public steam baths in the Moslem style. The Church frowned upon public baths as leading to immorality, and several of them justified her fears. Some towns provided public mineral baths. Monasteries, feudal castles, and rich homes had latrines, emptying into cesspools, but most homes managed with outhouses, and in many cases one outhouse had to serve a dozen homes. Pipes for carrying off waste were one of the sanitary reforms introduced into England under Edward I from 1271 to 1307. In the 13th century, the chamber pots of Paris were freely emptied from windows into the street, with only a warning cry of Garlo. Such contretemps were a cliché of comedies as late as Molière. Public comfort stations were a luxury. San Gimignano had some in 1255, but Florence as yet had none. People eased themselves in courtyards, on stairways and balconies, even in the Palace of the Louvre. After a pestilence in 1531, a decree ordered Parisian landlords to provide a latrine for every house, but this ordinance was much honored in the breach. The upper and middle classes washed before and after meals, for most eating was done with the fingers. There were but two regular meals daily, one at ten, another at four, but either repast might last several hours. In great houses the meal was announced by blasts on a hunting horn. The dinner board might be rude planks on trestles, or a great table strongly built of costly wood and admirably carved. Around it were stools or benches. In French, banc, whence banquet. In some French homes, ingenious machines raised or lowered into place, from a lower or upper story, a full table ready served, and made it disappear in a moment when the meal was finished. Servants brought ewers of water to each diner, who washed the hands therein and wiped them on napkins, which were then put away. In the thirteenth century no napkins were used during the meal, but the diner wiped his hands on the tablecloth. The company sat in couples, gentlemen and lady paired. Usually each couple ate from one plate and drank from one cup. Each person received a spoon. Forks were known in the thirteenth century, but seldom provided, and the diner used his own knife. Cups, saucers, and plates were normally of wood, but the feudal aristocracy and the rich bourgeoisie had dishes of earthenware or pewter, and some displayed dinner sets of silver, even here and there of gold. Dishes of cut glass might be added, and a large silver vessel in the shape of a ship containing various spices, and the knife and spoon of the host. Instead of a plate, each couple received a large piece of bread, flat, round, and thick. Upon this tranchoir, the diner placed the meat and the bread that he took with his fingers from the platters passed to him. When the meal was over, the trencher was eaten by the diner, or given to the dogs and cats that swarmed around, or sent out to the neighboring poor. A great meal was completed with spices and sweets, and a final round of wine. Food was abundant, varied, and well prepared, except that lack of refrigeration soon made meats high, and put a premium on spices that could preserve or disguise. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 4, Side 2. Food was abundant, varied, and well prepared, except that lack of refrigeration soon made meats high, and put a premium on spices that could preserve or disguise. Some spices were imported from the Orient, but as these were costly, other spices were grown in domestic gardens, parsley, mustard, sage, savory, anise, garlic, dill. Cookbooks were numerous and complex. In a great establishment the cook was a man of importance, bearing on his shoulders the dignity and reputation of the house. He was equipped with a gleaming armory of copper cauldrons, kettles, and pans, and prided himself on serving dishes that would please the eye as well as the palate. Meat, poultry, and eggs were cheap, though still dear enough to make most of the poor unwilling vegetarians. Peasants flourished on coarse whole-grain bread of barley, oats, or rye, baked in their homes. City dwellers preferred white bread, baked by bakers, as a mark of caste. There were no potatoes, coffee, or tea, but nearly all meats and vegetables now used in Europe, 
including eels, frogs, and snails, were eaten by medieval man. By the time of Charlemagne, the European acclimatization of Asiatic fruits and nuts was almost complete. Oranges, however, were still a rarity in the 13th century, north of the Alps and the Pyrenees. The commonest meat was pork. Pigs ate the refuse in the streets, and people ate the pigs. It was widely believed that pork caused leprosy, but this did not lessen the taste for it. Great sausages and black puddings were a medieval delight. Lordly hosts might have a whole roast pig or boar brought to the table and carve it before their gaping guests. This was a delicacy almost as keenly relished as partridges, quails, thrushes, peacocks, and cranes. Fish was a staple food. Herring was a main recourse of soldiers, sailors, and the poor. Dairy products were less used than today, but the cheese of brie was already renowned. Salads were unknown, and confections were rare. Sugar was still an import, and had not yet replaced honey for sweetening. Desserts were usually of fruits and nuts. Pastries were innumerable, and jolly bakers, quite unreproved, gave cakes and buns the most interesting shapes imaginable. Quaidam pudenda muliebra aliae virilia. It seems incredible that there was no after-dinner smoking. Both sexes drank instead. As unboiled water was seldom safe, all classes found substitutes for it in beer and wine. Drink water and boileau were unusual names, indicating unusual tastes. Cider or perry was made from apples or pears, and provided cheap intoxicants for the peasantry. Drunkenness was a favorite vice of the Middle Ages in all classes and sexes. Taverns were numerous; ale was cheap. Beer was the regular drink of the poor, even at breakfast. Monasteries and hospitals north of the Alps were normally allowed a gallon of ale or beer per person per day. Many monasteries, castles, and rich homes had their own breweries, for in the northern countries beer was reckoned as second only to bread as a necessary of life. Among the well-to-do of all nations and in all ranks of Latin Europe, wine was preferred. France produced the most famous wines and proclaimed their glory in a thousand popular songs. At vintage time, the peasants worked harder than usual, and were rewarded by good abbots with a moral holiday. A custom of the Abbey of Saint Peter in the Black Forest includes some tender clauses. When the peasants have unladen the wine, they shall be brought into the monastery and shall have meat and drink in abundance. A great tub shall be set there and filled with wine, and each shall drink. And if they wax drunken and smite the cellarman or the cook, they shall pay no fine for this deed, and they shall drink so that two of them cannot beat the third to the wagon. After a banquet, the host would usually offer entertainment by jugglers, tumblers, players, minstrels, or buffoons. Some manor houses had their own staff of such entertainers. Some rich men kept jesters whose merry impudence and ribald humor could be vented without fear and without reproach. If the diners preferred to provide their own amusement, they could tell stories, hear or make music, dance, flirt, play backgammon, chess, or parlor games. Even barons and baronesses romped about in forfeits and blind man's buff. Playing cards were still unknown. French laws of 1256 and 1291 forbade making or playing with dice. But gambling with dice was widespread nonetheless, and moralists told of fortunes and souls lost in the game. Gambling was not always forbidden by law. Siena provided booths for it in the public square. Chess was prohibited by a council at Paris in 1213 and by an edict of Louis the Ninth in 1254. No one paid much attention to these demurrers. The game became a consuming pastime among the aristocracy and gave its name to the royal exchequer, a checkered table or chessboard. On which the revenues of the state were reckoned. In Dante's youth, a Saracen player set all Florence agape by playing three games of chess at once against the best players of the city. He looked at one board and kept the plays on the other two in his head. Of the three games, he won two and tied the third. The game of checkers was played in France as dame, in England as draughts. Dancing was condemned by preachers and was practiced by nearly all persons except those dedicated to religion. Saint Thomas Aquinas, with characteristic moderation, allowed dancing at weddings or on the homecoming of a friend from abroad, or to celebrate some national victory. And the hearty saint went so far as to say that dancing, if kept decent, was a very healthy exercise. Albertus Magnus showed a like liberality, but medieval moralists generally reprobated the dance as an invention of the devil. The Church frowned upon it as a provocative of immorality. The young blades of the Middle Ages did their best to justify her suspicions. The French and Germans, in particular, were fond of the dance and developed many folk dances to mark the festivals of the agricultural year, to celebrate victories, or to sustain public spirit in depression or plague. One of the Carmina Burana describes the dances of girls in the fields 
as among the sweetest pleasures of spring. When knighthood was conferred, all the knights of the vicinity gathered in full armor and performed evolutions on horseback or on foot, while the populace danced around them to the accompaniment of martial music. Dancing could become an epidemic. In 1237, a band of German children danced all the way from Erfurt to Arnstadt. Many died en route, and some survivors suffered to the end of their lives from St. Vitus's dance or other nervous disorders. Most dancing took place by day and in the open air. Houses were poorly lit at night, by standing or hanging lamps with wick and oil, or a rushlight torch of mutton fat, and as fat and oils were expensive, very little work or reading was done after sunset. Soon after dark the guests dispersed and the household retired. Bedrooms seldom sufficed. It was not uncommon to find an extra bed in the hall or reception room. The poor slept well on beds of straw. The rich slept poorly on perfumed pillows and feather mattresses. Lordly beds were overhung with mosquito netting or a canopy and were mounted with the aid of stools. Several persons of any age or sex might sleep in the same room. In England and France, all classes slept nude. 8. Society and Sport The general coarseness of medieval manners was smoothed by certain graces of feudal courtesy. Men shook hands on meeting as a pledge of peace through unreadiness to draw a sword. Titles were innumerable in a hundred grades of dignity, and by a charming custom each dignitary was addressed by his title and his Christian name, or the name of his estate. A code of manners was drawn up for polite society in any circumstance, at home, at the dance, on the street, at tournament, at court. Ladies had to learn how to walk, curtsy, ride horseback, play, carry falcons gracefully on the wrist. All this, and a like code for men, constituted courtoisie, the manners of the court, or courtesy. The thirteenth century saw the publication of many guides to etiquette. In traveling, one expected courtesies and hospitality from persons of his own class. The poor for charity, the rich for fee or gift, would be sheltered en route by convents or monasteries. As early as the eighth century, monks established hospices in the passes of the Alps. Some monasteries had great guest houses capable of sheltering three hundred wayfarers and stabling their horses. Most travelers, however, put up at wayside inns. Rates were low there, and a wench might be had at a reasonable rate if one guarded his purse. Offered such comforts, many braved the dangers of travel—merchants, bankers, priests, diplomats, pilgrims, students, monks, tourists, tramps. The highways of the Middle Ages, however discouraging, were alive with curious and hopeful people who thought that they would be happier somewhere else. Class distinctions were as sharp in amusement as in travel. The mighty and the lowly mingled now and then— when the king held a public assembly of his vassals and distributed food to the crowd, when the aristocratic cavalry performed martial maneuvers, when some prince or princess, king or queen, entered the city in panoplied state and masses lined the highway to feed on pageantry, or when a tournament or trial by combat was opened to the public eye. Planned spectacles were a vital part of medieval life. Church processions, political parades, guild celebrations filled the streets with banners, floats, wax saints, fat merchants, prancing knights, and military bands. Traveling mummers staged short plays in the village or city square. Minstrels sang and played and strummed romantic tales. Acrobats tumbled and juggled, and men and women walked or danced on tight ropes across mortal chasms. Or two blindfolded men belabored each other with sticks, or a circus would come to town, exhibit strange animals and stranger men, and pit one animal against another in combat to the death. Among the nobility, hunting rivaled jousting as the royal sport. Game laws restricted the season to brief periods, and poaching laws kept game preserves for the aristocracy. The woods of Europe were still inhabited by beasts who had not yet acknowledged the victory of man in the war for the planet. Medieval Paris, for example, was several times invaded by wolves. In one aspect, the hunter was engaged in maintaining man's precarious ascendancy. In another, he was adding to the food supply and not least he was preparing himself for inevitable war by hardening body and spirit to danger, combat, and the shedding of blood. At the same time he made this too a pageant. Great oliphants, hunting horns of ivory sometimes chased with gold, rounded up the ladies and gentlemen and dogs, women sitting daintily side-saddle on prancing steeds, men in colorful attire and varied armament, bow and arrow, small axe, spear, and knife, Greyhounds, staghounds, bloodhounds, boarhounds, pulling on the leash. If the chase led across a peasant's fields, the baron, his vassals, and his guests were free to cross them at whatever cost to seeds and crops, and only reckless peasants would complain. 
The French aristocracy organized hunting into a system, gave it the name of chasse, and developed for it a complex ritual and etiquette. The ladies joined with a special flair in the most aristocratic game of all, falconry. Nearly all great estates had aviaries housing a variety of birds, of which the falcon was the most prized. It was taught to perch on my lord or lady's wrist at any time. Some piquant dames kept them so while hearing mass. The Emperor Frederick II wrote an excellent book on falconry, running to 589 pages, and introduced into Europe from Islam the custom of controlling the nerves and curiosity of the bird by covering its head with a leather hood. Different varieties were trained to fly up and attack divers birds, kill or wound them, and return to the hunter's wrist. There, lured and rewarded by a bit of meat, they allowed their feet to be snared in straps until fresh prey flew into view. A well-trained falcon was almost the finest gift that could be made to noble or king. The Duke of Burgundy ransomed his son by sending twelve white hawks to the captor, Sultan Bajazet. The office of Grand Falconer of France was one of the highest and best paid in the kingdom. Many another sport made tolerable the summer's heat and the winter's cold, and turned the passions and energies of youth to vital skills. Practically every lad learned to swim, and in the north all learned to skate. Horse racing was popular, especially in Italy. All classes practiced archery, but only the working classes had the leisure to fish. There were divers games of bowling, hockey, quoits, wrestling, boxing, tennis, football. Tennis developed in France, probably from Moslem antecedents. The name was apparently derived from the tene, or play, with which a player announced his serve. The sport became so popular in France and England that it was sometimes played before large crowds in theaters or the open air. The Irish played hockey as early as our second century, and a Byzantine historian of the twelfth century gives a vivid description of a polo match played with cord-strung rackets, as in lacrosse. Football, says a horrified medieval chronicler, is an abominable game wherein young people propel a huge ball not by throwing it into the air, but by striking and rolling it along the ground, not with their hands, but with their feet. Apparently the game had come from China to Italy to England, where it became so popular and violent in the thirteenth century that Edward II banned it as leading to breaches of the peace, this in 1314. Life was more social then than later. Group activities stirred the monasteries, nunneries, universities, villages, guilds. Life was especially hilarious on Sundays and solemn holy days. Then the peasant, the merchant, and the lord dressed their best, prayed the longest, drank the most. On May Day the English raised maypoles, lit bonfires, and danced around them in semi-conscious recollection of pagan fertility feasts. At Christmas time, many towns and chateaus appointed a lord of misrule to organize pastimes and spectacles for the populace. Mummers in masks and beards and jolly garb went about performing street plays or pranks or singing Christmas carols. Houses and churches were decked with holly, ivy, and whatsoever the season afforded to be green. There were festivals for the agricultural seasons, for national or local triumphs, for saints and for guilds, and rare was the man who on those occasions did not drink his fill. Merry England had Scott Ales, or money-raising bazaars at which ale flowed fast but not free. The Church denounced these festivities in the 13th century and adopted them in the 15th. Some festivals adapted the ceremonies of the Church to boisterous parodies that ranged from simple humor to scandalous satire. Beauvais, Saint, and other French towns through many years celebrated on January 14th a Fête de l'Anne, or Festival of the Ass, a pretty girl was placed on an ass, apparently to represent Mary on the flight to Egypt. The ass was led into a church, was made to genuflect, was stationed beside the altar, and heard a mass and hymns sung in its praise. And at the end both the priest and the congregation brayed thrice in honor of the animal that had saved the mother of God from Herod and borne Jesus into Jerusalem. A dozen cities of France celebrated annually, usually on the Feast of the Circumcision, a fête des fous, or Feast of Fools. On that day, the lower clergy were allowed to revenge themselves for their subordination to priest and bishop during the year by taking over the church and the ritual. They dressed themselves in feminine costumes or in ecclesiastical vestments turned inside out. They chose one of their number to be Episcopus Fatuorum, or Fool's Bishop. They chanted ribald hymns, ate sausages on the altar, played dice at its foot, burned old shoes in the censer, and preached hilarious sermons. In the 13th and 14th centuries, many towns in England, Germany, and France chose an Episcopus Puerorum, or boy's bishop, to lead his fellows in a good-humored imitation of ecclesiastical ceremonies. 
The local clergy smiled on these popular buffooneries. The church closed her eyes to them for a long time, but as they tended to ever greater irreverence and indecency, she was forced to condemn them, and they finally disappeared in the sixteenth century. A boy's bishop, however, is still annually elected at Adelston, Surrey, England. In general, the church was lenient with the lusty humor of the age of faith. She knew that men must have a moral holiday now and then, a moratorium on the unnatural moral restraints normally necessary to a civilized society. Some ultra-Puritans like St. John Chrysostom might cry out, Christ is crucified and yet you laugh. But there continued to be cakes and ale, and wine ran hot in the mouth. St. Bernard was suspicious of mirth and beauty, but most churchmen in the thirteenth century were hearty livers who enjoyed their meat and drink with a good conscience and took no offense at a well-turned joke or ankle. The age of faith was not so solemn after all. Rather, it was an age of abounding vitality and full-blooded merriment and tender sentiment and a simple joy in the blessings of the earth. On the back of a medieval vocabulary book, some wistful student wrote a wish for all of us. And I wish that all times were April and May, and every month renew all fruits again, and every day fleur-de-lis and gillyflower and violets and roses wherever one goes, and woods in leaf and meadows green, and every lover should have his lass, and they to love each other with a sure heart and true, and to every one his pleasure and a gay heart. 9. Morality and Religion Does the general picture of medieval Europe support the belief that religion makes for morality? Our general impression suggests a wider gap between moral theory and practice in the Middle Ages than in other epochs of civilization. Medieval Christendom was apparently as rich as our own irreligious age in sensuality, violence, drunkenness, cruelty, coarseness, profanity, greed, robbery, dishonesty, and fraud. It seems to have outdone our time in the enslavement of individuals, but not to have rivaled it in the economic enslavement of colonial areas or defeated states. It surpassed us in the subjection of women, it hardly equaled us in immodesty, fornication, and adultery, or in the immensity and murderousness of war. Compared with the Roman Empire from Nerva to Aurelius, medieval Christendom was a moral setback. But much of the empire had in Nerva's day enjoyed many centuries of civilization, while the Middle Ages, through most of their duration, represented a struggle between Christian morality and a virile barbarism that largely ignored the ethics of the religion whose theology it indifferently received. The barbarians would have called some of their vices virtues, as necessary to their time. Their violence as the other side of courage, their sensuality as animal health, their coarse and direct speech, and their shameless talk about natural things as no worse than the introverted prudery of our youth. It would be an easy matter to condemn medieval Christendom from the mouths of its own moralists. St. Francis bemoaned the thirteenth century as these times of superabundant malice and iniquity. Innocent III, St. Bonaventura, Vincent de Beauvais, Dante, considered the morals of that wonderful century to be dishearteningly gross. And Bishop Grosteste, one of the most judicious prelates of the age, told the Pope that the Catholic population as a body was incorporate with the devil. Roger Bacon, possibly 1214 to 1294, judged his time with characteristic hyperbole. Never was so much ignorance... Far more sins reign in these days than in any past age. Boundless corruption, lechery, gluttony. Yet we have baptism and the revelation of Christ, which men cannot really believe in or revere, or they would not allow themselves to be so corrupted. Therefore many wise men believe that Antichrist is at hand and the end of the world. Such passages, of course, are the exaggerations necessary to reformers and could be matched in any age. Apparently the fear of hell had less effect in raising the moral level than the fear of public opinion or the law has now, or had then. But the public opinion, and in a measure the law, had been formed by Christianity. Probably the moral chaos, born of half a millennium of invasion, war, and devastation, would have been far worse without the moderating effect of the Christian ethic. Our selection of instances in this chapter may have been unwittingly biased. At best they are fragmentary. Statistics are lacking or unreliable, and history always leaves out the average man. There must have been in medieval Christendom thousands of good and simple people, like Fra Salimbene's mother, whom he describes as a humble lady and devout, fasting much and gladly dispensing alms to the poor. But how often do such women make the pages of history? Christianity brought some moral retrogressions and some moral advances. The intellectual virtues naturally declined in the age of faith. Intellectual conscience fairness with the facts, 
and the search for truth were replaced by zeal and admiration for sanctity and a sometimes unscrupulous piety. Pious frauds of textual doctoring and documentary forgery seemed negligible venial sins. The civic virtues suffered from concentration on the afterlife, but more from the disintegration of the state. Nevertheless, there must have been some patriotism, however local, in the men and women who built so many cathedrals and some lordly town halls. Perhaps hypocrisy, so indispensable to civilization, increased in the Middle Ages as compared with the frank secularism of antiquity or the unabashed corporate brutality of our time. Against these and other debits, many credits stand. Christianity struggled with heroic tenacity against an inundation of barbarism. It labored to diminish war and feud, trial by combat or ordeal. It extended the intervals of truce and peace, and sublimated something of feudal violence and pugnacity into devotion and chivalry. It suppressed the gladiatorial shows, denounced the enslavement of prisoners, forbade the enslavement of Christians, ransomed numberless captives, and encouraged, more than it practiced, the emancipation of serfs. It taught men a new respect for human life and work. It stopped infanticide, lessened abortion, and softened the penalties exacted by Roman and barbarian law. It steadfastly rejected the double standard in sexual morality. It immensely expanded the scope and operations of charity. It gave men peace of mind against the baffling riddles of the universe, though at the cost of discouraging science and philosophy. Finally, it taught men that patriotism unchecked by a higher loyalty is a tool of mass greed and crime. Over all the competing cities and petty states of Europe, it established and maintained one moral law. Under its guidance, and at some necessary sacrifice of liberty, Europe achieved for a century that international morality for which it prays and struggles today, a law that shall raise states out of their jungle code and free the energies of man for the battles and victories of peace. Chapter 31. The Resurrection of the Arts, 1095 to 1300. 1. The Aesthetic Awakening. Why is it that Western Europe, in the 12th and 13th centuries, reached a climax of art comparable with Periclean Athens and Augustan Rome? The Norse and Saracen raids had been beaten off, the Magyars had been tamed. The Crusades aroused a fever of creative energy and brought back to Europe a thousand ideas and art forms from the Byzantine and Moslem East. The reopening of the Mediterranean and the opening of the Atlantic to Christian commerce the security and organization of trade along the rivers of France and Germany and on the northern seas, and the expansion of industry and finance generated a wealth unknown since Constantine, new classes capable of affording art, and prosperous communes each resolved to build a finer cathedral than the last. The coffers of abbots, bishops, and popes were swelling with the tithes of the people, the gifts of the merchants, the grants of nobles and kings. The iconoclasts had been defeated, Art was no longer branded as idolatry. The church, which once had feared it, found in it now a propitious medium for inculcating her faith and ideals among the letterless, and for stirring souls to a devotion that lifted spires like supplicating litanies to the sky. And the new religion of Mary, rising spontaneously from the hearts of the people, poured its love and trust of the Divine Mother into magnificent temples where thousands of her children might gather at once to do her homage and beg her aid. All these influences, and many more, came together to flood half a continent with profuse streams of unprecedented art. The ancient techniques had here and there survived barbarian devastation and municipal decay. In the Eastern Empire the old skills were never lost, and it was above all from the Greek East and Byzantine Italy that artists and art themes now entered the life of the resurrected West. Charlemagne drew into his service Greek artists fleeing from Byzantine iconoclasts. Hence, the art of Aachen married Byzantine delicacy and mysticism to German solidity and earthiness. The monk artists of Cluny, inaugurating in the 10th century a new era in Western architecture and adornment, began by copying Byzantine models. The school of monastic art developed at Monte Cassino by Abbot Desiderius in 1072 was taught by Greek teachers on Byzantine lines. When Honorius III in 1218 wished to decorate San Paolo fuori le mura, he sent to Venice for mosaicists, and those who came were steeped in the Byzantine tradition. Colonies of Byzantine artists could be found in a score of western cities, and it was their style of painting that molded Duccio, Cimabue, and the early Giotto himself. Byzantine or Oriental motives, palmettes, acanthus leaves, animals within medallions, 
came to the West on textiles and ivories and in illuminated manuscripts, and lived hundreds of years in Romanesque ornament. Syrian, Anatolian, Persian forms of architecture, the vault, the dome, the tower-flanked facade, the composite column, the windows grouped by two or three under a binding arch, appeared again in the architecture of the West. History makes no leaps, and nothing is lost. Just as the development of life requires variation as well as heredity, and the development of a society needs experimental innovation as well as stabilizing custom, so the development of art in Western Europe involved not only the continuity of a tradition in skills and forms, and the stimulation of Byzantine and Muslim examples, but also the repeated turning of the artist from the school to nature, from ideas to things, from the past to the present, from the imitation of models to the expression of self. There was a somber and static quality in Byzantine art, a fragile and feminine elegance in Arabic ornament that could never represent the dynamic and masculine vitality of a rebarbarized and reinvigorated West. Nations that were rising out of the Dark Ages toward the noon of the 13th century preferred the noble grace of Giotto's women to the stiff Theodorus of Byzantine mosaics, and laughing at the Semitic horror of images, they transformed mere decoration into the smiling angel of the Reims Cathedral and the Golden Virgin of Amiens. The joy of life conquered the fear of death in Gothic art. It was the monks who, as they preserved classic literature, maintained and disseminated Roman, Greek, and Oriental art techniques. Seeking self-containment, the monasteries trained their inmates to the decorative as well as the practical crafts. The abbey church required altar and chancel furniture, chalice and pyx, reliquaries and shrines, missal, candelabra, perhaps mosaics, murals, and icons to inform and inspire piety. These monks, for the most part, fashioned with their own hands. Indeed, the monastery itself was in many cases designed and built by them, as Monte Cassino rises by Benedictine labor today. Most monasteries included spacious workshops. At Chartres, for example, Bernard de Tiron founded a religious house and gathered into it, we are told, craftsmen both in wood and iron, carvers and goldsmiths, painters and stonemasons, and others skilled in all manner of cunning work. The illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages were almost all the work of monks. The finest textiles were produced by monks and nuns. The architects of the early Romanesque cathedrals were monks. In the 11th and early 12th centuries, the Abbey of Cluny furnished most of the architects for Western Europe and many of the painters and sculptors. And in the 13th century, the Abbey of Saint-Denis was a thriving center of varied arts. Even the Cistercian monasteries, which in the days of the watchful Bernard had closed their doors to decoration, soon surrendered to the lure of form and the excitement of color, and began to build abbeys as ornate as Cluny or Saint-Denis. As the English cathedrals were usually monastic minsters, the regular or monastic clergy continued to the end of the 13th century to dominate ecclesiastical architecture in England. But a monastery, however excellent as a school and refuge for the spirit, is condemned by its seclusion to be a repository of traditions, rather than a theater of living experiment. It is better fitted to preserve than to create. Not until the widened demands of a richer laity nourished secular artists did medieval life find the exuberant expression in unhackneyed forms that brought Gothic art to fullness. First in Italy, most in France, least in England, the emancipated and specializing laymen of the twelfth century, grouped in guilds, took the arts from monastic teachers and hands and built the great cathedrals. 2. The Adornment of Life Nevertheless, it was a monk who wrote the most complete and revealing summary of medieval arts and crafts. Theophilus, lover of God, in the monastery of Helmershausen near Paderborn, wrote about 1190 a Schedula Diversarum Artium. Theophilus, a humble priest, addresses his words to all who wish, by the practical work of their hands, and by the pleasing meditation of what is new, to put aside all sloth of mind and wandering of spirit. Here shall such men find all that Greece possesses in the way of diverse colors and mixtures, all that Tuscany knows of the working of enamels, all that Arabia has to show of works ductile, fusible, or chaste, all the many vases and sculptured gems and ivory that Italy adorns with gold, all that France prizes in costly variety of windows, all that is extolled in gold, silver, copper, or iron, or in subtle working of wood or stone." Here in a paragraph we see another side of the age of faith, men and women, and not least monks and nuns, seeking to satisfy the impulse to expression, taking pleasure in proportion, harmony, and form, and eager to make the useful beautiful. 
The medieval scene, however suffused with religion, is above all a picture of men and women working, and the first and basic purpose of their art is the adornment of their work, their bodies, and their homes. Thousands of woodworkers used knife, drill, gouge, chisel, and polishing materials to carve tables, chairs, benches, chests, caskets, cabinets, stair posts, wainscots, beds, cupboards, buffets, icons, altar pieces, choir stalls, with an incredible variety of forms and themes in high or low relief, and often with a mischievous humor that recognized no barrier between the sacred and the profane. On the misericords, one might find figures of misers, gluttons, gossipers, grotesque beasts and birds with human heads. In Venice, the woodcarvers sometimes made frames more beautiful and costly than the pictures they enclosed. The Germans began in the 12th century that remarkable wood sculpture which would become a major art in the 16th. The workers in metal rivaled the workers in wood. Iron was wrought into elegant gratings for windows, courtyards, and gates, for mighty hinges that spread across massive doors in a variety of floral designs, as on Notre Dame at Paris. For cathedral choir grills as strong as iron and as delicate as lace. Iron or bronze or copper was fused or hammered into handsome vases, goblets, cauldrons, ewers, candelabra, censers, caskets, and lamps. And bronze plates covered many cathedral doors. Armorers liked to add a touch of decoration to swords and scabbards, helmets, breastplates, and shields. The gorgeous bronze chandelier presented to the Cathedral of Aachen by Frederick Barbarossa attested the ability of the German metal workers. And the great bronze candlestick from Gloucester, circa 1100, now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, bears like testimony to English skill. The medieval fondness for making art of the simplest articles shows in the adornment of bolts, locks, and keys. Even weather vanes were carefully decorated with ornament that only a telescope could see. The arts of the precious metals and stones flourished amid general poverty. The Merovingian kings had gold plate, and Charlemagne collected at Aachen a treasure of goldsmith's work. The church pardonably felt that if gold and silver brightened the tables of barons and bankers, they should also be used in the service of the king of kings. Some altars were of chased silver, some of chaste gold, as in the church of St. Ambrose at Milan, and the cathedrals of Pistoia and Basel. Gold was normal for the ciborium, or pyx, that held the consecrated host, for the monstrance in which it was exposed to the veneration of the faithful, for the chalice that contained the sacramental wine, and for the reliquaries in which saintly relics were preserved. These vessels were in many cases more beautifully worked than the most costly prized cups of today. In Spain, the goldsmiths made resplendent tabernacles to bear the host in processions through the streets. In Paris, the goldsmith Bonnard, in 1212, used 1,544 ounces of silver and 60 of gold to make a shrive for the bones of saint Genevieve. We may judge the scope of the goldsmith's art from the 79 chapters devoted to it by Theophilus. There we find that every medieval goldsmith was expected to be a Cellini, at once smelter, sculptor, enameler, jewel mounter, and inlay worker. Paris in the 13th century had a powerful guild of goldsmiths and jewelers, and Parisian jewel cutters had already a reputation for producing artificial gems. The seals that rich men used to stamp the wax on their letters or envelopes were carefully designed and carved. Every prelate had an official ring, and every real or specious gentleman flaunted at least one ring on his hands. Those who cater to human vanity seldom starve. Cameos, small reliefs on precious material, were popular among the rich. Henry III of England had a great cameo valued at two hundred pounds, or forty thousand dollars. Baldwin II brought a still more celebrated cameo from Constantinople to house it at Paris in Saint-Chapelle. Ivory was painstakingly carved throughout the Middle Ages. Combs, boxes, handles, drinking horns, icons, book covers, diptychs and triptychs, episcopal staffs and croziers, reliquaries, shrines. Astonishingly close to perfection is a 13th-century ivory group in the Louvre, depicting the descent from the cross. Towards the end of that century, romance and humor gained upon piety, and delicate carvings of sometimes very delicate scenes appeared on mirror cases and toilet boxes designed for ladies who could not be pious all the time. Ivory was one of many materials used for inlay, which the Italians called intarsia, from the Latin intercerere, to insert and the French termed marquetry, marque to mark. Wood itself might be used as an inlay in other woods. A design was chiseled into a block of wood, and other woods were pressed and glued into the design. 
One of the more recondite medieval arts was niello, from the Latin nigellus, or black, inlaying an incised metal surface with a black paste composed of silver, copper, sulfur, and lead. When the inlay hardened, the surface was filed till the silver in the mixture shone. From this technique, in the 15th century, Finiguera would develop copper plate engraving. The ceramic arts matured again out of industrial pottery as the returning crusaders aroused Europe from the Dark Ages. Cloisonne enamel entered the West from Byzantium in the 8th century. In the 12th, the plaque representing the Last Judgment gave an excellent example of Jean Levé. That is, the spaces between the lines of the design were hollowed out into a copper ground, and the depressions were filled with enamel paste. Limoges, in France, had made enameled wares since the 3rd century. In the 12th, it was the chief center in the West of Jean Levé and Cloisonne. In the 13th century, Moorish potters in Christian Spain coated clay vessels with an opaque tin glaze or enamel as a base for painted decoration. In the 15th century, Italian merchants imported such wares from Spain in Majorcan trading ships and called the material majolica, changing R to L in their melodious way. The art of glass, so nearly perfected in ancient Rome, returned to Venice from Egypt and Byzantium. As early as 1024, we hear of twelve fiolarii there, whose products were so varied that the government took the industry under its protection and voted the title gentleman to glassmakers. In 1278, the glass workers were removed to a special quarter on the island of Murano, partly for safety, partly for secrecy. Strict laws were passed forbidding Venetian glassmakers to go abroad or to reveal the esoteric techniques of their art. From that foot of earth, the Venetians for four centuries dominated the art and industry of glass in the Western world. Enameling and gilding of glass were highly developed, Olivo de Venezia made textiles of glass, and Murano poured out glass mosaic, beads, files, beakers, tableware, even glass mirrors, which in the 13th century began to replace mirrors of polished steel. France, England, and Germany also made glass in this period, but almost entirely for industrial use. The stained glass of the cathedrals was a brilliant exception. Women have always received less credit in histories of art than they deserved. The adornment of the person and the home are precious elements in the art of life, and the work of women in dress design, interior decoration, embroidery, drapery, and tapestry has contributed more than most arts to that often unconscious pleasure which we derive from the intimate and silent presence of beautiful things. Delicate tissues, deftly woven, and welcomed to sight or touch, were highly prized in the Age of Faith. They clothed altars, relics, sacred vessels, priests, and men and women of high estate. And they themselves were wrapped in soft, thin paper, which took from them its tissue paper name. In the 13th century, France and England dethroned Constantinople as the chief producer of artistic embroidery. We hear of embroiderers' guilds in Paris in 1258. And Matthew Paris, under the year 1246, tells how Pope Innocent IV was struck by the gold-embroidered vestments of English prelates visiting Rome and ordered such opus anglicanum for his copes and chasubles. Some ecclesiastical garments were so heavy with jewels, gold thread, and small enamel plaques that the priest so robed could hardly walk. An American millionaire paid $60,000 for an ecclesiastical vestment known as the Cope of Ascoli. The most famous of medieval embroideries was the Dalmatic of Charlemagne, it was believed to be a product of Dalmatia, but was probably a Byzantine work of the 12th century. It is now one of the most precious objects in the treasury of the Vatican. In France and England, embroidered hangings or tapestries took the place of paintings, especially in public buildings. Their full display was reserved for festal days. Then they were hung under the arches of church bays and in the streets and on processional floats. Usually they were woven of wool and silk by the tire women or maids of feudal chateaus under the superintendence of the chatelaine. Many were woven by nuns, some by monks. Tapestries made no pretense to rival the subtler qualities of painting. They were to be seen from some distance and had to sacrifice nicety of line and shading to clarity of figure and brilliance and permanence of color. They commemorated an historical event or a famous legend or cheered gloomy interiors with representations of landscapes, flowers, or the sea. Tapestries are mentioned as early as the 10th century in France, but the oldest extant full specimens hardly antedate the 14th. Florence in Italy, Chinchilla in Spain, Poitiers, Arras, and Lille in France led the West in the art of tapestry and rugs. The world-renowned Bayeux tapestries were not strictly such since their design was embroidered upon the surface instead of forming part of the weave.
They derived their name from the Cathedral of Bayeux that long housed them. Tradition ascribed them to William the Conqueror's Queen Matilda and the ladies of her Norman court, but ungallant scholarship prefers an anonymous origin and a later date. They rival the Chronicles as an authority for the Norman conquest. Upon a strip of brown linen nineteen inches wide and seventy-one yards long, sixty scenes show in procession the preparation for the invasion, the Norse vessels cleaving the channel with high and figured prows, the wild battle of Hastings, the transfixing and death of Harold, the rout of the Anglo-Saxon troops, the triumph of blessed force. These tapestries are impressive examples of patient needlework, but they are not among the finer products of their kind. In 1803, Napoleon used them as propaganda to rouse the French to invade England, but he neglected to secure the blessing of the gods. 3. Painting 1. Mosaic The pictorial art in the Age of Faith took four principal forms, mosaic, miniatures, murals, and stained glass. The mosaic art was now in its old age, but in the course of two thousand years it had learned many subtleties. To make the gold ground they loved so well, mosaicists wrapped gold leaf around glass cubes, covered the leaf with a thin film of glass to keep the gold from tarnishing, and then, to avoid surface glare, laid the gilded cubes in slightly uneven planes. The light was reflected at diverse angles from the cubes and gave an almost living texture to the whole. It was probably Byzantine artists who in the eleventh century covered the east apse and west wall of an old cathedral at Torcello, an island near Venice, with some of the most imposing mosaics in medieval history. This book is continued on Cassette 5, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 5, Side 1. It was probably Byzantine artists who, in the 11th century, covered the east apse and west wall of an old cathedral at Torcello, an island near Venice, with some of the most imposing mosaics in medieval history. The mosaics of St. Mark's range over seven centuries in authorship and style. Doge Domenico Selvo commissioned the first interior mosaics in 1071, presumably using Byzantine artists. The mosaics of 1153 were still under Byzantine tutelage. Not until 1450 were Italian artists predominant in the mosaic adornment of St. Mark's. The 12th century ascension mosaic of the central cupola is a summit of the art, but it has a close rival in the Joseph mosaics of the vestibule dome. The marble mosaic of the pavement has survived through seven hundred years the tread of human feet. At the other end of Italy, Greek and Saracen workers united to produce the mosaic masterpieces of Norman Sicily. In the Capella Palatina and Martorana of Palermo, the Monastery of Monreale, the Cathedral of Cefalu. This in 1148. The wars of the papacy in the thirteenth century may have retarded art in Rome. However, resplendent mosaics were made in that period for the churches of Santa Maria Maggiore, Santa Maria in Trastevere, St. John Lateran, and St. Paul outside the walls. An Italian, Andrea Taffi, 1213-1294, designed a mosaic for the baptistry at Florence, but it was not up to the Greek work in Venice or Sicily. Suger's Abbey at Saint-Denis, in 1150, had a magnificent mosaic floor, partly preserved in the Cluny Museum, and the pavement, circa 1268, of Westminster Abbey is an admirable mingling of mosaic shades. But the mosaic art never prospered north of the Alps. Stained glass outshone it, and with the coming of Duccio, Cimabue, and Giotto, murals crowded it out even in Italy. 2. Miniatures The illumination of manuscripts with miniature paintings and decoration in liquid silver and gold and colored inks continued to be a favorite art, gratefully adapted to monastic quiet and piety. Like so many phases of medieval activity, it reached its western apogee in the thirteenth century. Never again has it been so delicate, inventive, or profuse. 
The stiff figures and drapes and hard greens and reds of the 11th century were gradually replaced with forms of grace and tenderness in richer hues on backgrounds of blue or gold. And the Virgin conquered the miniature even as she was capturing the cathedral. During the Dark Ages, many books were destroyed. Those that remained were doubly precious and constituted, so to speak, a thin lifeline of civilization in their text and art. Psalters, gospels, sacramentaries, Missals, breviaries, books of hours were cherished as the living vehicles of a divine revelation. No effort was too great for their fit adornment. One might reasonably spend a day on an initial, a week on a title page. Hartcare, a monk of St. Gaul, perhaps expecting the end of the world with the century, made a vow in 986 to remain within four walls the rest of his earthly life. He stayed in his tiny cell till he died fifteen years later and there he illuminated, brightened with pictures and ornament, the Antiphonary of St. Gaul. Perspective and modeling were now less ably practiced than in the Carolingian exuberance. The Enlumineur, as the French called the miniaturist, sought depth and splendor of color, and the crowded fullness and vitality of representation, rather than the illusion of tridimensional space. Most frequently his subjects were taken from the Bible, or the apocryphal Gospels, or the legends of the saints— but sometimes an herbal or a bestiary sought illustration, and he took delight in picturing real or imaginary plants and animals. Even in religious books, the ecclesiastical rules for subject and treatment were less defined in the West than in the East, and the painter was allowed to range and frolic widely within his narrow room. Animal bodies with human heads, human bodies with animal heads, a monkey disguised as a monk, a monkey examining with proper medical gravity a file of urine, a musician giving a concert by scraping together the jawbones of an ass. Such were the topics that graced a book of the hours of the Virgin. Other texts, sacred as well as profane, came to life with scenes of hunting, tournament, or war. One thirteenth-century psalter included in its pictures the inside of an Italian bank. The secular world, recovering from its terror of eternity, was invading the precincts of religion itself. English monasteries were fertile in this peaceful art. The East Anglian school produced famous psalters, one treasured by the Brussels Library, another, Ormsby, at Oxford, a third, St. Omer, in the British Museum. But the finest illumination of the age was French. The psalters painted for Louis IX inaugurate a style of centered composition and division into framed medallions, obviously taken from the stained glass of the cathedrals. The lowlands shared in this movement, the monks of Liège and Ghent attained in their miniatures, something of the warm feeling and flowing grace of the sculptures at Amiens and Reims. Spain produced the greatest single chef d'oeuvre of thirteenth-century illumination in a book of hymns to the Virgin, Las Cantijas del Rey Sabio, circa 1280, the canticles of Alfonso X, the wise king. Its 1226 miniatures suggest the labor and loyalty that medieval books might receive. Such books, of course, were works of calligraphic as well as pictorial art, Sometimes the same artist copied or composed and wrote the text and painted the illumination. In several manuscripts, one hesitates to decide which seems more beautiful, the decoration or the text. We paid a price for print. 3. Murals It is difficult to tell how far the miniatures in subject and design influenced murals, panels, icons, ceramic painting, sculptural relief, and stained glass, and how far these influenced illumination. There was among these arts a free trade in themes and styles, a continuous interaction, and sometimes the same artist practiced them all. We do injustice to art and artist alike when we separate one art too sharply from the rest, or the arts from the life of their time. Reality is always more integrated than our chronicles, and the historian disintegrates for convenience sake the elements of a civilization whose components flowed as a united stream. We must try not to sever the artist from the cultural complex that reared and taught him, gave him traditions and topics, praised or tormented him, used him up, buried him, and, more often than not, forgot his name. The Middle Ages, like any age of faith, discouraged individualism as insolent impiety and bade the ego even of genius submerge itself in the work and current of its time. The church, the state, the commune, the guild were the lasting realities. They were the artists. Individuals were the hands of the group. And when the great cathedral took form, 
Its body and soul would stand for all the bodies and souls that its design and building and adornment had consecrated and consumed. So history has swallowed up nearly all the names of the men who painted the walls of medieval structures before the 13th century, and war, revolution, and the damp of time have almost swallowed up their work. Were the methods of the muralists to blame? They used the ancient processes of fresco and tempera, applying the colors to freshly plastered walls or painting upon dry walls with colors made adhesive by some glutinous material. Both methods aimed at permanence, through permeation or cohesion. Even so, the colors tended to flake off in the course of years, so that very little remains of mural painting before the 14th century. Theophilus, in 1190, described the preparation of oil colors, but this technique lay undeveloped till the Renaissance. The traditions of classic Roman painting were apparently snuffed out by the barbarian invasions and the ensuing centuries of poverty. When Italian mural painting revived, it took its lead not from antiquity, but from the half-Greek, half-Oriental methods of Byzantium. Early in the 13th century, we find Greek painters working in Italy, Theophanes at Venice, Apollonius at Florence, Malormus at Siena. The earliest signed panel pictures in the Italian art of this period bear Greek names. Such men brought with them Byzantine themes and styles, symbolic figures, religio-mystical, making no claim to the representation of natural attitudes and scenes. Gradually, as wealth and taste rose in 13th century Italy, and the higher rewards of art drew better talents to their quest, Italian painters, Giunta Pisano at Pisa, Lapo at Pistoia, Guido at Siena, Pietro Cavallini at Assisi and Rome, began to abandon the dreamy Byzantine manner and to infuse their painting with the color and passion of Italy. In the church of San Domenico at Siena, Guido in 1271 painted a Madonna whose pure, sweet face left far behind it the frail and lifeless forms of the Byzantine painting of that age. This picture almost begins the Italian Renaissance. A generation later, Duccio di Buoninsegna, 1273-1319, carried Siena to a kind of civic aesthetic frenzy with his Maesta, or Majesty, of the Virgin enthroned. The thriving citizens decided that the Divine Mother, their feudal queen, should have her picture painted on an imposing scale by the greatest artist available anywhere. They found it pleasant to choose their townsman, Duccio. They promised him gold, gave him food and time, and watched every step of his work. When, after three years, it was complete in 1311, and Duccio had added a touching signature, Holy Mother of God, give Siena peace and Duccio life because he painted thee thus. A procession of bishops, priests, monks, officials, and half the population of the city escorted the picture, fourteen feet long and seven wide, to the cathedral amid the blare of trumpets and the ringing of bells. The work was still half Byzantine in style, aiming at religious expression rather than realistic portraiture. The Virgin's nose was too long and straight, her eyes too somber, but the surrounding figures had grace and character, and the scenes from the life of Mary and Christ, painted on the predellas and pinnacles, had a new and vivid charm. Altogether, this was the greatest painting before Giotto. Meanwhile, at Florence, Giovanni Cimabue, possibly from 1240 to 1302, had inaugurated a dynasty of painters that would rule Italian art for almost three centuries. Born of a noble family, Giovanni doubtless saddened them by abandoning law for art. He was a proud spirit, apt to cast aside any of his works in which he or another had found a defect. While stemming, like Duccio, from the Italian Byzantine school, he poured his pride and energy into his art to revolutionary effect. In him, more than in the greater artist Duccio, the Byzantine style was superseded, and a new path of advance was cleared. He bent and softened the hard lines of his predecessors, gave flesh to spirit, color and warmth to flesh, human tenderness to gods and saints and by using bright reds, pinks, and blues for the drapery, he endowed his paintings with a life and brilliance unknown before him in medieval Italy. All this, however, we must accept on the testimony of his time. Not one of the pictures attributed to him is unquestionably his. And the Madonna and Child with Angels, painted in tempera for the Rucelli Chapel of Santa Maria Novella in Florence, is more probably by Duccio. A tradition disputed but probably true assigns to Cimabue a virgin and child between four angels in the lower church of San Francesco at Assisi. This colossal fresco, usually dated 1296, 
and restored in the 19th century, is the first extant masterpiece in Italian painting. The figure of St. Francis is bravely realistic, a man frightened to emaciation by visions of Christ, and the four angels begin the Renaissance alliance of religious subjects with feminine beauty. In the closing years of his life, Cimabue was appointed capo maestro of mosaics at the Cathedral of Pisa, and there, it is said, he designed for the apse a mosaic of Christ in glory between the Virgin and St. John. Vasari tells a pretty tale how Cimabue once found a shepherd lad of ten, called Giotto di Bondone, drawing a lamb on a slate with a piece of coal, and took him to Florence as a pupil. Certainly, Giotto worked in Cimabue's studio, and occupied his master's house after Cimabue's death. So began the greatest line of painters in the history of art. 4. Stained Glass Italy was a century ahead of the north in murals and mosaics, a century behind in architecture and stained glass. The art of painting glass had been known to antiquity, but chiefly in the form of glass mosaic. Gregory of Tours, possibly from 538 to 593, filled the windows of St. Martin's with glass of varied colors. And in the same century, Paul the Silentiary marked the splendor of sunlight as filtered through the variously colored windows of St. Sophia's at Constantinople. In these cases, so far as we know, there was no attempt at making pictures with the glass. But about 980, Archbishop Adalbero of Reims adorned his cathedral with windows containing histories. And in 1052, the Chronicle of St. Benignus described a very ancient painted window representing St. Pascasius in a church at Dijon. Here was historiated glass, but apparently the color was painted upon the glass, not fused into it. When Gothic architecture reduced the strain on walls and made space for larger windows, the abundant light thereby admitted into the church allowed, indeed demanded, the coloring of the panes. And every stimulus was present to find a method of more permanently painting glass. Stain-fused glass was probably an offshoot of the art of enameled glass. Theophilus described the new technique in 1190. A cartoon or design was laid upon a table and was divided into small sections, each marked with a symbol of the desired color. Pieces of glass were cut, seldom more than an inch long or wide, to fit the sections of the cartoon. Each piece of glass was painted in the designated color with a pigment consisting of powdered glass mixed with varying metallic oxides, cobalt for blue, copper for red or green, manganese for purple. The painted glass was then fired to fuse the enamel oxides with the glass. The cooled pieces were laid upon the design and were soldered together with thin strips of lead. In viewing a window of such mosaic glass, the eye hardly notices the leads, but makes of the parts a continuous colored surface. The artist was interested in color above all, and aimed at a fusion of color tones. He sought no realism, no perspective. He gave the queerest hues to the objects in his pictures, green camels, pink lions, blue-faced knights, but he achieved the effect he aimed at, a brilliant and lasting picture, a softening and coloring of the light admitted to the church, and the instruction and exaltation of the worshiper. The windows, even the great roses, were in most cases divided into panels, medallions, circles, lozenges, or squares, so that one window might show several scenes in a biography or theme. Old Testament prophets were pictured opposite their New Testament analogues or fulfillments, and the New Testament was amplified from the apocryphal Gospels, whose picturesque fables were so dear to the medieval mind. Stories of the saints were even more frequent in the windows than episodes from the Bible, so the adventures of St. Eustace were narrated in the windows of Chartres, and again at Saint, Auxerre, Le Mans, and Tours. Events of profane history rarely appeared in stained glass. Within a half-century of its oldest known occurrence in France, stained glass reached perfection at Chartres. The windows of that cathedral served as models and goals for those at Saint, Laon, Bourges, and Rouen. Thence the art crossed to England and inspired the glass of Canterbury and Lincoln. A treaty between France and England specified that one of the glass painters of Louis the Seventh, 1137 to 1180, should be allowed to come to England. In the 13th century, the component parts of the pane were made larger, and the color lost something of the vibrating subtlety of the earlier work. Painting in grisaille, decorative tracery with thin lines of red or blue on a gray monochrome base, replaced towards the end of that century the color symphonies of the great cathedrals. The mullions themselves, in ever more complex designs, played a larger part in the picture. And though such window tracery became in its turn a lovely art, 
the skill of the glass painter declined. The splendor of stained glass had come with the Gothic cathedral, and when the Gothic glory faded, the ecstasy of color died away. 4. Sculpture Much Roman sculpture had been destroyed as loot by victorious barbarism, or as obscene idolatry by nascent Christianity. Something had remained, especially in France, to excite the imagination of barbarism tamed and a Christian culture coming of age. In this art, as in others, the Eastern Roman Empire had preserved old models and skills, had overlaid them with Asiatic conventions and mysticism, and had redistributed to the West the seeds that had come to it from Rome. Greek carvers went to Germany after Theophano married Otto II in 972. They went to Venice, Ravenna, Rome, Naples, Sicily, perhaps to Barcelona and Marseille. From such men, and from the Moslem artists of his regno, the sculptors of Frederick II may have learned their trade. When barbarism became rich, it could afford to wed beauty. When the church became rich, she took sculpture, like the other arts, into the service of her creed and ritual. That, after all, was the way the major arts had developed in Egypt and Asia, in Greece and Rome. Great art is the child of a triumphant faith. Like mural painting, mosaic, and stained glass, sculpture was conceived not as independent, but as one phase of an integrated art for which no language has a name, the adornment of worship. Primarily, the sculptor's function was to beautify the house of God with statuary and reliefs, secondarily to make images or icons to inspire piety in the home. After that, if time and funds remained, he might carve the likeness of a secular person or adorn profane things. In church sculpture, the preferred material was some lasting substance like stone, marble, alabaster, bronze. But for statuary, the church favored wood. Such figures could be borne without agony by Christians marching in religious pageantry. Statues were painted, as in ancient religious art, and they were more often realistic than idealized. The worshiper was to feel the presence of the saint through the image, and so well was this end attained that the Christian, like the devotee of older faiths, expected miracles of the statue, and raised few doubts on hearing that the arm of an alabaster Christ had moved in benediction, or that the breast of a wooden virgin had given milk. Any study of medieval sculpture should begin with an act of contrition. A great part of that sculpture was destroyed in England by Puritan zealots, sometimes by act of Parliament, and in France by the art terror of the Revolution. In England, the reaction was against what seemed to the new iconoclasts the pagan ornamentation of Christian shrines. In France, it attacked the collections, effigies, and tombs of the hated aristocracy. All through these countries we find headless statues, broken noses, battered sarcophagi, smashed reliefs, shattered cornices and capitals. A fury of accumulated resentment against ecclesiastical or feudal tyranny vented itself at last in a satanic demolition. As if enlisting in a conspiracy of ruin, time and its servant elements wore away surfaces, melted stone, effaced inscriptions, waged against the works of man a cold and silent war that never granted truce. And man himself, in a thousand campaigns, sought victory through competitive devastation. We know medieval sculpture only in its desolation. We add misunderstanding to injury when we view its scattered members in museums. It was not meant to be seen in isolation. It was part of a theological theme and an architectural whole, and what might seem crude and ungainly in separation may have been skillfully suited to its context in stone. The cathedral statue was an element in a composition. It was adjusted to its place and tended to follow, by elongation, the vertical lift of the cathedral lines. The legs were kept together, the arms were pressed to the body, Sometimes a saint was thinned and stretched through all the length of a portal jam. Less often a horizontal effect was stressed, and the figures over a door might be fattened and flattened as over the portal of Chartres, or a man or a beast might be crumpled into a capital like a Greek god cornered in a pediment. Gothic sculpture was fused in an unrivaled unity with the architecture it adorned. This subordination of sculptural to structural line and aim especially marked the art of the twelfth century. The thirteenth witnessed an exuberant rebellion of the sculptor, who now ventured out of formalism into realism, out of piety into humor and satire and the zest of earthy life. At Chartres in the twelfth century the figures are somber and stiff. At Reims in the thirteenth they are caught in natural conversation or spontaneous action. Their features are individual, there is grace in their pose. Many figures on the cathedrals of Chartres and Reims 
resemble the bearded peasants that still meet us in French villages. The shepherd, warming himself at the fire on the west portal of Amiens, might be in a Norman or Gaspé field today. No sculpture in history rivals the whimsical veracity of Gothic cathedral reliefs. At Rouen, crowded into little quatrefoils, we find a meditative philosopher with the head of a pig, a doctor, half man and half goose, studying another file of urine, a music teacher, half man and half rooster, giving a lesson on the organ to a centaur, a man changed by a sorcerer into a dog, whose feet still wear his boots. Funny little figures crouch under the statues at Chartres, Amiens, Reims. A capital in Strasbourg Cathedral, since reformed, showed the burial of Reynard the fox. A boar and a goat carried his coffin, a wolf bore the cross, a hare lighted the way with a taper, a bear sprinkled holy water, a stag sang mass, an ass chanted the funeral service from a book resting on the head of a cat. In Beverly Minster, a fox cowled like a monk preaches from a pulpit to a congregation of pious geese. The cathedrals are, among other things, menageries in stone. Almost all animals known to man, and many known only to medieval fancy, find somewhere room in these tolerant immensities. At Laon, sixteen bulls lower on the cathedral towers. They represent, we are told, the mighty beasts that through patient years transported the stone blocks from the quarries to the hilltop church. One day, said a genial legend, an ox laboring upward fell in exhaustion. The load was precariously poised on a slope when a miraculous ox appeared, slipped into the harness, drew the cart to the summit, and then vanished into the supernatural air. We smile at such fiction and return to our tales of sex and crime. The cathedrals found place, too, for a botanical garden. Next to the Virgin, the angels, and the saints, what better ornament could there be for the house of God than the plants, fruits, and flowers of the French or English or German countryside? In Romanesque architecture, from 800 to 1200, the old Roman floral motives persisted, acanthus leaves and the vine. In Gothic, these formalized motives yielded to an amazing profusion of indigenous plants, carved into bases, capitals, spandrels, archivolts, cornices, columns, pulpits, choirs, doorposts, stalls. These forms are not conventional. They are often individualized varieties locally loved and rendered to the life. Sometimes they are composite plants, another play of Gothic imagination, but still fresh with the feel of nature. Trees, branches, twigs, leaves, buds, flowers, fruit, ferns, buttercups, plantains, watercress, celandine, rose bushes, strawberry plants, thistle and sage, parsley and chicory, cabbage and celery. All are here, falling from the never-emptied cornucopia of the cathedral. The intoxication of spring was in the heart of the sculptor and guided the chisel into the stone. Not only spring, all the seasons of the year are in these carvings, all the toil and solace of sowing, reaping, and vintage are here. And in the whole history of sculpture there is nothing finer in its kind than the vintage capital in the Cathedral of Reims. But this world of plants and flowers, birds and beasts, was ancillary to the main theme of medieval sculpture, the life and death of man. At Chartres, Laon, Lyon, Auxerre, Bourges, some preliminary reliefs tell the story of the creation. At Laon, the creator counts on his fingers the days left him for his task, and in later scenes we see him, tired with his cosmic toil, leaning on his staff, sitting down to rest, going to sleep. This is a god whom any peasant can understand. Other cathedral reliefs show the months of the year, each with its distinctive work and joy. Others show the occupations of man, peasants in the field or at the wine press, some guiding horses or oxen in breaking furrows or pulling carts, others shearing sheep or milking cows. And there are millers, carpenters, porters, merchants, artists, scholars, even a philosopher or two. The sculptor portrays abstractions through examples. Donatus is grammar, Cicero is oratory, Aristotle is dialectic, Ptolemy is astronomy. Philosophy sits with her head in the clouds, a book in her right hand, a scepter in her left. She is Regina Scientiarum, queen of the sciences. Paired figures personify faith and idolatry, hope and despair, charity and avarice, chastity and lechery, peace and discord. A portal at Laon shows a combat of the vices and the virtues, and on the west front of Notre Dame, at Paris, 
A graceful figure with bandaged eyes represents the synagogue, while opposite her is an even lovelier woman with royal mantle and commanding air, the church as the bride of Christ. Christ himself appears, sometimes tender, sometimes terrible, taken down from the cross by his mother, rising from the tomb while nearby, in symbol a lion brings her cubs to life with a breath, or sternly judging the quick and the dead. That last judgment is everywhere in the sculpture and painting of the churches. Man was never allowed to forget it. And here, too, only one intercessor could be relied upon to win forgiveness for his sins. So in the sculpture, as in the litanies, Mary took the leading place, the mother of infinite mercy, who would not let her son take too literally those awful words about the many called, the few chosen. There is a depth of feeling in this Gothic sculpture, a variety and energy of life, a sympathy with all the forms of the plant and animal world, a tenderness, gentleness, and grace, a miracle of stone revealing not flesh but the soul, that move and satisfy us when the bodily excellence of Greek statuary has lost, perhaps through our aging, something of its traditional lure. Beside the living figures of medieval faith, the heavy gods of the Parthenon pediment seem cold and dead. Gothic sculpture is technically deficient, there is nothing in it that can match the perfection of the Parthenon frieze, or the handsome gods and sensuous goddesses of Praxiteles, or even the matrons and senators of the Arapaches at Rome. And doubtless those comely Ephebi and pliant Aphrodites once meant the joy of healthy life and love. But the prejudices of our native creed, remembering its loveliness and forgetting its terror, bring us back again and again to the great cathedrals, and tip the scales to the beau dieu of Amiens, the smiling angel of Reims, and the virgin of Chartres. As the skill of the medieval sculptor grew, he aspired to free his art from architecture and produce works that could please the increasingly secular taste of princes and prelates, nobles and bourgeoisie. In England, the marblers of Purbeck, using the excellent material quarried in that Dorsetshire promontory, earned high repute in the 13th century for ready-made shafts and capitals, and for the recumbent effigies they carved on the sarcophagi of the affluent dead. About 1292, William Torrell, a London goldsmith, cast in bronze the images of Henry III and his daughter-in-law, Eleanor of Castile, for their marble tombs in Westminster Abbey. These are as fine as any bronze work of the age. Remarkable schools of sculpture gathered in this period at Liège, Hildesheim, and Naumburg. And some unknown master, about 1240, made the strong and simple figures with magnificent drapery, of Henry the Lion and his Lioness in the Cathedral of Brunswick. France led Europe in the quality of her Romanesque, or 12th century, and Gothic, or 13th century, statuary, but most of it is integrated with her cathedrals and is best studied there. Sculpture in Italy was not so intimately bound up with architecture, the commune, and the guild as in France. And there, in the 13th century, we begin to get individual artists whose personality dominates their work and preserves their names. Niccolò Pisano embodied a diversity of influences fused into a unique synthesis. Born in Apulia, about 1225, he enjoyed the stimulating air of Frederick II's regime. There, apparently, he studied the remains and restorations of classic art. Moving to Pisa, he inherited the Romanesque tradition and heard of the Gothic style then at its apex in France. When he carved a pulpit for Pisa's baptistry, he took for his model a Roman sarcophagus of Hadrian's time. He was deeply moved by the firm but graceful lines of the classic forms. Though his pulpit showed Romanesque and Gothic arches, most of its figures bore Roman features and dress. The face and robes of Mary in the panel of the presentation were those of a Roman matron. And in one corner a nude athlete proclaimed the spirit of ancient Greece. Jealous of this masterpiece, Siena, in 1265, engaged Niccolò, his son Giovanni, and his pupil Arnolfo di Cambio, to carve a still finer pulpit for the cathedral. They succeeded. Standing on columns with Gothic flowered capitals, this pulpit of white marble repeated the themes of the Pisan work with a crowded panel of the crucifixion. Here, the Gothic influence won over the classical, but in the feminine figures that crowned the columns, the antique mood found voice in the frank portrayal of rosy health. As if to underscore his classic sentiments, Niccolo chiseled upon the tomb of the ascetic St. Dominic at Bologna virile forms in pagan style, full of the joy of life. In 1271 he joined his son and Arnolfo, 
to carve the marble font still standing in the public square of Perugia. He died seven years later, still relatively young, but in one lifetime he had made straight the way for Donatello and the rebirth of classic sculpture in the Renaissance. His son Giovanni Pisano, who lived circa 1240 to circa 1320, rivaled him in influence and surpassed him in technical skill. In 1271, Pisa commissioned Giovanni to build a cemetery fit for men who were then dividing the western Mediterranean with Genoa. Holy earth was brought from Mount Calvary for the Campo Santo, or sacred field. Around a grassy rectangle, the artist raised graceful arches in mingled Romanesque and Gothic styles. Masterpieces of sculpture were brought in to adorn the cloisters, and the Campo Santo remained a monument to Giovanni Pisano until the Second World War shattered half its arches into a neglected ruin. When the Pisans were defeated by the Genoese in 1284, they could no longer afford Giovanni. He went to Siena and helped to design and execute the sculpture of the cathedral facade. In 1290, he chiseled some reliefs for the bizarre face of the Orvieto Cathedral. Thence he returned north to Pistoia and carved for the church of Sant'Andrea a pulpit less virile than his father's at Pisa, but excelling it in naturalness and grace. This indeed is the loveliest product of Gothic sculpture in Italy. The third member of this famous trio, Arnolfo di Cambio, who lived circa 1232 to circa 1300, continued the Gothic style under the patronage of the popes, several of whom had a French background. At Orvieto he shared in cutting the façade and made a handsome sarcophagus for Cardinal de Bray. In 1296, with the multidextrous versatility of Renaissance artists, he designed and began to execute three of the glories of Florence, the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore, the Church of Santa Croce, and the Palazzo Vecchio. But with Arnolfo and these works, we pass from sculpture to architecture. All the arts had now returned to life and health. The old skills were not only restored, but were breeding new ventures and techniques with almost reckless fertility. The arts were united as never before or since, in the same enterprise and the same man. Everything had been prepared for the culminating medieval art that would combine them all in perfect cooperation and would give its name to a style and an age. Chapter 32. The Gothic Flowering, 1095 to 1300. 1. The Cathedral. Why did Western Europe build so many churches in the three centuries after 1000? What need was there in a Europe with hardly a fifth of its present population for temples so vast that they are now rarely filled even on the holiest days? How could an agricultural civilization afford to build such costly edifices, which a wealthy industrialism can barely maintain? The population was small, but it believed. It was poor, but it gave. On holy days or in pilgrimage churches, the worshippers were so numerous, said Suger of Saint-Denis, that women were forced to run toward the altar on the heads of men as a pavement. The great abbot was raising funds to build his masterpiece and could be forgiven a little exaggeration. In towns like Florence, Pisa, Chartres, York, it was desirable on occasion to gather the entire population into one edifice. In populous monasteries, the abbey church had to accommodate monks and nuns and laity. Relics had to be guarded in special shrines with room for intimate devotion, and a spacious sanctuary was needed for major rituals. Side altars were required in abbeys and cathedrals whose many priests were expected to say Mass every day. A separate altar or chapel for each favored saint might incline his ear to petitioners, and Mary had to have a lady chapel if the whole cathedral was not hers. The construction was financed largely by the accumulated funds of the Episcopal See. In addition, the bishop solicited gifts from kings, nobles, communes, guilds, parishes, and individuals. The communes were stirred to a wholesome rivalry, in which the cathedral became the symbol and challenge of their wealth and power. Indulgences were offered to those who contributed, relics were carried about the diocese to stimulate giving, and generosity might be prodded by an occasional miracle. Competition for building funds was keen. Bishops objected to collections made in their dioceses for undertakings in another. In some cases, however, bishops from many parts, even from foreign lands, sent aid to an enterprise, as at Chartres. Though some of these appeals verged on pressure, they hardly rivaled the intensity of the influences mobilized for the public financing of a modern war. 
The cathedral chapters exhausted their own funds and almost bankrupted the French church in the Gothic ecstasy. The people themselves did not feel exploited when they contributed. They hardly missed the might they individually gave, and for that might they received, as a collective achievement and pride, a home for their worship, a meeting place for their community, a school of letters for their children, a school of arts and crafts for their guilds, and a Bible in stone whereby they might contemplate in statue and picture the story of their faith. The house of the people was the house of God. Who designed the cathedrals? If architecture is the art of designing and beautifying a building and directing its construction, we must reject for Gothic the old view that the priests or monks were the architects. Their function was to formulate their needs, conceive a general plan, secure a location, and raise funds. Before 1050 it was usual for the clergy, especially the Cluniac monks, to design and superintend as well as to plan. But for the great cathedrals, all after 1050, it was found necessary to engage professional architects who, with rare exceptions, were neither monks nor priests. The architect would not receive that title till 1563. His medieval name was Master Builder, sometimes Master Mason, and these terms reveal his origin. He began as an artisan, physically engaged in the work that he directed. In the 13th century, as wealth permitted greater edifices and specialization, the master builder was one who, no longer sharing in the physical work, submitted designs and competitive estimates, accepted contracts, made ground plans and working drawings, procured materials, hired and paid artists and artisans, and supervised the construction from beginning to end. We know the names of many such architects after 1050, of 137 Gothic architects in medieval Spain alone. Some of them inscribed their names on their buildings, and a few wrote books about their craft. Villard d'Oncourt, circa 1250, left an album of architectural notes and sketches made on the travels that he undertook, in the practice of his profession, from Laon and Reims to Lausanne and Hungary. The artists who did the more delicate work, who carved the figures and reliefs, or painted the windows or the walls, or decorated the altar or the choir, were not distinguished from the artisans by any special name. The artist was a master artisan, and every industry strove to be an art. Much of the work was distributed by contract among the guilds to which artists and artisans alike belonged. The unskilled labor was provided by serfs or hired migratory workers, and when time pressed, the government conscripted men, even skilled artisans, to complete the task. Hours of labor were from sunrise to sunset in winter, and from a little after sunrise to a little before sundown in summer, with time allowed for a substantial meal at noon. English architects in 1275 received twelve pence, or twelve dollars, a day, with traveling expenses and occasional gifts. The ground plan of the cathedral was still essentially that of the Roman basilica, a longitudinal nave terminating in a sanctuary and an apse, and rising above and between two aisles to a roof supported by walls and colonnades. By a complex but fascinating evolution, this simple basilica became first the Romanesque and then the Gothic cathedral. The nave and aisles were cut by a transept, a transverse nave, giving the plan the figure of a Latin cross. The ground area was enlarged by rivalry or devotion until Notre Dame at Paris covered 63,000 square feet, Chartres or Reims 65,000, Amiens 70,000, Cologne 90,000, St. Peter's 100,000. The Christian church was almost always oriented, built with the head or apse pointing eastward toward Jerusalem. Hence the main portal was in the west façade, whose special decoration received the light of the setting sun. In the great cathedrals each portal was an archway with recessed orders, that is, the innermost arch was topped with a larger arch overlapping outward, and this again with a larger arch, until there might be as many as eight such overreaching layers or orders, the whole forming an expanding shell. A similar subordination of orders or gradation of parts enhanced the beauty of nave arches and window jams. Each order or stone band of the compound arch could receive statuary or other sculptural ornament, so that the portal, above all in the west front, became a profuse chapter in the stone book of Christian lore. The dignity of the west façade was heightened by flanking it with towers. Towers are as old as the records of history. In Romanesque and Gothic they were used not only to house bells, but to support the lateral pressure of the façade and the longitudinal pressure of the aisles. In Normandy and England a third tower had many windows, or was largely open at the base, 
and served as a lantern to give a natural light to the center of the church. Gothic architects enamored of verticality aimed to add a spire to every tower. Funds or skill or spirit failed. Some spires fell, as at Beauvais. Notre Dame, Amiens, and Reims received no spires. Chartres only two of its intended three, Laon one of five, and that was destroyed in the Revolution. As the spire pointed the landscapes of the north, so the Campanile or Bell Tower dominated the cities of Italy. There they were usually separate from the church, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa or Giotto's Campanile at Florence. Possibly they took some hints from Moslem minarets. In turn, they spread their style into Palestine and Syria, and they became the civic belfries of the northern towns. Within the church, the central aisle, if its flanking colonnades supported arches curving to meet across the ceiling vault, looked like the inner hull of an inverted ship, hence its name of nave. The full impression of its length was sometimes weakened, particularly in England, by a marble or iron grill, beautifully carved or cast, thrown across the nave to protect the sanctuary from lay intrusion during services. In the sanctuary were choir stalls, always works of art, two pulpits, sometimes called ambos from the Latin word for both, seats for the officiating priests, and the main altar, often displaying an adorned rear screen or reredos. Around the sanctuary, continuing the aisles into the apse, ran an ambulatory designed to allow processions to make full circuit of the edifice. Beneath the altar, some churches, as if recalling the burial chambers of the Roman catacombs, built a crypt to hold the relics of a patron saint or the bones of the distinguished dead. The central problem of Romanesque and Gothic architecture was how to support the roof. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 5, Side 2. The central problem of Romanesque and Gothic architecture was how to support the roof. Early Romanesque churches had wooden ceilings, usually of well-seasoned oak. Such timbers, if properly ventilated and yet guarded from damp, will last indefinitely. So the south transept of Winchester Cathedral still has its 11th century ceiling of wood. The disadvantage of such structures lay in the danger of fires, which, once ignited, were hard to reach. By the 12th century, nearly all major churches had ceilings of masonry. The weight of these roofs determined the evolution of medieval European architecture. Much of this weight had to be borne by the columns that flanked the nave. These had, therefore, to be strengthened or multiplied and this was done by combining several columns into a cluster, or replacing them by massive piers of masonry. The column, cluster, or pier was crowned with a capital, perhaps also with an impost to provide a larger surface to bear the superincumbent weight. From each pier or column cluster rose a fan of masonry arches. A transverse arch thrown athwart the nave to the opposite pier, another transverse arch crossing over the aisle to a pier in the wall two longitudinal arches to the next pier forward and the next to the rear, two diagonal arches connecting the pier with diagonally opposite piers across the nave, and perhaps two diagonal arches to diagonally opposite piers across the aisle. Usually each arch had its own individual support on the impost or capital of the pier. Better still, each might be continued in unbroken line to the ground to form a component of a column cluster or compound pier. The vertical effect so produced was among the fairest features of the Romanesque and Gothic styles. Each quadrangle of piers in nave or aisle constituted a bay, from which the arches rose in graceful inward curvature to form a section of the vault. Externally, this ceiling was covered by a gabled roof of wood, itself hidden and shielded by slate or tiles. The vault became the crowning achievement of medieval architecture. The principle of the arch allowed a greater space to be spanned than had been practical with timbered ceiling or architrave. The nave could now be widened to harmonize with greater length. The widened nave required for proportion a greater height. This allowed the raising of the level at which the arches sprang inward from piers or walls. And this further prolongation of the direct shaft again enhanced the breathtaking verticality of the cathedral lines. The vault became a clearer harmony when its groins, the lines where the masonry arches met, were edged with ribs of brick or stone. These ribs, in turn, led to a major improvement in structure and style. 
The Masons learned to begin the vault by erecting one rib at a time on an easily movable centering or wooden frame. They filled in with light masonry, one at a time, the triangles between each pair of ribs. This thin web of masonry was made concave, thereby shifting most of its weight to the ribs, and the ribs were made strong to channel the downward pressure to specific points, the piers of nave or wall. The groined and ribbed vault became the distinctive feature of medieval architecture at its height. The problem of supporting the superstructure was further met by building the nave higher than the aisles. The roof of the aisle with the outer wall thus served as a buttress for the vault of the nave, and if the aisle itself was vaulted, its ribbed arches would channel half their weight inward to counter the outward pressure of the central vault at the weakest points of the nave supports. At the same time, that part of the nave which rose beyond the roofs of the aisles became a clear story or clear story, whose unimpeded windows would illuminate the nave. The aisles themselves were usually divided into two or three stories, of which the uppermost constituted a gallery, and the second a triforium, so called because as the arched spaces by which it faced the nave were normally divided by two columns into three doors. In eastern churches, the women were expected to worship there, leaving the nave to the men. So, stage by stage, through ten or twenty or a hundred years, the cathedral rose, defying gravity to glorify God. When it was ready for use, it was dedicated in a ceremonious ritual that brought together high prelates and dignitaries, pilgrims and sightseers, and all the townsfolk except the village atheist. Years more would be spent in finishing exterior and interior, and adding a thousand embellishments. For many centuries the people would read on its portals, windows, capitals, and walls, the sculptured or painted history and legends of the faith, the story of the creation, the fall of man and the last judgment, the lives of the prophets and patriarchs, the sufferings and miracles of the saints, the moral allegories of the animal world, the dogmas of the theologians, even the abstractions of the philosophers, all would be there in a vast stone encyclopedia of Christianity. When he died, the good Christian would want to be buried near those walls where demons would be loath to roam. Generation after generation would come to pray in the cathedral. Generation after generation would file out from the church into the tombs. The grey cathedral would look upon their coming and their passing with the silent calm of stone, until in the greatest death of all the creed itself would die, and those sacred walls would be surrendered to omnivorous time, or be ravished to raise new temples to new gods. 2. Continental Romanesque, 1066-1200 we should misjudge the variety of Western architecture in the 12th and 13th centuries if we allowed the foregoing sketch of cathedral structure to stand as valid for all Latin Christendom. In Venice, the Byzantine influence continued. St. Mark's added ever new decorations, pinnacles, and spoils, but always in the manner of Constantinople crossed with that of Baghdad. Probably through Venice, perhaps through Genoa or Marseille, the Byzantine style of domes placed with pendentives upon a Greco-cruciform base entered France and appeared in the churches of Saint-Étienne and Saint-Franc at Périgueux, and in the cathedrals of Cahors and Angoulême. In 1172, when Venice decided to restore and enlarge the palace of the Doges, she took a medley of styles, Roman, Lombard, Byzantine, Arabic, and united them in a masterpiece that Villardouin in 1202 thought moul riche et beau, and which still remains the chief glory of the Grand Canal. No definition of an architectural style has ever escaped exceptions. The works of man, like those of nature, resent generalizations and flaunt their individuality in the face of every rule. Let us accept the round arch, thick walls and piers, narrow windows, attached buttresses or none, and predominantly horizontal lines as characterizing Romanesque, and let us keep an open mind for deviations. Almost a century after the foundation of its Duomo, Pisa commissioned Diotisalvi to erect a baptistry across a square from the cathedral in 1152. He adopted a circular plan, faced the structure with marble, disfigured it with blank arcades, encompassed it with colonnades, and crowned it with a dome that might have been perfect but for its conical cupola. Behind the cathedral, Bonanno of Pisa and William of Innsbruck raised the leaning tower as a campanile in 1174. It repeated the style of the cathedral façade, a series of superimposed Romanesque arcades, with the eighth-story housing the bells. 
The tower sank on the south side after three stages had been built upon a foundation only ten feet deep, and the architects tried to offset this by inclining the later stories toward the north. In a height of 179 feet, the tower now deviates 16 and a half feet from the perpendicular, an increase of one foot between 1828 and 1910. Italian monks migrating into France, Germany, and England brought Romanesque fashions in their train. Perhaps because of them, most French monasteries were Romanesque, so that in France, Romanesque has the second name of the monastic style. The Benedictines of Cluny built a magnificent abbey there, from 1089 to 1131, with four side aisles, seven towers, and such an array of zoological sculpture as roused St. Bernard's ire. In the cloisters, under the eyes of the monks who read, what do these ridiculous monsters seek to do? What do these unclean monkeys mean? These dragons, centaurs, tigers, and lions? These soldiers fighting? These hunting scenes? What business here have these creatures who are half beast and half man? We can see here several bodies under one head and several heads on one body. Here we observe a quadruped with the head of a serpent, there a fish with the head of a quadruped. Here an animal is a horse in front and a goat behind. The Abbey of Cluny was destroyed in the Jacquerie of the Revolution, but its architectural influence spread to its 2,000 affiliated monasteries. Southern France is still rich in Romanesque churches. The Roman tradition was strong there in art as in law, and long resisted the barbaric Gothic that came down from the north. Marble was rare in France, and the cathedrals atoned for lack of external brilliance, by a profusion of sculpture. Startling in the churches of southern France is the expressionism of the statuary, the resolve to convey a feeling instead of copying a scene. So the figure of St. Peter on a portal of the Abbey of Moissac, of 1150, with its tortured face and arachnid legs, must have aimed not so much to accentuate structural lines as to impress and terrify the imagination. That the sculptors deliberately distorted such figures appears from the minute realism of the foliage in the Moissac capitals. The best of these French Romanesque facades is the west portal of saint Trophimes at Arles, from 1152, crowded with animals and saints. Spain raised a lordly Romanesque shrine in the church of Santiago de Compostela, from 1078 to 1211, whose Portico de la Gloria contains the finest Romanesque sculpture in Europe. Coimbra, soon to be the university city of Portugal, built a handsome Romanesque cathedral in the 12th century. But it was in its more northern migrations that Romanesque reached its apogee. The Ile de France rejected it, but Normandy welcomed it. Its rough power accorded well with the people recently Viking and still buccaneers. As early as 1048, the Benedictine monks of Jumiège, near Rouen, built an abbey reputedly larger than any edifice that had been raised in Western Europe since Constantine. The Middle Ages, too, were proud of size. It was half destroyed by the fanatics of the Revolution, but its surviving façade and towers preserve a bold and virile design. There, indeed, was formed the Norman style of Romanesque, relying for its effect on mass and structural form, rather than on ornament. In 1066, William the Conqueror, to expiate the sin of marrying Matilda of Flanders, provided funds for a church of Saint-Étienne at Caen, known as the Abbé aux Hommes, and Matilda, perhaps with like motives, financed there the Church of La Trinité, known as the Abbé aux Dames. About 1135, in a restoration of the Abbé aux Hommes, each bay of the nave was divided with an extra column on each side, bound with a transverse arch. In this way, the usual quadripartite became a sexpartite vault, a form that proved popular throughout the 12th century. From France, the Romanesque style passed into Flanders, raising a handsome cathedral at Tournai in 1066. And from Flanders, France, and Italy it entered Germany. Mainz had begun its cathedral in 1009, Trier in 1016, Speyer in 1030. These were rebuilt before 1300, still in the rounded style. Cologne built in this period the church of St. Maria in Capitol, famous for its interior, and the church of St. Maria, famous for its towers. Both buildings were destroyed in the Second World War. The Cathedral of Worms, dedicated in 1171 and restored in the 19th century, is still a monument of Rhenish Romanesque. These churches had an apse at each end, and cared little for sculptured facades. They adorned their exterior with colonnades, and buttressed the towers with slender turrets of very pleasing form. 
The non-German critic praises these Rhenish shrines with patriotic moderation, but they have a charming, gemütlich beauty, quite in harmony with the inviting loveliness of the Rhine. 3. The Norman Style in England, 1066 to 1200. When Edward the Confessor came to the throne in 1042, he brought with him many friends and ideas from the Normandy in which he had spent his youth. Westminster Abbey began in his reign as a Norman church with round arches and heavy walls. That structure was buried under the Gothic Abbey of 1245, but it inaugurated an architectural revolution. The rapid replacement of Saxon or Danish by Norman bishops ensured the triumph of the Norman style in England. The conqueror and his successors lavished upon the bishops much of the wealth confiscated from Englishmen who had not appreciated conquest. The churches became instruments of mental pacification. Soon the Norman English bishops matched the Norman English nobles in wealth, and cathedrals and castles multiplied as allies in the conquered land. Nearly all tried to rival one another in sumptuous buildings in the Norman style, wrote William of Malmesbury, for the nobles felt that day lost which they had not celebrated with some deed of magnificence. Never had England seen such a frenzy of building. Norman English architecture was a variation of the Romanesque theme. It followed French exemplars in supporting the roof by round arches on fat piers and by heavy walls, though its ceilings were usually of wood. When the vault was of stone, the walls were from eight to ten feet thick. It was largely monastic and rose in out-of-the-way places rather than in cities. It used very little external statuary, fearing the effect of a damp climate, and even the capitals of the columns were simply or poorly carved. In sculpture, England never caught up with the continent. But not many towers could match the mighty structures that dominated the Norman castles, or guarded the façade, or covered the transept crossing of the Norman church. Hardly any ecclesiastical structure in England is still purely Romanesque. Most cathedrals underwent a Gothic lifting of arch and vault in the 13th century, and only the basic Norman form remains. In 1067, fire destroyed the old cathedral of Canterbury. Lanfranc rebuilt it from 1070 to 1077 along the lines of his former Abbe aux Hommes at Caen. Nothing survives of Lanfranc's cathedral except a few patches of masonry where Becket fell. In 1096 to 1110, the priors Ernulf and Conrad built a new choir and crypt. They kept the round arch but channeled the strains to points supported by external buttresses. The transition to Gothic had begun. York Minster, built in 1075 on a Norman plan, disappeared in 1291 under a Gothic edifice. Lincoln Cathedral, originally Norman in 1075, was rebuilt in Gothic after the earthquake of 1185. But the two great towers and sumptuously carved portals of the west façade survive from the Norman church and reveal the skill and power of the older style. At Winchester, the transepts and crypt remain of the Norman cathedral of 1181 to 1103. Bishop Walkellen built it to receive the flow of pilgrims to the tomb of St. Swithin. Walkellen appealed to his cousin the Conqueror for timber to roof the enormous nave. William agreed to let him take from Hempage Forest as much wood as he could cut in three days. While Kellen's flock cut down and carried off the entire forest in seventy-two hours. When the cathedral was finished, nearly all the abbots and bishops of England attended its consecration. We may readily imagine the competitive stimulus aroused by such an enormous edifice. Some echo of the scope of Norman building comes down to us when we note that St. Albans Abbey was begun in 1075, Ely Cathedral in 1081, Rochester in 1083, Worcester in 1084, Old St. Paul's in 1087, Gloucester in 1089, Durham in 1093, Norwich in 1096, Chichester in 1100, Tewkesbury in 1103, Exeter in 1112, Peterborough in 1116, Romsey Abbey in 1120, Fountains Abbey in 1140, St. David's in Wales in 1176. These are not names, they are masterpieces. Shame bows us at leaving them after a few hours or dismissing them in a line. All but one were later rebuilt or reclothed in Gothic. Durham is still predominantly Norman and remains the most impressive Romanesque structure in Europe. Durham is a little mining town of some 20,000 souls. At a turn of the river Weir, a rocky promontory rises. On that strategic elevation stands the gigantic mass of the cathedral, half church of God, half castle against the Scots. Monks from the island of Lindisfarne, fleeing from Danish raiders, built a stone church there in 995. 
In 1093, its second Norman bishop, William of St. Caroleth, demolished this building and with incredible courage and mysterious wealth raised the present edifice. The work continued till 1195, so that the cathedral represents the aspiration and labor of a hundred years. The lofty nave is Norman, with a double arcade of round arches resting on uncarved capitals and stout piers. The vault of Durham introduced to England two vital innovations. The groins were ribbed, helping to localize pressures, and the transverse arches were pointed, while the diagonals were round. If the transverse arches had been round, their crowns could not have reached the same height as the diagonals, which are longer, and the apex of the vault would have been a disturbingly uneven line. By lifting the crowns of the transverse arches to a point, they could be made to reach the desired height. This structural consideration, and no aesthetic aim, apparently fathered the most prominent feature of the Gothic style. In 1175, Bishop Pudsey added to the west end of Durham Cathedral an attractive porch or narthex, which for some unknown reason received the name of Galilee. Here, where lies the tomb of the Venerable Bede, the arches are round, but the slender columns approach the Gothic form. Early in the thirteenth century, the vault of the choir collapsed. In rebuilding it, the architects supported the nave arcade with flying buttresses hidden in the triforium. In 1240-1270, a chapel of the nine altars was added to hold the remains of St. Cuthbert, and in that shrine the arches were pointed, and the transition to Gothic was complete. 4. The Evolution of Gothic Gothic architecture might be defined as a localization and balancing of structural strains, emphasizing vertical lines, ribbed vaults, and pointed forms. It evolved through the solution of mechanical problems set by ecclesiastical needs and artistic aspiration. Fear of fire led to vaults of stone or brick. Heavier ceilings necessitated thick walls and clumsy piers. The ubiquity of downward pressure limited window space. The thick walls shadowed the narrow windows, and the interior was left too dark for northern climes. The invention of the ribbed vault lessened the ceiling weight, allowed slenderer columns and localized strains. The concentration and balancing of pressures gave the building stability without heaviness. The localization of support through buttresses allowed longer windows and thinner walls. The windows offered inviting scope for the already existing art of stained glass. And the stone frames surmounting compound windows aroused the new art of pierced design or tracery. The arches of the vault became pointed to allow arches of uneven length to reach their crowns at an even height, and other arches and window forms became pointed to harmonize with the arches of the vault. Better ways of bearing pressure permitted higher naves. The towers and spires and pointed arches emphasized verticality of line and produced the soaring flight and buoyant grace of the Gothic style. All these together made the Gothic cathedral the supreme achievement and expression of the soul of man. But it is presumptuous to concentrate a century of architectural evolution into a paragraph. Some steps in the development invite calmer scrutiny. The problem of reconciling light grace with stable strength was better solved by Gothic than by any architecture before our time. And we do not know how long our own bold challenges to gravity will escape the leveling jealousy of the earth. Neither did the Gothic architect always succeed. Chartres is still without a crack, but the choir of Beauvais Cathedral crumbled twelve years after it was built. The essential feature of the Gothic style was the functional rib. The transverse and diagonal arch ribs rising from each bay of the nave united to form a light and graceful web upon which a thin vault of masonry could rest. Each bay of the nave became a structural unit, bearing the weight and thrusts brought down by the arches rising from its piers, and supported by counterpressures from the corresponding bays of the aisles, and by outer buttresses applied to the walls at the inward springing of each transverse arch. The buttress was an old device. Many pre-Gothic churches had pillars of masonry externally added at points of special strain. A flying buttress, however, carries a thrust or strain over open space to a base support and to the ground. Some Norman cathedrals used half-arches in the triforium to prop up the arches of the nave but such internal buttresses reached the nave wall at too low a point and gave no strength to the Clare story, where the explosive pressure of the vault was most intense. To apply support at this high point, it was necessary to take the buttress out of its hiding place, let it rise from the solid ground and throw it through open space over the aisle roof to directly sustain the Clare story wall. 
The earliest known use of such an external flying buttress was in the Cathedral of Noyon, about 1150. By the end of that century it had become a favorite device. It had serious faults. Sometimes it gave the impression of a structural skeleton, a scaffolding negligently unremoved, or the makeshift afterthought of a designer whose building sagged. The cathedral had crutches, said Michelet. The Renaissance would reject the flying buttress as an unsightly obstruction and would support by other means such burdens as St. Peter's Dome. The Gothic architect thought differently. He liked to expose the lines and mechanisms of his art. He developed a fondness for buttresses and perhaps multiplied them beyond need. He compounded them so that they would give support at two or more points, or to one another. He beautified their stabilizing piers with pinnacles, and sometimes, as it runs, he provided that at least one angel could stand on the point of a pinnacle. The balancing of strains was far more vital to Gothic than the ogive or pointed arch, but this became the outward and visible sign of an inward grace. The pointed arch was a very old form. At Deer Becker in Turkey it appears on a Roman colonnade of uncertain date. The earliest dated example is at Kasser ibn Wardan in Syria in 561. The form is found in the Dome of the Rock and the Mosque of el -Aqsa at Jerusalem in the 7th century. On a Nilometer in Egypt in 861, in the Mosque of Ibn Tulun at Cairo in 879. It was in frequent use among Persians, Arabs, Copts, and Moors before its first appearance in Western Europe in the second half of the 11th century. It may have come to southern France from Moslem Spain or through pilgrims returning from the east, or it may have arisen spontaneously in the west to meet mechanical problems in architectural design. It should be noted, however, that the problem of bringing arches of uneven length to an even crown could be solved without the ogive by stilting the shorter arches, that is, raising their point of inward springing from pier or wall. This, too, had an aesthetic effect, as emphasizing vertical lines, and the device was widely adopted, seldom as a substitute for the pointed arch, often as a helpful accompaniment. The ogive solved a further problem. Since the aisles were narrower than the nave, an aisle bay had more length than width, the crowns of its transverse arches would fall far short of those of its diagonals, unless the transverse arches were either pointed or stilted so high as to prevent their harmonious inward movement with the diagonals. The ogive offered a similar solution for the difficult task of vaulting with arches of even crown, the ambulatory of the apse, where the outer wall was longer than the inner, and each bay formed a trapezoid whose vault could not be forgivably designed without the pointed arch. That this was not at first chosen for its grace appears from the large number of buildings in which it was used to meet these problems, while the round arch continued to be used in windows and portals. Gradually the vertical lift of the ogive, and perhaps a desire for harmonized form, gave the pointed arch the victory. The ninety years of struggle between the round and the pointed arch, from the appearance of the ogive in the Romanesque Cathedral of Durham in 1104 to the final building of Chartres in 1194, constitute in French Gothic the period of the transition style. The application of the pointed arch to windows created new problems, new solutions, and new charms. The channeling of strains through ribs from vault to piers, and from piers to specific points supported by buttresses, ended the need for thick walls. The space between each point of support and the next bore relatively little pressure. The wall there could be thinned, could even be removed. So large an opening could not be safely fitted with a single pane of glass. The space was therefore divided into two or more pointed windows, or lancets, surmounted by an arch of stone. In effect, the outer wall, like that of the nave, became a series of arches, an arcade. The four-pointed shield of masonry left between the upper ends of the paired and pointed windows and the top of the enclosing stone arch made an ugly blank and cried out for decoration. About 1170, the architects of France responded with plate tracery, that is, they pierced the shield in such a way as to leave stone bars or mullions in ornamental designs, circular, cusped, or lobed, and they filled the interstices as well as the windows with stained glass. In the 13th century, the sculptors cut away more and more of the stone and inserted into the opening little bars of stone carved into cusps or other forms. This bar tracery took on ever more complex patterns, whose predominating lines gave names to styles and periods of Gothic architecture, lancet, geometrical, curvilinear, perpendicular, and flamboyant. Similar processes applied to wall surfaces over the portals produced the great rose windows, 
whose radiating tracery generated the term rayonnant for the style that began at Notre Dame in 1230 and reached perfection in Reims and Saint-Chapelle. In the Gothic cathedral, only the soaring articulation of the vault transcends the beauty of the rose. Stone tracery, in the large sense of any piercing of stone in a decorative design, passed from the walls to other parts of the Gothic cathedral, the buttress pinnacles, the gables above the portals, the soffits and spandrels of arches, the triforium arcade, the sanctuary screen, the pulpit and reredos. For the Gothic sculptor, in the joy of his art, could scarcely touch a surface without adorning it. He crowded facades and cornices and towers with apostles, devils, and saints, with the saved and the damned. He cut his fancy into capitals, corbels, moldings, lintels, frets, and jams. He laughed in stone with the whimsical or terrifying animals that he invented as gargoyles, or little throats, to carry staining rain away from the walls or channel it into the ground through buttresses. Never elsewhere have wealth and skill, piety and lusty humor combined, to provide such a feast of ornament as revels in the Gothic cathedral. Undeniably, the decoration was sometimes too profuse, the tracery was carried to a fragile excess, the statues and capitals must have been too gaudy with the paint that time has cleansed away. But these are the signs of a vital exuberance, to which almost any fault can be forgiven. Wandering in these jungles and gardens of stone, it dawns upon us that Gothic art, despite its heaven-pointing lines and spires, was an art that loved the earth. Amid these saints proclaiming the vanity of vanities, and the terror of the judgment soon to come, we perceive the unseen but omnipresent medieval artisan, proud of his skill, joyful in his strength, laughing at theologies and philosophies, and drinking with relish, and to the last drop, the bubbling, brimming, lethal cup of life. 5. French Gothic, 1133-1300 to Why did the Gothic Revolution begin and culminate in France? The Gothic style was not a virgin birth. A hundred traditions joined in a fertilizing flow. Roman basilicas, arches, vaults, and clair stories, Byzantine themes of ornament, Armenian, Syrian, Persian, Egyptian, Arabic, ogives, groined vaults, and clustered piers, Moorish motifs and arabesques, Lombard ribbed vaults and facade towers, the Germanic flair for the humorous and grotesque, but why did these streams of influence converge in France? Italy, as in wealth and heritage the favored country of Western Europe, might have led the Gothic flowering, but she was the prisoner of her classic inheritance. Italy accepted, France was in the twelfth century the richest, the most advanced nation of the West. She, above all others, had manned and financed the Crusades and profited from their cultural stimulus. She led Europe in education, literature, and philosophy, and her craftsmen were conceded to be the best this side of Byzantium. By the time of Philip Augustus, from 1180 to 1223, the royal power had triumphed over feudal disunity, and the affluence, power, and intellectual life of France were congregating in the king's own domain. That Ile de France, loosely definable as the region of the Middle Seine. Along the Seine, Oise, Marne, and Aisne, a fruitful commerce moved, leaving behind it a wealth that turned to stone in cathedrals at Paris, Saint-Denis, Saint-Lys, Mantes, Noyon, Soissons, Laon, Amiens, and Reims. The manure of money had prepared the soil for the growth of art. The first masterpiece of the transition style was the magnificent Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, in the Paris suburb of that name. It was the work of one of the most complete and successful personalities in French history. Suger, possibly from 1081 to 1151, Benedictine abbot and regent of France, was a man of refined tastes who, while living simply, thought it no sin to love beautiful things and to gather them for the adornment of his church. If the ancient law, he replied to St. Bernard's criticisms, ordained that cups of gold should be used for libations and to receive the blood of rams, how much rather should we devote gold, precious stones, and the rarest of materials to vessels designed to hold the blood of our Lord? So he tells us proudly of the beauty and cost of the gold and silver, the jewels and enamels, the mosaics and stained windows, the rich vestments and vessels, which he gathered or had made for his church. In 1133 he brought together artists and artisans from all lands to raise and adorn a new home for France's patron Saint-Denis, and to house the tombs of the kings of France. He persuaded King Louis the Seventh and the court to contribute the necessary funds. Following our example, he says, they took the rings from their fingers to pay for his costly designs. 
We picture him rising early to superintend the construction, from the felling of the trees that he chose for timbers to the installation of the stained glass, whose subjects he had selected and whose inscriptions he had composed. When he dedicated his edifice in 1144, twenty bishops officiated, the king, two queens, and hundreds of knights attended, and Suger might well have felt that he had won a crown more glorious than any king's. Of his church only parts remain in the present edifice, the west front, two bays of the nave, the chapels of the ambulatory, and the crypt. Most of the interior is a reconstruction by Pierre de Montereau between 1231 and 1281. The crypt is Romanesque. The west façade mingles round and pointed arches. Its sculptures, mostly from Suger's time, include a hundred figures, many well individualized, and all centering about one of the best conceptions of Christ the Judge in the whole sweep of medieval art. Twelve years after Suger's death, Bishop Maurice de Sully paid him the compliment of bettering his instruction, and Notre-Dame de Paris rose on an island in the Seine. Its chronology suggests the immensity of the task. The choir and transepts were built in 1163 to 1182, the nave in 1182 to 1196, the westernmost bays and the towers in 1218 to 1223. The cathedral was finished in 1235. In the original design, the Triforium was to be Romanesque, but in the completion the whole structure adopted the Gothic style. The west front is unusually horizontal for a Gothic cathedral, but that is because the spires that were meant to top the towers were never built. Perhaps for that reason there is a firm and simple dignity in this façade that has led able students to rank it as the noblest architectural conception of man. The rose windows of Our Lady of Paris are masterpieces of bar tracery and coloring, but they were not meant to be described by words. The sculptures, though injured by time and revolution, represent the finest work in that art between the age of Constantine and the building of Reims Cathedral. In the tympanum over the main portal, the Last Judgment is carved with greater calm than in most later renderings of that ubiquitous theme. The Christ is a figure of quiet majesty, and the angel at his right is one of the triumphs of Gothic sculpture. Better still is La Vierge du Trumeau, the Virgin of the Pillar, on the north portal. Here is a new delicacy of treatment, finish of surface, naturalness of drapery, a new ease and grace of stance, with the weight on one foot and the body thereby freed from stiff verticality. In this lovely figure, Gothic sculpture almost declared its independence from architecture and produced a masterpiece quite capable of being taken from its context and standing triumphantly alone. In Notre-Dame at Paris, the transition was ended and Gothic came of age. The story of Chartres illuminates the medieval scene and character. It was a small town, fifty-five miles southwest of Paris, just outside the royal domain, a market for the plain of Beauce, the granary of France. But the Virgin was said to have visited the place in person. The pious lame or blind or sick or bereaved made it a goal of pilgrimage. Some were healed or comforted at her shrine. Chartres became a lord's. Furthermore, its Bishop Fulbert, a man mingled of goodness, intellect, and faith, made it in the eleventh century a shrine of higher education, alma mater to some of the most brilliant figures in early scholastic philosophy. When Fulbert's ninth-century cathedral burned down in 1020, he set himself at once to rebuild it, and lived long enough to see it finished. This, in turn, was destroyed by fire in 1134. Bishop Theodoric made the construction of a new cathedral a veritable crusade. He aroused such devotion to the task, financial and physical, that in 1144, according to the eyewitness account of Abbot Aymon of Normandy, Kings, princes, mighty men of the world, puffed up with honors and riches, men and women of noble birth, bound bridles upon their proud and swollen necks, and submitted themselves to wagons, which, after the fashion of brute beasts, they dragged with loads of wine, corn, oil, lime, stones, beams, and other things necessary to sustain life or build churches. Moreover, as they draw the wagons, we may see this miracle, that although sometimes a thousand men and women are bound in the traces, Yet they go forward in such silence that no voice, no murmur is heard. When they pause on the way, no words are heard but confessions of guilt with supplication and pure prayer. The priests preach peace, hatred is soothed, discord is driven away, debts are forgiven, unity is restored. This cathedral of Bishop Theodoric had hardly been completed in 1180 when, in 1194, fire gutted the nave, brought vault and walls to the ground, and left, as scarred survivors, only the subterranean crypt and the west façade with its two towers and spires. 
We are told that every house in the town was destroyed in that awful conflagration, whose traces are visible on the cathedral today. The discouraged people for a time lost faith in the Virgin and wished to abandon the town. But the indomitable papal legate Melior told them that the calamity had been sent by God to punish their sins. He commanded them to rebuild their church and their homes. The clergy of the diocese contributed nearly all their income for three years. New miracles were reported of the Virgin of Chartres. Faith was rekindled. Multitudes came again as in 1144 to help the paid workers pull the carts and set the stones. Funds were contributed by every cathedral in Europe. And by 1224, toil and hope completed the cathedral that makes Chartres again a goal of pilgrimage. The unknown architect had planned to top with towers not merely the flanks of the west front, but also the transept portals and the apse. Only the two façade towers were built. La Cloche Vieux, the old bell tower, 1145 to 1170, rose with its spire to 351 feet at the south end of the façade. It is simple and unadorned, and wins the preference of professional architects. Its northern mate, the Cloche Neuf, twice lost its wooden spire by fire. The spire was rebuilt in stone from 1506 to 1512 by Jean Le Texier, in flamboyant Gothic style of crowded and delicate ornament. Ferguson thought it the most beautifully designed spire on the continent of Europe. But it is generally agreed that so ornate a spire mars the unity of an austere façade. The fame of Chartres rests on its sculpture and its glass. In this palace of the Virgin live ten thousand carved or pictured personages, men, women, children, saints, devils, angels, and the persons of the Trinity. There are two thousand statues in the portals alone. Additional statues stand against columns in the interior. Visitors who climb the 312 steps to the roof are astonished to see carefully carved life-sized figures where none but the vigorous curious can ever notice them. Over the central portal is a splendid Christ, not, as in later facades, sternly judging the dead, but seated in calm majesty amid a happy throng, his hand held out as if to bless the entering worshippers. Attached to the recessed orders of the portal arch are nineteen prophets, kings, and queens. They are slender and stiff as befits their station as literally pillars of the church. Many are crude and unfinished, perhaps injured or worn. But some of the faces have the philosophic depth, the gentle repose, or the maiden grace that were to be perfected at Reims. The transept facades and porches are the fairest in Europe. Each has three portals, flanked and separated by beautifully carved columns and jams, and almost covered with statues, every one of which is so individualized that several have received names from the folk of Chartres. The south porch centers its 783 figures around Christ enthroned on his judgment seat. Here, Notre Dame de Chartres is subordinated to her son. But in compensation she is endowed, as in Albertus Magnus, with all the sciences and philosophy, and in her service on this portal appear the seven liberal arts. Pythagoras is music, Aristotle is dialectic, Cicero as rhetoric, Euclid as geometry, Nicomachus as arithmetic, Priscian as grammar, Ptolemy as astronomy. St. Louis, in the words of his charter of 1259, caused the north porch to be completed by reason of his particular devotion to the Church of Our Lady of Chartres and for the saving of his soul and the souls of his forefathers. In 1793, the French Revolutionary Assembly defeated by a narrow margin a motion to destroy the statues of Chartres Cathedral in the name of philosophy and the Republic. Philosophy compromised by chopping off some of the hands. This north porch belongs to the Virgin, and tells her story with reverent affection. The statues here stand out in the round as fully matured sculpture. The drapery is as graceful and natural as any in Greek carving. The figure of modesty is French girlhood at its best, where modesty gives to beauty a double power. There is nothing finer in all the history of sculpture. These statues, said Henry Adams, are the Egenine eaten marbles of French art. As one enters the cathedral, four impressions mingle. The simple lines of the nave and fault, hardly comparable in size or beauty with the nave of Amiens or Winchester. The ornate choir screen, begun in 1514 by the flamboyant Jean Le Texier. The peaceful figure of Christ on a pillar of the south transept, and, suffusing all with soft color, the unequaled stained glass. Here, in 174 windows, are 3,884 figures from legend and history, ranging from cobblers to kings. It is medieval France seen through the richest colors ever developed. 
dark reds, soft blues, emerald greens, saffron, yellow, brown, white. Here above all is the glory of Chartres. We must not look to these windows for realistic portraiture. The figures are ungainly, sometimes absurd. Adam's head in the medallion of the expulsion from Eden is painfully askew, and the bilateral charms of Eve could hardly divert the worshipper to concupiscence. It seems to these artists enough that the pictures told a story while the colors fused in the viewer's vision and in their mingling painted the cathedral air. Excellent in design is the window of the prodigal son. Famous for color and line is the window of the symbolic tree of Jesse. But better than all the rest is Notre Dame de la Belle Verrière, Our Lady of the Beautiful Window. Tradition holds that this lovely panel was rescued from the fire of 1194. Standing at the crossing of transept and nave, one may see the major roses of Chartres. This book is continued on Cassette 6, Side 1.